Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep our weekly date with the Dean of Storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting it. I am indeed, Mr. Bell. Good evening. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. This is one doctor's appointment I'll never be late for. Oh, that's very nice of you to say, sir, my boy. Uh, draw up your usual chair and settle down. <sighs> ah, that's it. <laughs> Fire in the grate, the lights turned low, and a wind howling outside. It's a perfect setting for a Sherlock Holmes adventure. Which one is it going to be? Well, tonight I thought I'd tell you a most weird and macabre story. Concerns werewolves on the wild moors of Scotland. And the strange happenings that took place in McKinnon Castle. Dear, dear, werewolves and haunted castles... My hair's beginning to stand on end already. Please get on with the story, Doctor. In due time, Mr. Bell, but first, haven't you a little uh, business with our listeners? Business that also has to do with the hair? Business? (laughs) Oh, no, Dr. Watson, this isn't business. It's a pleasure. But thanks for the reminder. And I know you men will thank me again and again for this hot tip. Try Kreml hair tonic. Just notice how Kreml makes stubborn hair so much easier to comb. How your hair falls in place just where you want it and stays that way all day long. Now, be honest, men. Did your hair ever look better? You see, Kreml gives even dull, lifeless-looking hair a rich, attractive luster. It makes hair look so handsome and alive. Yet Kreml never glues hair down. It never leaves it looking or feeling greasy or dirty. Just try Kreml hair tonic once, and you readily see why it's such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the werewolf? Well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began innocently enough on a slate gray November afternoon in Baker Street, just before the turn of the century. Holmes and I were seated comfortably on either side of a crackling fire when shortly before tea time, there was a jangle on our doorbell, and a few minutes later, a young girl, who Mrs. Hudson announced as Miss Victor, was standing before us. A young girl dressed in a wedding gown. She was in a great state of excitement. In fact, almost hysterical. Mr. Holmes, you must help me. There's no one else to whom I can turn. I, there, I don't know what there, to do. There, 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 my dear. Compose yourself. <laughs> if you will just tell us the facts, Miss Victor. Well, at three o'clock this afternoon, I was to have been married to David McKinnon. Any relation to the heir to McKinnons? The son and heir to the estate, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? I think I met one of the family in a shooting party a few years ago. I remember distinctly... Some other time, what... Watson, please. Oh. Miss Victor's problem is immediate. Oh, sorry, Holmes. You say uh, you were to have been married, Miss Victor. <laughs> what occurred to prevent the ceremony? David just... just didn't appear. Oh, it was dreadful, Mr. Holmes. I waited and waited, and finally I knew he wasn't coming... You've had no word from him since? No, none. I went to his hotel as soon as I left the church. And what did you discover? That that he'd received a visit from an elderly Scotsman this morning. And the porter said that immediately afterward they left together in a cab for St. Pancras Station. St. Pancras? Undoubtedly their destination was Scotland, Holmes. Quite. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must find David for me. I know he's been kidnapped. Miss Victor... A man who is being kidnapped does not walk out of a hotel in broad daylight and order a cab. But something's happened to him. He wouldn't do a thing like this of his own volition. Are you quite sure that you didn't have some lover's quarrel, some little tiff in the last few days that might have made your fiancé change his mind? Of course I'm sure, Dr. Watson. We've never had any misunderstanding. Only something dreadful could have made him leave. I shall do everything in my power to find out what it was, Miss Victor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, Watson, get me the railway guide. Oh, uh, there you are. It's on the table beside you. I knew you'd help me. I only hope we'll be successful. Ah. Now, Watson, if you'll pack a couple of bags and meet me at the station at 9.15 in time for the Scottish Express, I have a few simple inquiries to make. Kept you so long, Holmes. We almost missed the train. You're shockingly out of condition, Watson. Oh, well. A little sprint like that shouldn't leave you so winded. Oh, well, never mind about my condition. Where have you been for the last four hours? Delving into the back issue files of the Times. Very instructive. You should try it sometime. Rubbish. There's nothing duller than yesterday's news. I doubt it would call the legend of the McKinnon family dull, Watson. 
on the continent. Oh, so that's what you've been looking up. Yes. It's a history that goes back several hundred years of brawling and bloodshed. The founder of the clan was a 14th century Scottish warrior by the name of Wolfhound McKinnon. He is reputed to have been so incredibly vicious in battle that his enemies accused him of being a werewolf. Uh, a vampire? Oh, come now, Holmes. <laughs> Merely repeating a 500-year-old legend. The point is that the present head of the clan, the father of the disappearing fiancé today, is known as Black Angus. He's a dominant, thoroughly hated man whose local reputation is as frightening in our day and age as his predecessors was five oh, centuries that's ago. Oh, very interesting, Holmes, but I don't see why you should get so excited over a 500-year-old legend. Well, you see, Watson, I found another rather curious fact in the papers. Oh? What was that? Several times during the last few months, sheepdogs have been found dead in the vicinity of McKinnon Castle with their throats torn out. Good heavens! Thomas, you've lived in this village a good many years, I expect. All my life, sir. And this inn was my father's before me. We're interested in some of the local beauty spots, particularly McKinnon Castle. McKinnon Castle is no beauty spot, sir. Oh, really? Devil's Castle, we call it. There isn't a one of us in the village that wouldn't have been glad to see the ground open up and swallow the place. I and every McKinnon who lives there. Gracious me. Why are the McKinnons so hated, Thomas? There are no men... They're monsters. And McKinnon thinks that because he owns the land, he owns the air Amon breathes, too. And Black Angus is the biggest, blackest devil of them all. Black Angus? You mean the present laird? Aye. And if he keeps up with his devil's work, he'll be the dead laird before long. Dear me, how bloodthirsty. What's been going on, Thomas? It's the sheepdog, sir. Hereabouts, a man's sheepdog is his living. And yet six more have been killed in the past two weeks. And all of the poor wee beasties lying there on the moors with their throats torn out. How can you blame McKinnon for that? Surely some animal... Aye, been... sir. Aye. An animal that stands on two feet. What are you suggesting, Thomas? I'm suggesting nothing, sir. Except those dead dogs all had human teeth marks on their throats. <laughs> You insinuating that uh, Black Angus is, is a vampire? Oh, now, now, now. Really, my dear fellow. Oh, we've seen him at night, huh? when the moon was high, galloping across the moors on his big black horse. And the next morning, there's always been a dead sheepdog. You've seen him yourself? Well, well, no, sir. But there are those that have. There's no mistaking him with his big coat flapping and his hat pulled down over his eyes. What an extraordinary business. Interesting. Very interesting. Do you see that gentleman that just came in, sitting by himself in the corner there, sir? The man in the grey overcoat? Aye. His name's Humphreys. He can tell you more about the McKinnons than I can. He's a cousin of the family. And even though he's related and lives at the castle, he's as nice a gentleman as you'd meet up with. Thank you for the information, Thomas. I think perhaps we'll go and have a chat with him. Come on, Watson. Right, sir. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Glad to be of service, gentlemen. Excuse me, Mr. Humphreys. Aye. May we take the liberty of introducing ourselves? I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, oh, Mr. Do Humphreys? You do? Oh, won't you uh, sit down? Thank you. Thomas tells me you are a cousin of the McKinnon family. I am. Uh, do you know them? We're particularly interested in one of them, Mr. Humphreys. Yes, in David McKinnon. Ah, David's a very fine boy. You knew he was to have been married in London yesterday? Aye, I knew that. Did you also know that just before his wedding, he suddenly disappeared, Mr. Humphreys? Uh, gentlemen, may I ask the uh, reason for your interest in young David? That's a very fair question, sir. I have been asked by Miss Victor, David's fiancée, to try and find the young man. Oh, I see. Mm. It's a very unfortunate business. Mr. Humphreys, shortly before the wedding yesterday, David McKinnon had a visitor in his hotel. They left together, presumably to catch the express for Scotland. And poor Miss Victor was left stranded at the church. The little thing was, was heartbroken. Uh, she would be. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, I wish I could help you in some way, but... Uh... You can, Mr. Humphreys. 
Well, how? By telling us what message you delivered to David at his hotel yesterday. That I... Oh, come now, Mr. Humphreys. The man seen to be leaving the hotel with David was wearing a grey raglan coat, such as you are wearing. In addition, I observed as we sat down that you're reading yesterday's edition of the London Times. Even if you subscribed to it, it couldn't have reached you here in Scotland through the post this speedily. Amazing, home. Elementary, isn't it, Mr. Humphreys? Well, I don't know about that, but uh, your deduction is correct. Yes. yes, Mr. Holmes, I did return with David from London yesterday. What was the message you were sent to give him, may I ask? The message that decided him not to go through with his marriage? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, Mr. Holmes. Uh, though I may tell you, it's a family secret of the gravest importance. Hmm. Well, in that case, our only recourse is to go to McKinnon Castle and pursue our inquiries there. Yeah, I imagine that would be best, gentlemen, but uh, frankly, I doubt if you'll gain admittance. Angus is a willful man with a terrible temper, and when he knows you want to see David... We've he... handled terrible men before, haven't we, Watson? Yes, indeed. I remember that afternoon in Baker Street when Dr. Grimsby Royal picked up the poker and was yes, about... Yes, Watson. To... You can regale Mr. Humphreys with that some other oh, time. Well. But now I think we'd best be starting for the castle. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes... If by any chance you do see Angus, I must ask you not to mention that you've talked to me. I, if he finds out, there might be trouble. All right, Mr. Humphreys. Come along, Watson. I wish they'd put some springs in this vehicle. It's worse than an Irish jaunting car. <laughs> if Thomas's directions are to be believed, we should see the castle when we get to the crest of this hill. This Black Angus seems to be quite a lovable character. Even Humphreys, his, his cousin, seems to be terrified of him. The man was positively shaking. Yes, I noticed that. Ah, that must be the castle now. I just... Forbidding-looking place, isn't it? Yes. Watson... Rain in your horse. Well, back, well, back, well, back. What is it, Holmes? Look, lying by the side of the road. Just a dead dog. Yes, a dead sheep dog. Come on. Uh, the dog's throat has been torn out. Yes. And look here, Watson. Look at these marks on the throat. Good heavens, Holmes. They look like they are the marks of human teeth. <laughs> Hey, gentlemen. Is the lad at home? I'm sorry, sir. But the lad will not see people we have to an appointment. Uh, then will you please give him a message? But the two... Tell him that Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come here from London to see him. Yes, my good man. And, and tell him it's on a very important and confidential business. If you'll wait here in the hall, I'll give him the message, gentlemen. But he'll no see you. He'll no see you. Stupid old lad. Anyone think he owned the castle? Watson, have a look at these two portraits. <laughs> a couple of grim-looking characters. Give you the creeps. I think we may reasonably assume they're McKinnon ancestors. Do you notice something odd about them? Well, both of the men are smiling. If you call that smiling, it looks more like leering to me. <laughs> Whatever it is, it shows their teeth. Notice the abnormal length of the eye teeth? Oh, sure, yes. And the teeth marks on the dead sheep dog. Quite. Yeah, who he is. Black Angus seems to be living up to his name. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but the lair will not see you. He asks that you please leave at once. That's a bit of an understatement. You may tell him we're not leaving here until we've seen Mr. David McKinnon. I'm sorry, Just sir, Just a but... moment. I'm David McKinnon. You are splendid. We've come here on behalf of... I know why you're here, gentlemen. I must ask that you leave at once. But, Miss Victor, your fiancé... After all, you know gentlemen, you... Gentlemen, you heard my father's message... Please go. As for Miss Victor, I have no interest in hearing anything concerning her. Good day. Come, Watson. I think perhaps our visit was ill-timed. This way, please, gentlemen. Let's get away from here. Unprincipled young care, David. I'd like to give him a good thrashing. 
might be interesting to talk to David McKinnon when he's away from the influence of Black Angus. Oh, you're wasting your time, Holmes. A man's a bounder. Besides, they'll never let us in the house again. By the front door, true. However, we can still try the back. Leave your hat and coat in the bushes here, old chap. Rumple up your hair, dirty your face, and adopt that delightful Scottish dialect of yours. For the moment, we will be plumbers. Plumbers? How do we know they need plumbers? In an old castle like this, you can always be sure of one fact. Something must inevitably be wrong with the drains. They always need plumbers. But Holmes, do you think it's safe? I mean, if Black Angus discovers us, he may be dangerous. I'm afraid that's a chance we'll have to take. Come along, Watson, and try to look as much like a plumber as possible. <laughs> In just a moment, Dr. Watson will continue the story of Black Angus. But first, here's something which should certainly interest you men about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml is one of the greatest improvements ever made in the history of hair tonics. It's been especially developed to keep dry, unruly hair in perfect order all day long, always looking its best with a nice, rich luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that objectionable, greasy, patent leather look. That kind of hair went out of style with handlebar mustaches. No, Kreml goes in for modern, handsome hair grooming. And it does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It also promptly relieves itching of dry scalp and leaves the scalp feeling so clean and alive. May I suggest that tomorrow, when you're out for your Sunday walk or drive, you stop and buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, did you and Sherlock Holmes manage to get into McKinnon Castle disguised as plumbers? We did, Mr. Bell. Holmes is right about the drains. We were welcomed at the service entrance with open arms, figuratively speaking. Of course, we, we were shown down to the basement and left to our own devices. As soon as the coast was clear, I found myself following Sherlock Holmes as he stealthily mounted an, an old stone stairway. I must confess that my heart was in my mouth. This stairway should lead us up to the east wing, I'd say. By the way, Watson, you make a most convincing plumber. Oh, well, uh, oh, rather good at charge, you know. <laughs> Quiet, Watson. There's a light under that door. The door's slightly ajar. Come here, Watson. We can see through the crack. There's a man seated in front of the dressing table, staring into the mirror. Candlelight's flickering, but I'll give you odds that's black angles. Oh, I don't like this, Holmes. I don't like it. He may... Holmes, he's got a revolver. He's raising it. Angus McKinnon, put down that revolver. Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I told Bruce to throw you out. This time I'll do it myself. then, you trying... Mr. McKinnon... I know what you were thinking when you raised that revolver to your temple just now. And believe me, you're wrong. You can't possibly know. I think I do. You are convinced that you have been killing these sheepdogs. You have been so preoccupied with the legends of your great ancestor, Wolfhound McKinnon, that you think that your brain has snapped and that you've turned into a vampire. You're right, Mr. Holmes. But how you found out is beyond me. You know about the dogs? The sheep dogs with their throats torn out? Yes, we know about them. In fact, we found one as we were driving out about a mile from here. I know. They brought me the news not more than two hours ago. It won't happen again. You're convinced that you are responsible for these killings? What else can I think? All the evidence, the blood stains on my cloak. And I know those stains are not caused by human blood. You remember nothing? Nothing. But when I think of the heritage of the McKinnons... How can I doubt? Then that's the reason your son was recalled from London yesterday. It is. You suddenly had proof of what you thought to be your own morbid tendencies. And so you sent a message to your only son, warning him that he must not allow the woman he loved to marry into a family stained with madness. Holmes, you seem to understand my problem. But I will not discuss it with you. Go away, both of you. A McKinnon cannot go to his maker before strangers. Mr. McKinnon... Give me your help in a few hours, Grace, and I'm convinced I can prove to you that you're the victim of a devilish plot. A plot? I, I don't understand. Oh, come now, Mr. McKinnon. In this year of Grace, it's a little hard to believe in vampires. But how can you disprove the evidence I've seen with my own eyes? The human teeth marks. It wouldn't be hard to conceive of an instrument that could simulate those marks, Mr. McKinnon. But who could think of such a fiendish plan? 
And what would be the motive? I have a suspicion. But what's more important at the immediate moment is to find the evidence. An instrument such as I've suggested would be damning proof. Therefore, it would be hidden in the most obscure hiding place in the castle. Now, what would be the most secret place? The cellars? Aye, we have extensive cellars. We'll search them. But another possibility occurs to me. In castles as old as this, there's often a secret room. Or, as they were sometimes called, a priest's hole. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. We have such a hiding place here, though I haven't been in it for years. A narrow stairway leads down between the walls from an entrance behind that big cabinet. Splendid, Mr. McKinnon. You have a lantern? There, on the dressing table. I'll light it, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. I have a strong suspicion that the solution of the postponed wedding ceremony, as well as that of the mangled dogs, lies at the foot of that secret stairway. Stuffy little place, festooned with cobwebs. Oh, dear, dear. Just walked into another one. Nobody's been down here recently, Holmes, I'd swear to that. Give me the lantern, Watson, will you? Uh, there you are, fella. Thanks. Uh-huh. Look here in the dust on the floor. Footprints. Footprints leading to that old chest in the, in the corner over there. Yes. Doesn't seem to be locked. <laughs> Look, Mr. McKinnon. See this devil's instrument? Oh, what is it? It looks like a metal trap. It is, with jaws of steel and a powerful spring. Oh, good heavens! And you can see the recent bloodstains on it. This fiendish instrument gives us the answer to those poor dead dogs. You mean that this was used to tear up their throats? Undoubtedly. And look, more devil's work. Great Scott, a human jawbone with the teeth intact. This must have been used to leave the prints of human teeth after the animals were dead. And to try and make me think that I was mad. The devil's... Somebody shot, the, somebody shot the lantern out of my hand. You're too inquisitive, Sherlock Holmes. Humphreys. Yes, Angus, your cousin, Humphreys. We've found out, Humphreys. I know what you and your meddling friends have found out, Angus. Thoughtful of you to put yourselves in my power. A priest dungeon will make a perfect coffin for the three of you. I'm going to lock and bolt this door at the head of the stairs. It's your only escape. I'm afraid death by suffocation and starvation won't be very pleasant, my friend. I'm friends, I'm coming back up those stairs. I'm going to get my hands on you. Your step, Angus, and I fire. Your devil, I'm friends. I warned you. Oh, Watson, where are you? I'm here, sir. How is he? I'm all right, Holmes. I think the shot just grazed me. I'll strike a match. Yes. Just a flesh wound as far as I can see. Good. McKinnon, is there another exit from this room? There is, Mr. Holmes. Under that chest, the stone slides out. Gracious me, Mr. Humphreys said... Humphreys knows nothing about it. Some secrets of the McKinnon family are only interested to those bearing the family name. Thank heaven for that. And I'd suggest we get out of here as soon as possible. The air in here is getting stale already. Lean on me, Mr. McKinnon. That's it. How are you feeling? A little shaky, but I'm all right, Mr. Holmes. We're in blazes, are we? We've been following this little passage up and down, round and round. Right now we're behind the wall of the library. The entrance is ahead of us, concealed by a tapestry. Shh! There's a faint crack of light. We're behind the tapestry. Someone's in the library. Oh, boy, I don't know how to say this. It's Humphreys. And my son, David. Shh! Listen. I was worried about those men from London. Sherlock Holmes should learn of the shame of the McKinnons. David, I'm afraid I've got shocking news for you. Your father has confessed that he has been killing the sheepdog. Father? He knows that he's mad. He, he left the castle just now with a pistol. He plans to kill himself. Kill himself? We must stop him. Oh, no, 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 my boy. Let him go. It's the best way. Poor father. What can I do? There's only one honorable solution, David. Your branch of the family is corrupt, decayed. If your father dies and you disappear, the estate reverts to me, and we can save the McKinnon name with fresh blood. But, Uncle... You it's... can go to the colonies and start life over with a new name. It's the only way. We've heard enough. Come on. Humphreys, you lion devil father. They said the... Drop that revolver, Humphreys. Drop it or I'll shoot. 
We overheard your conversation, Mr. Humphreys. Most enlightening. And we found this where you headed, you filthy beast. A human jawbone. You'd marked the dogs with it and tried to make me think that I'd done it the sun. Then what he told me in London was nothing but a pack of lies. Of course. Mr. McKinnon, I suggest you send for the police. The police? What crime can they hold me for? A few sheepdogs killed and they can't prove I was responsible. There's... There's a, there's a mob of people outside the window. Mr. McKinnon, sir, excuse me. What is it, Bruce? It's a crowd of the villagers. They're in an ugly mood. They say you're responsible for the sheepdogs being killed on the moors. They're threatening to burn the castle. I'm afraid they're getting out of hand. Go back and tell them that in a few minutes I'll come out and explain the killing. Aye, sir, I. But in a way too long. I'll go and talk to them, Father. They know me. Mr. Humphreys, possibly the law can do little to you. But the violence of mob rule may prove strikingly effective. Aye, I'll take this blackguard Humphreys out there. They'll know what to do with him. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to keep me away from them. They tear me to pieces. Sign a written confession, Mr. Humphreys, and we'll protect you. I'll sign anything. Just keep me away from that mob. You suggested that my boy should go to the colonies. Put it in writing that you'll do just that yourself. Give me a pen. Here you are. And now, Watson, I think we still have time to catch the night express for London. I hope we'll have no difficulty in obtaining three tickets on such short notice. Three tickets? Of course. I'm certain young David McKinnon will be accompanying us. I fancy we may be attending a wedding within a very few days. And did you, Dr. Watson? Did I... did I what? Attend the wedding. <laughs> Indeed we did, Mr. Bell. As a matter of fact, Holmes acted as best man. It was a very charming affair. <laughs> I'm sure it was. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. What shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you a story called The Adventure of the Hungry Cat, in which Sherlock Holmes saves an innocent man from the gallows and brings to justice... A particularly vicious and cold-blooded murderer. Now, here's something which should interest you ladies. My wife has beautiful, natural highlights in her hair. And girls, I'll let you in on the secret of how she does it. I always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves my hair with a natural, glossy luster that lasts for days and days. Cremel shampoo actually brings out all the natural, glossy highlights that lie concealed in the hair. In addition, it has a beneficial oil base that helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. This famous hard water shampoo works like magic in every type of water. And girls, you'll love the way its rich, luxurious foam penetrates right to the scalp. And removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is the same beautifying shampoo which those famous Million Dollar Powers models use. So why not glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Cremel Shampoo? Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures and Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the hungry cat. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time to call on our old friend, that incomparable host and storyteller, Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his familiar study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I won't get up, if you don't mind. 
This change in the weather has given me a twinge or two of rheumatism, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Dr. Watson. Well, uh, we old fossils can't expect to be as hale and hearty as you young fellows, you know. Uh, I don't know that I feel so young today, Dr. Watson. I stopped by the military academy this afternoon and saw my cousin there. He's 13 years old, and after an hour with him, I realized I'm really quite ancient. 13 years old. Oh, a fine age. He's happy at the school, Mr. Bell? Crazy about it. Yes, I'm sure that in this day and age, a boy almost looks forward to going to school. Conditions were far different in certain parts of England just before the turn of the century, I'm afraid. I'm thinking in particular of a school that Holmes and I had occasion to visit and of the frightened, unhappy youngsters who lived there in mortal terror of their lives. Oh, this has all the hallmarks of the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is, my boy. It's a story I call The Singular Affair of the Dying Schoolboys. But before I begin, haven't you a message for our listeners? Yes, I have. Folks, it looks as if we're in for plenty of excitement tonight with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And men, I'll bet you'll be plenty excited about the great improvement in the appearance of your hair once you use Kreml hair tonic. Frankly, I've tried any number of hairdressings, but it took Kreml to really convince me that my hair can always be neat without having to plaster it down with grease or those sticky, gooey concoctions. And Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. It makes hair so much easier to comb and actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, easier to manage. At the same time, Kreml removes embarrassing dandruff flakes. It relieves itching due to dry scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so clean, so alive. Man, what a treat. Now be sure to buy a bottle at any drug counter spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the dying schoolboys? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began on a stormy September evening in Baker Street many, many years ago. All day long, the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against our windows. Shortly after dinner, there was the old familiar jangle on our front doorbell. And a few moments later, Mrs. Hudson ushered a distinguished visitor into the room. As he stood there in front of the flickering firelight, I could see that he was a good-looking man and also that he was in a state of considerable excitement. Now, Lord Manders, if you will just give us the facts. Well, Mr. Holmes, three years ago... I was a passenger on that ill-fitted ship, the Sophie Anderson. She was wrecked in a gale, and I was the only survivor. I clung to a piece of broken spar and was washed ashore, and after that, for over two years, I lived alone on an island in the Indian Ocean. Naturally, when the Sophie Anderson foundered, I was believed to be dead. My young brother, Eric, who was next in line, inherited the estate under the guardianship of our uncle. Oh, there must have been quite a lot of confusion when you arrived home this year, Lord Manders. There was, Dr. Watson but not for the reason you suppose. I landed in England to find that my brother had died last December. Oh, indeed, I'm very sorry. He died under very peculiar circumstances. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. What were those circumstances? My uncle sent Eric to a school on the Welsh Moors, not far from Cardiff, a school known as Punsonby Hall. He died in the school infirmary there, supposedly of pneumonia. And you have some reason to believe it was not pneumonia? Nothing definite. I've been down to the school, but Dr. Punson, the owner, was too ill to see me. However, I did talk to a frightening woman there, who's the matron of the place, a Mrs. Arkwright. I became suspicious. So I stayed on and, for a few days, made some local inquiries. With what results? Punsonby Hall has a black name with the villagers, Mr. Holmes. Five boys have died there in the last two years under circumstances similar to my brother's. Good gracious me. I presume that you immediately had an accounting with your uncle? My uncle had settled another account before my return, Mr. Holmes. He died of a heart attack last February. But I am certain he was responsible for Eric's death. You see, he stood to inherit the estate. It may sound incredible, but I believe Eric was murdered at Punsonby Hall. Murdered in a boys' school? Oh, come, 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 sir. Such things can't happen in this 19th century of ours. But they can, Watson, and do, unfortunately. You don't mean it. I do. A private school situated in a desolate spot and operated by an unprincipled scoundrel could provide excellent and profitable opportunities for removing unwanted relatives. What a ghastly thought. Mr. Holmes, I know that Eric's dead and nothing can bring him to life again. But I can try and avenge his death and bring his murderer to justice. You will help me, won't you? Yes, Lord Manders, I will. 
If these shocking occurrences have been taking place, we may be able at least to prevent further tragedies. Watson, suppose we join Lord Manders on the West of England Express tonight and tomorrow see what can be done to penetrate the black clouds that surround Punsonby Hall. We're walking in the wrong direction, Mr. Holmes. The school's behind us. And before going there, I thought we might profitably pay a visit here in the village to Llewellyn Coffin. Oh, who's he? The local undertaker. An undertaker named Coffin? <laughs> That's very funny, isn't it? Coffin, undertaker. <laughs> Quite. But try and control your amusement, will you, Watson? Oh, sorry, Oliver. Here's his establishment now. Good day, gentlemen. Mr. Coffin? Yes, sir. That's my name, Coffin. We're strangers in these parts, and we're in search of information. I'm hoping, Mr. Coffin, that you'll be able to help us. What I can do, sir, I will, and do it gladly. I understand that you've had an unusually large proportion of business from Punsonby Hall in the past two years. Five boys died, didn't they? Five boys it was. Mr. Coffin, we've heard some strange stories in the village. Yes, stories that make us wonder if those deaths were from natural causes. Gentlemen, I'm a simple man, look you. A man who plies his trade but cannot afford to ask questions. What goes on at Punsonby Hall, and I'll not say strange things haven't happened there, is none of my business. Then let me appeal to your sympathies. My young brother died at Punsonby Hall last December. You must have buried him. Your brother? Well, now look you, that makes it different. But you'll not say anything up at the hall, sir. Dr. Punsonby's a savage man. Don't worry on that score, Mr. Coffin. What do you have to know him, sir? All the five boys were supposed to have had pneumonia, I understand. That's what the medical report said. Who signed those reports? Dr. Punsonby himself. He's a regular medical doctor, look you. How very convenient. No questions had to be asked. Mr. Coffin, when you prepared those bodies for burial, did you notice anything unusual about them? Anything to make you think their deaths were possibly not caused by pneumonia? No, sir. Think now. Think, uh, uh, well, now that you mention it, there was one thing I was after noticing. Oh, what was that, my good man? The boys had a strange look on their faces as they lay there. As if something had frightened the wits out of them just before they died. That's very odd. The face of anyone dying from pneumonia would be in repose. Did you notice anything else, Mr. Coffin? Any other peculiarity? Well, there was one thing, sir, that gave me to thinking. All the boys had marks on them. Mm, stretch marks they were on their necks or shoulders. Perhaps they were bites. Rem- remember Dr. Rylett of Stroke Moran Holmes? Uh, did these marks look like the bites of a snake, Mr. Coffin? No, that they weren't. Look, you, I know a snake bite when I see one. Didn't these marks make you suspicious? That they did, sir. And when I saw them on the boys, I took my courage in my hands and asked Dr. Ponsonby. And what did he say? Inoculation marks. He said that he had tried to save them with some newfangled medicine. No autopsy was held on the boys? No, sir. Dr. Punsonby is the only doctor in these parts, look you. He gave the certificates. Who was to ask any questions? Exactly. Come on, Watson, Lord Manders. This has been a very promising start. Thank you, Mr. Coffin. You've been most helpful. It was a pleasure to talk to you, gentlemen. But please don't be after repeating what I said. Well, Mr. Holmes, I think you'll agree my suspicions were well grounded. Yes. And we'll lose no time investigating this matter. I think we may work faster if we divide our forces. I shall return to the inn and compose a telegram that I shall ask you to send for me, Lord Manders. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Aren't you going to Punsonby Hall, Holmes? Not immediately. However, you, my dear Watson, can be my advance guard. Me? Yes. I think that your open countenance, combined with that delightful Scottish accent you sometimes assume, plus an appropriate name, should lull Dr. Punsonby into believing that he has another wealthy customer who needs his very specialized services. Well, Holmes, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Just the same, I'll be very relieved when you get on the scene. I'm Mrs. Arkwright, the school matron. Whom did you wish to see? I want to have a word with Dr. Ponsonby. My name is Angus McLaughlin, and I'm most anxious to send my young cousin here. Oh, Aye, he needs discipline. And I'm told that you dinner pamper a young lad here. 
Please come in. I'm sure Dr. Punsonby will see you. Thank you, Mrs. Arkley. Come in. Go in, please. Dr. Punsonby? Yes, uh, please sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Angus McLaughlin. I've travelled all the way from Aberdeen to see you. I was told that at your school you at least know how to uh, discipline a lad. Well, Mr. McLaughlin, <laughs> in our <laughs> modest way, we endeavour to inculcate our students with a sense of responsibility. Aye, aye, aye. I was about to have a glass of wine. Perhaps you'd care to join me? That's very kind of you, Dr. Bunsen. I'd like to. You uh, wish to send a relative here, Mr. McLaughlin? I sir, a, a young cousin of mine, if you'll, if you'll take him. And here's your wine, Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, sir. And to your very good health. Ah, that's very good. <laughs> Tell me more about your cousin, sir. Before I accept a new student, I like to know as much about him as possible. Well, I'll be quite frank with you. He's 13 years old and he's a young devil. And an inconvenient young devil, too. You see, Dr. Punsonby... I'm his guardian. You, you follow me? No, sir, I don't think I do. <laughs> well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm not a poor man. And I'd be a very wealthy one if uh, if it weren't for that boy. The whippersnapper is the only person who stands between me and uh, my dead brother's fortune. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be sorry if, <laughs> if anything were to happen to him. Uh, Am I making myself quite uh, clear, Doctor? Much clearer, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Another glass of wine? Thank you. Well, it's, it's very good. Mr. McLaughlin, why not put all your cards on the table? So much simpler that way. Very well. Does £10,000 mean anything to you, Dr. Punsonby? You did me, yes. The scholastic profession is notoriously unremunerative. If my young cousin were to be taken ill, perhaps, shall we say, uh, with pneumonia, if he, uh, if he were to, to die here at your school, uh, or what was I saying? Oh, I'd pay you £10,000. And uh, now, sir, I, I can't be more expensive. Is it than that? No, 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 can I? I don't think so. <laughs> By the way, Mr. McLaughlin, your Scottish accent is beginning to disappear. Such a pity. It was quite colourful. This wine's drugged. You, you haven't touched your wine's drugged. I'm a most abstemious man. <laughs> Particularly on occasions like this. Dr. Watson? Dr. Watson, how, how did you know my name? Even in this remote spot, I've seen photographs of you and your friend, the famous Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> I'm just a little hurt that you both thought I was stupid enough to be fooled so easily. Oh, you seem dreadfully sleepy, Dr. Watson. Sleep, yes, I've got to go to sleep. And sleep well, my friend. <laughs> I only hope that you don't have too much trouble waking up. In just a moment, we'll find out just how much trouble Dr. Watson does have in waking up. But first, have you noticed how men are taking a greater interest in their appearance lately? Competition today is keener than ever. And I'm sure you'll agree one of the greatest assets to a man's appearance is well-groomed hair. So, men, let me give you this tip about Kremel hair tonic and why it's preferred by so many of America's most successful and prosperous executives. Kremel, K-R-E-M-L, keeps dry, ruffled hair neatly in place all day long. It gives it such a handsome, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet Kremel never leaves hair with that offensive, cheap, greasy look. It never leaves hair and scalp full of sticky goo, which feels so dirty. Kremel always looks and smells so clean on both hair and scalp. It gives hair that attractive, natural, he-man look, which certainly hits the jackpot with the ladies. And don't forget, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Let me repeat, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. It makes hair feel softer, easier to manage. 
At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and makes the scalp feel so clean and invigorated. Men, use Kreml hair tonic daily. And see if you don't say, my hair never looked better. My scalp never felt cleaner. Well, Dr. Watson, you certainly left me teetering on the edge of my chair. We left you drugged in the schoolmaster's study. What happened next? Well, my first conscious recollection was to find myself with a violent pounding in my head, lying in a small clearing between some trees. Bending over me with a look of deep concern on his face was my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Watson. Uh, Watson, old chap, uh, are you all right? Yes, yes, I've I got a frightful headache, Holmes. What are you doing there in those, those clothes with that droopy moustache? It proved a good enough passport to secure me employment at the stables here. Well, how did you get me out of Punsonby's study? And the stables command an excellent view of the school building. Your long absence worried me. And when Dr. Punsonby finally appeared, alone, I became suspicious. So I took advantage of his absence, slipped through the study window and rescued you. Well, thank heavens you did. He gave me drugged wine. It's a funny thing, Holmes. I was probably delirious, but I swear that I saw a woman's handbag on the table, a pink and black beaded bag, and it was alive and moved. Great heavens! That confirms my worst suspicions. Did you see it too? No, it wasn't there when I came in. Somebody, probably Mrs. Arkwright, removed it. Watson, you were never closer to death. I blame myself for having allowed you to tackle Dr. Punsonby alone. Uh, don't reproach yourself, Holmes. Where, where's Lord Manders? Waiting at the inn for an answer to my telegram. He is to meet us later behind the lodge gates. What's our next move? To go to the stables. Dirty you up a bit and get your change of clothes. Then we'll return to the attack. There's desperate work ahead of us. Here, this way, sir. What, what my man? <laughs> Don't look so alarmed, Lord Manners. Dr. Watson, I... I wouldn't have recognized you. What's happened? Trouble. I had to assume a disguise, too. You brought an answer to Holmes's telegram? Yes, in my pocket. Where is he? He went over to the main school building and asked me to... Other things that the second cook, an acidulated woman of dubious charms, is most susceptible to flattery. Over a glass of stout, she quite inadvertently gave me three vital clues. What were they? Firstly, that all five of the unfortunate boys died in the same small room. Secondly, that that fatal room is directly under the room of Mrs. Arkwright. And she's capable of anything, if you ask me. The third clue makes our next step an urgent one. A boy by the name of Carruthers Minor was moved into that room yesterday. He's supposed to have an extremely bad cold. Dr. Punsonby is afraid it might turn into pneumonia. Good heavens! Exactly, Watson. I suggest we lose no time in visiting Carruthers Minor. Though I'm sure Dr. Punsonby would consider it unethical, this is one occasion when another doctor's opinion is absolutely vital. There, there, Carruthers. This is Dr. Watson. He's come to make you well. You can't make me well. Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia. Oh, nonsense, my dear boy. You've got a slight cold, that's all. If Dr. Punsonby says I've got pneumonia, pneumonia's what I've got. Nothing of the kind, my boy. Nothing of the kind. Watson, you notice this bed is anchored to the floor? It can't be moved. What does that suggest to you? Well, again, it reminds me of Stoke Moran and Dr. Rylett. But I don't see any bell pull. No, Watson. No bell rope is needed because no murderous snake is involved in this plot. But look up there, directly above the bed. A small trap door. Leading from Mrs. Arkwright's room. Now the whole picture's clear. The trap door, the strange marks on the dead boys, the beaded bag that you saw. What, what was that? I don't know. Lord Manders is standing guard in the hallway. It's Dr. Ponsonby. He's come to look at my pneumonia. Mrs. Arkwright. I know you were expecting Lord Manders. He's lying in the hallway. He was looking in the wrong direction, unfortunately for him. Don't let Mrs. Arkwright come near me. Don't let her. Mrs. Arkwright, I'd put that revolver away if I were you. I doubt if you know how to handle it. I assure you that I do. Having used the butt end of it on your friend so successfully should prove that fact. Grab her, Watson. Right, you Get away from Drop me. Drop that revolver, Mrs. Arkwright. That's right. That's the old girl. Have it. Drop that revolver. Do you hear me? Ah, that's better. I say, Holmes, she's fainted. Good. 
Help me carry you up to a room. Well, what about young Carruthers and Lord Manders? We must remove them to a place of safety. And then, Watson, all that remains is to call on the giggling Dr. Punsonby. <laughs> It's very dark in here, Holmes. I don't like this at all. Quiet. Somebody's coming. Good evening, Dr. Punsonby. Let me light your desk lamp for you. You've startled me. Who are you? What are you doing in my study? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Watson, you've already met. Yes, we've met you, scoundrel. Oh, yes. Uh, My friend, the Scotsman. I was expecting you both. Uh, By the way, please put that revolver away. (laughs) Firearms make me nervous. Uh, Dr. Punsonby, I know how those five boys were murdered. I would venture the opinion that you once spent some time for the sake of your health in America. In Arizona Territory, I'd say. I wonder what makes you think that, Mr. Holmes. (laughs) I've never been in America in my life. And yet I'm certain that someone here spent some time in the vicinity of the Gila River. Well, I understand that uh, Mrs. Arkwright was in America a few years ago. Mrs. Arkwright? Dr. Punsonby, is it possible you're hoping to transfer our suspicions to your accomplice? My accomplice? You talk in riddles, Mr. Holmes. (laughs) It's most confusing. Then shall we be more specific? You consider Carruthers Minor to be quite ill, I understand. Yes, I'm dreadfully worried about him. Uh, Then let me tell you, Dr. Punsonby, that I examined the boy only a few minutes ago, and as a medical man, I say that he only has a slight cold. Then obviously we disagree in our diagnosis, Dr. Watson. After all, you're just a general practitioner, whereas I specialize... Yes, we know what you specialize in. Gentlemen, I suggest the three of us go over to Carruthers' room and hold a consultation. It's just possible that his health has taken a sudden turn for the better. But the bed's empty. Carruthers Minor has gone. Yes, Dr. Punsonby. And suppose you take his place. Leave me alone. What are you going to do? Lash you to this bed and see if you can stomach your own filthy medicine. This is outrageous. Of course. I thought that if we were to reconstruct your crimes with you as the victim, we might persuade you to confess. Mrs. Arkwright! Mrs. Arkwright, help! I'm afraid she can't help you. She's in her room with the door locked from the outside. Uh, There we are, Holmes. He's lashed up so that he can't move. But you don't understand. Mrs. Arkwright has his instructions. Your... Great heavens! What was that? Mrs. Arkwright. It came from the room above. Come on, Watson. Quick, up the stairs. She's fainted again. Feel her pulse. I was just going to... Holmes, there is no pulse. She's dead. The poison works fast. Observe those marks on her wrist. Looks as if some animal had bitten it. It has. And that means the animal's loose in this room. Great heavens. Somehow it must have escaped from its cage and turned on her. Guard the door, Watson. Our lives are not safe until we've found this monster. I don't understand. Look. Look. Under that washstand there. Good heavens, it's that... It's that beaded handbag again. And it's moving. Give me your walking stick, Watson. Here. There. This diabolical creature has done enough damage for one lifetime. It's dead, Holmes. But what in thunder is it? It looks like some sort of lizard. It's all pink and covered all over with black scales. That's what made me think it was a handbag. But I've never seen a lizard as large as that. Of course you haven't. So let me introduce you to the peculiar villain of this piece... His name is Heloderma Suspectum, better known as the Gila Monster, indigenous to the Gila River in America. I've never seen anything like that before. How on earth did you recognize it, Holmes? When Mr. Coffin, the undertaker, mentioned those strange marks on the dead boys, I was reminded of an article I'd read recently on venomous lizards. So that telegram you sent to Was to the Museum of Natural History. Their answer confirmed my suspicions. The Gila Monster's bite produces almost instantaneous death, and yet it's a poison that would be extremely hard to identify. The fixed bed in the room below us, the trap door directly above it in this room, and the help of an unscrupulous accomplice like Mrs. Arkwright makes the rest of the picture very clear. Now that the monster's dead, how are you going to frighten Dr. Punsonby into a confession? Uh, Dr. Punsonby need not know the animal's dead. Examine the floor, Watson. See if you can find that trap door. Right, your home. Meanwhile, I'll see if I can find some cord or string. Uh Uh-huh. Here's a ball of twine on the dressing table, placed there for use in the intended murder of Carruthers Minor, no doubt. 
Uh, found the trap, Holmes. There's a ring here in the floor and a section of the carpet's been cut out. Good. And now to attach the twine to the body of the healer monster. So, all right, Watson, open the trap door. Very well, Holmes. Well, Dr. Ponsonby, have you changed your mind? She is dead, Dr. Ponsonby. Your healer monster turned on her. No! No! I'm going to lower the animal, Watson. There we are. Oh, get away from me! I think a few more feet will do the trick, Holmes. Yes. There. Get away! I tell you anything! Everything! You will sign a confession? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes, I will! Just take that beast away, I'll sign anything! We'll be down, Dr. Ponsonby. Well, Holmes, thank heavens that's done with. What a shocking affair. Yes, Watson, but not without a note of poetic justice. What do you mean? Well, isn't it poetic justice that a dead reptile should be instrumental in bringing a live one to the gallows? Quite a gruesome finale, Dr. Watson. It certainly was, Mr. Bell. All in all, one of the most unpleasant adventures that Holmes and I ever encountered. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, how would you like a thrilling new experience? Then just listen to how beautiful Powers models glamour bathe their hair. We certainly were thrilled to discover the amazing, beautifying action of Cremel Shampoo. It actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and leaves hair sparkling for days with natural glossy luster. And Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle, it positively contains no harsh caustics or chemicals. Instead, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Oh, and don't forget how its luxurious active foam penetrates right to the scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, why not follow the advice of these million-dollar powers models and glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Kremel shampoo? It takes only ten minutes right at home. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Next week, I think I'll tell you the adventure of the genuine Garnelius, in which Holmes solved the mystery of Drenko a famous violinist who was found dead in a locked room touching a suicide note, but who nevertheless had been murdered. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Speckled Band. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the genuine Garnerius. This is ABC... The American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Here it is, Saturday night again, and time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in the old familiar study, so let's waste no time enjoying it. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. You bet I am. When it's time for Dr. Watson to tell a new adventure he had with the immortal Sherlock Holmes, I'm not going to miss a <laughs> second. It's nice of you to say so, my boy. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Before I sit down, Dr. Watson, you mind if I take a look at the old metal case on the mantelpiece? wasn't there last week. No, I placed it there because it played a prominent part in tonight's story. You see, it's a memento of yet another encounter that Sherlock Holmes and I had with the arch-villain of London crime, Professor Moriarty. But what is it, Dr. Watson? It looks like an old compass. That's exactly what it is, my boy. But there are no numerals on it, just these strange figures around the dial. Well, those apparent hieroglyphics helped us to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. 
I call it The Adventure of the Half-Eaten Apple, the Coptic Compass, and the Unclothed Corpse. I can hardly wait, Doctor. Oh, I'm sure you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? <laughs> right. Men, aren't you sick and tired of hair preparations which leave your hair looking and feeling greasy? When you run your hand over your hair, does your hair feel sticky and dirty? Does grease come off on your hand? If so, then now's the time to change to Kreml hair tonic. The first thing you'll notice about Kreml is how clean it smells, how clean it looks and feels on your hair and scalp. When you use Kreml, you can run your hand over your hair. And honestly, men, it's a pleasure. Not a trace of that greasy, sticky feeling. Yet you can't beat Kreml to keep hair neatly groomed. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair in place longer, with such a natural, well-groomed appearance. So, men, let Kreml give your hair this handsome, clean-cut look which is bound to make a hit, both on the job and with the ladies. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the compass, the half-eaten apple, and the... And the unclothed corpse? <laughs> well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began on a November morning shortly after the turn of the century. Holmes, seldom one to indulge in exercise for its own sake, had displayed a rare burst of activity and joined me in a stroll through Regent's Park. Just before noon, we retraced our steps, and as we turned the corner into Baker Street, I nearly collided with a tall, well-dressed man... Walking in the other direction. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, it's quite all right, sir. Excuse me. Aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. I'm Major Stanley. Indeed. You're a little, little early for our appointment, Major Stanley. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, do, sir? Dr. Watson. I am early, Mr. Holmes, and when your housekeeper told me you were still out, I decided to take a stroll. Then let's walk back together. And perhaps you can tell me your problem as we go. It isn't exactly my problem, Mr. Holmes... You see, I made the count to the Maharaja of Kasul. Oh, really? It's a very interesting job, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it is. You know, is. I was in India myself, uh, for Shawa and further north. I oh, was once attacked uh, by... Quite, uh, Watson. Some oh. other time, don't you think? Oh, sorry, Holmes. The Mr. Maharaja's Watson problem would seem pressing since his emissary has been so eager to reach us. Hmm? Uh, please continue, Major Stanley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the star of Kasul? A fabulously valuable diamond, isn't it? Yes. It's the treasure of the Maharaja's collection. At the moment, it's in the vaults of the Bank of England. No, it's the best place for it, I should say. There have been several jewel robberies lately. Yes, so I've been told, and that's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. You see, the Maharaja has come to England to have his portrait painted by Sergeant. Your problem becomes apparent, Major Stanley. When this portrait is painted, the staff Kasul will no doubt be set in the Maharaja's turban. And you quite justifiably feel concerned about the jewel's safety. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It must be cleverly and closely guarded on its daily journey from the vaults to the Maharaja suite and back. Well, hardly sounds like a job for you, Holmes. No, Major Stanley. Without wishing to appear conceited, I may say that such a routine matter is rather outside my scope. The Maharaja insists on having you, Mr. Holmes. I assure you his fee would be princely. Now, here we are at 221B. Come in, Major Stanley. We'll discuss the matter further, if you like. Mrs. Hudson, we're back. Oh, very well, Doctor. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, there were two gentlemen waiting to see you. Said they had an appointment, but they've gone. Said they'd come back later. And did they leave their names? No, sir, they didn't. That's odd. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, sir. Let's go upstairs, shall we, Major Stanley? Very well, Doctor. Regarding your problem, Major Stanley, it occurs to me that Humphrey Pedder might be a good man to see. Humphrey Pedder? Yes, I'm not personally acquainted with him, but I'm told that he specializes in the uh, uh, more physical aspects of detective work. The Maharaj will be very distressed if you refuse him, Mr. Holmes. Naturally, I wish to... Uh... I'm sorry, Major Stanley. I've made my decision. I can't handle the case. See Mr. Pedder, if you will. But, but Mr. Holmes, uh, can, can't we sit down and talk about it at least? Yes, Holmes. After all, there's no need to be rude. I'm afraid not. Good day, Major. Well, I, I've heard you were eccentric, Mr. Holmes, but I, I didn't know how eccentric. Holmes, what on earth's the matter with you? You ask him up, and then you won't even let him in, uh, enter the room. For an excellent reason, Watson. Come inside. Look, there on the floor. Great heavens. I could hardly let the emissary of a Raja walk into a room containing a corpse, and an unclothed one at that. Lift the blanket off the face, Watson. Right, you are, huh? There. 
Oh, Doctor. The poor man. Is that the face of one of the men that called here? Aye, sir, it is. Cover it again, Watson. I saw the other one leave, sir. He said his friend had already left. Oh, I never dreamed and This that... one you saw leaving, was he carrying anything? A bundle, perhaps? No, sir, he wasn't. Could you describe him? Well, he was tall and thin, and he had a but high... If he was carrying no bundle, where are the corpse's clothes? There's no sign of them in here. What a shocking thing, sir. A murder right in your living room. Oh, well, a scene for the police? Definitely not, Mrs. Hudson. And please keep this to yourself. Aye, sir. When a corpse is deposited on my own carpet, there's a certain point of honour in being able to present the police with a complete explanation when I do call them in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. What a terrible thing. Holmes, this is incredible. Why leave a corpse here and... And why unclothed? The obvious reason to remove clothing would be to make identification difficult. And how did the murderer get the clothes out of here? Mrs. Hudson said that he wasn't carrying anything. We have many other questions to answer, old chap. The knife wound in the heart gives us no clue, I'm afraid. But observe the singular collection of objects that are lying beside the body. Well, let's have a look at them. A railway ticket, a funny-looking compass... And an apple that has been bitten into. The corpse has protruding teeth. I bet you that he didn't make the bite in this apple... Holmes, these must be the murderer's tooth marks. If you're correct, Watson, our murderer is an extraordinary man indeed. Well, why do you say that? Because if you look closely, you'll notice the interesting fact that this bite was made by two sets of upper teeth. <laughs> you're, you're the one no mistake, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> two sets of upper teeth. Now, that was the best touch. Yes, Carter. I must confess it was neat. Simple, of course. You start the bite with your upper teeth, reverse the apple, and conclude the bite. <laughs> yes, simple. But I trust also somewhat disconcerting for the great Sherlock Holmes. Our past encounters have given me an insight into his very unusual mind. I'd like to watch his face when he walked in there, Professor. So would I. But the next 24 hours will give me little leisure, I fear. I must arrange for a certain matter concerning a change of ownership in the Star of Kursul. This should be a fascinating game. But the old compass, the railway ticket. Carter, with your somewhat limited cranial development, it must be hard for you to absorb the subtler points in such a plan, but surely its basic purpose is obvious. Sherlock Holmes is about to be engaged by the Maharaja to guard the jewel. I had to divert his attention, so I perpetrated an intriguing murder on his own doorstep and surrounded the corpse with meaningless and completely unrelated objects which I knew would torment his curiosity and keep him off my trail. And that corpse would take some explaining to the police too, Professor. Yes, that's why I placed it there. It puts him in an acutely embarrassing position. He has to try and solve the case or become the laughing stock of London. <laughs> it's one of your neatest jobs, Professor. Oh, I won't say that, Carter. But I'm quite sure that I've posed a problem that Sherlock Holmes will be totally unable to resist. I can't resist this problem, Watson. No fee on earth could make me bother with the safety of a mere diamond when such a puzzle presents itself. On my soul, you talk rather as though you were settling down to a game of chess. You've got to solve this problem, Holmes, or else it's going to put you in a ridiculous position with Scotland Yard. And just think if it got into the papers. I shall reserve my imagination for the problem posed. The question of the apple is, of course, obvious. Well, I suppose all you have to do is to find a man with two sets of false upper teeth. <laughs> Very simple. Quite. The only way such an imprint could be left is to take a half bite with the upper teeth. Reverse the apple and repeat the procedure. The only question here is, why indulge in such a bizarre performance? Well, whatever the reason, those are the murderer's tooth marks. Unquestionably. You notice the eaten portion of the apple has only just commenced to turn brown. The bite was undoubtedly taken in this room. But to identify teeth marks is a monumental problem and might prove insoluble. Let's turn our attention to the compass for a moment. Well, I've never seen one like it. There are no numerals on it, no points of the compass indicated anywhere. Just a lot of funny little squiggles. Oh, no, Watson. Surely you recall the singular affair of the Coptic patriarchs? You overrate my memory, Holmes. In any case, I don't even know what a Copt is. My dear Watson, sometimes you astound me. Well, it seems to me it takes very little to astound you. I repeat, 
What is a Copt? The Copts are the principal Christian race descended from ancient Egyptian stock. What you refer to as squiggles on this compass, in reality, are letters of the Coptic alphabet. Well, that makes it more confusing than ever. An apple bitten into by an eccentric and now a compass with ancient Egyptian lettering on it. I just can't see any relation between the two of them. And yet we know there must be. That's what makes the problem so fascinating. Well, what does the compass tell you, Holmes? Two things. The Coptic lettering on the dial is inscribed by hand. Obviously, it was constructed for a Copt who could speak no European language. Yet the corpse was definitely not of Egyptian origin. I'll wager that he was born not too far away from the sound of bow bells. I agree, Watson. And so the problem becomes more confusing. Now, uh, let us examine another piece of this fascinating puzzle. The railway ticket. Well, it's the unused return half of a first-class ticket from the village of Chipping Sodbury to London. Yes, and the date stamped on the back is November the 6th. Today? Yes, Watson, today. Chipping Sodbury is a tiny village. I imagine that the number of passengers that travelled from there to London this morning could be counted on one hand. You're going to Chipping Sodbury? Yes. It shouldn't be too hard to find out who purchased this ticket. And while I'm doing that, I want you to stand guard here. Oh, oh, oh. With the corpse? Yes, Watson. And I suggest that you keep your revolver handy. My revolver? You mean... I mean that after what has happened in one short morning in Baker Street, we should be prepared for any eventuality. In just a moment, we'll see just what eventualities do develop. But first, if you're smart, you'll take better care of the hair you've got. Let me assure you, men, you can't use a better product than Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which no other hair tonic has. That is why Kreml keeps your hair in place longer. Why your hair always has such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. And listen carefully to this, men. Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated, how clean your scalp feels. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kreml actually helps condition the hair by making it feel softer, more pliable. So men, why be satisfied with a product which merely keeps your hair in place? when you can have handsomely groomed hair plus all those extra advantages of Kreml. Buy a bottle as soon as possible at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Professor Moriarty did quite a job in sending you and Sherlock Holmes off on a false trail. He did, Mr. Bell, and for a while his nefarious plan succeeded. But to take up the story where I left off... While I stood guard in Baker Street over the mysterious corpse, Holmes caught the next train for the tiny village of Chipping Sodbury. He told me that after a talk with the village station master, he had no trouble in tracing the purchaser of the first-class railway ticket that we'd found beside the body. It had been bought by a dignified and elderly clergyman by the name of Russell, and Holmes lost no time in, in calling on it. The station master told me, sir that you were the only person to purchase a return first-class ticket to London this morning. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I had occasion to make one of my rare excursions to London this morning. But though it was an unfortunate experience for me, I can't think my humble visit to the city could be a matter of any possible interest to you. I'm very interested in what happened to the return half of your railway ticket, sir. Very odd you should mention that. A regrettable business. Most regrettable. It was stolen from me by a pickpocket together with my watch and chain. Didn't notice it until I had occasion to look at the time when I was lunching with the Bishop of St. Luke's. You've no idea when or where the theft took place, sir? I walked from the station. The crowds were quite dense, and I do recall being jostled rather heavily on one occasion. You reported your loss to the police, I suppose. Naturally. But I have little hope that they'll catch the criminal. Most regrettable business. Cost me a... Watch on the price of another ticket. An expensive lesson in the frailty of human nature. <clears throat> Do you uh, care for a cup of tea, Mr. Holmes? No, thank you. I'm afraid I haven't time. I must return to London on the next train. Urgent and unfinished business awaits me there. <laughs> we, we 
we followed Sherlock Holmes to Paddington Station, Professor Moriarty. Excellent. He caught the train for Chipping Sudbury, no doubt, Carter. Oh, yes, Professor. A fat lot of good that'll do him, even if he does find the old clergyman we pinched the stuff from. Mm, but it consumed valuable time. Time during which I can complete our plans regarding the star of Kursul. Before midnight tonight, I think I can safely say that the jewel will be in our hands. <laughs> How very fortunate that Sherlock Holmes has such a devouring curiosity. Any luck, Holmes? A waste of valuable time, Watson. I found the purchase of the ticket all right. The return half, together with his watch, had been stolen by a pickpocket. Oh, Lord, so that means we start all over again. No, Watson. At least one clue has been eliminated. Let us analyze the remaining ones more thoroughly. Now, the problem of the Coptic compass should next engage our attention. A call on the Egyptian embassy might prove illuminating. You know, Holmes, <laughs> while you were away, I had a brainwave. Congratulations. It was connected with the missing clothes from the corpse. Where, I asked myself... Where would be the obvious place to hide clothes? Why, in the, in the clothes closet, of course. So I searched both our wardrobes absolutely thoroughly. They weren't there. Interesting, Watson. Of course, I'd already done the same thing. Oh, well. The problem of the missing clothes is still... Numbskull! Yes, Holmes? Why didn't I think of it before? What is it, Holmes? The special wardrobe that I keep for my disguises. In the dressing room. Come on, Watson. Oh. By Jove, yes, I, I never thought of that. Perfect place for hiding the dead man's clothes. Let's see if there have been any recent additions to this raggledy collection of mine. Costa's outfit. And there's a clergyman's suit. You always made a surprisingly convincing clergyman, Holmes. And here's the unfailing passport to many a servant's back door. The stained and roughened worsteds of the English plumber. Yes, these patched and frayed ghosts could tell many a tale of... Hello. Look here, Watson. Plain blue suit in rather good condition. Quite. And it doesn't belong in my collection. I think we've solved the mystery of the vanishing clothes. The labels have been ripped out of the coat. Yes, and the pockets emptied. All possible identification removed. We're getting warm, Watson. We're getting very warm. Wait a minute. What is it? Give me a knife. All right, sir. There's something in the lining of this coat. Feels like paper. Perhaps the murderer didn't remove all identification after all. Uh, here you are. These scissors will do the trick. Splendid. There we are. Piece of paper sewn to the padding of the coat. Yes. Let's see what it tells us. Humphrey Pedder, 118 Montague Crescent, Knightsbridge. That's the private detective you were talking about earlier on today. Do you suppose that Pedder's the corpse? At this stage, Watson, I shall suppose nothing. We'll go to Montague Crescent and find out for ourselves. <laughs> Peter, I can't say how glad I am that we found you alive and well. From what you gentlemen have told me, Doctor, I feel glad myself to be here. Is it your custom to have an extra identification label sewn into all your clothes, Mr. Pedder? Yes, Mr. Holmes. A detective never knows what may happen to him. I've always felt such identification might be valuable. A very sound precaution. Thank you, sir. And you say that a suit of your clothes was stolen from your wardrobe last night? Yes, and I can't unearth a clue. Embarrassing situation for a detective, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it certainly is. Though I'm sure in your position, you've never had a thing like that happen to you. I uh, doubt, Mr. Pedder, if you know just how embarrassing a detective's life may become. Yes, indeed. Take our present situation, for instance. Quite, I... Watson. Mr. Pedder. I can't get a word of it, George. Did Major Stanley call on you today? I suggested that you would be eminently suited to the task of guarding the Maharaja's diamond. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going over to the Savoy tonight to talk to the Maharaja. Much obliged to you for giving me the recommendation, particularly since I've never had the privilege of meeting you. I'd heard very flattering reports of your ability. I'm very glad, Mr. Holmes. Your recommendation means a lot to well, me. Well, Holmes, we've drawn another blank. Yes, Watson. I fear we must return to Baker Street and see if an ancient compass can point the way to the solution. Where to, sir? The Egyptian Embassy in Grosvenor Square, Caddy. What, your devil? Jump in, Watson. I feel a blasted fool trotting around London with a cupcake compass under my arm. I hope this leads us somewhere. 
if the excursion proves fruitless, Watson, I'm afraid I shall be compelled to get in touch with Scotland Yard. A few hours delay in reporting a murder can be explained, but beyond that, we may find ourselves in trouble. Well, I think you should have reported it before this. By the way, Holmes, did you notice the brougham and pair that drove up to Pedder's house just as we left? I'm afraid for once I was sufficiently preoccupied to yield to you in observation, my dear Watson. I'm not certain, but I thought that it was Major Stanley who, who stepped out of it. Major Stanley? And yet Mr. Pedder said that... But of course... What an idiot I've been. Cabby, cabby. Yes, sir. Turn around and drive us to the Savoy Hotel as fast as you can. Right, you are, Dennett. But uh, why the Savoy Hotel, Holmes? Surely the situation is crystal clear now, it's Watson. just about as clear as porridge to me. The whole thing's a plot to fool me. Tell me, Watson, what is suggested to you by the combination of an unclothed corpse, a stolen suit, and a railroad ticket? Well, if I knew the answer, Holmes, I'd have given it to you this morning and saved ourselves a lot of trouble. The answer, Watson, is organization a group of well-organized criminals who are able to perform these unrelated tasks. And who is the only person in London who can arrange for running the criminal gamut from murder to plain pickpocketing? Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Of course. Remember Mrs. Hudson's description of our visitor? Tall, thin, and with a high forehead. And if you add organization and Moriarty to Major Stanley, the Maharaja of Kasul, and the portrait painter, the sum total should be apparent. You mean that you've solved the problem of the unclothed corpse? I mean I know precisely how Professor Moriarty intends to steal the star of Kasul. Master Cabby, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, it's an astonishing story you've told me. At least it explains my apparent rudeness this morning, Major Stanley. You can appreciate the embarrassing position in which my friend was placed, sir. You, yes, indeed. But, but of course, you understand that Mr. Pedder here is now in charge of guarding the Star of Kasul. Quite, Major. And uh, you're in very excellent hands, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But your own problem still fascinates me. The unclothed corpse, the compass, and the apple. As a humble exponent of your profession, I'm curious to see how you arrived at your conclusions. I reached them only just in time, Mr. Pedder. If I hadn't, I should at this moment be paying a fruitless visit to the Egyptian embassy. Well, I'm still confused, Holmes. And yet the answer is simple. What was outstanding about the crime committed at Baker Street? What was its uh, individual peculiarity? Well, I suppose the air of mystery that surrounded it. I prefer to use the word mystification. The crime fascinated me, stimulated me, as Professor Moriarty hoped it would until I realized that it was intended to do precisely that. The whole plan was a decoy, designed to prevent me from accepting your mission, Major Stanley. How could I accept such a commonplace job as guarding a jewel while such a fascinating problem was presented in my own living room? And the apple and the compass Fictional were... clues that led nowhere, but were sufficiently challenging for the criminal to know I wouldn't be able to resist tracking them down. What an amazing plot. And the railway ticket and the suit of clothes that were stolen from me were all meant to focus your attention elsewhere and away from the diamond. Exactly, Mr. Pedder. Well, Mr. Holmes, I assure you we are very grateful for the warning. Yes. We shall be more than ever on our guard now. We know where the danger's coming from. Professor Moriarty. I'm taking the star across you back to the Bank of England in a few minutes. I assure you that I shall guard it extremely well. I think, Mr. Pedder, that if you don't mind, I'll take charge of the stone. But, Mr. Holmes, I've already been commissioned for the work. That's true, Mr. Holmes. Since you refused the job, I had to make other arrangements. Mr. Pedder was your own suggestion for the assignment. Nonetheless, Major... I think the Maharaja will sleep much more comfortably if I take charge of the stone. Holmes, I don't think it's very ethical. After all, you did refuse to take on the case, you know. This is hardly a time for ethics, Watson. Where is the Star of Kasul, Major Stanley? I just handed it over to Mr. Pedder before you arrived. Then supposing you give it to me, Mr. Pedder. By the way, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your royal name. But Holmes, he's Humphrey Pedder. Oh, no, Watson. The unclothed corpse of Humphrey Pedder still lies in Baker Street. This is one of Professor Moriarty's most trusted henchmen. You're too smart for your own good. Look out, he's got a revolver. A little slow in drawing it. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. Send for the police, please, Major Stanley. We have a prize catch for them here. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'll take the liberty of removing the diamond from the pocket of our recumbent friend. There we are. Behold, Watson... The star of Kasul. What a magnificent stone. Magnificent. And yet one man was murdered for it. I only wish another might hang because of it. But Moriarty still goes free. And he killed Pedder. We'll catch him, Watson. We'll catch him. He is getting clumsy. 
If he'd noticed the credentials in Pedder's clothes, he would have been in possession of this bauble before the night is out. Instead of which, the evidence of this man here may help us to trap him. I hope so, Watson. But Moriarty inspires his henchmen with such loyalty that I doubt if he'll give us much help. The jewel is safe, our own peculiar problem is solved, and we've captured a prize villain. Next time, we shall capture the master himself. <laughs> Did you, Dr. Watson? Did I what, Mr. Bell? Did you and Holmes finally capture Professor Moriarty, the master himself? No, Mr. Bell, haven't you uh, got a word for our listeners? <laughs> yes, I have. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, here's some advice from one of America's foremost beauty authorities, John Robert Powers. Mr. Powers tells his famous million-dollar Powers models to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And how right Mr. Powers is. Because cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to its own natural, glossy luster. It leaves the hair shining bright for days. Just a vision of beauty. You know, cremel shampoo is great for washing children's hair, too. Yes. Its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo never dries the hair. So, ladies, buy a bottle at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to its natural shining glory. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I'll tell you a story about a dowager dip. A dowager dip? What on earth is that? <laughs> That's a, a slang way of saying that our story concerns... The Dowager Duchess of Penfield, who had the misfortune of being a kleptomaniac. And the story also concerns the strange, and I must admit, embarrassing adventure of the elusive emerald. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the elusive emerald. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Naturally, when I have an appointment with my favorite doctor. Oh, well, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy. I was going over my notes on the case before you arrived. I came across this old theater program. I think it'll interest you. Garrick Theatre, Sir Basil Wentworth in a revival of Martin Reeves' famous play, The Road is Narrow. A production that you and the great Sherlock Holmes attended, I'm sure. We certainly did, Mr. Bell, though at the time we had no idea that we were about to become involved in the tragic death of Martin Reeves. You've probably heard of him, haven't you, Mr. Bell? It seems to me I had to read him in school, Dr. Oh, Watson. he's rather out of fashion now, like so many other good things. But in the 1890s, apart from Lord Tennyson, there wasn't a more famous writer in England. Or a, a more respected one. The story I'm going to tell you tonight, Mr. Bell, concerns the horrible circumstances surrounding his death. Sounds like a mighty intriguing Sherlock Holmes adventure. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if do I... Do you have your little talk? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not, Mr. Bell. Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, successful appearance. 
And I'm sure you'll want to know why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives. Kreml never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kreml is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair, and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off in your hand. Yet Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, always looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular death of Martin Reed? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began late on a foggy evening many, many years ago. Sherlock Holmes and I had been to the Garrick Theater to see the revival of Martin Reed's play. And I remember that we decided to walk home to Baker Street. As we approached the old familiar door of 221B, our footsteps echoed hollowly in the deserted street, and the chimes of a neighboring church reminded us of the fact that it was midnight. A delightful evening, Watson. A good dinner, an excellent bottle of wine, and three hours of theatrical magic. Well, personally, I found the play rather depressing. Its theme is a morbid one, but the writing and construction are flawless. Yes, a magnificent play and well worth reviving. By the way, I noticed an item in the Times this morning concerning Martin Reeve. He's dangerously ill. Oh, really? Well, he must be quite an old man. Eighty-two, to be precise. Well, really, he's as old as that. Curious career, Watson. His greatest success was written when he was a young man. In the past 50 years, he has never written anything to compare with tonight's play. No, I don't think it... Holmes, look up at our window. Hello. The gas is brightly lighted, whereas Mrs. Hudson invariably turns it low when we're out. And look at the silhouette on the blind. There's a man pacing up and down the room. A visitor at midnight, Holmes. This looks ominous. Be careful now. It may be some sort of trap. I think not, Watson. If some desperado were lying in wait for me, I doubt whether he'd be stupid enough to turn up the gas to advertise his presence. Well, just the same. I wonder how he got in. Presumably through the front door. Mrs. Hudson has instructions to let a client wait in our rooms if his business seems urgent. Uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. At your service, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Manners. Harvey Manners. How do you do, Dr. Manners? This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you How do, do, Doctor? You? Uh, I must apologize for being here at such an hour of night, Mr. Holmes, but my business is urgent. I'm sure it is, Doctor. I left Carlisle this morning, arriving at St. Pancras Station two hours ago. I came directly here, persuaded your housekeeper to let me wait for you. Then sit down, my dear Doctor, and tell me what urgent business has brought you to London. Uh, thank you. Well, Mr. Holmes... I've been acting in the capacity of personal physician for Martin Reeve, the playwright. Martin Reeve? What an extraordinary coincidence. We've just returned from seeing the revival of his play, The Road is Narrow. We were talking about him as we walked home. I understand the grand old man is dying. He's not in good shape, Mr. Holmes. His heart's in very bad condition. Auricular fibrillation, Dr. Watson. No, then at his age, I imagine you don't hold out much hope. No, but I think with care, he might last a year or two. Uh, but uh, the reason I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, is that I'm convinced that although he's a dying man, someone is trying to murder him. To murder him? Good Lord. What reason do you have for saying that, Dr. Manners? Well, Mr. Holmes, I've been in almost daily attendance on Mr. Reeve. Last night, his coachman drove over to get me, saying that his master had suffered another bad attack. When I got to the house... I found that Mr. Reeve had received an, a severe shock. He was in a state of almost complete hysteria, and he kept insisting that he'd seen an apparition in his room a few hours earlier. What kind of an apparition? A ghost from his past, as he referred to it. I think that someone arranged for that apparition, that they knew of his heart condition, and also knew that a sudden fright could kill him. It's possible, Dr. Manners... And it would be one of the least detectable methods of murder. But who would want to kill a dying man? Who lives at the house with him, Dr. Manners? His daughter, Catherine, his brother, Silas, who's a drunken good-for-nothing, and his secretary, a fellow by the name of uh, Hugh Kingslake. Uh, do you know the condition of Mr. Reeves' will? Uh, no, but I do know 
He had dictated a new one a few days ago. Oh, a honey. fact that might easily have provoked a crisis. Uh, Dr. Manners, you will say that Mr. Reeves spoke of seeing an apparition, a ghost from his past. Was he able to describe its appearance? Well, he, he was a little incoherent, but uh, he kept babbling something about blonde hair and blue eyes and a young man who'd come back from beyond the grave to haunt well, him. Don't you think, uh, Dr. Manners, that these might simply be the delusions of an old and a, and a sick man? I didn't overlook that possibility, I assure you, Dr. Watson, even though Mr. Reeves' mental faculties are remarkably acute for his age. But last night, after I'd given him a sedative, I examined his room. I found these, Mr. Holmes. That's when I decided to come to you. Well, let's have a look at them. Hmm. They look like... Uh... Blonde hair? Yes, they are, Doctor. I found them on the bedclothes, and yet uh, no one in that house has blonde hair. Interesting. Very interesting. The hair is human, and yet the roots have minute particles of glue attached to them. Obviously, they're from a wig. Get out the timetable, Watson, will you? you? We're going to Carlisle? On the earliest possible train. Though the grand old man of the English theatre is dying, we must do everything in our power to see that his death is not an unnatural one. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm Hugh Kingslake, Mr. Reeves' secretary. Oh, how, how do you do, do, you do sir? The accommodations at the hotel are satisfactory, I trust, gentlemen? Entirely, yes, thank you, Mr. Kingslake. Thank you. Good. Frankly, I'm most relieved that you're here. Mr. Reeve received a severe shock the night before last. I quite agree with Dr. Manners that someone deliberately induced that shock, knowing the serious condition of Mr. Reeve's heart. Have you any idea who that someone might be? Well, it's a little difficult for me to talk, Mr. Holmes. After all, I'm only an employee here, but, but I can't help feeling that... Oh, oh good morning, Mr. Reeve. Kingsley, who are these men? Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. And Mr. Silas Reeve. How do you do, Mr. Reeve? Uh, and what, may I ask, is the professional meddler Sherlock Holmes doing in my brother's house? I'm here at the request of Dr. Manners. Manners has no right to bring you here, sir. A lot of rubbish. All this talk about apparitions. Nonsense. Martin's in his second childhood. He's become a gibbering old fool. Personally, I wish he'd die and have done with well, it. Well, upon my soul... Never sir, mind your soul, my good doctor. Why don't you mind your own business and get out of the house? We don't want detectives here. Mr. Reeve, I've traveled some 200 miles to see your brother, and I have no intention of leaving this house without talking to him. And talk and the devil with you. And if my dear, distinguished brother tells you that I've been sponging on him for years, it's perfectly true. Uncle, stop! <laughs> Enter the beautiful Catherine to try and persuade her drunken old uncle to return to his room. No, Uncle Silas. I came to get Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Dr. Manor said that Daddy can see them now. Uh, shall I take them up, Miss Reeve? Uh, no, Mr. Kingslake. I will. And don't be deceived by the Mr. Kingslake and the Miss Reeves, gentlemen. My dear niece and this young man here have a dark secret. A secret that is perfectly apparent to every member of this household. Uncle Silas! <laughs> They're in love. Delightful, isn't it? Uncle, you're intolerable. Will you lead the way, Miss Reeve? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Don't forget to ask him about the play that made him so famous. You might learn some interesting facts. I must apologize for Uncle Silas, gentlemen. I'm afraid he's like this all the time these days. I quite understand, Miss Reeve. It must be very distressing for you, my dear. Oh, I'm used to it, Doctor. Here's Daddy's room. I won't come in with you. Too many people upset him. Come in. Please go in, gentlemen. I'll see you later. Ah, there you are. Uh, who is it, Manners? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, Mr. Reeve. Ah, good. Good. You can leave us, Manners. Yes, Mr. Reeve. I, uh, I'll see you both later. Very well, Doctor. Uh, come. Sit on my bed. That's it. Uh, how are you feeling, sir? Oh... Old and ill. But I'm glad you're both here. Man has displayed unusual enterprise in persuading you to visit me. There's been a lot of nonsense printed about my impending death. Anyone would think a great man is dying. The author of The Road is Narrow is a great man, Mr. Reeve. 
He was a great man, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean, sir? The author of that play died 45 years ago. What? And yet, his ghost appeared in this room two nights ago. Mr. Reeve, are you saying that you didn't write The Road is Narrow? Yes, my boy, I am. And it's a secret that's been gnawing at me for years. Now that I'm on my deathbed, I'd like to clear my conscience. Then who did write the play, sir? A young friend of mine, by the name of Colin McGrath. I started life as a lawyer's clerk in Keswick, a few miles from here. Colin lived in the same village, and we became great friends. One day, he gave me the manuscript of his play to look at, and I realized it was a work of a genius. Suddenly he died. No one knew about the manuscript. You claimed it uh, as your own, sir? Yes. To my eternal shame, I did. Now, I want to make amends. Mr. Holmes, I want you to find out if any heirs of Colin McGrath still survive. If they do, I'll give them half of my estate. Hmm. Mr. Reeve. Does anyone else know of this, uh, fraud? Yes. Knowing that I hadn't long for this world, I confided the secret to three members of my household. And you're convinced that the apparition you saw the other night was that of the dead Colin McGrath? Uh, there was no mistaking him. The blue eyes, long golden hair. It was Colin, or his ghost come to hunt me on my deathbed. This decision on your part to leave half of your estate to any heirs of the man you wronged, was that decision made uh, before you had this strange visitation the other night? Yes. Yes, it was. Did you mention it to any member of your family, sir? No. I did say something to Dr. Manners, and I didn't mention Colin McGrath's name. It's obvious that someone wished to frighten you knew your secret, and disguised himself to resemble Colin McGrath. Yeah, it was Colin. Never forget his blue eyes. He was standing over there, in the chest of drawers. He, he looked at me. So, so approachfully. So... He's asleep. Yes, Watson. And while he lies there, some member of this household continues to plot his death. We must work fast. Well, what are we going to do? Split forces. I shall remain here for a while and see what may be found out. I'll meet you at our hotel later and we'll compare notes. And what shall I do? Go to the village of Keswick. Colin McGrath lived and died there. See what you can find out about him, Watson. I remember Colin McGrath. Well, I should be very grateful for any information about him, madam. As postmistress, I imagine that very little village gossip has escaped you. <laughs> of course it hasn't. I remember the McGrath boy well. He was no good. Didn't he marry poor old Mrs. Northrop's granddaughter Susan and then go and desert her just to kill himself? And the poor girl was going to have a baby. No good on earth. That's what young McGrath was. And you can tell him I said so if you ever reached the place I'm sure he went to. Oh, I said, well, uh, ha they had a child, you say. Uh, what happened to it, madam? How should I know? I'm only the postmistress. You'd better go and see the vicar, young man. It's a tragic story you've told me, Dr. Watson. But you remember Colin McGrath, sir? Oh, very well. And I always suspected something akin to genius in the boy. But he burned with too hard and gem-like a flame. Uh, as Walter Pater has said, he burned himself out, destroyed his life and poor Susan Northrips with it. She died of a broken heart less than a year after his death. And their child? There was no money, no one to look after the boy. He was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. Then that child, if he's still alive, stands to inherit half of Martin Reeves' fortune. If only we can find him. Oh, it 
It's good to be back here at the hotel, Holmes. I've had an exhausting day. I trust you had better luck than I did. What did you find out? That Colin McGrath had a child, that his wife died shortly after the child's birth, and that the boy was sent to an orphanage in Liverpool. In Liverpool? Go on, Watson. Well, the vicar gave me this photograph where, where we are, of uh, Mrs. McGrath. It was, uh, it was taken on their wedding day. Let me see it. But this is amazing, Watson. One of our problems is solved. Well, I'm blessed if I see how. Let me explain it to you. After you left, I had quite a long talk with the secretary, Hugh Kingslake. It transpired that he knew nothing of his parents. He'd been raised in an orphanage, and the only memento he has is a picture of his mother. A picture that he carries in his watch. And that picture... Is a duplicate of this one. Great Scott, and the fellow calling himself Hugh Kingsley is really the Colin McGrath heir. Precisely. A fantastic situation indeed. Come on, old chap. Grab your hat and coat. We must drive over to Mr. Reeves and break the good news that the missing heir is a member of his own household. But we're still no nearer finding out who's been trying to frighten old Mr. Reeves. Surely that's obvious now, Watson. Come in. Dr. Manos, what's wrong? Uh, please, please come at once, both of you. It's Mr. Reeves. It's hot? Yes, Dr. Watson. This evening, he had another visit from that apparition. I'm only afraid this time the devilish plan may work and that Martin Reeve won't live through the night. In a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes says is obvious. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not get your money's worth? Why not enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long and always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kreml stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, remember Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men... Just as soon as possible, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Let Kreml always keep your scalp feeling clean and refreshed. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this story certainly has me on the edge of my chair. What happened next? You drove over to Mr. Reeves' house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, we did. And as we went rattling down the country lanes, the flickering oil lamps on Dr. Manor's carriage lighting a shadowy path, I found it almost impossible to get a word out of Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, sometimes you're the most irritating man on earth. And what prompts that little tirade, Watson? Well, you haven't opened your mouth since we left our hotel. Purposeless conversation is a waste of time. Not much further, is it, Dr. Manners? No, Mr. Holmes. We're nearly there. Well, I don't consider conversation purposes when it clarifies the problem, Holmes. You said it was obvious who had been frightening Mr. Reeve. I suppose I'm stupid, but I find it far from obvious. And yet the facts are clearly in front of your eyes. Eyes. That's it, Watson. Think about eyes. The, the blue eyes of the supposed ghost, eh? But the Reeves family have all got brown eyes. Apparently, it's a marked family characteristic. Quite, Watson. That fact should lead you to the obvious conclusion. Oh, you're always talking in riddles, Holmes. In the room. Here we are, Mr. Holmes. And Hugh Kingslake is standing at the front door. How is he, Mr. Kingslake? Better, Mr. Holmes. Seems to have rallied a bit. But I'm glad you're all here. I'll drive my carriage round to the stables. Be back in a moment. Well, come in, gentlemen. With uh, Mr. Reeves so ill... It may seem a little inappropriate to announce my news. But uh, Catherine consented to marry me tonight. We're engaged. Oh, really? My congratulations. Thank yes, you, indeed. She's a charming girl. Oh, Catherine, darling. I've uh, told them our news. Oh, it must seem a terrible time to announce it, Mr. Holmes, with poor Daddy lying so ill upstairs. It's quite understandable, Miss Reeve. And uh, before we go up and see your father, I'd like you both to know that we have something in the nature of a wedding present for you. A wedding present? Yes, 
You're both familiar with the story of Colin McGrath, I understand? You mean that he was the true author of The Road is Narrow? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Daddy told us all about it. And did you also know that Mr. Reeve is planning to leave half his estate to the heir of Mr. McGrath? I knew that, Dr. Watson. In uh, my capacity as secretary, I had occasion to draw up a rough draft of the new will a few days ago. Then I'm sure, Mr. Kingslake, that you'll be very interested to know that today Dr. Watson and I discover that you are the son of Colin McGrath. The... That I am? You as the heir? Well, that doesn't seem possible. The fact is proven beyond a doubt, Miss Reeve. Then then if Mr. Reeve makes the new will, I stand to inherit half the fortune. Yes, my boy, you do. That's what Mr. Holmes meant when he was talking about wedding presents. Hey, come here, somebody! That's Uncle Silas. He's upstairs with Daddy. What's wrong, Mr. Reeve? Fire! I knocked over a lamp in Martin's room. And Daddy's up there. The room's oh. ablaze. What? Come on, Watson. Well, the whole top landing's burning, Holmes. Can't go through this way. We can't, just can't stand here. Mr. Reeve will roast alive. I, I'm going after him. Come back, Kingslake. Come back, come back. Great Scott, he went right through the flames, Holmes. Send one of the servants for the fire brigade and tell the rest to bring buckets of water and to bring them fast. <laughs> Dr. Watson, how is Hugh? Well, he's going to pull through, Miss Reeve. He's badly burned, but he'll be all right, won't he, Dr. Manners? Yes, oh. yes, a few weeks in the hospital, and he'll be as good as new. And father? Well, uh, I am afraid he's dead, Catherine. Dead? Oh, poor daddy. Oh, my dear, he might have lived for a time, but the shock of the fire coming so close on top of the other one was too much for him. He died just as I took him from your fiancé's arms. So that by knocking over a lamp, I, I was responsible for my brother's death? Yes, Mr. Reeve. The credit is yours. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the local police might consider booking you on a charge of arson. Rubbish! It was an accident, and you can't prove otherwise. Possibly not. But there's one matter I can settle here and now. Two nights ago, someone in this house tried to murder Martin Reeve by posing as Colin McGrath. The same despicable action was repeated tonight. Well, one person that we can eliminate is Hugh Kingsley. He nearly gave his life just now, trying to save his employer. Then who was responsible, Mr. Holmes? A feature of the impersonation that especially struck your father, Miss Reeve, was the colour of the eyes. He described them as a brilliant blue. Then that rules out Catherine and me. We both have brown eyes. Precisely, Mr. Reeve. I have devoted some considerable study to the art of disguise. There are wigs and uh, methods of altering height and weight. But the colour of the eyes cannot be altered. Watson, ten minutes ago you had the opportunity of examining Mr. Kinslake's eyes without the tinted glasses he's in the habit of wearing. Well, they did fall off when he stumbled back down the back stairs, but I can't say that I noticed the colour of his eyes. They were blue, Watson. Brilliant blue, just as his father's were before him. You mean that young Kingslake was responsible? Yes, Mr. Reeve, I do. But that's ridiculous, Mr. Holmes. He just hurt himself severely in trying to save Father. True, Miss Reed. But surely his reason was obvious. He intended to marry you. And when he learned a few days ago that your father planned to will half his estate to the McGrath heir, he decided to try and kill him before that will could be put into effect. Oh, I see it all, Holmes. And then tonight, he realized that he was the heir. Precisely, Watson. And so it was to his great advantage to see that his employer stayed alive to execute that new will. That accounts for his bravery in the fire tonight. I can't believe it of him, Mr. Holmes. I can. I've always disliked you, and I'll have great pleasure in prosecuting him. It'd be hard to prove, Silas. After all, your brother did die a natural death. Yes, Dr. Manners. I fear that legally there's very little we can do to Mr. Kinslake. But when he recovers and realizes that he risked his life for nothing, I think he'll find his own punishment. The change in the will was not made. The estate will be divided between the family, and I doubt if Mr. Kinslake will now acquire any of it by marriage. No, of course he won't. I'll never see him again. Oh, quite right, my dear, quite right. What a despicable scheme. And to think that, that his father wrote one of the greatest plays of our century. I prefer to forget the fact, Watson. Emotional qualities are antagonistic to clear thinking. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance is uh, a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. And now, my dear chap, I think we should look up the next train back to London. Our work here is done. In a moment, 
we'll hear about next week's story. But first, girls, here's a sensational beauty tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls. Powers models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And really, ladies, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural sparkling beauty. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. And you can always count on cremel shampoo to thoroughly cleanse your scalp and hair. It never leaves any dull, cloudy film. Then, too, the beneficial oil base helps keep hair from becoming dry and brittle. That's right. Cremel shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, a silkier, a silkier hair with satin smoothness. Your hair holds a better wave, too. So, ladies... Buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. And remember, a bottle of Cremel hair tonic or a bottle of Cremel shampoo makes a fine addition to that Christmas stocking. Well, Dr. Watson, I won't be seeing you before next Wednesday, so I'll, I'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Bell, and the same to you, my boy. I'd also like to take this opportunity of extending the season's greetings to all our listeners and all our friends. On behalf of our sponsors, on behalf of Mr. Conway and myself, and on behalf of Mr. McKnight, our director. So, Dr. Watson, we'll be meeting again next Saturday night. What new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us then? The strange story of a weird jungle music that was heard in the peaceful English countryside and of a diabolical plot that failed. I call it the Singer Affair... Of the white cockerel. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sign of Four. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion. Help win the war against tuberculosis. Buy colorful Christmas seals and use them to dress up all your cards and packages. Buy the Christmas seals that help save lives today. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the singular affair of the white cockerel. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, come in, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, my boy. How are you feeling after your Christmas holiday? Remarkably well, thank you, Mr. Bell, considering how extremely hospitable my friends have been. (laughs) Just a twinge or two of gout to remind me that an old man should treat tawny port with the respect that it deserves. I know (laughs) just what you mean, Dr. Watson. Well, draw up your usual chair, my boy. And settle yourself down. Ah. That's it. All ready with tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bell. And when I was going over my notes on the case just before you arrived, I came across this white feather. It played a prominent part in tonight's adventure. A white feather? That signifies cowardice, doesn't it? Yes, it can, it can, Mr. Bell, it can. But this is a very special feather. It was plucked from a white cockerel, and it helped Sherlock Holmes to foil one of the most diabolical plots that we ever encountered. But first, don't you want to have your your usual word with our listeners? Thank you, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Men, if you want to stand out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use Kreml hair tonic. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair-grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. It keeps hair neatly in place longer, too. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. 
Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Kreml always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the story of the white cockle? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place after Sherlock Holmes had given up his regular practice and retired to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I was staying with him there for a few weeks' holiday, and I remember coming down to breakfast one morning to find my old friend, his pipe clenched between his teeth, squatting on a stool, examining the contents of a large metal box at his feet. As he threw back the lid, I could see that the box was half full of papers. Papers tied up with red tape in separate packages. After sorting through them for for a few moments, he turned to me and said, A box of secrets, my dear Watson. A box of deep, dark secrets. Are they the records of your early cases, Holmes? Yes, my boy. These were all done before my biographer had come to glorify me. I've often wished that I had the notes on them so that you might transmute my little adventures into those rather florid stories of yours? My stories aren't florid. They're factual accounts of what happened. Oh, don't be hurt, my dear oh, fellow. It's much too story. early in the day. Mm-hmm. Well, Watson, perhaps someday the world will hear of these cases. They're not all successes, but there are some pretty little problems among them. I'm sure there are. For example, here's the record of the Tarleton murders. And here's the case of Bambury, the wine merchant. What happened to him? He died, Watson under peculiarly horrible circumstances. Oh, really? That case was one of my failures, I'm afraid. Aha! This adventure was really a little recherche. It's a full account of Ricoletti of the club foot and his abominable wife. Yes, yes, I, I vaguely remember her dreadful woman. Ghosts from the past, Watson. Ghosts to remind me that my heyday's long oh, past. <laughs> rubbish. I'm quite sure that if a case were to present itself at this moment, you'd be totally unable to resist it. You're wrong, old chap. Look at this note, derived just before you came downstairs. Mr. Manderby, the local squire, apparently needs my help. And yet I assure you I'm not in the least tempted to give it to him. Oh, may I see it? Certainly. Yeah. Let's have a look. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I need your help desperately. Have the goodness to call on me as soon as convenience permits. Continued theft of chickens may appear to be a small matter. Chickens, with gracious me. But I assure you that there are sinister forces at work. <laughs> Asking you to catch a chicken thief. Well, <laughs> really, Holmes. Yes, Watson, chickens. Something of a come down, isn't it? Well, do you know this, Mr. Mandeby? No. But surely his handwriting gives you a clue to his character. Well, it's legible and regular. A man of business habits, I should say, and of some force of character. No, no, Watson. Oh, sorry? Look at his long letters. They hardly rise above the common herd. That D might be an A, and the L an E. Men of character always differentiate their long letters, however illegibly they may write. There's vacillation in his case and self-esteem in his capital. That's amazing, Holmes. It's elementary, my dear Watson, and our long association together should remind you of the fact. I'm afraid you're getting rusty. Well, perhaps you're getting rusty too, Holmes, and since the sun is shining and this letter comes from a neighbor of yours... It might be rather interesting to... uh... Call on Mr. Manderby. Exactly. I'd like to see if your analysis of his character matches the gentleman himself. In any case, Holmes, he may really be in trouble, you know. Watson, you're like an old war horse hearing a nearly forgotten bugle. I dare say, Holmes. But even for stolen chickens, it's good to be in harness with you again. When that wistful tone creeps into your voice, I can't refuse you, Watson. Very well. Let's stroll across the downs and investigate the mystery of Mr. Mandeby's chickens. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you and your friend came here so promptly. It would seem to me, Mr. Mandeby, that uh, your wisest course would have been to call in the local police. I did. And the idiot scoffed at me. Indeed, Mr. Mandelbert, why? Well, they said if they had to track down all the chicken thieves in these parts, they'd have no time for their more important duties. I must admit that I can follow their reasoning, sir. Well, I can't, since they seem to spend most of their time playing skittles in the Star and Garter. The local sergeant appears to have been selected for his complete lack of grey matter. 
isn't one eye ultra of imagination. He's unable to see in what respect this differs from an ordinary chicken theft. Well, in what way does it differ, Mr. Bandeville? Well, the chicken coops were broken into with considerable ingenuity. The thief could have taken uh, all he could carry. But he stole only one chicken, a white cockerel. A white cockerel? When did this take place? Uh, early last evening. Uh, that was when I uh, sent my note to you, Mr. Holmes. But in the early hours of this morning, a burglar broke into the house itself. And what was stolen this time? Again, the thief took only one object. My daughter's hairbrush. Does your daughter know of these thefts? No, no, I didn't tell her. The child's full enough of peculiar fancies as it is. A white cockerel and a hairbrush. Mr. Mandeby, I came here against my better judgment, but thank heaven I did. Please let me talk to your daughter at once. Unless I'm very much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. Alicia's uh, playing in the drawing room. I'll take you in. I think if you don't mind, Mr. Manderby, that uh, we would prefer to see her alone. Rubbish. What could you possibly wish to say to my daughter that you couldn't say in front of me? Well, since my friend has been kind enough to help you, sir, I think you'd better let him conduct his investigation in his own manner. Oh, very, very, very well. All sounds unnecessarily mysterious to me. Uh, I, I'll be in my study. Dreadfully pompous fellow. You were right in your analysis of his character, Holmes. Well, let's go in. Shh! Listen to the piano, Watson. What a weird tune. Yes. An odd, primitive melody to hear in the heart of the English countryside. Very curious. Come in. I'm sorry, Father. Ah, oh, it isn't Father. Who are you, gentlemen? Miss Manderby... Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, well, how do you do, my dear? Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I knew you lived in the neighborhood. Why are you here? At your father's request. Well, nothing's wrong, is it, Mr. Holmes? I'm not sure, Miss Manderby. That's why we've come to talk to you. Oh, may we sit down, my dear? Oh, yes, of course. Please forgive me. Thank you, sir. You play the piano excellently, Miss Manderby. Have you ever thought of concert work? Concert work? Oh, no, sir. Papa'd never allow it. He needs me here all the time. You don't see many people here at the house. No, Dr. Watson. Papa doesn't like me to cultivate any friends. He wishes me to devote all my attention to him. Extremely selfish and medieval point of view, it would seem to me. Oh, please, Mr. Holmes. You mustn't say anything against Papa. If he knew that we were talking about him, he'd be furious. Then uh, let me confine myself to you, Miss Manderby. Do you know of anyone in this neighborhood who might... Uh, Wish you serious harm? Oh, no. No, I don't. I, uh, as I told you, I, I hardly know anyone. Then why, my dear young lady, are you so obviously terrified of your own shadow? Oh, please don't ask me that. I haven't even had the courage to tell Papa. Possibly not, my dear, but Mr. Holmes is here to help you and to protect you. That's why he insisted on our seeing you alone. Yes, Miss Manderby. And uh, a trouble shared, you know? Very well, Mr. Holmes. I will tell you. I've got to tell someone. Last night I had a, a ghastly dream. I dreamed that I was in some foreign country, in the jungle. I was tied to a stone slab, and a group of natives danced around me, waving knives. And they were all wearing terrifying masks. Oh, my dear, it sounds like too much lobster for supper. Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Uh, please continue, Miss Manderbin. All the time I could hear a strange, haunting pipe playing in the background. It sounded like some sort of flute, and there was a drum beating out a slow, rhythmic beat. The same rhythm that you were playing on the piano as we came in? Why, yes. It's been haunting me ever since I awakened this morning. It goes like this. I awakened from the nightmare, but I could still hear the melody continuing. I went to the window, and in the moonlight, I saw a tall man walking below. Could you recognize him? No, Mr. Holmes. 
He was disappearing through the shrubbery and his back was turned. But his hands were raised to his mouth. And I could hear the same melody being played on it, some kind of flute. It was awful, awful. You haven't told your father about it? No, Dr. Watson. He wouldn't have believed me. Papa's always accusing me of being fanciful. Oh, but I'm not. Really, I'm not. Miss Mandeby, I'm glad that you've told us this. Though I suggest that you continue to keep it a, a secret from your father. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Come on, Watson. All right, Holmes. Goodbye, my dear, and courage, Miss Mandeby. You have friends now. Good day, gentlemen. And thank you. Holmes, what the devil's all this about? When I can answer that question, Watson, the case was solved. As it is, there's work to be done. Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. Yes, Mr. Mandeby. Here we are. Yeah, I hope you found out what's wrong with the lassie. Uh, she uh, hasn't been herself today. A change from her normal self, where you are concerned, might be a benefit, sir. Yes, indeed. The poor girl seems completely terrified of you, sir. The problem of my daughter's relationship with her father is no possible concern of yours. I asked you here on a simple matter of detection. Detection, yes, but far from simple. I warn you, you're in serious danger of the loss of a great deal more than a white cockerel and a hairbrush. Be on your guard, Mr. Manderby. Dr. Watson and I must conduct a little investigation in the village. You may expect a call from us later in the day. Well, Watson, here we are at Larches. Charming house, but I still don't see quite why we're here. Because my inquiries uncovered the fact that this is the only house in the neighborhood with relatively new tenants. When something extraordinary happens in the peaceful countryside, look first for a newcomer. The owner's name is Mr. George Shapley. Let's see what information the gentleman can give us. Listen to that, Holmes. Sounds like a flute. Yes, Watson. And the melody is the same that Miss Mandeby played for us on the piano. And this house is only a stone's throw away from hers. Precisely. Yes, gentlemen. Mr. Shapley? Yes. My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How are you, doctor? Uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? I'm something of a student of music. We were walking past your house, and I heard what sounded like a flute playing a strange it melody. It seemed to come from the direction of the stables over there. Oh, that. <laughs> it's my manservant, Harker. He's a West Indian. Brought him over with me from Trinidad. He's quite a musician. <laughs> In an amateur sort of way, you know. I wonder if I might speak to him. Of course you can, Mr. Holmes. I'll walk you over there. Thank you. We were thinking of getting up a little entertainment in the village for the church ladies' bazaar. Perhaps your man would uh, consider contributing his services. You can ask him. He spends two or three hours a day out here practicing. Harker. Yes? Come here a minute. Yes, Mr. Harper. These gentlemen heard you playing and wondered if you'd like to do something for some... Oh, <laughs> some village concert or other. Oh, that's flattering. We're organizing a musical soiree for the church ladies in a few weeks. Yes, sir, man, and we'd like you to play for us. Oh, I'm only an amateur, but I'll be very glad to help, gentlemen. That uh, instrument you were playing, it had an odd quality. Was it a flute? Oh, yes, sir. Though I doubt if you've ever seen one like it. Look for yourself. Good Lord. Looks as if it's made of bone. It is, sir. From a human leg bone. Really? It's about 200 years old and originally came from Brazil. It's quite a collector's item. I'm sure it is. Tell me, Harker... Since you're from the West Indies and uh, obviously a lover of music, I presume you're familiar with some of the primitive melodies indigenous to that part of the world. Some of the tribal chants, for instance. Oh, yes, sir. I know many of them. Perhaps you'd play some at the concert. I'd rather not, sir. Primitive chants are dangerous medicine when their evil powers are not appreciated or understood. I quite agree with you, Harker. Well, well, I'm much obliged to you, and uh, we shall count on you for the concert. Good day to you both. Come on, Watson. Uh, good day. Good day, good day, good day. Good day. Good day. Dr. Watson. That servant's our man, Holmes. He lives within two houses of Miss Manderby, and he plays the flute. Well, Watson, though I don't think the pattern is remotely as clear as you think, I'll agree that suspicion would seem to focus on the servant, Harker. I could even produce another clue that points to it. You could? I picked this object from his coat as he turned to you during the conversation. 
None of you noticed it. What is it? Look for yourself, Watson. Here. Great heavens! It's a feather from a white cockerel. Holmes, I thought you said we were going back to Mr. Mandeville's house before the day is over. We are, Watson. Why are we back here at your bee farm? It's 8.30 in the evening now. We shall call on Mr. Mandeville before long. My investigations are complete. What luck did you have well, with yours? I did, as you told me, and made exhaustive inquiries in the village. With what results? I couldn't find out much about Mr. Shapley. Nobody knows anything about the man except that he has a foreign manservant and that he paid cash for his house and deposited a large sum of money in the local bank. Uh, what did you discover? I see that you've been up to your ears in reference books. Yes, Watson. Books concerning the peculiarly revolting ceremonies connected with voodooism. Voodooism? That's black magic. But flourishing in our English countryside, apparently... A white cockerel is the second finest sacrifice in voodoo magic associated with the West Indian church. That accounts for the first theft. How about the stolen hairbrush? In all such magic, the possession of intensely personal objects, particularly human hair, is considered to give great supernatural powers over that person. Then it's obvious that West Indian servant is trying to get power over Miss Mandeby. Holmes, you spoke of a white cockerel being the second finest sacrifice. What is the first? A human sacrifice. The sacrifice of a young girl. Great Scott. And tomorrow night the moon is full. I think that tonight the girl should be safe, though, of course, we'll go over there at look, once. Look, 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 Holmes. The lights of a carriage are coming up your drawer, your driveway. And it's no social call. It's driving at a gallop. Come on, Watson. I have, uh, have nothing that's happened to Miss Mandeville already before we get her. Who is it? What's wrong? Uh, it's Robert Mandeville. What's happened, Mr. Mandeville? Alicia, my daughter, she's disappeared. The whole neighborhood's searching for her. For heaven's sake, both of you come at once. <laughs> We'll find out in a moment what Sherlock Holmes decides to do now. But first, men, why not start today and take better care of the hair you've got? Remember, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Cremel? Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky, gummy, or dirty. Your hair and scalp always look and feel so clean with Cremel. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, start using Cremel at once. Let it make your hair feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. Cremel is also fine to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. A quick massage with Cremel helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. So for better groomed hair, a hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? You and the great Sherlock Holmes drove over to Mr. Manderby's house, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, as fast as the pony and trap could carry us there. When we arrived, Manderby quickly led us to the shrubbery beneath his daughter's window. Yes, you, uh, you can see how the fiend got into the house, Mr. Holmes. By climbing this trellis work. Hmm... Footprints in the earth leading toward it, but none leaving. And the man, whoever he was, must have left the house by some other exit. An amazing deduction, Watson. There's no need to be sarcastic. Holmes, we should go to Shapley's house at once. It's obvious that that's where the danger lies. Before saying that anything is obvious, Watson, I'd like your help in trying an experiment. Yes, of course, Holmes. Well, what is it? Try climbing that trellis for me, will you? you give me all the best jobs, don't you? Let me hand, will you, Willow? Here you are. Up you go. You know, Holmes, it seems to me you're wasting valuable time. Mr. Manderby. Since you asked my help, I suggest you let me handle the case in my own way. Holmes, I don't think this trellis is going to hold my weight. No, no. Look out, Holmes! Oh, oh! Bravo, Watson. Your test has been invaluable. What do you mean it's been invaluable? I think I've broken my back. I'm sure you'll survive. Come on, old chap. Get on your feet. We must go over to Mr. Shapley's house at once. I only hope we're not too late to prevent a tragedy.
There's a light coming from the stables, Holmes. Music, too. Listen. It's that West Indian playing his devilish chant again. Master Watson. Look, look, look. There's someone standing in the shadows by the harness room there. It's Mr. Shapley. Good evening, sir. Mr. Who, Dr. Watson, thank heavens you're here. What's wrong, Mr. Shapley? Look in that empty store there. You can see through the broken plank in the wall. The one where the music's coming from. Good heavens, the combs. There's Miss Mandeville lying on the floor unconscious. Yes, with a dead white cockerel beside her and a fire smoldering in the corner. And you think that servant of mine's in there playing his filthy music? I don't see him. Mr. Holmes, I've got a revolver. I'm going into getting. I think we'll come with you, Mr. Shaftesbury. No, no. He's my servant. I'll take care of him myself. Archie Watson. Give me that revolver. Give it to me, I say. What do you think you're doing, Mr. Holmes? I'll you not. You knocked the revolver right out of his hand. Pick it up, Watson. I have a profound dislike for seeing murder committed under my very eyes. Murder? But the potential murder is Harker, the, the servant. Indeed. Sir. Then why is his unconscious body lying in the corner it there? It can't be. The music's still playing. That's his flute. Yes, and it's accompanied by a drum. A remarkable feat even for a man not lying unconscious on the floor. The music is undoubtedly that of a gramophone. You're remarkably quiet, Mr. Well, Harker. Of course he is. He's unconscious. My dear Watson, you're overlooking an important fact. It's a case of identity. The West Indian gentleman lying on the floor is the master, Mr. Shapley. This man is the servant, Parker. Let me... No, you don't. Let me... Let me... I've got him, Holmes. Let go of me. You can't prove anything. I can and I will. You'll go to prison for this night's work. Watson, see what may be done to the rabbit houses while I turn this man over to the police. How is Miss Manderby, Watson? She's, uh, she's going to be all right, Holmes. I took her home to her father's and left instructions for her, her care. How are you feeling, Jeffrey? Fine, thank you, Dr. Watson. But I'm waiting for Mr. Holmes to explain this nice happenings to me. Uh, so am I, as usual. Then let me analyze this singular affair in its uh, logical progression. I early concluded that you, Mr. Shapley, were the master, and the other man was the servant. Right, Mr. Holmes, but I didn't know how you knew it. Your speech and manner suggested nothing else. You reversed roles, I imagine, because it was an easier way to rent a house in the English countryside. That was the reason, Mr. Holmes. In my previous visits, I've discerned a certain prejudice against foreigners. That's a shocking thing, but I, I wouldn't doubt it, Mr. Shapley. You decided to live here... Your health, I suppose. No, Doctor. I came to the English countryside for peace. Peace to conclude my studies on the origin and history of West Indian native music. I see. I've been working in close conjunction with Professor Griffiths of the Brighton College of Anthropology. It was he who concerned me to make graphophone records my works with a view to recording them for musical archives. And your servant saw his advantage. When you decided to change identities, he realized that if he disposed of you, he would be able to continue in his false character as the supposed Mr. Shapley. He could have taken over your large bank balance and retired under yet a third name with the proceeds. And then he concocted this elaborate plot involving voodoo and native chants, knowing that his master would be suspect. Precisely. He drugged his master, placed him in the incriminating trap, and then planned to burst in just ahead of us and shoot him. But, Holmes, the white feather you found on Mr. Shapley's coat undoubtedly planted there. Mr. Holmes, I still don't see how you knew that my man was responsible. The first clue was the trellis. It's obvious that you never claimed, climbed that. You're heavier than Dr. Watson, and it wouldn't support his weight. Your servant was a small, light man. Obviously, it was he. Well, I see it all now, and then, of course... When we heard the music while Mr. Shapley was still lying unconscious, it was obvious that the whole thing was a plot. Oh, what, a, what a shocking business. Yes, but I can't tell you how grateful I am to you, gentlemen. You saved my life. Mr. Holmes, I must insist on paying you a handsome fee. A fee? No, Mr. Shapley. I couldn't dream of accepting one. Some people in my country have been sufficiently inhospitable to a foreigner to make him believe it advisable to change places with his own servant. Presumably, this was done in order to obtain tolerance and peace. Surely the least I can do is to see that his stay on these shores is a tolerable one. Girls, I imagine most of you are planning to go out to a party or a dance on New Year's Eve. Or perhaps just spend a quiet evening with friends. 
Naturally, you want your hair to look its best. So why not follow this beauty tip from those divinely beautiful powers models? We wash our hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazing beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair, revealing all its natural glossy luster. And so many women tell me how wonderful Cremel Shampoo is for washing children's hair. <laughs> well, you can readily see why. Because Cremel Shampoo is so mild and gentle on the hair. Its luxurious active foam removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if only you could see how Powers Models hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. You can buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, Mr. Bell, next week I think I'll tell you a story I call the Darlington Substitution Case. It's a strange story how Holmes saved a prominent British peer from scandal and disgrace by exercising the judgment of Solomon. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Mazarin Stone. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the Darlington substitution case. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's time for that weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, there you are, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Well, have you quite recovered from your holiday festivities? I think so, my boy. And I was particularly flattered by the number of friends who were kind enough to remember a rather elderly and lonely doctor at this time of year. Well, as long as you keep telling those swell Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll never be lonely, Dr. Watson. Then I'd better get on with tonight's new adventure. <laughs> It involved us in one of the most shocking scandals of the 19th century. A scandal that, had it ever emerged in the light of day, might easily have brought ruin and disgrace to one of the most famous men who ever came a member of the House of Lords. Well, this one I've got to hear. But first, I have a message for our listeners. Today, more than ever before, I think men realize how important it is to keep their hair neatly groomed. And men, may I ask you this about the preparation you use... Does it give your hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look? When you run your hand back over your hair, does your hair feel greasy, sticky, or dirty? Does grease come off on your hand or hat band? If it does, then be smart, men. Change at once to Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer with such a handsome, well-groomed look. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand back over your hair, and men, it's really a pleasure. No grease comes off on your hand. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always looks and feels so clean on your hair and scalp. Let it keep your hair looking handsome at all times. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... How about the 19th century scandal in which you and the great Sherlock Holmes became involved? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in the very early days of the great man's career. World acclaim and handsome fees were some years ahead of him. And in those times, we spent many long evenings discussing whether a decent living could be obtained by the practice of criminal detection. On the day that this particular story began, we just finished our breakfast. Holmes, 
A curved pipe clenched between his teeth was scanning the personal columns of the morning paper. I can almost hear him now, as he said... Demi Watson, the agony column of the Times is more than usually barren this morning. Are you looking for a possible client, Holmes? Naturally. Since we already owe Mrs. Hudson for two months' rent here, and our doorbell has been frighteningly silent during that period... I must see what possible service I might render these unhappy correspondents. Well, I glanced over the column, but I couldn't see anything very promising. No, Watson, it's a rag bag of bizarre happenings. What a chorus of groans, cries, and bleatings. One skims through them, and what does one glean? Lady with a black bow at the Prince's Skating Club wishes to meet gentleman who was kind enough to... That we may ignore, I think. Yes, she doesn't sound as though she needs your services. Well, oh, here's an item. <laughs> Surely Jimmy will not break his mother's heart. Hmm. That appears to be irrelevant. If the lady who fainted on the top deck of the Brixton bus... She doesn't interest me either, Watson. No, probably anyone else who wasn't on that bus. Every day my heart longs for... Ah, bleat, Watson. All this twaddle is unmitigated bleat. It's very disheartening, Holmes. You haven't had a case for over two weeks. Yes. Sometimes I think I chose the wrong profession. What do the public, the great unobservant public who can hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Holmes, uh, come over here to the window. What's wrong, Watson? Uh, look at that man walking down the street. He's looking at the numbers of the houses. Let's hope 221B is the number he's searching for. What do you make of him, Watson? Oh, let me see. What do I make of him? Well, I uh, say that he is a foreigner. Uh, yes, foreigner. Look at those flashy clothes and his pointed moustache. Oh, don't be misled by externals, old chap. Observe the steady, controlled gait. No trace of the light agility of the Latins or the military heaviness of the German. No, Watson. I think an English gait in foreign attire would suggest an expatriate Englishman, only just returned from a stay abroad. He is coming here, Holmes. Meet him on the stairs, Watson. It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, so that's all right. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, would you please come along up? That's right, sir. Straight up here. Uh, in, in here, sir. Which of your fellows is Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir. And your name is... Uh... Tremaine. Reginald Tremaine. I'm Dr. Watson. Uh, sit down, won't you, Mr. Tremaine? My business won't take long. Holmes, I need protection, and I'm prepared to pay for it. Protection from what? My life's been threatened. The police wouldn't do a thing for me, so I've come to you. I'm told you detective fellows will do anything for money. Oh, rather really? then you've been misinformed, sir. My friend... Your friend well... is very interested in Mr. Tremaine's problem, Watson. Pray continue, sir. Holmes, I want you to warn my cousin... Tell him you'll get nowhere by threatening me. Frighten the wits out of him if you can. I'll give you 20 pounds uh, and another 20 if I need you again. And uh, who is your threatening cousin? Lord Darlington. Oh, really? Charming fellow. I He's a him scoundrel. Oh, but his title impressed Scotland Yard. That's why they wouldn't help me. Well, even a title can be vulnerable. A public scandal would shake him. And that's what is going to happen if he threatens me any more. And you can tell him so from me, Holmes. I've always heard of Lord Darlington as the very model of an English aristocrat. Why should he threaten you, Mr. Tremaine? That's none of your business. Oh, my soul, none of your, your job is to see that he doesn't carry out his threat of thrashing me with an inch of my life. Very well. For 20 pounds, I shall warn Lord Darlington that I stand between you and a thrashing. The fee will be paid in advance, please. I have it in this envelope here. And I expect immediate action, Holmes. You shall have it, Mr. Tremaine. Holmes, the man's insufferable. Why'd you take on the case? He's a bounder. Let him get thrashed. These four crisp five-pound notes persuade me otherwise, Watson. We owe money to Mrs. Hudson, and your medical practice shows little signs of picking up. I must take what fees I can. Oh, how can my practice pick up when I spend half my time chasing all over the country with you? In any case, Watson... Ask yourself why such a man as Lord Darlington should threaten Tremaine with physical violence. Obviously, only because Tremaine is himself, in some way, a threat to Lord Darlington. There may be yet another fee in this case, and a much fatter one. You're going to see Lord Darlington at once? Yes. 
I'd ask you to come with me, old chap, but after your remark about chasing all over the country, I hesitate to waste your time. Rubbish. I was only joking, and you know it, you silly fellow. Of course I'm going with you, Holmes. Get your coat and hat. The game's afoot. Ten thousand pounds, my dear cousin, or the scandal will be spread all over London. It's preposterous, Reginald. And I warn you that if you continue in this vein, you'll get that thrashing, I promise. Oh, no, I won't. I've engaged a detective fellow by the name of Sherlock Holmes. He's going to act as a bodyguard. So you'd better not try any tricks. He should be here any moment. How dare you bring a stranger into this mess? How dare you? That's right, my dear cousin. Bolster up your courage with the brandy bottle. Oh, be quiet, Reginald. It'll cost you ten thousand pounds to keep me quiet. I won't pay it. The scandal will make pretty readings in the newspapers. Before we go any further, Reginald, I insist on one thing. I shall bring Lady Darlington to here, and you must make this shocking accusation to her face. I shall be delighted to. Yes, Jenkins, what is it? Excuse me, Your Lordship, but there's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Watson to see you. I told them that you were engaged, but they seem most insistent. Better have them come in, my dear cousin. We may need independent witnesses. Oh, very well. Show the gentleman in, Jenkins. Yes, Your Lordship. And then if you'll ask Lady Darlington to come here, I'll be very glad to make my accusation in public. It's blackmail, Reginald. That's what it is. You'll never get away with it. <laughs> Won't I? I think you'll be surprised. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Allow me to introduce my cousin, gentlemen, Lord Darlington. How do you do? How do, you do? Uh, Jenkins? Yes, Your Lordship. Ask Lady Darlington to step in here for a moment. Yes, Your Lordship. Lord Darlington... I greatly admired your speech in the House of Lords on tax reform. I only wish we had met under different circumstances. As it is, it is my duty oh, to that's inform... all right, Holmes. I've already told my dear cousin that I'd engaged your services. I want you both here as witnesses. Witnesses? To what? Reginald has made a shocking accusation. As soon as my wife comes here, I'm going to insist that he repeat the statement to her face. Now, oh, there you are, Clara. Well, I'll just put Gordon to sleep, dear. Hello, Reginald. How are you, Clara? My dear, I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? do, you do? Well, do you sit down, won't you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Albert, what's wrong? You all look so dreadfully serious. Clara, my dear, Reginald has made a shocking accusation. It concerns you, and I insisted that he repeat it in your presence. An accusation against me? Yes, Clara, my dear. You see, I'm requesting a paltry sum for concealing my knowledge of the Darlington substitution scandal. Substitution? What on earth do you mean? Well, who should understand me better than you? The baby asleep upstairs. The supposed heir to the Darlington title is not your child. That's a lie. How dare you say that, Reginald? Lord Darlington, surely you were present at your son's birth? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't. I was abroad on government business at the time. My wife went to the country with a paid companion. My son was born there. Oh, no, my dear cousin. A son was born there, and then it was passed off as yours. That's a foul lie. Albert, make him leave this house. I'm afraid, Clara, my dear, that, well, he's threatened to go to the newspapers. We must hear him out. Lord Darlington, surely the matter is not hard to settle. You say your wife had a companion. Confront her with a story. She can establish the truth of the matter. Oh, yes, of course she can, but where is she? I haven't seen Maud Harris since she left me a year ago. Then I have a surprise for you, Clara. She's waiting in my cab outside now. I'll tell Jenkins to send her in. Jenkins? Yes, sir? Ask Miss Harris to join us. She's waiting in my cab. Yes, sir. Albert, I don't know what devil's work Reginald's up to, but you don't believe him, do you? Well, of course not, Clara, darling. Mr. Tremaine... How did you get in touch with this, uh, Miss Harris? For an employee, you ask a lot of questions, Holmes. I met Maud Harris at Brighton last week. As soon as she knew I was the black sheep of the Darlington clan, she thought we might profitably put our heads together. And so you organized with the idea of blackmailing this poor lady. And such a valuable secret is surely worth a few thousand pounds, Dr. Watson. Maud. Yes, Lady Darlington, it's me. You're just in time to settle a most important truth. I'll handle this, Reginald. Young lady, as I understand it, you claim to know that the boy lying upstairs is not my son. Who should know better, Your Lordship? 
He's mine. Bert, how can you tell such a lie? It's no lie, and you know it, Lady Darlington. Your child was born dead. Oh, but make her stop saying such things. Here, my dear, control yourself. Let's hear this shocking tale to the end. Well, go on, young woman. You were abroad, Lord Darlington. When her ladyship lost her child, she was terrified. She knew how much you longed for a son, and she made this plan. Oh. I was a widow, and I was going to have a child, too. We fooled the villagers, even the doctor, by giving each other's names. And so my son was born as the Darlington heir. Lord, that's the most shocking lie I've ever heard. I can't stay here and listen to any more of it. Mr. Holmes, I understand you're a man of discretion and ability in such matters. What am I to do? I would like to ask this young lady a few questions. Miss Harris, why have you chosen to reveal the supposed truth now? I thought that money could compensate me for the loss of my boy. But I was wrong. A mother's love can never be stifled. Indeed, and I suppose Mr. Tremaine's plans for blackmail are purely incidental. Oh, keep out of this, Watson. It's no affair of yours. Establishing truth and justice is anybody's business, my good man. Mr. Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name to disprove this monstrous story. Oh, no, you don't, my dear cousin. Holmes is employed by me. Mr. Tremaine, I've undertaken to protect your physical safety. That pledge I will keep. Otherwise, I'm a free agent. Then you'll accept my commission? Yes, Lord Arlington, on one condition. And what's that? You have asked me to disprove this story. I would prefer that you ask me to establish the truth. Of course, Holmes, and spare no expense. Remember, the honor of the Darlingtons is at stake. Well, Holmes... Little did I think when Tremaine called on us this morning that we'd end up the day tramping a village lane in Surrey, looking for a Dr. Godfrey. And yet, that gentleman must surely be able to give us the final answer. Lady Darlington said that he attended yes, her. Yes, but supposing the companion story was true and they had changed names. Even so, the good doctor will certainly know whether the boy was born to a slight blonde woman like Lady Darlington... Or a brunette Amazon like Maud Harris. Well, here's the doctor's house. They said in the village it was the one with the gabled roof. Hmm. No lights visible. I hope the doctor's not out. Doesn't seem to be any answer. Couldn't find it. I don't believe there's anyone at home. And you will observe, Watson, that this morning's delivery of milk still stands on the doorstep. Curious. Let's explore a little. Well, perhaps the doctor's gone away for a few days. If so, he's a very careless man. Look, that window's wide open. Well, do you think we might go in and look round? We not only might, we will go in. Too much is at stake to stand on ceremony. Strike a match, Watson. Right, you are. I light that lamp. There you are. Holmes! Holmes, look, look, look! The figure slumped over the desk. Someone has reached the doctor before us. He's been shot through the chest. He's dead, Holmes. How long would you estimate he's been dead, Watson? Oh, uh, about 24 hours, I say. So now we become involved in murder as well as blackmail. Well, the answer's perfectly obvious to me. Tremaine came here and shot him. He knew that he could never blackmail Lord Darlington while this doctor was still alive. Not necessarily, Watson. If the story of the substitution is true, you must realize that one other person would have an equal motive for murder. Which cut, Holmes? Who? Lord Darlington himself. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes as they endeavor to solve the mystery. But first, they say New Year's resolutions are made to be broken. But here's one which should pay you big dividends to keep. Resolve to take better care of your hair, to keep it better groomed, your scalp hygienic. Start using Kreml hair tonic at once. You see, Kreml is a highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair neatly in place longer and gives the hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And a quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. 
And men, you like to rub cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and looks as if it had some body to it. So men, for better groomed hair and a hygienic scalp, change to cremel. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so you went to interview that village doctor and arrived there to find him dead. Yes, Mr. Bell, but before we reported the tragedy to the police, Sherlock Holmes conducted an intensive search of the dead man's room. After a moment, he turned to me and said... Watson, we must see what the inanimate objects in this room can tell us. Aha, here's the doctor's appointment pad. Let's see who his last visitor was. Look, look, there's the name of Darlington. Yes, but that tells us little. If the companion's story is true, the word Darlington could refer to either of the women or to Lord Darlington himself. But what are these letters scribbled before the word Darlington? Why must doctors have such illegible handwriting? Doctors don't have illegible handwriting. I disagree. Hmm? In fact, I've often thought they train you to write badly in medical colleges. Yes. The letters are R-E, Re. Re, Re, Darlington. That means that someone was calling about the Darlington case. A fact we already knew. Yes, oh, sure, uh, let's see what else we can find. Hello. Look over here on the sideboard. Brandy decanter with a stopper left cloud. And one glass that has been drunk from. The killer must have had a drink after he shot the doctor. And in so doing, I think he gave us the clue to his identity. Oh, how? There's a speck on the rim of this glass. I think it's... Ah, the very thing. The doctor's microscope. Most convenient. What does it tell you, Holmes? Uh, wait a minute. Uh-huh. I was right. This speck on the glass is wax. Wax? Then that means the murderer used a candle. Oh, no, Watson. Oh, didn't... Come on. Oh. We must go back to the village and report his death. And then we'll catch the next train to London. Uh, aren't you going to stay here and help the police? Why should I? Beyond telling them the name of the murderer. You mean you know who did it? Of course. And so should you. Well, I don't. But we don't know the answer to the Darlington substitution scandal. That answer, Watson, still lies in London. Nine thousand, nine thousand five hundred, ten thousand pounds. Well, there you are, Reginald. Thank you, my dear cousin. I'll put the money in my bag, Reginald. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Lord Darlington. That sheaf of banknotes in Miss Harry's hand. Surely you didn't pay the blackmail. I discussed the matter with my wife, Mr. Holmes. She's deeply upset. We both agreed that the scandal, once started, would cling to us for life, even if it was disproved later. That's why I paid the money. You engaged me as your representative in this case, Lord Darlington. Miss Harris, give that money back at once. It was a gift from Lord Darlington, in front of a witness. If you try to touch it, I shall send for a policeman. That won't be necessary. Two of them are waiting in the anteroom now. Police? Oh, Holmes, you shouldn't have done it. I wanted no breath of this scandal to emerge from beyond these four walls. The fact that police are here has nothing to do with the problems of blackmail. I brought them here to apprehend a murderer. A murderer? Well, what do you mean? Dr. Godfrey, your wife's physician, was shot dead during the past 24 hours. He was killed before he could tell us the true answer to the parentage of the child upstairs. Murdered? Oh, what a dreadful thing. Have you any idea who did it? Every idea, Lord Darlington. But before I expose the criminal, I'd be obliged if you'd bring Lady Darlington here. And also the child. Oh, very well, Holmes. This is going to be a terrible shock to her. You're suddenly very quiet, Mr. Tremaine. Am I? I was wondering who might have killed Dr. Godfrey. Fortunately, we don't have to wonder. The murderer left a clue... After he'd committed the crime, he made the mistake of taking a drink. Darlington's quite a drinking man, you know. And you have been known to take a drink on occasions too, Mr. Tremaine. For instance, uh, after you'd killed Dr. Godfrey. After I'd... What rubbish are you saying? You see, the murderer left a tiny blob of wax on the glass. Oh, what does that prove? Merely that someone had been carrying a candle. But this wasn't candle wax. It was cosmetic wax, such as you used to wax that pointed moustache of yours. Reginald. All right, all of you, I'm getting out of here. <gasps> Snatch my bag. Reginald, come back here. I'll go after them. No, no, Watson. The police are prepared to arrest him, but not the young lady. 
We shall need her cooperation in the last act of this little tragedy. But surely the whole thing's clear by now. If Tremaine killed the doctor, obviously the whole story about the substitution is, is a lie. Not necessarily. Even if it were true, the doctor was still a menace to his plans. How could he and Miss Harris ask the highest price for their secret when the doctor also knew it? No, Watson. Tremaine had a motive for murder either way. In the meanwhile, I must set the stage before Lady Darlington gets here. Where'd I put that parcel? Oh, here it is. What the devil have you got in there, Holmes? A present from a plumber friend of mine. Though the object in this pa package is only a simple tool of his trade, I feel that it may give us the answer to a peer's inheritance. Upon my soul, you're being very mysterious. In a few moments, I propose to conduct a test. You must hide outside the windows. When I turn down the gaslight over the mantel here, Watson, I want you to strike a match, apply it to the object in this package, and toss it through the open window. At the same time... Cry out the word fire at the top of your oh, voice. Oh, I remember that. I think the results of the experiment may prove quite startling. Lord Darlington, now that all the principals in this case are assembled, I shall conduct my experiment. Very well, Holmes. I don't see why I had to bring the boy down here. It's long past his bedtime. I assure you, Lady Darlington, that his presence is absolutely essential. Please place him in the bassinet on the sofa. All right. Uh, that's it. And you, Miss Harris, will you be good enough to place your handbag on the table? Mm, very well, Mr. Holmes. But no funny business now. The police took it away from Reggie and gave it back to me. That money's mine. Each of you ladies claim to be the mother of that boy. Since scientific tests of parentage are notoriously unreliable, I shall conduct a simple experiment which I think may give us the truth in this matter. Now... I want both you ladies to come toward me with outstretched hands. That's it. I turn down the gaslight over the mantel. So. Ah! Ah! Oh, 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 it's, it's all right. It's all right. If you look closely, you'll observe that this object is a perfectly harmless plumber's smoke rocket. Ah! Ah! You can drop the masquerade, Watson. The case is solved. Ah! Oh, is it home? Holmes, what on earth are you up to? You notice that on the cry of fire. Miss Harris ran for her handbag containing the 10,000 pounds. Lady Darlington instinctively rushed to her son. I think, Lord Darlington, that there can no longer be any question of the child's parentage. Midnight. <laughs> been a long day, Holmes. Yes, but uh, profitable, Watson. A very profitable day's work indeed. Here's a thousand guineas from Lord Darlington. And uh, don't overlook the 20 pounds that Mr. Tremaine well, I gave me. Sean, he retained you for protection and you end up by sending him to the gallows. A fate that he richly deserves. I only wish I could have persuaded Lord Darlington to prosecute Miss Harris. Blackmail is a devilish crime. It's funny to think that a simple plumber's rocket smoked out the truth. Yes. Though, you'll remember, I've had occasion to use the instrument before. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her impulse is at once to rush to the thing she values most. It's a perfectly overpowering instinct. Well, you certainly took advantage of the fact. Ah, well, Watson, you may remember the old Persian saying. There's danger for him who taketh the tiger cub, and danger for whoso snatches delusion from a woman. Oh, really? Oh, yes, Watson. There's as much sense in Hafiz as in Horace and as much knowledge of the world. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a very exciting story. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Incidentally, don't you think you'd better tell our listeners about the change of day and time for our next meeting? Yes, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, our next broadcast will be on Monday, January 13th, over these same stations. And better consult your newspaper for the time. Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair 
and uncovers all its natural radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies... Buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? It's not next week, uh, Mr. Bell. It's a week from next Monday. Yes, of course. Well, what story are you going to tell us a week from next I Monday? I think I'll tell you about the Devil's Foot. The Devil's Foot? What was that? I won't tell you now, Mr. Bell, but I will say that Sherlock Holmes and I never encountered a more gruesome or a more horrible mystery. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us one week from Monday. That's January 13th when Dr. Watson will tell us about the devil's foot. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your chair and settle down. Thank you. That's it. All ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Yes, Watson? Yes, Mr. Bell. And as I was going over my notes on the case, I, I came across this. I think it might interest you. Well, what is it? It looks like an ordinary piece of clay. It is clay, but I assure you it's very far from ordinary. This piece of dried earth enabled Sherlock Holmes to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call the case The Singular Affair of the Babbling Butler. I can hardly wait to hear the story. <laughs> I'm sure that you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? Yes, Dr. Watson, but it won't take me a moment. In a recent poll, women picked the ten best-dressed men in America. These men were all men at the top, statesmen, governors, movie stars, producers, and millionaires. And I know you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But why shouldn't Kreml be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look, such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml also keeps hair neatly in place longer, with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair feels so delightfully clean. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kreml in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the singular affair of the babbling butler? Well, that adventure began on a November evening many years ago. For four days, a dense yellow fog had virtually marooned Holmes and me in our Baker Street lodgings. The first day, the great man had spent in cross-indexing his huge book of references. The second and third had been patiently occupied upon a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day... We still saw the heavy brown swirl drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes. My old friend's active and impatient nature began to assert itself. He started to pace restlessly about our room in a fever of suppressed energy. 
Confound this fog. Oh, do stop pacing up and down, Holmes. No good getting angry with the weather. That's one problem even you can't do anything about. It isn't the weather, Watson. It's the infernal dullness of the London criminal these days. Come over here to the window. Oh, what is it, Holmes? Look out there. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the fog. What a night for a thief or a murderer, Watson. He could roam London as a tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces. It's fortunate for this community that I'm not a criminal. Yes, it is indeed. Suppose that I were Brooks or Woodhouse or any of the 50 men who have good reason for taking my life. How long could I survive against my own pursuit? A summons, a bogus appointment, and all would be over. What a depressing thought. The only thing that depresses me is inactivity. Why doesn't something happen? Why doesn't someone come to me with a problem? <laughs> it sounds as if your prayer's been answered. I hope so. See who it is, Watson, will you? It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, of course. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Ask the, the gentleman to come up, please. This way up, sir. You wish to see Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Uh, yes, sir, I do. Then come along in. My name's Watson, Dr. Watson, and this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Uh, my name is Jenkins. I'm butler to Sir Roderick Martin. Sir Roderick Martin? Indeed. Sit down, Jenkins. Thank you, sir. Sir Thank Roderick you. Martin, isn't he the theatrical producer? Yes, Watson. And he is quite famous in his own circle for his cynicism and a certain mordant wit. Your master needs my services, I presume, Jenkins? Uh, yes, Mr. Holmes, he does. He's in desperate trouble, and he'd like you to come over to his house at once. Well, what sir. kind of trouble is he in? Oh, please don't ask any questions, sir. Just come to the house and see for yourselves. I've long wanted to meet Sir Roderick. I believe it was he who gave currency to that pun. Though he might be more humble, there's no police like Holmes. That's all funny. No police like Holmes. <laughs> I'm glad it amuses you, Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, I implore you to come with. Please, gentlemen, come with me. Whatever your master's problems may be, I think I would enjoy a discussion with him. Perhaps on the topic of humility. Yes, Jenkins, we'll accompany you at once. <laughs> This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, Jenkins. Oh, how very odd. Now, why should Jenkins make such a meteoric exit? I presume, Sir Roderick, he wished to leave us alone. Indeed. What a singularly depressing thought. Well, so now that he's gone, you can talk quite freely. My dear Dr. Watson, I've been in the habit of talking freely ever since I had the pleasure of insulting my nurse at the age of four. She was a peculiarly revolting female by the name of Pearl. After 44 years, I still can't think of a more inappropriate name for her. Sir Roderick, your childhood reminiscences are fascinating, but supposing we get down to business? Very well, Holmes. To what do I owe the, uh, well, for lack of a better word, the pleasure of this visit? Your butler came to fetch us. He said that you were in desperate trouble and needed our help. Jenkins told you that. I can only assume that he stole more than his usual quota of brandy today. I've noticed in the past that alcohol seems to give him the quaintest delusions. Then uh, you don't wish to consult me professionally? No, Holmes, I don't. Nor do I wish the services of a doctor. Therefore, I suggest you both retire and ask Jenkins for your hats and an explanation. Good evening, gentlemen. It's one of his stupid jokes, Holmes. The bounder's trying to make a fool of you. I think not, Watson. It'd be a singularly pointless joke and far below his standard. No, I believe there's some other game afoot. Though Sir Roderick dismissed us somewhat unceremoniously, I think we may still be reasonably certain of a welcome in the servants' quarters. You're going to talk to the butler? Yes, Watson. I'm certain he's neither been drinking nor suffering from delusions. I'm convinced that the man is in mortal terror of his life. Thank heavens you came to see me, Mr. Holmes. Well, how could we resist it when Sir Roderick told us that your entire story was a lie? Oh, you must forgive me, gentlemen. I, I was desperate with fear, and I, I had to attract your attention. But why? You've accomplished your purpose now. You've thoroughly roused my curiosity. But I repeat, why? Because I'm in terror of my life, sir. Someone's trying to murder me, Well, sir. what reason have you for saying that, Jenkins? Last night an attempt was made to kill me. Oh, Please describe the circumstances. Well, sir, I, I was carrying a keg of wine down into the cellar. 
slipped from my arms and hit the stairs, and then the stairs collapsed. When I examined them, I found that they'd been sawed almost through. Mm. I assume that you are the only member of the household who ever visits the wine cellar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was a deliberate trap to break my neck. Oh, if I'd stepped down, it would have been the end of me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I, I'm only a servant. I couldn't pay you much, Oh, but... my dear Jenkins, I assure you that Mr. Holmes is as interested in preventing the murder of a servant as he is, is in saving the life of a prime minister. Jenkins, have you any idea who might want to kill you? There's only one person on earth with a motive for killing me, sir. And that's my master. Sir Roderick Martin. Oh, come, 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 my dear man. You're surely mistaken. What reason do you have for suspecting him? Well, it's this way, Mr. Holmes. A year ago, a certain lady killed herself when Sir Roderick jilted her. Good gracious well, me. The affair was all hushed up. and huh? Nobody knew Sir Roderick was even involved. But her brother swore to avenge her death. That brother is a very close friend of Sir Roderick's, but has never suspected him. Complicated situation, eh, Holmes? Yes, Watson. I take it, Jenkins, you are the only person who knows that your master was guilty? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if I were dead, his secret would be safe. Oh, Mr. Holmes, please, what can I do? I, I know he's planning my death. You've got to save me, sir. Jenkins, my advice is this. Write a full statement of the circumstances in this case. Sign and seal it and hand it over to me for safekeeping. Inform your master that if anything happens to you, I shall make public the contents of the statement. That's a very good idea, Holmes. I'll do that, sir. I'll do that. I'll bring it to you in the morning. Splendid. Come on, Watson. Oh, uh, by the way, Jenkins, what's the name of your doctor? My doctor, sir? I I never said... I, you uh, never said what? Oh, oh, oh yeah, doctor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. David Stanley in Wimpole Street. Dr. David Stanley. I see. Well, good night, Jenkins. We shall expect you in the morning. <laughs> But why are we going to see Dr. Stanley? Firstly, because I want his physician's opinion as to whether Jenkins might be suffering from hysterical delusions. Well, as a doctor myself, I say that's more likely. I must say his actions tonight hardly seem the behavior of a sane man. When a man is badly frightened, Watson, it's sometimes hard to judge his actions by uh, more rational standards. Incidentally, did you notice the way he started when I asked him the name of his doctor? Almost certainly, Dr. David Stanley is the vengeful killer. Hi, George. Now that you mention it, I do remember hearing some gossip in Harley Street about Stanley's sister killing herself. But uh, nobody seemed to know the motive. Well, here's the house, Watson. Well, let's hope the doctor's at home. If he isn't, we haven't come very far out of our way. Want me to wait for you, Governor? No, thank you, Cabby. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Governor. Oh, idiot! Oh. I can hear a piano playing. Someone is at home. That seems an eminently logical deduction. There's no need to be funny, Holmes. Good evening. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm Mrs. Stanley. How we do? wondered if we might have a few words with your husband. With David? Well, come in, won't you, gentlemen? Mr. Holmes, you're a detective, aren't you? Yes, Mrs. Stanley. I hope you haven't come here to talk to David about his sister's death. Not directly, madam. Though my mission is not uh, unconnected with that tragedy. Then I can't let you see Well, me. really, Mrs. Stanley, my friend only no, wishes gentlemen. to... No, gentlemen. For the sake of his sanity, I daren't let you talk to him. Ever since his sister died, he's been like a soul tormented. He spends most of his time in there playing those frightening compositions of his on the piano. I can't let him be subjected to any more questioning about his sister. Even I don't mention her. Sylvia, I've heard voices. I, uh... Oh. oh. Who are these gentlemen? It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. How do you do, Dr. Turner? I hope we're not intruding, sir. The great Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson intruding? Well, of course not. I'm flattered. Come in, come in, gentlemen. Please don't say anything about his sister's death. Don't worry, Mrs. Stanley. We won't. No, 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 of course not. Holmes, I... I believe you're something of a musician. I, I'd like your opinion of this. David, dear, they haven't come here to listen to I the music. I don't care what they came here for. This is what they're going to hear. Well, how'd you like it? 
A strange, savage melody, Dr. Stanley. Yes, indeed, sir. Rather depressing, if you don't mind me saying so. No, why shouldn't it be? When it's finished, I call it, uh, a Threnody for a Dead Sister. That's what you've come to see me about, isn't it, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Now, David, dear, you must... Sylvia, I should prefer that you leave us alone. But, David... I said alone, Sylvia. Very well. Sylvia's a girl who can't face up to facts, but I can. Tell me, Holmes, what have you found out about my sister's death? Dr. Stanley, I'm afraid you're laboring under misapprehension. I know nothing of your sister. I came here to talk about Jenkins, Sir Roderick Martin's He butler. told us that you were his physician. Oh, Jenkins, eh? Hmm. Uh, what do you want to know about him? Has he been uh, ill recently? Well, a few months ago, he had a bad attack of enteric fever. Why do you ask? Enteric sometimes leaves bad after effects. Would you say, Doctor, that Jenkins has suffered no lasting damage? Hallucinations, for instance? Well, at the time, he was out of his head for a while, but uh, I'd say he's perfectly sound now. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. That's all we wanted to know. You mean to say that you came here simply to find out about the state of Jenkins' sanity? Just that, sir. Good evening. Good night, Dr. Stanley. I think you had something else on your mind before you talked to Sylvia. Well, Jenkins may be sane, but that man's on the edge of a mental collapse, if I ever saw one. I quite agree, Watson. Hmm. Mrs. Stanley seems to have gone upstairs. I think we'll let ourselves out. Well, Holmes, that was rather a fruitless trip. We didn't learn much there, except that Jenkins is compass mentis. I disagree, old chap. We learned a great deal more than that. Tomorrow morning, I shall lose no time in calling on Sir Roderick again. That horrible fellow? For heaven's sake, why? Because he is the focal point in a grim tragedy. Inevitably, either he will kill Jenkins or Dr. Stanley will kill him. My dear Holmes, I'm accustomed to facing two brown eggs at breakfast, two brown eggs lightly boiled, followed by a leisurely perusal of the Times... I see no reason why this day should commence any differently. Sir Roderick, I've explained to you... You've that explained I... nothing, including your own presumption, Holmes. I can see no cause for your meddling, even if I understood precisely what you were driving at, which I don't. Well, surely, Sir Roderick, you must see that my friend is trying to protect you. Dr. Watson, I once had the acute misfortune to read one of your shockingly florid stories. What? Uh, I can only assume that your gross imagination mm -hmm. has infected your daily life. Since your own safety seems to be a matter of indifference to you, Sir Roderick, I may point out that I know too much if you plan on being a danger yourself. Holmes, you're impertinent, a quality which is attractive only in a younger person and of a different sex. What is even more unpardonable, you're boring. Please leave and take this bumbling veterinary surgeon with you. It's extremely offensive. Before I leave, I insist on knowing one thing. Where is your butler, Jenkins? A new man opened the door just now. Jenkins? Jenkins? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I omitted to tell you. Um, Jenkins has left my service. You discharged him, I suppose. Not exactly, though it is my invariable rule to discharge any servant found guilty of a crime. A crime? And what was Jenkins' crime? He committed suicide. In just a moment, we shall hear more about this ironic crime of suicide. But first, men, nice-looking, attractive hair means so much to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once. Take better care of the hair you've got. Change to Kreml hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men... Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. 
So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic preferred among America's most successful men. Well, Dr. Watson, this story really has me on the edge of my chair. So the butler Jenkins had committed suicide? Well, that's what Sir Roderick told us, Mr. Bell. Although we had great difficulty in persuading him to let us examine the, the dead man's room. Finally, after Sherlock Holmes had pointed out that if we couldn't handle the case, and Scotland Yard certainly would, we were allowed to visit that uh, room of death. The evidence of suicide was apparent. After a brief examination, Holmes turned to me and said... What do you make of it, Watson? Obvious signs of strychnine poisoning, Holmes. Quite clearly, a suicide. Yes. The other servants told us that they had to break the door down to get in. It was locked and bolted from the inside. Your examination proved that there was no sign of a lock having been tampered with. Precisely. And he drank the poison from this glass here by the bed. Yes, I'd say that there's been nothing in this glass but strychnine and water. Hello. What's this on the carpet? Looks like a piece of clay. It is. And it bears the imprint of a heel. From a man's boot. Look at the size. And observe the color of the clay, Watson. This particular specimen is quite rare. I shall take it back to Baker Street and examine it. I can't see any logic in this case, Holmes. After all, people terrified of murder don't go committing suicide. Patience, old fellow. I'm convinced that this is one case where an R in the laboratory may aid the solution more than all the logic in the world. Well, Holmes, what do your tests with the microscope tell you? First of all, that the glass contained nothing but strychnine and water. And nobody could drink that without knowing it. That proves that it was suicide. Not necessarily, Watson. I've also tested the clay. In addition to being a very rare clay, it's oddly impregnated with certain acids and chemicals, exactly as it might be if a doctor picked it up on his heel outside his house and later went into his laboratory. A doctor? That would explain the poison. Exactly. Jenkins was under his doctor's care. Supposing the physician prescribed a draft to be taken on retiring... Why question its peculiarly bitter taste? Jenkins was a frightened man. Undoubtedly, he bolted and locked his door last night and then, trustingly, drank the fatal poison. All of which points to Dr. Stanley. Quite. But I don't understand it. He had a motive for murdering Sir Roderick, and Sir Roderick had a motive for murdering Jenkins. But all the evidence points to the fact that Dr. Stanley murdered Jenkins. It doesn't make any sense. But it does, Watson. Precise, accurate, and terrifying sense. We must return to Sir Roderick's house at once. There's not a moment to be lost. Holmes, you and your friend here are positively pachydermatous. Twice I've told you to mind your own business, and yet you come back for more insults. Am I to assume that you find my personal charm so utterly irresistible? On the contrary, sir, you can assume that your personal charm utterly escapes us. Sir Roderick, the only reason we've returned is because I'm convinced you're in grave danger. As I told you before, Holmes, I'm eminently capable of taking care of myself. In any case, I'm expecting Dr. Stanley, my physician, here in a few minutes. Sir Roderick, by all you hold sacred... I hold nothing sacred, Holmes, save human life. By which, of course, I mean my own. Then, for the sake of your own life, sir, allow us to slip behind that tapestry while your doctor visits you. Behind the arras, eh? <laughs> the proper place for rats, if I remember my Hamlet correctly. Oh, that's undoubtedly the doctor now. Then please let us hide. You won't regret it, I promise you. Very well, you may hide. Scurry away. Come on, Watson. Right, you're home. Come in. Roderick, I had to see you. Yes, so it would appear... Sylvia, if you have to come making dramatic entrances in my house at an hour that virtually represents the crack of dawn, I do wish you'd take a little more pains with your ensemble. Roderick, you... Your dress is only suitable for tea and crumpets with the vicar's wife at Tooting Beck. Oh, Roderick, stop trying to be facetious. I came here because I had to talk to you before David got here. Well, I'm expecting him at any moment. Yes, I know that. You're his closest friend, Roderick, 
You've got to do something for him. He's ill. He's mentally unbalanced. All he thinks about and talks about and dreams about is Angela. He's even composed a horrible piece of music that he calls... Sylvia! David! What are you doing here? Everyone's being extraordinarily melodramatic this morning. It's a pity, David, but you have not caught your wife and me in a compromising situation. Uh, chiefly, I admit, because I find her somewhat uh, colorless. Roderick, how dare you? I suggest you? that you leave us, my dear. You! Uh, you! I believe the word you're groping for is beast. You beast! Hmm. Roderick, you put up a convincing caricature of being the inhuman man of the world. But if people only knew how you'd stood by me during the past year... Now, 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 David, this has been a most emotional morning. For heaven's sake, don't you become lachrymose. I'm not. I'm just saying that if you hadn't stood by me since Angela's death, I don't know what I'd have done. You'd probably been back on your feet long before this, but uh, you came here this morning in your uh, professional capacity, David. Yes, yes, I know, Roderick. How are you feeling? Hmm. I... Uh... Don't like your color. I don't like my symptoms. I can't sleep. My nerves have been more than usually on edge for the past three weeks, David. You promised me some medicine, you know. Uh, I brought it with me. It's in my bag here. Uh, you have a glass and some water? Yes, on the sideboard. Though. Good. Well, this will steady you up quite a bit. Now I add a little water. So, uh, here you are, Roderick. Drink this. I wouldn't, Sir Roderick. It won't do much good to the only thing you hold sacred. Sherlock Holmes. What are you doing here? Your opening conversation begins to become somewhat monotonous, Dr. Stanley. I'm here because I don't like to see murder committed, even Sir Roderick. You mean that Dr. Stanley just tried to poison him? Certainly. Just as he poisoned the butler, Jenkins. Mr. Why? Holmes, he has no motive. I tried to protect Jenkins against Sir Roderick. I was stupid enough not to see the other motive at first. Uh, riddles are fascinating, Holmes, but not when they become personal. What are you talking about? It's a simple equation, Sir Roderick. Dr. Stanley attended Jenkins during his bout of enteric. He told us himself that the butler was delirious. It was then that he must have learned Jenkins' secret, that Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Sir Roderick was responsible for Angela's suicide. Logically, he had to die first. But I still don't see that... Dr. Stanley does, despite his silence. Jenkins was the only human being who knew that Dr. Stanley had a motive for killing Sir Roderick. This is very melodramatic, Holmes, but I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Nor have I, except that you seem to be laboring under the delusion that I killed Jenkins. Of course you did. You had to, before you could kill Sir Roderick. Had Jenkins lived, he would have been suspicious of his master's death. But if he were out of the way, no one would have connected Sir Roderick's close friend and physician with his murder. The cellar stairs attempt failed. But last night's poison did not. And now he's trying to repeat the pattern. The glass over there contains strychnine and water. Of course it does. I assure you, this medicine is perfectly harmless. To prove it, I shall drink it myself. Stop him, Watson. Put that down. Put it down, I say. It's too late. That was meant for you, Roderick. It was too good for you. Considering the way you treated my sister, Angela... Angel. He's dead, Holmes. Yes. And you, Sir Roderick, have escaped a brother's vengeance. I'm almost sorry that I insisted on trying to save your wretched life. Well, just because you have saved it, don't expect anything as conventional as thanks or remorse. My only regret is that during the past few minutes, you've enjoyed an experience granted to very few men on this earth. And what is that, may I ask? You have seen me speechless. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Ladies, here's some very important beauty advice from some of the world's most divinely beautiful women, Powers Models, girls who are famous for their shining, bright, lustrous hair. Powers Models wash their hair with cremel shampoo, this amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair simply abundant with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. And doesn't Cremel shampoo do a wonderful cleaning job on your scalp? Removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Yes, and it's wonderful to soften dry, brittle ends. Cremel shampoo leaves your hair so much softer, silkier with a satin smoothness. Your hair holds a wave better, too. 
So, ladies, buy a bottle of glamorizing cremel shampoo at any drug counter and see how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of beauty. How easy it is now to have naturally lustrous, glossy hair. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you about the greatest shock that Sherlock Holmes ever gave me. Well, that must have been quite a shock, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell. I call it The Adventure of the Dying Detective. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plan. The music was composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the dying detective. <laughs> ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our old friend and genial host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As you can see, I'm quite ready for you. A crackling fire in the grate, some port in the decanter over there, and although I smoke a pipe myself, I think you'll find those cigars rather special. All the fixings for a session of storytelling, eh, Dr. Watson? Well, which particular Sherlock Holmes adventure have you selected for tonight? The story that I call The Strange Case of the Persecuted Millionaire. It sounds promising. In some respects, my boy, I think it was one of the one of the oddest adventures that we ever had. It was a case in which Sherlock Holmes narrowly prevented a shocking tragedy, and yet, at the conclusion of the affair, he appeared in a most unusual role. The role of a rather lean and elderly Cupid. This I've got to hear. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? Of course not, Mr. Bell, of course not. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kreml Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every lock in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster, yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kreml. If you're using some other hair dressing... Change to Kreml. Just see if your hair doesn't look much better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I want to hear about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in Baker Street on a gray November day at the turn of the century. Sherlock Holmes and I had just finished our lunch, I remember, and were sitting each side of a blazing fire just like you and I are tonight. The great man, his feet thrust out before him, was lying back in his chair, his long, thin hands locked behind his head, and a curved pipe jutting out the corner of his mouth was emitting great clouds of grey-blue smoke. After a few moments, I noticed that he was gazing at my boots with very marked attention. But why Turkish, Watson? The boots are English. I got them at Latimer's in Oxford Street. And not the boots, the bath. Why the relaxing and expensive Turkish bath rather than the invigorating homemade article? Well, because for the last few days I've been having some nasty twinges of rheumatism. 
By the way, I'm sure the connection between my boots and the Turkish path is perfectly obvious to you, Holmes, but uh, I'm completely mystified. You're in the habit of doing up your boots in a certain way. I observe that on this occasion they're tied in a double bow. You have, therefore, had them off. Who has retied them? A bootmaker or the boy at the Turkish bath? But your boots are nearly new. Then what remains? The bath. Absurdly simple, isn't it? <laughs> when you explain it... Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? It's a note for you, Mr. Holmes. A messenger boy just brought it. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Who's it from, Holmes? I swear that only reigning royalty can be as presumptuous as an American businessman. Read it for yourself. I shall be at your lodgings at two tomorrow. Be there. And it's signed John V. Harden. Be there. Huh. Sounds an extremely arrogant fellow. What makes you think that he's an American? The use of the initial for the middle name is peculiar to that country. Oh. I do. It's, it's nearly two o'clock now, Holmes. Yes. Let's see what we can find out about the gentleman. Where's that Cyclopedia of American Biography? Ah, here it is. H-H-A. Hanley, Hanson, Harden. Here's our man, Watson. John Vincent Harden. What does it say about him? Born in Chicago, 45 years old, unmarried. Chiefly noted for his tremendous tobacco interests and his addiction to fishing. It's an odd combination. And this is odder. He made his professional debut as a violinist 30 years ago. A millionaire musician. Ah, that must be him now. Yes, there's a most impressive broom and pair outside. Then, since my client is a violinist, I think I'll welcome him appropriately. Hand me my instrument, will you, old chap? Uh, uh, Holmes, funny way to start a business interview, I must say. Uh, Mr. Harden sounds like an aggressive man. <laughs> and uh, music hath charms to soothe. Come in. Mr. Harden to see you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Come in, Mr. Harden. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? The way to do business, Mr. Holmes, for heaven's sake, put that violin away. I heard you scraping away as I came up the stairs. <laughs> so you, you don't care for my friend's playing, sir? <laughs> I don't care for anyone's playing. I loathe the fiddle. Curious. I was under the impression... Listen, that... Mr. Holmes, I haven't come here to discuss your musical impressions. I've come here to talk about my personal safety and my sanity. Then pray talk about it, Mr. Harden. I'm being persecuted. Somebody's trying to drive me crazy. Oh, really? Just what form does this persecution take, Mr. Harden? Yeah, it began about a month ago. My horse ran away in Rotten Row and threw me. Maybe it was an accident, maybe not. I've heard of burrs under saddles. And then, last night... Something else happened? Someone destroyed Methuselah. Methuselah? An old retainer of yours, Mr. Harden? Or a pet? No. Methuselah was the finest, largest, oldest tarpon ever caught. A stuffed fish? You ask Sherlock Holmes? Quiet, well, Watson. Well, 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 I'm uh, sure that a great deal more <laughs> lies behind this. Please continue, Mr. Harden. Everything was going fine, Mr. Holmes, until these persecutions started. Early this year, I bought a fine old house in Cavendish Place. I'm engaged to be married to Alicia Edwards, uh, the Honorable Alicia Edwards. She's Lord Brentwood's daughter. My life was perfect until I began to get these notes. What sort of notes, Mr. Harden? Uh, they kept turning up in odd places, in my coat pockets, under my pillows at night. I found them on the upholstery of my carriage. You brought these notes with you? Of course. Hmm... All in the same handwriting, and all the messages seem to have the same theme. Oh, what do they say, Holmes? The first one says, You thought he had no one to avenge him, didn't you? And this one says, You murdered him, you will pay for it. And this is curious. It will have blood. They say, Blood will have blood. That quotation is from Macbeth. Oh, then that means the note was written by an Englishman. Not necessarily, Watson. It's possible that they've heard of Shakespeare in America, you know. Oh, I suppose they might have. Mr. Harden, all these messages threaten your death. Can you think of anyone who might wish to kill you? No, I can't. I've never heard anyone, much less killed a person. The notes don't make any sense. Do you recognize the handwriting? 
I've never seen it before in my life. You mentioned that your prized tartan was mutilated. What members of your household might have had the opportunity of performing that uh, act of vandalism? Mm, three people. My secretary, Margaret Bates, Stephen, my brother, and my fiancée. They were all at the house last night. There seems to be a clear pattern to this case, Mr. Harden. I suggest that you return to your home and obtain for me samples of the handwriting of the three people you've mentioned. When I've examined those, I shall be in a better position to advise you in this matter. Holmes, you've spent three hours with a magnifying glass and those samples of handwriting that Mr. Harden brought back. Have you found a clue? Nothing positive, Watson. It's quite curious... The handwriting of the threatening note seems to be that of a male with an American education. Oh, why do you say that? Observe this note. Who dies unavenged can never sleep with honor. You'll notice that honor is spelt without a U. That's the American way. Then that means that his fiancée didn't write him. She might have deliberately spelt it that way to remove suspicion from herself. No, I'm afraid these samples prove nothing. Then we're no nearer finding out who's responsible. Well, at least we've ruled out an obvious possibility. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson. It's a telegram, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Better get your coat and hat, Watson. It's from Mr. Harden? Yes. He says, a worse blow has fallen. Come at once. I'm Margaret Bates, Mr. Harden's secretary. How do you do? How do, you do? What happened, Miss Bates? We left as soon as we received his wire. I don't know what happened, Mr. Holmes, but I'm terribly worried. He rushed out here, dictated that telegram, and then went back and locked himself in the study. He says he'll see no one but you. Hello, Margaret. Oh, Stephen, you startled me. What's the matter? Do you think I was listening at the keyhole? Oh. Introduce me to our visitors, won't you? This is Stephen, Mr. Harden's brother. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Hello. Sherlock Holmes and his friend, huh? I've heard about you. Don't tell me Brother John has fallen foul of the law. No, sir. He needs its protection, I fear. <laughs> Don't be too sure. I'm thinking of taking him to court myself on a charge of woman stealing. Your brother a kidnapper? Great Scott. No, no, Dr. Watson. It's perfectly legal. It's just that I saw Alicia Edwards first, but then, of course... I don't control the hardened millions. Let's go to the study, shall we, Mr. Holmes? An excellent idea. Perhaps we'll see you later, sir. Perhaps. And don't take John too seriously. Oh, he's hateful. Always making fun of John, uh, his brother. And yet Stephen's never done a day's work in his life. This is the door to the study. Who is it? Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson are here. Go ahead, go ahead. Come in. Thank you, Margaret. I'll see you gentlemen later. What form did the new attack take, Mr. Harden? This time it's theft. My safe was rifled last night. What was stolen, sir? An extremely valuable document. It was the key to my agreement with the British Tobacco Trust. The loss of the paper will represent a million dollars to me. But that isn't what upsets me most. Money I can afford to lose, but my sanity is more valuable. In the safe, I found another note, Holmes. May I see it, please? Here. Hmm. The coffin is made, the funeral parlor is ready, the time is ripe. The croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Good Lord, what a frightening message. And once again observe the odd combination of Shakespeare and American idiom. Funeral parlor is what we refer to as an undertaker's, and the croaking raven comes from Hamlet. Holmes, I'm not a weak man, but I'm frightened. You've got to protect me. I shall do my best, Mr. Harden. Who was here last night? My secretary, Margaret Bates. My fiancé. She went back to London this morning. I uh, met your brother, Stephen, just now. I noticed that he was carrying a valise. Was he leaving the house or returning to it? Returning. He went out of town last night. Oh, then that rules him out. Not until we investigate his alibi, Watson. Mr. Harden... I'm a constant and thorough reader of the Times. The engagement of a peer's daughter to a prominent American would be striking news. And uh, yet I've read nothing about it. We're announcing it formally tomorrow. 
I'm giving a party at Claridge's to celebrate the event. Then I think it would be a wise precaution if Dr. Watson and I attended that party. I was about to suggest the same thing, Holmes. I need to have men about me I can trust. I think this is a deliberate plot to drive me mad. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I want you to meet my fiance, Miss Alicia Edwards. Alicia, my dear. Yes, John. I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you How do? do? You? May I congratulate you on your engagement? Yes, indeed. A union between the old world and the new is an encouraging sign of the times. I wish you could convince Papa that, Mr. Holmes. Whenever he meets John, he always behaves as if he expected him to be wearing feathers and carrying a scalping knife. <laughs> feathers and a knife. That's very funny. <laughs> I don't find it so. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. I want to talk to the officer. Dear me, now I've upset John again. He's ridiculously sensitive. Americans are really rather touchy. And yet you're going to marry one? Papa's estates have eaten up a lot of money. And that's a commodity with which John seems well endowed. I think you understand me, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure I do. Personally, I may say that I'm always glad to meet an American. I'm one of those who believes that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far-gone years should not now stand between two nations... Mr. Holmes, I find you pompous and dull. Goodbye. Oh, my soul, what an unpleasant, heartless young woman. She's obviously marrying Harden for his money. Obviously. Though I don't think she has an aversion to uh, all Americans. Oh? Why do you say that? She has been dancing with Mr. Harden's brother, Stephen, most of the evening. At this moment, he joined her at the door, and uh, they're leaving together. Wait, Scott, you think that the... Uh, Carolyn, I don't understand for this. Hello. What's happening up there on the orchestra? John Harden, he's arguing with one of the violinists. A musician. I won't take any more of it. Look, look. He snatched the instrument out of his hand. Ah, oh, get out of here. You're not fit to fiddle in an Irish wake. Out with you. The rest of you, go on and play. Holmes. He's behaving like a madman. He's rushing after the musician and brandishing the violin as if he's, as if he's going to brain him with it. Yes, Watson. But that quarrel with the violinist was not a totally sane act. If the anonymous correspondent's motive is to undermine Harden's reason, he may be succeeding. But who has a motive? It might be the brother, Stephen. He's obviously jealous of the girl. And he probably is next in line for the Harden millions. But I checked his alibi for last night. He was out of town. Stop the music! Stop, hey! What the devil's wrong now? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Here I am, Mr. Harden. Well, come with me at once. What's wrong, sir? It's Alicia. I found her in the car, though. She's been strangled. In just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Hair specialists constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of this highly specialized Kremel hair tonic? Kremel contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated, as fresh as a daisy. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men... Take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair. For a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so the Honorable Alicia Edwards had been strangled at her engagement party. 
What happened next? Well, I applied first aid, Mr. Bell, and found that the girl was not dead. We rushed her to the hospital, and a few hours later, we were able to talk to her, and, uh, but we found that she could give us no clue. <clears throat> when we left the room, Harden was waiting for us in the corridor. How is she? Is she going to be all right? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Harden. She'll be all right, but she's... She had a very narrow escape. But why attack her? Why not me? The pattern becomes increasingly clear, Mr. Harden. Your enemy has struck at your fishing, your business, and now at your fiancé. So every blow is at your wealth and position. And my sanity. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find out who's behind all this. On the occasion of the mutilation of the fish, three people have the opportunity. Your brother Stephen is clear on the second attack, and on this last one, I think we may reasonably assume that your fiancé did not strangle herself. Yes, I'll wager my medical reputation on that fact. And that means that only one person who was present on all three occasions was... No, you, you can't mean... Your secretary, Miss Bates? Where is she? In the waiting room. Splendid. Then Dr. Watson and I will take her back to Baker Street. I have an idea that she can be of invaluable help to us. A little more tea, Miss Bates? No, thank you, Dr. Watson. Then please go on with your story. As I was saying, Mr. Holmes, I've known John, Mr. Harden, all my life. My father was the Harden coachman. And as I grew up, I thought John Vincent Harden was the most wonderful man in the world. Well, I imagine that he was quite different then, my dear. Very different. He was young and romantic, and he loved music. He took violin lessons, and it turned out that he was a prodigy. I understand that he made his professional debut at the age of 13. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I was only a little girl then. But he used to tell me that he wasn't John Vincent Harden, the heir to the tobacco millions. He was Giovanni Vincenti, the great violinist. Giovanni Vincenti? Odd. Uh, pray continue, Miss Bates. For five years, it seemed that he would be a great musician. Then... On his 18th birthday, his father gave him a lecture on his family obligations, told him that it was his duty to go into the business. John broke his violin across his knee, Mr. Holmes, and he's never played since. Miss Bates, I don't need to be a detective to deduce that you, uh, that you love him. Of course I do. Or at least I love Giovanni Vincenti. And maybe he's still there. Somehow. Somewhere. Of course. I've been an idiot. A numbskull. What do you mean, Holmes? The case is solved. Come, Miss Bates. We must return to Mr. Harden as fast as we can. I only hope we're not too late. But why doesn't he answer? The servant said he locked himself in the study again. The yeah, door's locked. I don't like the look of this. Oh. Come on, Watson. We'll break it in. Once more. Oh! Look! He's lying crumpled over his desk. There's a revolver beside him, Holmes. Oh. Miss Bates, please leave us. Oh. My friend's a doctor. He'll take care of him. He's only wounded. Yes, it's just grazed his scalp. Oh, thank heavens. I'll be waiting outside. Well, obviously, this was attempted suicide. They finally succeeded in driving him mad. Did they? Read this note lying here. It's in the same handwriting as the other messages. I might try to fool another detective, but not you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I admit I shot John Vincent Harden. I'm sure you'll have no difficulty discovering how I escaped from a locked room. Good Lord. You'll observe that the note was written and blotted on this desk. Watson, I'll see to getting Mr. Harden to bed and summoning his own doctor. I want you to return to Baker Street. To Baker Street? Why? Though the case is solved, I have some heavy thinking to do. And I must do it here. So be a good fellow and go back to our lodgings and get me two ounces of shag tobacco and uh, my violin. How are you feeling now, Mr. Harden? Weak, Holmes. But I'm all right. You still can't remember anything, sir? No, uh... I felt half out of my mind since that attack was made on Alicia. They told me she'd be all right. I, I do faintly remember coming home from the hospital and locking myself in the study. Oh, the rest is a blank. Well, 
What did happen, Mr. Holmes? I'll give you the complete answer very shortly, Mr. Harden. Come on, Watson. Very well. Try and rest, Mr. Harden. You've been through quite an ordeal. I'll try, Doctor. I'll try. Holmes, you left your violin in Harden's room. Did you mean to? I meant to. And in the meanwhile, we must talk more seriously to Miss Bates. Well, she's down here in the sitting room. Yes. Yes, I have. And Brother Stevens you with to her. Be the first to know the good news, Margaret. And may we inquire what the good news is, sir? Oh, didn't see you fellas coming down the stairs. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't hear it, too. I've just come from the hospital. Alicia's broken off her engagement to John. She's going to marry me. Indeed. My congratulations. Yes, sir, but I suggest you don't tell your brother the news. He's a very sick man. Oh, I won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to celebrate. From the sparkle in your eye, Miss Bates, I can see that you're just as excited as Stevens is. Of course I am. But tell me, Mr. Holmes, have you found out who attacked John? Yes, Miss Bates. At last, I know the name of Mr. John Vincent Harden's enemy. On the incident of the mutilated fish, you or Stephen... Or Alicia might have been guilty. On the stolen document, you or Alicia. And on the attack on that lady, you or Stephen. Which seemed to leave only you. But I was having tea with both of you in Baker Street when John was shot. Precisely. As perfect an alibi as I've ever known. Then no one person was responsible. There must have been accomplices. No, Watson. Oh, sir. Remember another fact. The note, supposedly written after the attempted murder was blotted at the very desk which the wounded man was slumped over. Isn't it clear? Frankly, no. The persecutor and the would-be murderer of John Vincent Harden is Giovanni Vincenti. <gasps> but they're one and the same man. Miss Bates told us so. They were the same man. But Harden forced the dominant part of his character into annihilation. When he destroyed his violin, he thought he had destroyed Giovanni Vincenti. But his alter ego was still dormant. Yes. And after the shock of the riding accident in Rotten Row... Giovanni Vincenti emerged, hunting for revenge. You mean that poor John really has a dual personality, Mr. Holmes? Yes, my dear. No one person seemed to have the opportunity of committing all the attacks. But we left one person off our list. John Vincent Harden himself. But why, Holmes? For heaven's sake, why? Giovanni Vincenti struck at the fish, the document, and at the fiancé. All symbols of what Harden had gained for himself. Finally, he attacked Harden's life. But, Mr. Holmes, what will happen now? He's out of his mind, but they won't send him to an asylum, will they? I think not, Miss Bates. There's a possibility that this second shock, this uh, self-inflicted wound on the skull, may cure him. Uh, don't you agree, Watson? Yes, I do. It's perfectly <sighs> possible there'll be a complete reintegration of personality. Listen. It's John. And he hasn't touched a violin for ages. So that's why you left your violin in his room, Holmes. Exactly. Now, Giovanni Vincenti and John Vincent Harden are again one man. One whole and sound man. I trust he may create a new life for himself. And I'm convinced that he has here the woman who will help him. <laughs> Ladies, you certainly must notice how men are attracted by bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair. Then why not follow this beauty tip from the famous Million Dollar Powers Models, girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers Models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural, radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness, hair shimmering with natural brilliant luster. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I'll tell you about one of the most exciting adventures that Holmes and I ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Haunted Bagpipes. Haunted Bagpipes, huh? Where did you hear them? In Edinburgh, Mr. Bell. In the same room with 
three naked corpses. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Solitary Cyclist. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the haunted bagpipes. This is Boy Scout Week. Let's all back our scouts and their themes. Scouts of the world, building for tomorrow. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, here we are once more in Dr. Watson's study. And maybe we're not glad to get here. If we hadn't had a Sherlock Holmes story waiting for us at the other end, we'd have never ventured out on a night like this. Uh, pretty bad weather out, eh, eh, Mr. Bell? Indeed it is, Dr. Watson. There's a cold wind that chills you to the bone. I had one hand holding my coat collar and the other holding my hat all the way over. I felt as though some malignant deity were determined to keep me from reaching your door. You hear that wind? Hmm. Reminds me of what I just escaped from. Oh, it's typical Edinburgh weather, Mr. Bell. Perhaps you've heard that there's no language richer in terms of reproach against the howling wind than the Scots, darling. Snell, Bly, Nerle, Scouthering, to mention just a handful. All of them words that carry a shiver with them. Yes, as Stevenson so aptly puts it, Edinburgh pays cruelly for our high seat and commanding views in one of the vilest climates under heaven. She's liable to be beaten upon by all the winds that blow. To be drenched with rain, to be buried in cold sea fogs out of the east, and powdered with the snow as it comes flying southward from the highland hills. The weather is raw and boisterous in winter, shifty and ungenial in summer, and a downright purgatory in the spring. It sounds like a pretty unattractive place, Dr. Watson. Well, there you're entirely wrong, Mr. Bell. Nowhere will you find such stark magnificence, such grim beauty. Edinburgh, the great granite sphinx of the north, Crouching high on a towering rock, looking across the intervening plains to the waters of the Forth and to the North Sea. Fascinating, regal, splendid, and cruel. Yes, I think this is just the night to tell the story of the haunted bagpipes. One of the weirdest and most gruesome adventures that Holmes and I ever shared. The setting was Edinburgh. And the motivating character, Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty, the man Holmes called the Napoleon of crime. Exactly. I wondered when we were going to have another of your famous bouts with Professor Moriarty. They're always pretty hair-raising. Yes, and I think I can safely promise you that this is the most hair-raising of the lot. In fact, it's so unbelievably macabre and gruesome that I've never told it to any but to my closest friends, those who know that I'm a truthful man. In fact, sometimes, in the same light of day, I doubt myself that this adventure really happened. But a night like this brings it all back to me in all its horror. Yes, Mr. Bell, on a night like this we realize that anything is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Watson begins his story, men, I have a friend who used to comb his hair with water. After the water dried, his hair would get out of place and he didn't look neatly groomed. Well, I ran into him last Saturday and he said he'd heard me talking about Kremel hair tonic and decided to try it. He should see the big improvement Kreml made in his appearance. Why, he looked like a different man. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps every hair in place all day, just as you combed it in the morning. Kreml gives hair a healthy-looking luster, too. 
Yet it never leaves hair feeling greasy or dirty like some of those sticky preparations you want to wash right out. Kremel always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. It always gives hair such a clean-cut, prosperous appearance. Why not try it? Spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, won't you please go on with the story? The shivers run up and down my spine in anticipation. Well, I certainly will. As I look back on that particular visit to Edinburgh, it seems that a cold fear settled into the very marrow of my bones from the moment we got off the train late one winter afternoon and caught our first glimpse of Edinburgh Castle rising bleak and menacing out of a cloud of fog and rain. There it is, Watson, in all its austere majesty, Edinburgh Castle. <laughs> nice, impressive pile of stone. Nice and grim. No grimmer than its history, Watson. Part castle, part fortress, part prison. Wars have been plotted there. Dancing has lasted deep into the night. Murder has been done in its chambers. Oh, well, this is no time to stand here chatting. Let's get out in the, out this confounded rain. Rain, Watson? You are getting soft. This isn't rain, it's just a good scotch mist. Mist, my, my grandmother. I'm, I'm soaked to the skin and my, my teeth are chattering like castanets. Thank heaven the town has a, has a few modern hotels. A nice hot toddy at the Royal, eh? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Watson, but this is not a pleasure trip. We must uh, forego the luxuries of Princess Street and take up our quarters in the old town. The old town? Holmes, you mean that we're going to live in one of those crumbling grey stone houses all huddled together on the slope leading up to the castle? Exactly. Why, they're nothing but tenements. Those lands, as they're called, once housed the flower of the Scottish nobility. In the old days, this was a walled city, and space was at a premium. That is why those crazy buildings tower eight and ten stories into the yes, air. Yes, the days of the nobility are over. Those tenements are full of goodness knows what. True. What more suitable dwelling place could one imagine for our friend, Professor Moriarty? Professor Moriarty? Quite. You may have noticed, Watson, that London has been singularly free from crime during the last few months. And for a very good reason. Professor Moriarty was not in residence. Oh, you mean that you think we've succeeded in driving him out? No, Watson. Let us not underrate the professor. He is not in London because he has business elsewhere. But where? I confess I was in complete ignorance until the day before yesterday morning when I received a telegram informing me that one of Moriarty's chief assistants had been seen prowling through the graves at Greyfriars. Then I remembered that Professor Moriarty has a particular reason for hating Edinburgh. He's not a man to forget his grudges, Watson. The question is, shall we be in time to prevent his revenge? But here, get into this cab before you catch pneumonia. Professor Moriarty in Edinburgh. Huh. I thought the place looked even more forbidding than usual. Oh, cabby. Let us out in front of St. Giles. Ah, hi. I say, Holmes, why St. Giles? You're not going in for sightseeing this time of day? No, Watson. We must go from there on by foot, I'm afraid. By foot in this weather? The gutters are fairly running with muddy water. Oh, uh, no one asked you to walk in the gutters, Watson. Here you be. St. Giles. And so it is. Come along, Watson. Oh, gracious me, this rain. I say, Cabby, where's Hangman's Lane from here? Lush, you'll no be going there. Why not? It's where we hope to spend the night. Tis an unchancy spot, gentlemen. You'll no find me going up Hangman's Lane after dark. As bad as that, huh? I'll no stand here arguing with you. It's the first land back of the kirk, if you must go. Thanks. Here, drink to our health. A horn. There you stand, two fine upstanding gentlemen, hale and hearty, with a black shadow of death looking over your shoulder. What sort of death was Ah, well, then I say I didn't warn you. Come along, Beatrice. Hmm, cheerful individual. Holmes, what do you say? Let's go back and spend the night at a good hotel. We can't possibly find any lodgings in a place like Hangman's Lane. But we shall, Watson, we shall. They're expecting us. Come along. What do you mean, they're expecting us? I mean the owner of most of the tenements in Hangman's Lane has arranged that we should be taken care of. 
He is uh, most anxious to have us inspect his property. Oh, very well, but I don't see what that has got to do with our search for Professor Moriarty. Whenever anything curious and inexplicable happens in the professor's neighborhood, the chances are he's mixed up in it. Ah, here's Hangman's Lane. Narrow, steep little byway, eh, Watson? I don't like it, Holmes. No lights in any of the windows. Usually these tall houses are overrun with inhabitants. Several flam- families to, to a floor. Look, look, the buildings in this street look positively deserted. They are deserted, Watson. That's the most interesting part of it. Oh, really? One particular house hasn't been open for several hundred years. But during the last month, the rest of the tenements have been vacated too. Their inhabitants have fled from them like rats from a sinking ship. The rents have been lowered to the vanishing point and still there are no takers. The people hereabouts seem to think the whole street is haunted. Haunted? Uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't we come up here and look the place over in the daytime, Holmes? Look, already the, the light's beginning to fade. Unfortunately, Watson, the phenomena we're going to investigate occur only at night. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Ah, here's the house we're staying. There should be a bell somewhere. Yes. Well, perhaps there isn't anyone to let us in. I think there will be, Watson. Yes, I hear footsteps. Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, the Lord be thanked. One moment, gentlemen. I'll unbar the door. Oh, be pleased to enter. Go ahead, Watson. Good Lord, it's dark in here. And if you'll kindly step this way, there's a bra blazer burning and candles lit in the back parlor. Oh, the canny gentleman. This corridor is not so smooth as once it was. Yes, I discovered. Yeah, this is the place. Please send her. Oh, well, this is more like it, eh, Holmes? What a magnificent old room. Just look at that fireplace. Aye. For once a blight bit this old house. Full of lords and their ladies, they say. But here, gentlemen, will you be standing in front of the fire and dry on your bricks? Not a bad idea. We're pretty wet, eh, Watson? <clears throat> wet? There's a brandy on the shell of your what now we drop it. A tasty cockle pie in the pot. And no, if you'll forgive me, I'm on shank my cellar. I'm going so soon. But uh, we've just arrived. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I dare not stay at the sundown. I'm late to let you alone, but I dare not stay. But in a fashion cell, I'll return the morn early. But what is there to be afraid of? The neighbors. Neighbors? Aye, the neighbors in the old hurly host other side of this wall. But no one has lived in that house next door for years. Not humans, no. No living man has crossed the door staying this hundred year. But there be others. Ogles. You can hear the rattle of their going and coming every night through the wall. Have you ever heard these ghosts, or bogles, as you call them? No, I certainly have not. I will not stay at the sundown. But the bogles, there's no the worst of it. Really? Aye. The times you can hear the sound of doodling. Sound of bagpipes, eh? Aye. And that's when they be entertaining old horny yourself. The devil himself? Aye. Hmm. The ghosts next door move in very high society, eh, Watson? Ah! What, what, what was that? Just the wind in the chimney. I would have swore with the devil's total sucker. No, I don't think so. I'll not be waiting to find out. When the skirling begins, this is the house that sell dirge like it was singing a dirge. Good night, gentlemen, and God help you. I say. Oh, she was frightened, all right. I wish that chimney would stop moaning. But those two legends... The house next door and the haunted bagpipes. They're famous Edinburgh superstitions. I'd like to hear more about them. Well, I've heard more than I want to already. Confound that chimney. That building next door is one of the so-called fatal houses. Fatal houses? Houses marked generations ago by the Great Plague. Discipline in the time of pestilence was sharp and sudden. The houses having the disease were marked by a large cross. No one dared enter or leave. Furniture was destroyed and houses sealed up. In those houses, of which one or two still remain, the plague is supposed to lie ambushed like a basilisk, ready to escape and spread sickness and death through the city once the doors are open. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Holmes, ridiculous. Germs can't sustain themselves like that. Oh, at least we've no medical evidence that they can. Oh, we'd gone to an hotel. 
The other legend is not quite so gruesome. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. It's about a secret passage that is supposed to have existed in the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, between Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace, which uh, lies at the other end of town. About a century and a half ago, a piper made a bet that he could walk the length of it. He started at the castle, piping merrily. The crowds were able to follow him through the streets above by the sound of the skirling. Everything was going smoothly. They followed the sound down from the castle along the top of the hill. Just about here, the piping stopped suddenly in the middle of a note. And that was the last that was ever heard of the piper. Noxious gas, most probably. Uh, some say the devil was so captivated by his playing that he carried him off to hell. Well, what of it? As long as he stays there and doesn't go about waking up the neighbors? Uh, but that's just what he has been doing for the last month or so. Oh, nonsense. It's just a, a noisy chimney like this one. Why should a ghost who's kept quiet for over a hundred years suddenly decide to return and annoy people? That, my dear Watson, is what I'm anxious to find out. Holmes. Holmes. Do you hear that? By Jove. Then it's more than just a superstition. Holmes, it's a, it's a piper. The devil's bagpiper. He's playing in the house next door. Splendid. Well, what are we going to do? Want me to inform the authorities? And have them put the devil in jail? No, Watson, I have a better plan. I suggest we go over and call on the old gentleman himself. In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in the mysterious house next door. Men, if you're wise, you'll start right away and take better care of the hair you've got. Remember, handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. So why be content with just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? This highly specialized hair tonic goes in for modern, natural-looking hair grooming. It keeps hair perfectly groomed all day long, looking so neat and attractive yet never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And at the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and tingling. And if your hair breaks off and falls when you comb it because it's so dry, use Kremel, which actually helps condition hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. And since Kremel is never sticky or gummy and because it's such a nice, clean product, you can use it every day and your hair will always look its very best. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. K R E M L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the ghostly bagpiper? Did Holmes no, ever. No, no, really... no, not so fast, Mr. Bell. Holmes insisted that we investigate the house next door at once. And I must admit that it was with some misgivings. I followed him into the street. Come along, Watson. Oh, another little bit of local superstition I forgot to mention. They say that the corpses of people who died here of the plague sometimes come to life and wander about the house. Holmes, I wish you wouldn't talk like that. Oh, this, this sleet cutting into my face like a knife. Oh, here's the doorway. I'll find out if the key still works. Yes, it looks more like a crowbar than a key. I only hope the lock isn't too rusty. Hmm. Won't budge. Thank heaven. Let's go back. Oh, give me that oil can. Perhaps a few drops of oil. There you are. Ah, confound this lock. No good trying to break the door in. It's as solid as Gibraltar. A good deal more solid than the house itself, judging by that long crack over the archway up there. Hmm, yes, that is a crack. The building is settling, Watson. That crack... Hello, I've turned the key. Lock's decided to work. Ah, the door sticks now. Hinges rusty. Come on, Watson, get your back into it. Uh, it's, it's moving, Holmes. Yes, so is that crack. Hurry, help me close the door before the archway falls on us. Huh. Isn't it quiet? Can't even hear the wind. It smells like a tomb. Yes, but there's something else. Something unhealthy. Like a disease I smelt once in the tropics. Oh, you don't think it's true that the plague is still... Uh... Nonsense. You yourself said it wasn't possible. Better light that dark lantern we brought along. Yes, indeed. I hate pumping about in the dark. Uh, I can't say that it's much more cheerful in the light. Look at those great dirty cobwebs. 
That old tapestry hanging in shreds. Yes, nothing has been moved since the plague first touched the house. Look there in that room. That old oak table set for a meal. One of the goblets overturned. It gives me the creeps up and down my spine. Nothing else of interest here. Let's get on to the next room. How hollow uh, our footsteps sound. Yes. This must have been the living room of the house. Ashes of a bygone fire still on the hearth. Holmes. Holmes. Look. There's some people seated in those chairs over there. Nonsense. Give me the lantern. By Jove, I think you're right. That smells stronger in here. We'll soon find out. Watson, hold the lantern. Holmes. It's a body. A naked body. A corpse, Watson. A cadaver. Holmes, don't touch it. For the love of heaven, don't touch it. Why, Watson? Can't you see? The swollen eyes, the, the froth of the mouth, the flesh turned black. I've never seen it before, but those are the symptoms, Holmes. That's the Black Plague. What? That's not possible. That's crazy. Here, look. Let me look at the other chairs. Yes. Here an old man and here a woman. All victims of the Black Death. Holmes, these are the bodies of people who died in this house centuries ago of the plague. But they're not decayed. It's not possible. We must be going mad. Tell me quick, Watson. Did women do their hair with fringes at the time of the last plague? Fringes? Now I know that we're crazy. Why, Watson, do you hear that? It's the devil coming with his piper. He's going to make him dance. The old woman was right. The house does vibrate to the sound of those pipes. He's coming, Holmes. He's coming. Good evening, gentlemen. Dear me, if it isn't our friend Professor Moriarty, I uh, had no idea you were a musician. You admire my piping, eh? Yes, I wondered how long it would take you to find me. Allow me to congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. You're very prompt. Most flattering, Professor. But I assure you it was simplicity itself. You didn't think I'd overlook anything as obvious as a sealed house and the haunted bagpiper who so conveniently came back to life in the past month? Yes, I might have known my little roost to get rid of my superstitious neighbors wouldn't keep Sherlock Holmes away. Perhaps it's just as well... You've been getting in my way quite a bit lately, Mr. Holmes. I shall have to continue my experiments begun on these three poor devils. On yourself and Dr. Watson. You mean the plague? You're going to give us the black plague? I really must try my serum on two healthy specimens before I pronounce it perfect. After all, these three, an old beggar, a thief dying of starvation, and a woman of ill repute... They could hardly be expected to resist the disease. That's very interesting. I was just assuring Dr. Watson that these uh, corpses were quite recent because I was sure that women didn't wear fringes during the last pestilence. Mm. And Dr. Watson was afraid they might be victims of the original plague. <laughs> but in a sense, he's right. The uh, <clears throat> victims are recent. But they were killed by the germs of the original Black Death. <laughs> uh, most amusing, isn't it? Fascinating. Tell me, how did you discover those germs? They were in this house. I found a nice little culture of them in a glass of calf's foot jelly, which was on the table in the front room. How they ever survived as long as this, I can't imagine. Uh, but here, gentlemen, come into my laboratory. I want to show you what I've done with them. Oh, what should we do? Black plague. It's a terrible thing. The man's mad. Humor him, Watson. Humor him. Oh, yes, I... Here we are, gentlemen. Quite a nice modern little outlay for such an ancient house. Eh? Yes, it is an ancient house, Professor. But here, uh, this little test tube. It contains enough of the Black Plague to wipe out the entire city of Edinburgh. Yes, I rather thought that was your purpose. You've never forgotten how they drove you out at the time of the Burke and Hare scandal. You know about that? Quite. Your name wasn't Moriarty then, huh? What of it? You were Dr. Knox's young assistant at the time. Together, you were carrying on some exciting experiments. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Experiments that might have saved the world a great deal of suffering. But you were short of cadavers. It wasn't you, by any chance, who suggested to Burke and Hare, those two body snatchers, that a body did not have to be legally dead to be acceptable? Well, what if I did? They only killed the refuse of the city. Beggars, scum. Quite. But they met the hangman nonetheless. Aye, the fools... What price the death of a few when we might have discovered a cure that would have saved all humanity? Humanity. Bah, I hate it. Ever since then, I'd sworn I'd get revenge on humanity and the law-abiding citizens of Edinburgh in particular. And now, 
the time has come. Tomorrow, the contents of this test tube will spread destruction throughout the city. But in the meantime, you, Mr. Holmes, and you, Dr. Watson, you know too much. You shall be the first of the law-abiding citizens to feel the prick of my little needle. Just a moment till I prepare my instrument. Stop him, Holmes! Stop him! Do not move, gentlemen. One drop out of this test tube, even in its present state, is enough to cause death. I quite agree. By the way, Professor Moriarty, while you are preparing your solution, you uh, have no objections if I play a tune on your bagpipes? I used to be rather good at them in my younger days. Not at all, if it'll amuse you. Quite. Watson, stand here beside me against this wall. No, no, quite. Don't argue. <laughs> The house, it's vibrating. I can feel the wall quiver. That's the note that does it. Hold on there, you're shaking the house. The foundations, I can hear them cracking. Look out, man, you'll bring the house down. Well, that's what we intend to do. The walls, I've got to get out of here. We can't see, the front door's blocked. The secret passage in the basement. If I can reach it in time. Holmes, he's dropped the test tube. It's spreading across the floor. Watson, step back into the fireplace. Hurry. Mr. Bell, Holmes played that note on the bagpipes until the house crashed in upon itself. But, Dr. Watson, weren't you killed? <laughs> Not quite, Mr. Bell. No, no. Holmes had deduced from that crack above the front door that the house was weak. And he also guessed which way it would fall if it did cave in. The wall that we were standing against in the fireplace alone were left standing. If you've seen any ruined castles, Mr. Bell, you'll notice how frequently that seems to happen. And Professor Moriarty, did he escape? Unfortunately, he did, Mr. Bell through the secret passage in the basement which he had mentioned. But the Black Plague and those corpses, what did you do about that? We left them where they were. No use informing the authorities, they wouldn't have believed us. And besides, it would have been too dangerous to go poking about in the ruins. No, Holmes simply poured the spirits from our lantern on the old rafters and started a fire. The wood was as dry as tinder, and there was quite a blaze. And fire, Mr. Bell, is a great purifier. And so you prevented an outbreak of the Black Death. Hmm. That's a gruesome story. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson will return in just a moment to tell us something about the thrilling Sherlock Holmes mystery he has for us next Monday night. Ladies, those beautiful Powers models whose photographs you see in magazines always have to keep their hair shining bright with dazzling highlights. Now, here's how they do it. Powers models were among the very first to discover how cremel shampoo brings out all the natural sparkling luster of each tiny strand of hair. How it keeps hair simply radiant for days. Yes, and those lovely Powers models told me that no other shampoo gives their hair more natural, glossy luster. It never dries the hair or makes it brittle. Well, that's because cremel shampoo has such a beneficial oil base. It actually helps hair, and it keeps the hair from becoming dry. Then, ladies, why not take a tip from Beauty Wise Powers Models? See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing beauty. Buy a bottle of Kreml shampoo at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. I wonder. Next week. Next week... I think I'll tell you the story of an experience that Sherlock Holmes and I had with something I was convinced was an invention of the devil. I call it the invention of the adventure, rather, of the horseless carriage. Horseless carriage? You mean one of the early automobiles? One of the very earliest, Mr. Bell. Holmes was called in to protect the inventor and, in the end, had to solve the mystery of his murder. Tonight, 
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the horseless carriage. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, owing to Mr. Conway's illness, the part of Sherlock Holmes will be played by Mr. Ben Wright. And now for our weekly visit with Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, your friend and mine, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I'm glad to see you. Make yourself at home. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You know, I've been waiting eagerly all week to hear about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. And the most singular affair it was, to be sure. It had its beginnings in the august halls of the British Museum. I've been looking over my old records to refresh my memory, and even after all these years, it sends what in Scotland they call a cow gru down my spine. <laughs> I can hardly wait, Dr. Watson. Recently, in a poll conducted throughout the country, women picked the ten best groomed men in America. These men were all men at the top, statesmen, governors, motion picture stars, producers, and millionaires. And men... I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But then why shouldn't it be? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kremel also keeps the hair neatly in place longer with a healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy. After you apply Kremel, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or on your hat band. Just use a little Kremel on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... What about the singular affair which began in the sacrosanct confines of the British Museum? Well, I must admit that I was not a frequent visitor to those gloomy halls, but on this particular morning, Holmes had been insistent. All the scientists in London, especially the archaeologists, were agog over the arrival of Lord Cranwood's sensational Egyptian discoveries. For several days, Holmes had been deeply immersed in research among the Cranwood antiquities, so that now I find myself in the Egyptian gallery of the British Museum. I say, Watson, look here. This notation definitely proves the use of stringed instruments as well as flutes as early as 3000 B.C. Oh, very interesting, Holmes. Very interesting indeed. If you please, sir. The smoking is absolutely forbidden. Huh? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Uh, hello, Holmes. Oh, Watson, I don't think you know Professor Halliday of the British Museum. Professor, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not the eminent Dr. Eustace Watson, the well-known archaeologist of Edinburgh? I'm honored. No, sir. Dr. John H. Watson of Baker Street. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is Dr. Watson's first visit to all your magnificent new acquisitions, Professor Halliday. It's a veritable treasure house, gentlemen. The late Lord Cranwood's excavations at the site of ancient Abydos have given the museum a priceless mine of information. And yet the price in human lives has not been inconsiderable. First Lord Cranwood himself, only a few days after the shrine of Harshafit was opened. A man of almost 80, Mr. Holmes. The strain and excitement of the discovery were too much for him. No doubt. And then a month later, Dr. Duma, disappearing mysteriously from camp, only to be found hopelessly insane and babbling madly before he died. And young Wilson, vanished into thin air and assumed to have been lost overboard from the ship that was bringing the expedition back to England. 
Oh, it was a calm, moonlit night. Don't tell me that you, of all people, believe this newspaper talk of Hasha Fitz's curse, Mr. Holmes. I believe nothing that is not susceptible of proof, Professor. Evidently, the new Lord Cranwood is quite undisturbed by any threats of a curse upon his family. I've seen him working here every day this week. Oh, is that Lord Cranwood? Yes, the uh, heavy set, middle aged man over there, just beyond that fifth sarcophagus. Fifth which? The, the chap with a rather florid face, just packing those notes into his briefcase. Oh, looks fit enough, I must say. Judging from his appearance, I should think the curse of a what's his name wouldn't have much luck with him. You'll excuse me, gentlemen. I want a word with Lord Cranwood before he leaves. Oh, Sir Holmes, supposing I run along, I'll meet you at the club for lunch and. Uh... Lord Cranwood, what's the matter? Why, well, he, he's collapsed. Quick, Watson. I, I don't understand. He just seemed to keel over. Well, let me take a look at him. You were standing right beside him, Professor. Just what happened? Well, I was speaking to him. He clutched his throat, tried to say something, and collapsed. Holmes. Yes, Watson? The man's dead. Impossible. Cause of death, Watson? Well, I should have said heart, but... But uh, the I... curious rigidity of the muscles of his hands and throat aren't consistent with that diagnosis. Is that it, Watson? Quite correct, Holmes. You would better notify Scotland Yard at once, Professor Halliday. Scotland Yard? Mr. Holmes, are you suggesting... I suggest nothing, Professor Halliday. But Lord Cranwood has died extremely suddenly. In view of the three previous deaths which have occurred among the members of the expedition, I feel that this is definitely a matter for the police. I'll send for them at once. I'm certain, Watson, that a second look at Lord Cranwood's body will suggest to your mind a cause of death with which you cannot be unfamiliar. After your army career in India... The congested eyeballs. The rigid neck muscles. You mean snake bite? Precisely. The bite of some venomous and highly poisonous snake is the only cause consistent with these appearances. But there are no snakes here in the British Museum? That, Watson, is why I sent for Scotland Yard. Pacing up and down after two solid days, Holmes. Would it be too much to ask you to be seated for at least five minutes? I'm sorry, Watson. The lack of any satisfactory solution to the problem of Lord Cranwood's death has driven me almost out of my mind. You find the problem insoluble, then? So far. Come in. Ah, Inspector Lestrade. I've been expecting a call from you. Yeah, this thing's here got me beat, Mr. Holmes. Oh, sit down, Inspector. Can I get you a drink? Thank you, Doctor. I'll be glad of one. <laughs> well, we've got the coroner's verdict, Mr. Holmes, and much good it does us. Death by misadventure from unknown causes. Well, you could hardly expect a coroner's jury to say more. Did the Home Office pathologist confirm my opinion? Uh, here you are, Lestrade. Well, Holmes. thank you, Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. All the appearances of death were consistent with the bite of some deadly snake... But did we find any snakes running around? Were there any snake bites on the deceased body? No. <laughs> Why, you yourself, within a few yards of the man, Mr. Holmes, and you know as well as I do that if a man gets bitten by a snake, he's going to let out a yell. I know exactly how you feel, Lestrade. Yeah, and have you seen the papers? <laughs> Scotland Yard baffled by 5,000-year-old curse. Death strikes again from Egyptian tomb. You can't blame the journalist, Lestrade. It's a newspaper editor's dream. And Scotland Yard's nightmare. Well, I must be off. The commissioner wants to see me this afternoon. You can be thankful this isn't one of your cases, Mr. Holmes. I think this one would be too much even for you. Phew. I've never seen a steward quite so worked up before. And I can't say that I blame him, Watson. Well, come along. Since the late Lord Cranwood's funeral is to take place at two o'clock, we might well stroll over to Hanover Square. Perhaps a brisk walk may serve to blow the cobwebs from our brains. It's the first time I've known you stand about outside a church at a funeral, Holmes, peering at the relatives of a dead man. I'm anxious to see the new Lord Granwood, as well as his relatives. He was a nephew of the late Lords, you know. And the family's interest in Egyptology has been inherited by him, along with the title. Here they come. And there's the new Lord Cranwood. I wouldn't want to be in his boots with a curse hanging over me head. There's Lord Cranwood, Watson. Husky looking young chap. Looks as though it'd take more than a family curse to get him down. Who's that coming after him, the pale young fellow in the wheelchair? His cousin, Mr. Neville Robertson, I believe. 
been hopelessly paralyzed ever since boyhood. Horse rolled on him while hunting. Yes, the lines of pain and suffering are very evident in the poor fellow's face. That must be Robertson's older brother, Mr. Oliver Robertson. That rather heavy set young man just coming out. I assume that's his wife with him, the, the girl with the black veil. Well, it's rather rough on them, all these curious people staring. Come along, Holmes. Let's be off. Very well, Watson. I've seen all that I... I beg your pardon, sir, but aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Oh, my name's Oliver Robertson. <laughs> Fortunate coincidence, my seeing you here. I'd intended sending you a message this evening. A message? Yes, I... I wanted you to... Well, this is hardly the place to discuss such matters. Look, I'm staying at my cousin, Lord Cranwood's house. I wonder if you'd be good enough to come there this evening. Would nine o'clock be satisfactory? Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Good day, sir. Good day, Mr. Roberts. Oh, come in, gentlemen, come in. I don't think you know my wife. Dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes? How do you do? And this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm very happy to see you here, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes, my wife and I, well, to put it frankly, have asked you to come here because we're afraid. Not for ourselves, but for my cousin, the new Lord Cranwood. Mr. Holmes, neither Oliver nor myself is of a nervous temperament. But if you've read the accounts of the Cranwood expedition, you must appreciate my feeling that we're contending against more than... Mere ill fate. Four members of the same small group, dying mysteriously or by violence within a few weeks of each other. Well, sir, you don't put any stock in all this talk about an ancient Egyptian curse? No, I, I don't really know. Uh, tell me, Mr. Robertson, does the new Lord Cranwood share your fears? I regret to say he does not. He laughed when I told him I'd asked you here. Am I interrupting a council of war, or may I be permitted to be present? Oh, come in by all means, Neville. Here, let me give you a hand with your wheelchair. I can manage, I can manage. My brother Neville, gentlemen, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, do, do? I assume that the presence of the celebrated sleuth of Baker Street is not unconnected with the curse of the Cranwood. Please, Neville, don't make fun of us for being frightened. Oh. After all, it's Derek we're worrying about, not ourselves. Time enough for you to worry, Oliver, when the curse catches up with Derek. Then you'll be Lord Cranwood yourself, and it'll be my turn to start worrying. I gather, Mr. Robertson, that you are somewhat skeptical regarding the efficacy of Hash Rafit's 5,000-year-old curse. My granduncle died of heart failure after the excitement of discovering the tomb. Dr. Dumas' death was certainly not the first case of sunstroke that's ever been heard of in Egypt. And Wilson, who fell overboard from the ship, was notoriously fond of the bottle. Does that answer your question? Ingenious, Mr. Robertson, but it leaves out of account your uncle's death in the British Museum the other day. I could offer you a dozen theories to account for that, but I doubt if they'd be sensational enough to please you. Mr. Holmes, regardless of what my cousin may say, and I know he'll agree with my brother, I wish to engage you to prevent any repetition of the tragedies which have already struck this family. Do say you will, Mr. Holmes. I will do my best, Mr. Robertson, to keep Lord Cranwood safe from harm, but without his cooperation, I greatly fear that I... Simpson said he wanted to see me, Oliver. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had guests. I very much want to see you, Derek. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My cousin, Lord Cranwood, gentlemen. How do you, How do you do? do? I'm sorry, gentlemen. I have no sympathy with my brother's fears, nor do I see any necessity for dragging detectives into this matter. I trust you'll excuse me. Good night. Well... You see, Mr. Holmes, it's just as I told you. But I do hope you'll do your best anyway, Mr. Holmes. I promise you I shall. Your task won't be made any easier, Mr. Holmes, by my cousin's stubborn determination to continue working at the museum. He's arranged with Professor Halliday to work there at night in the future, uh, beginning tomorrow. He wishes to avoid the stairs of the curious. Hmm, interesting. Great Scott, my watch must have stopped. 9.30 and I haven't as yet fed my snakes. Snakes? Uh, did you say snakes? Why, yes, Doctor. Since my affliction debars me from digging in Egyptian tombs and similar active pastimes, I amuse myself with a small herpetarium. Would you care to see my collection? Good heavens, no. Or some other time, perhaps, Mr. Robertson. Dr. Watson and I must be off. Good. Snakes. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, that I find that sinister cripple Neville and his nasty collection of poisonous reptiles highly suspicious. Well, there's no doubt that Neville's personality has been warped by his affliction. And the availability of snake venom is, of course, significant. And look at his motive, Holmes. Look at his motive. The Cranwood title and the Cranwood fortune. But there's one thing you've forgotten, Watson. 
Even if the new Lord Cranwood were to die, it would be Neville's older brother who would inherit Oliver and his wife would become Lord and Lady Cranwood. Are you trying to tell me that a murderer who'd killed two men would boggle at a third? If Cranwood dies and Oliver gets the title, he'd be the last barrier in Neville's way. I don't like to say it, Holmes, but for once you seem to be singly obtuse about the facts of this case. Possibly, Watson. At any rate, I intend that you and I shall be present, although concealed, when Lord Cranwood visits the Egyptian galleries tomorrow night. You mean that you anticipate an attempt upon his life? As I have told you on previous occasions, Watson, it's a great mistake to theorize ahead of one's data. Mr. Holmes, you, you, don't, uh, you don't really put any faith in all this talk about the supernatural curse. Do you, Watson? I, I... Oh, gosh, no, no, of course not. Good. Well, then I trust that tomorrow night you will arm yourself with your service revolver. Oh, really? Yes, Watson. I should like to be in readiness for anything we may encounter at the British Museum. Supernatural or otherwise. place at night, isn't it? Carved humanity? Yes. What do you mean? Merely that the relics of the past are all about us. Oh, yes, yes, yes of course, sir. Oh, oh, on this way, through the northern vestibule. I say, Holmes, what's that thing? Looks like a coffin. That's what it is. Oh, good, good. Ah, uh, here we are. Ah, uh, you'll no doubt work at that long table. It has the only decent light in the room. Now, you take that side of the table, Watson. I'll take this. And make certain there's no one and nothing concealed. You're, you're, you're not expecting to find a, a snake anywhere, are you, Holmes? I don't expect to find anything. I merely wish to make certain that there is nothing to find. Yeah, I'll careful, Watson. Don't knock over that little figure. What the devil is it? And the Egyptians call those little statues the answerers. They were buried in the cedar coffins within the sarcophagi to accompany the dead... And to obey their orders. Well, pleasant idea, I must say. Well, there's nothing hidden on this side of the table. No, I hear. Now, now, there's an excellent spot to conceal ourselves. Over here, Watson. Great. God, what a horrible sight. What sort of a nightmare is that? And appropriately enough, it's a statue of Hashafit, a ram-headed god. Oh, excellent, Watson. Now, this will do perfectly. We can see everything in the room from behind here. Uh, just what uh, are you expecting, Holmes? I don't know. Quiet. Someone coming. It's Lord Cranwood. Yes, he's taking his papers out of his briefcase. Oh, now that he's turned the lamp up, I can see it better. Oh, he's all right so far. He's setting down to work. What? Something's wrong. Quick. He must have fainted. Here's the antitoxin. Give him the injection. Hurry. It's too late, Holmes. He's dead. just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they endeavor to solve the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. And if you're smart, you'll use Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive and tingling your scalp feels. And you like to massage Cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. 
Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and our story. I say, Holmes, if you won't have any lunch, you at least take a cup of tea. No, thank you, Watson. I'm not hungry. You've been saying that ever since that poor fellow Derek was killed the night before last. You simply must eat, Holmes. My appetite will return when I have a solution for this case, Watson, and not before. Well, I've, I've hesitated to say it, Holmes, but uh, if that man had died by any natural means in front of our very eyes, I'm perfectly certain that you would have solved the riddle. Well, if your hypothesis is correct, Watson, this case is not a matter of the mortal's minds. And that I refuse to admit. Well, we saw him come in, we saw him open his briefcase, he turned up the lamp, sat down... Thank and... you, Watson. Thank me for what? You've just given me some remarkably interesting food for thought. Oh, really? Come in. Why, Mrs. Robertson? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. It's Lady Cranwood now, isn't it? it? Makes me unhappy to say that it is, Dr. Watson. Won't you sit down, Lady Cranwood? I've already expressed to your husband my deep feeling over the tragedy I failed to prevent. Let me assure you, Mr. Holmes, that neither my husband nor I feel that you were in any way to blame. I appreciate your kindness, Lady Cranwood, but I still blame myself for having failed to reach a solution. And that is why I've come to see you this morning, Mr. Holmes. I... I hardly know how to say it. My suspicion is such a horrible one. Oh, there, 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 there my dear. I'm convinced that Oliver is in deadly peril. And... And from his own brother. Do you hear that, Holmes? You felt it too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I've been fighting down a horrible thought, denying it even to myself. But I felt I had to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Well, have you any proof, Lady Cranwell? Anything definite on which to base such an accusation? Only Neville sneers and his jealousy of my husband. And those horrible snakes of his. Perhaps you may be able to assist me in confirming or disproving your suspicions of Neville. Lady Cranwood. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes. Anything. I imagine that the entire family, and the servants as well, will all be attending the funeral this afternoon. Yes, of course. Then, if you will be good enough to leave me your key to the house, I shall take advantage of everyone's absence to go there and investigate one or two possibilities that have occurred to me. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Head us the key. Thank you. And one other thing. I should appreciate it if you would ask your husband to meet Watson and myself at the museum tonight. About nine o'clock. At the museum? Yes. I feel that a reenactment of the late Lord Cranwood's death may bring us to a solution. If you think it's necessary, Mr. Holmes. I think it is vitally necessary. Very well. I will ask my husband to meet you at the museum at nine. I must go now. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Watts. Uh, goodbye. Poor woman, no wonder she's overwrought. Come, Watson. Your hat and stick. We have work to do. Cranwood's house, you mean? Well, I shall go there this afternoon. But meanwhile, I want you to take a note to Lestrade at Scotland Yard and personally see to it that he gets it. And then? Meet me at nine o'clock tonight at the British Museum. I must say, Holmes, that as long as we had to come back to this chamber of horrors, I'm glad that you insisted on a decent amount of illumination. Since we won't be concealing ourselves this evening, Watson, I asked Professor Halliday to leave the Egyptian gallery fully lighted. Now, you sit here, Watson. Well, as long as none of the professors are about, Holmes, I don't suppose the museum will be shaken to its foundations if, if I smoke the pipe. Ah. Huh. That's better. Good evening, Lord Cranwood. Good evening. Lady Cranwood? Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good evening. Well, I fail to see what purpose will be served by a reenactment of my cousin's tragic death, but well, I'm willing to do anything within my power that will offer any hope. I insist on coming with Oliver, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid every moment I'm away from him. And now, Lord Cranwood, let us try in every way to duplicate your cousin's actions of two nights ago. I have here his briefcase, and I'd like you to enter through those doors... Carrying the briefcase in your left hand and humming a tune. All right. Ready? All right, go ahead. 
Now, uh, put the briefcase down on this table. Take off your hat and coat and put them on the table. Any particular place you want them? Well, I just place them on the table, as your cousin did. Now, open the briefcase. Oh, I thought I... What were you about to say? Uh, n- nothing. You were about to say, Lord Cranwood, that you thought the ingenious adaptation of the Borgia's poison needle had been removed from its mount in the briefcase lock. What on earth are you talking about? I found that fiendishly clever mechanism in your study this afternoon. Mr. Holmes, what do you mean? I mean that this briefcase was fitted with a poison needle, which was removed after Derek's death. Oh, no. And which I replaced when I found it at your house this afternoon. How horrible, how utterly vile. I also found some of the poison, Lord Cranwood. And I greatly fear that when I remounted the needle in the briefcase after my experiments, some of the venom may have remained on it. It was, Neville. Bluff, Holmes. Sheer bluff. You wouldn't dare. If you think I'm bluffing, Lord Cranwood, why is your face going so pale? You're clutching your arm with your other hand. Why? Uh, Fiend, it was poison. Oh, no. My arm's swelling. It's going down. There's no feeling left in my hand. No, 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 Oliver. Mr. Holmes must be mad. Must do, Holmes. You've killed me. All right, I did it. I killed the others, but... You'll never hang me! Oh. All right, Lestrade, oh. there's your confession. It's a confession, all right, oh. Dr. Holmes, but all you've given us is the corpse of a murderer. He's dead! You've killed him! Not a bit of it. He's only collapsed from fear. Holmes, the pain in his arm, the symptoms. Merely a harmless, though painful solution which I placed on the poison needle. Oh! Catch her, Watson, she's fainting. That Oliver's a fiend, Holmes, an absolute fiend. Oh, unquestionably. But you must admit that his hiring us was an ingenious attempt at a novel method of removing all possible suspicion from himself. And now he'll pay the penalty for murdering at least two men. A good thing, too, although I'm sure I don't know how you ever found out about the briefcase. Why, you gave me the clue, Watson. You yourself. I did? Back in Baker Street when you were talking about the second death. You mentioned that we had seen Lord Cranwood enter the room. Open his briefcase. Well, we did. Exactly. But until you mentioned it, the significant fact had escaped me that the only object common to both deaths and handled by both men was the briefcase. Good gracious me. Well, that solves the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Does it, Watson? Have you forgotten the three who died previously under such strange circumstances after they had opened Harshafit's temple? You, uh... You don't mean that you really believe in that stupid curse? Those three deaths have still not been explained, and I doubt that they ever will be. There are powers, Watson, higher powers, of which we poor humans still know nothing. Ladies, the poet who said a woman's hair was her crowning glory certainly knew what he was talking about. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances, and it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamabays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo never hurts the texture of your hair. You can use it as often as you wish, over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, it has a beneficial built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week, I think I'll tell you a story about the strange and ferocious behavior of Professor Presby's dog. And the even stranger behavior of the professor himself. I call it The Adventure of the Creeping Man. <laughs> Tonight's new 
new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tonight, the part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Ben Wright. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the creeping man. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Here we are once more in Dr. Watson's firelit study. The wind is howling outside, but inside the heavy red curtains have been drawn across the windows, and the only sound we can hear is the cheerful crackling of the logs in the fireplace. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You don't know how lucky you are that you don't have to go out on a night like this. Yes, it's one of the advantages of having retired from active medical practice. You know the old adage, man works from sun to sun, but woman's work's never done. (laughs) It's a base libel as far as doctors are concerned. You never know when Mr. Smith is going to acquire a black eye or... Mrs. McTavish may decide to present an addition to the clan. (laughs) Never a dull moment, eh, Dr. Watson? Oh, dear me, no. That's one thing I've never complained of. If it wasn't a patient who disturbed what little routine I had, it was Sherlock Holmes. I remember one bitter February evening. It was the second winter after my marriage. I just settled down to my after-dinner pipe when the doorbell rang. It was a note from Holmes. It said... Come at once if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. And you went, of course. Now, Mr. Bell, you'll hear all about that in good time. But uh, haven't you something to tell our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, attractive, well-groomed hair does a great deal to give a man self-assurance, to say nothing of helping his appearance. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite among America's most successful men. It's called Kreml Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer. Keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks clean on your hair and scalp. No other hair tonic keeps hair more handsomely groomed, yet it never looks greasy. So, men, for better groomed hair, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, when you received the mysterious message from Sherlock Holmes, you at once went round to Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, curiosity has always been my Achilles' heel. Well, when I arrived at Baker Street, I found Holmes huddled in his armchair, his knees drawn up and his pipe in his mouth. He was sunk in a profound reverie. And I'd been in the room several moments before he became aware of my existence. Oh, so there you are, Watson. There you are. Obviously. I've been here for seven minutes, as a matter of fact. Unimportant. Completely unimportant and uninteresting. Watson, have you ever speculated on the importance of a knowledge of dogs in detective work? Dogs? Well, naturally. Bloodhounds? Luthard. No, no, I'm not interested in that phase of the subject. It's too obvious. There is another side, far more subtle. Oh, I suppose there is, but I'm dashed if I know... You it. recollect in the case you so sensationally wrote up as the adventure of the Copper Beaches? Yes, but the case was sensational. In that instance, it wasn't the dog. It was the fact that the master of the house was willing to pay a sizable sum don't to... Don't prattle, Watson, don't prattle. Prattle? I was about to point a moral. In the case of the Copper Beaches... I was able, by noting the actions of a rather vicious child, to draw some startling deductions as to the criminal instincts of its father, who was considered a thoroughly respectable citizen. Mm, Of course, yes, I remember, but uh, what's that got to do with... My line of thought about dogs is analogous. Whoever saw a frisky dog in a gloomy family, or a sad dog in a happy one, 
Snarling people have snarling dogs. Dangerous people have dangerous dogs. Surely, Holmes, you didn't write me out on a night like this to discuss the temperaments of dogs? Not in general, no. What interests me is why Professor Presbury's faithful wolfhound, Roy, endeavors to bite him. You mean Professor Presbury, the famous Camford physiologist? Quite. The dog, until recently a most devoted animal, has attacked his master twice. Huh? What do you make of it? The dog is ill. Possibly. But he attacks no one else. Nor does he molest his master, save on very special occasions. Curious, Watson. Very curious. Ah, that must be Mr. Bennett, Professor Presbury's assistant. He is before his time. His appointment was 8.30. Come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Mr. Bennett. Good evening. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. I couldn't consider undertaking a case or solving an enigma without his invaluable aid. Oh, Holmes, really. Pay no attention to Mr. Bennett. He, he, he's pulling my leg again. Delighted to meet you, sir. Oh. I, I hope you'll forgive me arriving so early, Mr. Holmes, but... Edith is so worried about her father, and naturally I... Uh, quite so. Uh, Edith, my dear Watson, is Professor Presbury's daughter, oh, yes. to whom Mr. Bennett is engaged to be married. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Holmes, I have that honor. Oh, congratulations, young man, congratulations. Ideal state, matrimony. Watson, I... stop chattering. Oh, I was only going to say that I've only been... Married. Now then, Mr. Bennett, oh. Oh. I believe you gave me the salient points of the case in your letter, but I've not had the opportunity to relate them to Dr. Watson. So if you will be good enough to go over the matter again... Well, certainly, Mr. Holmes... The professor, as you may know, Dr. Watson, is a man of splendid reputation. Yes, indeed he is. A trifle positive, I might even say combative, but there has never been a breath of scandal, at least until a month ago. Dear me, you tell me that old Presbury has started to sow his wild oats at his age. <laughs> I always considered him the soul of respectability. Well, you see, early last fall he became attached to the daughter of Professor Morphy. It was not the reason courting of an elderly man, but... Rather, the passionate frenzy of youth. In short, his family considered the infatuation rather excessive. Exactly. And so I gathered that the young lady, although her father, Professor Morphy, favored the match. Mm, yes. Presbury is fairly well to do, I understand. Yes. About a month ago, Professor Presbury did something he's never done before. He left home without telling anyone he was going. A fortnight later, he returned rather travel-worn. Oh, had he been? Well, he refused to say... By chance, however, I received a letter from a friend of mine in Prague... ...saying he'd seen the professor at a distance. And now comes the remarkable part of the story. Oh? Yes, Dr. Watson. From that time on, a curious change came over the professor. Those around him had the inexplicable feeling... He, ...that he was under some influence that darkened his better nature. Uh, you don't think that he was uh, hypnotized, possibly... Or, ...or mentally unbalanced in some way? No, on the contrary. His lectures were more brilliant than ever. His mind was singularly alert... But there was something new about him, something something sinister. His daughter tried again and again to penetrate the mask he'd put on, but in vain. Extraordinary. He behaved to her almost as though she, she were a stranger. In fact, all of his friends and co-workers noticed a, a rather singular change of personality. And the incident of the letters, Mr. Bennett. Don't forget that. I was just coming to that. You see, Dr. Watson, the professor has never had any secrets from me. I handled every paper which came in to him and opened all his letters. Yes, 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 of course, of course. Shortly after his return, all this was changed. Certain letters began to arrive marked with an X under the stamp. These I was in no account to touch. What was the handwriting like? Decidedly illiterate. The envelopes had the E.C. mark. East Central, eh? Huh? Not exactly the portion of London one would expect the professor to be in touch with. The letters were curious enough, but... But not more curious than the little wooden box. Wooden box? Yes. One of those quaint carved things one associates with a, a visit to Germany. I discovered it one morning in the drawer of Professor Presbury's desk. He had sent me into his study in search of a cannula. I put it on my desk, Bennett. In front of the inkwell. It's not here, Professor Presbury. I I'll try the drawers. It's usually in the upper right. No, not here. Perhaps the left one. No. I say, Professor, what a curious box. I've never seen that in here before. What box? This one with the carving. You must have got it on your trip to Germany. What, what trip to Germany? Who said I was in Germany? Professor Pesbury, I, I didn't mean to... You sniveling little cat. You contemptible but, uh, snooper. I, I what do you mean by poking about among my things? But, Put sir, that box down. Well, let me explain. Put that box down, I say. Get out. Now get out of here. Get out. 
before I break every bone in your body. Oh, jolly chap, the Professor. Sounds as if he were heading for an apoplectic fit. Do you remember the date of that outburst, Mr. Bennett? It was December the 2nd. It was on that very day that Roy the Wolfhound made his first attack on the Professor. An attack? Do you mean that the dog actually bit him? Well, he certainly tried to. When was the next attack? December the 11th and again on December the 20th. After that, we had to banish Roy to the stables. Singular, most singular. But those dates were new to me. There have been some even stranger developments since I wrote you, Mr. Holmes. Yes? What I speak of occurred the night before last. It was really a terrifying experience. Yes, yes, go on. I live with Professor Presbury, as you know, Mr. Holmes. I had retired rather early and was correcting the papers of a lecture I was to deliver in the morning. At 11.30, all was quiet, and I blew out my lamp and went to sleep. A little after midnight, I was uh, awakened by a curious shuffling and muttering in the corridor. It was followed by a series of dull knocks on what I took to be Edith's door. I heard her open the door. There was a gasp, and then she uttered a terrible scream. It's all right, darling. I'm coming. Oh. What's the matter? Don't look oh. so terrified. Oh, Edward. Edward, it was horrible. Like a nightmare. What was? Oh, oh. darling, don't tremble so. I'm here now. Tell me what frightened you. I thought I heard someone knocking at my door. I heard it too. I got up and opened the door. And there it was, leering up at me. It? What do you mean? Was it a man? I don't know. I only know it was something dark and crouching. I screamed and it hurried down the hall, not quite in its hands and knees, with its face sunk between its shoulders. How awful. You lock yourself in and I'll have a look. No. No, don't leave But, me. darling, I... I uh... Shh. Do you hear anything? No. Nothing that... There it is again. In the ivy outside the window. As though someone were climbing up the wall. That's impossible. The window's a good 20 feet from the ground. Nobody would dare. Look. On the windowsill. A hand. It's... It's drawing itself up. Here comes the head. Good heavens, what a horrible face. The eyes that leave. Oh, Edward. Edward. It's father. Ah! <laughs> Watson, what do you make of that? The professor crawling about in this curious fashion. Lumbago, probably. I've known it to double a man up. Oh, rubbish, Watson. Did you ever hear of a man with lumbago scaling a 20-foot wall? Well, now that you mention it, no. Mr. Bennett, how did Professor Presbury explain his actions the next morning? He seemed to have no recollection of them. No recollection of them at all. When did you say this happened, Mr. Bennett? The night before last. The 4th of February, huh? That rather complicates matters. And uh, last night, did anything further happen? The only unusual thing I heard was Roy, barking furiously a, a little after midnight. Poor fellow, he's been chained down to the stable. I, I must confess, if anything else happened, neither Edith nor I would have known it. You see, we both had a feeling of impending danger and slept with our doors locked and the shutters barricaded. Very sensible procedure. I would suggest that you get Miss Presbury out of the house for a few days. Send her away until we can clear this matter up. I've already persuaded her to pay a visit to her aunt in Cambridge. Splendid. Now, as to the dates of these uh, seizures, you will say the first was December the 2nd, the next December the 11th, and the third... Uh... Here's a list of the dates. When I first observed abnormality in the professor's behavior, I, I felt it my duty to obtain all possible data about the case. Excellent. Let me see. Yes. Yes, as I thought, the intervals are regular. Putting two and two together... Let us say that every nine days, the professor takes some strong drug, which has a passing but highly poisonous effect. He learned to take this drug while in Prague, and is now supplied by an intermediary who resides in the East Central District of London. Yes, yes, but the dog and the creeping man in the passage. Holmes, the thing's too fantastic to be explained by a simple addiction to drugs. It's not simple, not in the least. But patience, Watson, patience, we've at least made a beginning. Our next step is to obtain an interview with the professor himself. Uh, what is the best time to catch him in, Mr. Bennett? When would he be free to see us? About 11 in the morning, Mr. Holmes. Good. 
You may expect us at that time tomorrow. In just a moment, we'll keep our appointment with the professor. But first, men, remember, if you want your hair to look healthy and handsome, one of the first requisites is a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be smart. Enjoy the extra advantages of a highly specialized hair tonic like Kreml. Kreml contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why it keeps unruly hair neatly in place longer, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. It never leaves hair feeling sticky or dirty. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. A quick massage with Kreml helps stimulate the cutaneous circulation of the scalp. Notice how alive your scalp feels, how it tingles. And if your hair is so dry it breaks off and falls, start using Kreml at once. Because Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling softer, more pliable, makes it look as if it had some body to it. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Dr. Watson, what happened next in the strange case of Professor Presley? Well, early the next morning, found us near the town of Camford, approaching a large, rather gloomy house. This must be the house, Watson. Notice the ivy vines reaching up to the bedroom windows. See? Some of the leaves have been torn away. The vines look decidedly the worse for wear. Oh, but surely no man could possibly climb up that way? No normal man, Watson. No normal man. But look, I fancy that is the professor peering at us from behind the curtains in that second window. Doesn't seem to be too well pleased at our presence. Mm, Fierce-looking chap. Tremendously vigorous for his age. I say, Holmes, do you, do you think we ought? Ought what? Well, I mean, what excuse are you going to give for our call? Assuming that Professor Presbury's memory is a trifle defective during his bad spells, uh, how is he to know that he didn't send for us himself? Well, isn't that rather skating on, on thin ice? Possibly, my dear Watson, possibly. Uh, oh, I must say, uh, I don't relish this interview at all. Shh! Someone's coming. It's Presbury himself. For heaven's sake, Watson, pull yourself together. You look as though you've been caught stealing sheep. Good morning. Professor Presbury, I believe? Yes. I'm Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Oh, yes, I believe I've heard of you. Won't you come in? Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Oh, all right. Come this way, gentlemen, to my study. Oh, uh, thank you, sir, thank you. Uh, what a charming room. Uh, uh, delightful, eh, Holmes? Pray sit down, gentlemen. Now, what can I do for you? Why, that was the question I was about to put to you. To me, sir? Yes. Apropos of the communication you sent me. A letter? I sent you a letter? Uh, no. Not exactly a letter. A telegram, then? Have you got it with you? No, I can't say I have. No, I dare say not. Because I sent you no telegram. Impossible. Why, then, someone's been playing a practical joke on us both. That statement, Mr. Holmes, is highly questioned. Hmm? Really, Professor Presbury, I can only apologize for this needless intrusion and uh, hope that you will forgive me. But that is hardly enough, Mr. Holmes. What kind of fool do you take me for? Why, I... You know I didn't send for you. You can't get out of this so easy. I say, Stidus, I'll I show you, you, you scoundrel. What? Put down that paper, wait, Professor. I shall... Consider your position. I... You can't afford a scandal. After all, shall... I'm rather well known. You cannot possibly afford to treat me with such discourse. I should think not. Come on, Watson. The interview's closed. Good day, Professor. What a narrow escape. The professor was certainly in a dangerous mood. Yes, our learned friend's nerves are somewhat out of order. Highly inflammable temper. Maniacal, I should say. And yet his mind seemed perfectly clear. Too clear. That was my miscalculation. His memory is quite reliable, unfortunately. Strange. Very strange. I must say, Holmes, I'm a bit disappointed in you. All that trouble for nothing. Not quite for nothing. We have seen the gentleman and have gained a personal contact. We have also discovered the address of the intermediary in London. Have we? Well, how in thunder... The professor wrote to him this morning. I deciphered the name from the blotting pad on the professor's desk. I say... The gentleman's name is Dorak, and he lives in the commercial road. 
And now, Watson, I'm a busy man. We will drop this case until next Tuesday evening. Tuesday? But why Tuesday? On that date, if my calculations are correct, the professor should have another of his curious spells. We must be on hand to notice the developments and to prevent a catastrophe. <laughs> Sir Holmes, this isn't my idea of the way to spend a pleasant evening. Look at those clouds cutting across the moon. Yes. I told you to bring your greatcoat. I suspected it might be a trifle uh, drafty. Drafty? My legs are quite numb from crouching behind this gooseberry bush. Why did you have to pick this particular night? If the cycle of nine days holds good, we shall have the professor at his worst tonight. Moreover, I ascertained that he received a packet from the man Dorak this morning. Yes, we shall see. We shall see. Look, look, look. look. Someone has lit a light in the corner bedroom. That must be the professor. So I was right in my calculations. Things are beginning to happen. I warned Bennett not to try to interfere with him, but to follow him at a safe distance. Safe? You don't think that he's uh, as dangerous as that, do you? I don't think so. I know it. What? Have you your revolver no. handy? Yes, but you don't think I should be obliged to, to, to use it? Huh? Oh, control your nerves, Watson. I can hear your teeth chattering. It's not nerves, it's a cold. The professor's symptoms are particularly interesting. Huh? Apart from these fits, he has more energy and vitality than ever. And then his knuckles. Did you notice his knuckles? No, I can't say that I did. Thick and horny. Quite unusual for a man. Very curious knuckles that can only be explained by the mode of progression observed in... The knuckles. But of course. And the dog. And the ivy. Why didn't I think of that before? Shh. Holmes, Holmes. Look, 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 look. He's opened the side door. There he is. Standing in the doorway. Leaning forward. With his arms dangling. Of course. Of course. Now he's coming down the drive. Why, he's not walking. He's crouching. Running and skipping along on, on his hands and feet. Holmes, it's uncanny. It's, it's almost as if he were possessed by some strange, unnatural force. There he goes, round the corner of the house. Quick, Watson, we must follow him. Here comes Bennett. Oh, Mr. Holmes, have you seen him? Yes, he went this way. Come along. He's worse than usual tonight. I could hear him through my door, chattering and jabbering to himself. There he is. He's crouching at the foot of the ivy. Now he's climbing... Actually springing from vine to vine. His dressing gown flapping in the wind. How horrible. He looks like some huge bat glued against the side of the house. It's... it's uncanny. Now he's swinging himself over to that tree. He's coming down again. He's heading for the stables. Come along. We mustn't lose sight of him. We can't let him get away from us. The dog has caught sight of him. Oh, you'll kill him if you can get at him. No, the professor's staying out of reach. Look at him crouched on the ground like that. He's teasing the dog. He's throwing stones at it. Oh, this, this isn't human. Quite, Watson, quite. Professor Presbury isn't human. Great heavens, Holmes, what do you mean? Look out. Well, his leash is broken. He's out of the professor. He'll ah! kill him. Come on. He, he's got him by the throat. Drag him apart. Come on, drag him apart. Down, down I say. I, I, I've got him by the collar. Watson, help me carry the professor into the house. His throat is badly mangled. <laughs> Come in, Watson. Come in. I've been looking over the professor's laboratory while you were treating his injuries. How is he coming along? Well, as well as can be expected. He pulled through, I fancy. The wound was dangerous to near the carotid artery. The hemorrhage was rather serious. But, I say, what's that you got in your hand? The professor's little German box. Curious, isn't it? Yes, but it's open. You broke the lock. Really, Holmes, do you think that you ought to go... Probably not. But not being deterred by your scruples, I've gone ahead... The contents are quite enlightening, if your conscience will permit you to look. Two files, one empty and one nearly full. And a letter with a cross under the stamp. Yes, that's from our Mr. Dorak, the London intermediary. It contains another note that completely solves the mystery. Here it is. It's signed H. Lowenstein. H. Lowenstein? But I say, that's the Lowenstein. Obviously, Watson, obviously. I mean, it's Dr. Lowenstein, the famous Prague physician, who claims to have discovered a serum that will rejuvenate people. It's been tabooed, of course, by the medical profession because he refuses to reveal its source. And for a good reason. Here, read the letter. 
So look, honored colleague, since your visit, I have thought much of your case. I beg you report fully to me on the results of my treatments. It is possible that the serum of anthropoid would have been better. I have, as I have explained, used black-faced languor because a specimen was accessible. The languor is, of course, a crawler and a climber, while anthropoid walks erect and is in every way nearer to man. But I say, Holmes, this is beastly. The languor is an ape. Quite. It is found on the slopes of the Himalayas and is the biggest and most human of the climbing monkeys. Then that serum explains the professor's recent peculiarities. He used it in an attempt to regain his youth. Yes, giving himself a dose at nine-day intervals with the curious results we've witnessed. It's dangerous to trick nature, Watson. When man tries to rise above it, he is liable to fall below it. Even the highest type of man may revert to the animal if he leaves the straight road of destiny. What a curious story, Dr. Watson. But did Holmes manage to stop the treatment? Indeed. He wrote to Dr. Lowenstein and told him that he would be held criminally responsible if he continued to circulate his poisons. And that was the end of that. Why do you suppose the dog noticed the change in his master before anyone else did? His sense of smell told him. It was the monkey, not the professor, whom Roy attacked. Just as it was the monkey who teased the dog. That's fantastic. I didn't know such things were possible, Dr. Watson. Oh, dear me, yes. Both in detection and in medicine... Things are apt to happen that it is difficult for the lay mind to believe. And between you and Mr. Holmes, you covered both fields. Yes, 221 Baker Street must have been an exciting place to reside when you both lived there. Yes, Mr. Bell, as you remarked a few minutes ago, we never had a dull moment. <laughs> Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Here's some sensational information for our lady listeners. I'm sure we all know or have heard how divinely beautiful Powers models are. But did you know these famous beauties make up to $35,000 a year? <laughs> Which shows they have brains as well as beauty. <laughs> but seriously, Joe, what impresses me most is that Powers models can afford to spend a fortune on their hair. Yet when they wash it, they rely on inexpensive cremel shampoo. Which proves how wonderful cremel shampoo really is. Powers models were among the first to discover that no other shampoo leaves hair more shining bright with natural gloss and luster. But under no circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. Cremel shampoo is not a drying detergent. Cremel shampoo is entirely different. And you know, after a cremel shampoo, the hair actually radiates natural, brilliant highlights. And cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base, which helps hair from becoming dry or brittle. It rinses out so easily and positively never, never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, always wash your hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining, sparkling beauty, yet in no way hurts its texture. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week. Uh, next week... I think I'll tell you a story about international intrigue in Paris and how, in a vile apache den, I met a beautiful, glamorous spy and almost, uh... Almost what, Dr. Watson? Well, now, Mr. Bell, you'll have to wait next week to find out. I call this story The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Creeping Man. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Scarlet Worm. There are
are 80,000 patients in our veterans' hospitals. Your Red Cross contribution helps place the volunteer efforts of the community at their service. This is just one part of the Red Cross story. Give generously to the Red Cross. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday evening and time for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. From the hints you gave us last week about tonight's story, it sounded like quite a yarn. It took place in Paris, you said. Yes, my boy. It was in that colorful city of bright lights, lilting music, and beautiful women that Sherlock Holmes and I had one of the oddest adventures that ever happened to us in our long association. I call the case The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm. Sounds mighty intriguing, Dr. Watson. But first, men, if you want a successful, prosperous appearance, don't give your hair that cheap, greasy, plastered-down look. I've heard many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed. That's why I urge you to try Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed all day long. Every hair in place. Cremel gives hair a rich, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. And how the ladies admire that natural, well-groomed look which Cremel always gives. Yes, Cremel gives your hair a handsome, clean-cut appearance. As if you had just combed it, and it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about your new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Scarlet Worm? Well, Mr. Bell, though that singular affair took place in Paris, I suppose the story really began on an October evening in, in Baker Street, a long, long time ago. I'd been more than usually busy with my practice that day, and I returned to our lodging shortly after nine, I remember. As I entered the living room, Sherlock Holmes was seated at his side table, clad in his dressing gown and working hard over a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Finally, he brought a test tube containing a solution over to the table. In his right hand, he held a slip of litmus paper. You come at a crisis, Watson. If this litmus paper remains blue, all is well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. Good Lord, Holmes, really? Aha. As I thought, it turns red. And now to send a telegram to Scotland Yard, and I need have no further connection with the case. Well, you didn't tell me that you were working on a new case, Holmes? It was a shoddy little affair, my dear Watson. An orthopedic shoemaker in Wapping became somewhat fretful with his wife. He added poison to her morning pot of tea and was stupid enough to leave a sample of the deadly brew. It was purely a routine matter. Let's forget it. You look tired, old chap. Yes, I'm Holmes. I'm busy, dear. I hope you won't be too tired to accompany me to Paris tomorrow. To Paris? Why? This afternoon, I received a very rare visitor in these rooms, my brother Mycroft. All is not well at the foreign office. They need our help. Well, what's wrong, Holmes? An international spy ring is at work. In the past few months, important secrets have leaked out. Vital secrets that might bring this country to the verge of war. Good gracious me. Two of the foreign office's brightest young men have committed suicide rather than divulge how they betrayed their trust. Mycroft tells me he has reason to suspect a beautiful and dangerous young lady in Paris who inspired these men... Uh, in these men, a loyalty even above patriotism. And they want you to try and trap her, is that it? No, Watson. They want us. Oh, oh us. Yes. Mycroft and I agreed that you would be perfect bait to use in such a trap. Bait? Makes me sound like a piece of cheese. Only metaphorically, Watson. You must agree that your imposing appearance, your open countenance and hearty manner would attract the attention of any female spy. Yes, I see what you mean. Perhaps you're right. In any case, we shall make you doubly desirable by entrusting you with... Uh, uh, certain invaluable naval secrets. Masterly, Holmes, masterly. You will entrust me with utterly worthless documents, spread the story that they're valuable, and uh, wait for the woman to approach me. Precisely. 
I shall accompany you as a bodyguard, but uh, leave you largely to your own devices. Yes, Watson, I have high hopes of this trip to Paris. With you as the worm and me as the hook, I think we may snare this evil loveliness. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, you have shown me your credentials and explained your mission. We are aware of this firing. We are on constant watch. But I think you would have done better to have stayed in your own country. We of the Paris police are perfectly capable of handling such an affair ourselves, I assure you. Inspector Rigaud, the fact remains that two foreign office men died here under sinister circumstances. Yeah, nasty business, you know. British officials. Monsieur, I myself investigated the deaths. They were both self-inflicted. We of the Deuxième Bureau cannot fathom the mind of a suicide. Quite. But I doubt if the deaths were coincidental. Surely there must be some connecting link between them, Inspector? The only facts I can give you, monsieur, are these. Both men frequented an American-owned gambling casino in Montmartre. The name of it, please? Slater's en Rome Fontaine. The only other fact I can give you is that both the dead men were seen there in the company of a certain Mademoiselle Elvira. Ah, that must be the woman that Mycroft spoke of. Can you describe her, Inspector? Oh, what a woman. Although she is very young. Princes have dueled for her papers. Oh, huh? <laughs> At the moment, a high official of the Bank de France lies in a prison cell because he appropriated funds that he lavished on her. She is a femme fatale, monsieur. But she is as elusive as the wind. Well, Watson, our first move is obvious. Tonight we shall visit Slater's gambling casino on the Rue Fontaine and try our luck. <laughs> I say, Holmes, this is all rather exciting, isn't it? Paris at night, and we're on our way to an American gambling casino in the hopes of meeting a beautiful young spy named Elvira. <laughs> Just like a novel. Quite. Incidentally, since the young lady apparently moves in high society, I think it would be wiser if we give you a more impressive name. A uh, fictitious title, perhaps. Well, how about the title I used once before? Sir William Norton. Splendid. Sir William Norton it shall be. And I trust that Sir William remembers the role he is to play. Yes, indeed, Holmes. If I do meet the young lady, I'm to appear very susceptible to her beauty. Uh, not too hard for you, I imagine. And... Uh... And I'm to drop dark hints about the valuable secret that I'm carrying. Precisely, Watson. And uh, if the lady proves as intrigued as I hope she will, you will follow the matter through to its uh, logical conclusion. Well, logical conclusion, Holmes. Yes, I don't quite know how to take that. Ah, here's the casino. Courage, Watson. And good luck. Good evening. I'm Sam Slater. You gentlemen haven't been here before. No, Mr. Slater. My name is Sherlock Holmes, and uh, this is Sir William Norton. How, How do you do, do Sam? Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, the detective? Not here drumming up business, I hope. Oh, no. Just showing Sir William some of the sights of Paris. Fine. Then relax and enjoy yourself, gentlemen. Forget your profession, Mr. Holmes. In Paris at night, there's no crime. <laughs> or if there is, the police are conveniently blind to it. Glad to have you. Oh, nice place, Holmes. I think perhaps I'll take a little flutter at the tables. Uh, pardon, monsieur. You wish to speak to me, sir? Uh, yes. I could not help but overhear Slater mention your name. It is a great honor to meet Sherlock Holmes. Uh, uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am André Flandon. How do you do? And this is Sir William Norton. Do, I flatter myself that uh, perhaps you have heard of me. My poetry has been published in England. Oh, poetry, oh, Lord. No, Monsieur Flandon, I'm afraid it's escaped me. You have not heard my verses? Etant, etant salon, où seront jamais mon cœur? <laughs> Charming, do you not think? Quite. Though the metaphor seems a little involved, if you don't mind my saying so. What do you think, Sir William? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one language. That's English. <laughs> bon. Then I shall recite a poem of mine in English translation. Oh, must you? I say, Holmes, look at that stunning creature sitting by herself at the Chemin de Fur table. <laughs> She's smiling at me. Oh, you are fortunate, Sir William. That is Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira? Oh, never heard of her. And now, gentlemen, in translation, my poem begins... A grave as the grave, August as August heat... Yes, I think I'll try my luck at the tables over there. I'll see you later, Holmes. Much later, I hope, Sir William. William Norton, is it not? Yes, it is. Oh, I can't think how you recognize me, Miss, uh, uh, Madam... Uh... You may call me Elvira. Oh, well, that's very friendly of you. Uh, Elvira? <laughs> uh, how do you know me? 
Sam Slater told me who you were. He knows that I have a certain penchant for distinguished Englishmen. That's extremely flattering, but perhaps you'd care to join me in a glass of champagne. Oh, yes, I would like that. Let's sit at this table. Yes, you are. Garçon, garçon. Oui, monsieur. Uh, de champagne. Uh, uh, bon champagne, too. Oui, monsieur. You are here in Paris on business? Uh, uh-huh. Yes, yes, I am. Important business. You see, I'm... Uh, well, uh, I'm handling an extremely delicate and confidential matter for the British government. Oh, how very impressive. And I suppose you will be too busy to let me show you some of the sides of Paris. Oh, no, no, I don't think so. All work, no play, you know. I, I, I must be very flattered to escort you, but... Uh... Oh, good. <laughs> then if we are to be friends, hmm? I can't go on calling you Sir William. I think I shall call you Willie. Willie, no, 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 thank you, Willie. Oh, yes, thank you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Uh, open it up, will you? Oui, monsieur. Well, we must uh, drink a toast, do we? May I propose one uh, to Willie, the man of mystery? Oh, thank you, my dear. And I shall drink to uh, Elvira and to our better acquaintance. Mm. Good night, Willie. I shall see you tomorrow. Yes, rather. Uh, how about how about breakfast? Oh, it's nearly breakfast time now. Oh, is it really? How about lunch? <laughs> yes, yes, of course, my dear. But your important mission for the British government. Uh, when will you attend to that? Well, in a day or two, Elvira. Uh, good night, my dear. Come here, Willie. Closer. Good night. What? You, you kiss me, you little darling. Thanks awfully. <laughs> You're doing splendidly, Watson. Splendidly. Keep it up. Oh, she's a sweet little thing, Holmes. It's hard to believe that she's a spy. I told her that I was here on a secret and confidential mission. I even told her that I was carrying important naval plans. She didn't seem particularly interested. Of course not. She's much too clever to use the clumsy approach. She'll work slowly. She'll wait until she thinks she's got you completely captivated before she goes after that secret. Oh, then I'm just to carry on the way I did last night. Yes, old chap. Oh, good. Wine her, dine her, send her flowers, buy her jewellery. Make her think you're head over heels in love with her. I suspect that you won't find the job too unpleasant. Oh, I'm sure I shall. Now, Vera, you've been showing me past, but <laughs> this is the first time I've actually been in your flat. You like it, Willie? Yes, very much. <laughs> I thought it would be much quieter here. At dinner, you said you were going to explain some of your important business to me. You were going to show me what a secret treaty looks like. Yes, I know I said that, but... Uh... Well, Vera, a pretty girl like you wouldn't be interested in, in such matters. Oh, but I would. You have the treaty with you? Yes, I have. Then please let me see it. Oh, please, Willie. Oh, I can't go through this masquerade any longer. Masquerade? What do you mean? Well, I've, I've grown really fond of you in these last few days, Elvira. I can't let you walk into a trap. Trap? What are you talking about, Willie? I'm not Willie. I'm, I'm not Sir William Norton. My name's Watson. Dr. John H. Watson. My closest friend is the detective Sherlock Holmes. We came to Paris to try and trap you. Me? Oh, my dear girl, you're suspected of being mixed up in a spy ring. What? Well, that's why I pose as a, an important embassy from England. From England. Trap! Are you doddering, old fool? Oh, no, don't say that, don't say that. I'll teach you about trap. Elvira, put down that revolver. No, I'm going to. I'm... Oh, I'm... you're going to drop it, my dear. I can't do it. I'm just a stupid, weak female, after all. I've grown fond of you, too. The bumbling old walrus. Oh, there, 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 there. You remind me of my father. He was such a sentimental old fool. Like you. Just as sweet. Oh, there, you're young. I know you don't really want to stay mixed up with a bunch of criminals. No, no, no. Now, now, look here. You tell Sherlock Holmes and me what you know about this spy ring, and we'll see that no harm comes to you, my dear. I've wanted to get out of it for months. 
It was rather glamorous and exciting at first. And they paid me well. But I hate them now. And yet when I told them I wanted to get away, they threatened me. Oh, we'll take care of you. Just tell us who's at the head of the organization. That I don't know. But I can tell you a lot about some of the members. That's splendid. And slip on your coat and a funny little bonnet and, and we'll go over and talk to Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and have him see me looking like this. Oh, play eyes and red. Oh, no. You go and bring him here. By the time you get back, I'll be more presentable. All right, so, uh, I'll go and get him at once. <laughs> Watson, I'm occasionally astonished at the many facets to your character. Oh, thank you very much, Holmes. It's nice of you to say so. Your personal charm has apparently convinced a dangerous woman that crime does not pay. It's remarkable, if it's true. What do you mean, if it's true? Surely it must have occurred, even to a man burning with the zeal of one who was snatched a convert from the fiery flames, that this could be a trap for us to walk into. The delay, while the young lady makes herself presentable, would provide an excellent opportunity for her to summon her associates. Oh, upon my soul, Holmes, you're utterly cynical. I don't believe you have a heart. Possibly not, but I do have a head. Well, here's her place now. Stop, cabby, stop. Arete. Oh. I'll bet you a hundred pounds to a shilling that she's still waiting for us and alone. Long odds, Watson. Very long odds. Look, look, look. The concierge is sweeping up the steps. He'll be able to tell us if anyone's been here since I left. True. Uh, bonsoir. Bonsoir, monsieur. Vous parlez anglais? Yes, monsieur. Splendid fellow. Parlez anglais. Uh, look here, we were, we were calling on Mademoiselle Elvira. Has anyone been to see her in the last half an hour? Oui, monsieur. A hey, man. She left with him only five minutes ago. Do I do not think she wished to go? You mean that she was taken away by force? Not exactly, monsieur. But I could swear on the sacre coeur that the man who accompanied her was holding a pistol to her back. You don't mean it. I uh, think she has been, uh, how you say, kidnapped. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients, which is found in no other hair tonic. Kremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair, in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men... Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kremel help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K R E M L. Kremel hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, once again you left me on the edge of my chair. So when you went back to the girl's flat, she'd been kidnapped, hmm? What did you do next? Well, fortunately, the concierge was able to give us a good description of the cab driver. And, with the aid of Inspector Rigo, we were able to find the man and question him. He'd driven the couple, he told us, to a vile apache den in the alleys of Montmartre. Uh, a club known as the Scarlet Worm. Holmes and I, accompanied by the French inspector, lost no time in taking a cab to the place. Messieurs. I should not permit you to visit Le Ver Eterlat, the scarlet worm, as you would say, without my protection. It is a cesspool of the underworld. Men have been known to enter there and make their exit by back door, at first into the sewer. Oh, Lord, they've taken that poor little girl there. Uh... Inspector Rigo, as I said, Mademoiselle Elvira told my friend that she does not know who is at the head of this organization. Have you any suspicions? Yes, but little else, my friend. One thing we are sure of. This man of mystery, the brain behind these criminals, is not French. Probably he is English. An Englishman or a Jolinot? Ah. 
Le Ver et Carlat is waiting for us. Be on the alert, my friends, and keep close to me. I told you we didn't want to do it. Oh, well, there's Sam Slater, the man who, who owns the casino we went to the other night. Yes, and he seems to be involved in a violent argument. Yeah, a rat hole like this, you don't know what you're doing, sir, but... What are you doing here? Stay in your own golden fish time. Who's the man that Slater's arguing with, Inspector? Well, that is Chavert, the owner of this establishment. Oh, Slater's leaving. I wonder what he was doing in a place like this. Uh, come, we'll speak to Chavert and find out. Et bonsoir, Chavert. Uh, bonsoir. Ah, I am honored with a visit from the inspector, the detector. Que voulez-vous? Since when does a visitor from the Desiam Bureau have to explain his business, Chabert? Tell me, why was Slater here? And why did you argue? Bah, sure. He comes here to try and hire some of my apache. He has troubled collecting his gambling debts. I spit on him and his high class victims. Let the kind stick to themselves. I'm not bothered if, uh, if I left. <laughs> Let's sit at the table, shall we? We might as well be as unobtrusive as possible. I shall rejoin you in a moment, monsieur. I wish to make some investigation. Watson, you seem to be a positive magnet towards the fair sex. Look at this uh, young lady heading for you. Oh, red hair, belly, and a painted face. Not my type, I'm afraid. Bonsoir, monsieur. Voulez-vous m'offrir un impératif? Uh, run along, young lady, and don't sit there. Oh, no, no, Watson. Where's your chivalry? Please sit down, won't you? Merci, monsieur. Pretend you don't recognize me. Of course I don't. Never saw you before in my life. Whereas I've been keeping silence, Mademoiselle Elvira. Elvira! The wig is excellent and the use of makeup superb, Mademoiselle. But I recognized you at once by the confirmation of your earlobes. Elvira, why are you disguised? Why'd they bring you here? Shh. I cannot speak now. You must get me away at once. Be careful. I'm being watched. We can't leave by the front way. But I know a back staircase that leads from the cellar. But there may be trouble. You take her, Watson. I'll guard the retreat. When the music starts again, dance with her. When you get to the back of the hall, slip out. I'll join you at the hotel. Oh, Lord. Look, 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 Holmes. Look who's coming to our table. It's that ghastly poet fellow we met at the casino. Andre Flandon. Pay no attention. I'll take care of him. Ah, once again, I meet my friend Sherlock Holmes. I have a new poem that I've composed in your especial honor. Dance, Watson, and good luck. All right, you are, Holmes. Come along, my dear. Come along. Your friends leave. Au revoir. Now, I shall tell you my poem. It begins... Well, Vera, my dear, I can't tell you how relieved I am to find you all right. Shh. Don't look so serious. Pretend that I'm some girl that you don't know. Laugh. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's better. Now, dance me toward that door in the corner. There we are. <laughs> now, let's slip through it. I can't see a thing. Follow me. There are stone stairs here. Careful. Where do these lead? To an alley. Oh, careful. The stairs turn here. There's a light coming up the steps towards us. Shut up! You did not think you could live so easily, did you, Elvira? Uh, I've been waiting for you. Look out! He's got an eye! But he can't see without his lantern. Where's that path? Uh, run, Elvira! I'll follow you! Run, run, run! You will follow her! Oh, won't I? How'd you like that, you filthy swine? Watson, are you all right? Yes, Holmes, I'm quite all right. Then run, old chap. I'll take care of this end. See that the girl is safe. <laughs> Now that we're all safely back at the hotel, I can tell you, Holmes, that I hated leaving you in that filthy den. Inspector Rigaud had a revolver. It's more efficient than a knife, eh, Inspector? It was a near thing, Monsieur Holmes. You fought bravely, and so did your recumbent friend on the sofa there. Andre Flandon, the poet. I wondered why you brought him back here. For a poet, he uses his fists with surprising skill. He must be hurt. He seems to be unconscious. I think he's suffering from the effects of a trifle too much absinthe. I hadn't the heart to leave him. Ah, there you are, Mademoiselle Elvira. You're feeling no ill effects, I hope? No, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. Then, now that we're all assembled, supposing you tell us your story. Who kidnapped you tonight? It was one of Chavez's men. They made me disguise myself and swear never to see either of you again, on pain of death. Instead of which, we came to see you. We knew that Chavez was connected with the spies. Now he is safely under lock and key. But we still don't know who is at the head of this organization. 
Can you give us any clues, mademoiselle? I... I think that the man you want was waiting in the cab that took me to the Scarlet Worm. But he was masked and he never spoke. Can't you recall anything that might give us a clue? Oh, one incident, if it means anything. Chavez's man said to him, We go to the Scarlet Worm, eh? That is good. You also, you make worms, no? And then he laughed. He said this in French, of course? Yes, yes, he did. Then the case is solved. I'm an idiot. I should have spotted it sooner. The man you want, Inspector, is lying asleep on the... Look out! He's not asleep. Watson, he's got a revolver. Oh, no, you don't. Oh! He's gone to sleep again. Really, Watson, you're in splendid form tonight. But, Monsieur Holmes, why do you say that man is the culprit? You yourself gave me the clue, Inspector, when you told me that the criminal was an Englishman posing as a Frenchman. But you only met the fellow on two occasions, and then not for more than a few minutes. It was long enough to realize that Flandau was really an Englishman. The first time we met him, he quoted a poem that he said was translated from the French. The translation was, Grave as the grave, August as August heat. The poem could not have been translated from the French because both of those puns are possible only in the English language. But how did my repeating the conversation in the cab give you a clue, Mr. Holmes? Because it was another pun. In French, the word for worms and for verses is the same. There. Spelt V-R-S. I see it now. When the man in the cab said, you make worms, he also meant, you make verses. Precisely, Watson. And thereby pointed directly at the poet there. With André Flandin, or whatever his real name is, in prison, I'm sure Mycroft will have no more trouble with his spy ring. Ladies, of course you use a shampoo to wash your hair, but just a word of caution. There are many popular shampoos today which leave the hair lustrous but have a tendency to dry the hair. And that's why I advise you to always use Cremel shampoo. How right you are, Joe. Lovely Powers models were among the very first to discover the amazing, beautifying qualities of Cremel shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves hair with more brilliant, glossy, natural highlights. Yet under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry your hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, after a Cremel shampoo, your hair actually radiates natural, brilliant luster. But Cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy today that has a beneficial built-in oil base, which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. So, ladies, be smart. Always wash your hair with Cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining beauty, yet in no way hurts the texture. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week, what shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of how Sherlock Holmes, by solving an ancient musical cipher, managed to save the estates and restore the fortunes of the Earl of Moultrie. I call it The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey. Tonight's newest Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Naval Treaty. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes.
Well, once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments, our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell, just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Moultrie Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer, keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kreml. If you're using some other hairdressing, change to Kreml. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking when you use Kreml. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable bead and the adventure of Maltry Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. It was shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room, suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boa and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly, with a plunge like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Oh, took her a long enough time to, to make up her mind in home. Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affaire du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. Oh, she looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Yes, I know yes. Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering her. Yes, yes, sir. Of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man who wants oh, Quiet, Watson. Oh, sorry. Uh, Please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Davis wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. Uh, supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, <laughs> very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mention your brother's title. May I ask what that title is? Uh, my brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltry, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently, and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful bore, but extremely wealthy. And he, he wants to marry you, sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. 
Now he's offered Harold 50,000 pounds in cash if he'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of male kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltree, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says, if the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable bead. Beadle, some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bede, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bede. Bede. Yes, spelt B E D E. Oh, B D. Oh. The Venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Mm, yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that. <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltrees were in trouble, they should play a bit peculiar piece of music which he composed. Piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltrees couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd bring your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Mortree Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. An express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Oh, so it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. An eighth-century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case, shall you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. I'll just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Maltry Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it and my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm, what a beautiful building. Must be very old. Or oh, 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly a hundred years later. 16th century? Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you a prize possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes. It's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. Uh, note particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... How many times I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum? Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, what on the devil's going on out there? Oh, come on. Come down, your evidence. Take that. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Jonathan, what's the matter? Harold, I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice today I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago I was taking a walk by the bottom of the tarn, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him sneaking after me here. I say you must discharge him, Harold. But he was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. Is one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African oh, slave driver comes in. Oh, I'll have your blood. you see if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. Now, clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. How are you, gentlemen? Don't excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. Oh, filthy bully. 
That poor devil of a groom was half his size. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by uh, the bottomless tarn half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless tarn? Oh, it's a lake on the estate, just behind the gamekeeper's cottage. Here's a legend that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago, a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. We dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Ah, oh, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Here you are. Thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. Oh, it says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is in answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltree fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear the devil's covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. <laughs> Now that Sibyl's played that rather dull piece of discordancy, I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltree fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mysterious message. Yeah, blessed if I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to Never me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? Huh. I, too, have my investigators, Harold. They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. Ah, <clears throat> oh, there you are again. What are you doing listening at the door, you filthy swine? I was just to go into the kitchen. Oh! Uh, get to the stables where you belong. I see that groom again, Harold. I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sybil. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. He's a thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, if you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco. I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow, we... Moultrie Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my... Uh, Peculiar modesty needs your constant reassurance. Uh, I can finally sleep out. Then why not go to sleep, my dear well, chap? How can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da 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 lot of rubbish. Sit up half the night. We'll get you. Oh yeah, I'm gonna sleep. When the mall trees are in need, seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the mole tree's problems. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the mole tree is in need, seek the venerable bee. I've got it. 
Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh, 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 what's, uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic? Cremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes. And it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell. I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as we went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure that... Absolutely certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, and, and then close. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Well, that's Jonathan Zever's room. Well, I suppose he knows what we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, yeah. here's the door. Look, 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 look. Through the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede, Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B E. D-E-E, B-E-A-D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B-E-D-E obviously stand for Bede, the venerable Bede, and we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B-E-A-D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B-E-A-D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, by George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the front. It slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltry fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. Oh, must have built these steps for pygmies. Holmes, do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. 
a crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer, has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust, and yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table, as though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha. Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots, rectangularly spaced. I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family, and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Devers is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though, what would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question... I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I am a millionaire, and therefore I don't need the treasure. Too risk it to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I have the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. So I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. A fathomless lake on this estate. Better be the place, the bottomless tarn. Of course. Remember the Devers told us earlier that he'd been walking by it this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. Look, look, look. There, in the moonlight. It's Jonathan Devers. He's running towards the edge of the lake. Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag. Which means that we can run faster than he can. You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have. Don't hesitate to use it. This devil's work must be stopped. Come on, faster, faster. Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him. He's at the edge of the top. Drop that bag, Mr. Devers. You're too late, my friend. Drop it or I'll shoot. I'll drop it in the bottom of the star. There. <laughs> uh, goodbye to the treasure of the Maltese. You devil. You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. That was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the tarn. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. Good Lord, it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag and went off to get his coat before coming out here, I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book and I filled the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll No, you skin. won't, Devers. Or you'll end up in the tarn where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be, they must be, the original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the more trees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. Rubbish. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity. All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. A very satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back to London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. The fortunes of the Maltrees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody... And, uh, And Scotland Yard will get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Anthony Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltry Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. 
Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. And then I suppose the first earl discovered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Moultrie family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Moultries be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved and uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as uh, our most successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory, and how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Divinely Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who had terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the tolling bell. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now let's drop in for our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you this evening? Uh, never better, Mr. Bell, thank you. And you? Fine, thanks. Ah, uh -huh, I see. You've kept your promise to open your dispatch box and bring out your files in connection with the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Indeed I have, Mr. Bell, just as I promised. And a most macabre adventure it was, too. Well, I'm eager to hear it. So you shall, Mr. Bell, so you shall. But first, uh, am I correct in deducing that you have, you'd like to have a word with uh, 
with our listeners? <laughs> a most accurate deduction, Dr. Watson. Men, if you want your hair to look handsomely groomed from morning until night, use Kreml hair tonic. Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that offensive, cheap, greasy look. Kreml always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Carpathian horror? It all began with this very letter which I have here in my hand, Mr. Bell. A letter from a most prosaic firm of solicitors. Holmes and I were at breakfast one spring morning in June 902 shortly after the end of the South African War. Holmes had been bored and restless since the conclusion of our last case. And this was the first time that I'd heard him laugh for days. I must say, Watson, that the Morning Post has brought at least one unusual communication. For a mixture of the modern and the medieval, of the uh, practical and the wildly fanciful, this letter is really the limit. Oh? Why, Holmes? Listen. 24, Gray's Inn, London, June the 4th. Re-vampires. Re-what? Re-vampires. The legal mind is always precise, no matter how odd the subject. The letter goes on as follows. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Sir, our client, Count Paul Romani of Grasnia in Carpathia, whose trustees we are, has made inquiry from us in a communication of even date concerning vampires and demoniac possession. As our firm specializes entirely in trusteeships and chancery work, the matter hardly comes within our purview. And we trust that you will be able to take the matter in hand. We hope you will call upon us at your earliest convenience with a view toward undertaking the case. Please ask for our Mr. Atterbury. We remain, sir, faithfully yours, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. <laughs> Scott Holmes, that's the weirdest farrago of legal jargon and sheer nonsense that I've ever heard. I wonder, Watson, the mention of Carpathia is most significant. Significant of what? Uh, for one thing, that remote and mountainous section of southeastern Europe has been the stronghold for centuries of all the legends of vampirism. Oh, rubbish. Oh, come, come, Watson. Where's your spirit of adventure? After weeks of lying in the doldrums, here's a fresh breeze from the unexpected uh, environs of Gray's Inn. Come on, it's a beautiful morning for a walk. Well, where to? Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. And then, I hope, Carpathia. <laughs> forsaken spots that I've ever seen. This is the worst. Not a light in sight, not a sign of human habitation. And you've dragged me two-thirds of the way across Europe on what will unquestionably prove a wild goose chase. At least we have our fishing rods with us, my dear fellow. And we can always console ourselves with the promise of some of the best trout streams to be found anywhere. And you must admit that this mountainous Carpathian country offers some superb scenery. <laughs> I might admit it if I could see it, as it's uh, black as the ace of spades, to coin a phrase. <laughs> ah, there we are. Here, look out of the window on this side. And there are the lights of the castle. Cheerful looking place, I must say. When did that fellow Atterbury say that it had been built? The first Count Romany built it in 1410. 1410? That's given it almost 500 years in which to disintegrate. Do me a pile of stone if ever I saw one. Look at all those turrets and battlements. Probably damper inside than out. Well, we'll soon see. Aye, careful with that luggage driver, careful. Here you are, my man. Well, they follow that driver. You think the devil was after him the way he drove off? He shut up the moment he heard our destination. Evidently, the Count's local reputation is not an enviable one. Well, I can't say that we're getting a very warm reception. They must have heard us, driver. Well, here's the door, but I can't see any sign of a bell. And they seem a trifle short of modern conveniences. Let's try the knocker. I really think this is perfectly outrageous, Holmes. Why the devil do... Esternam. What you say? Esternam. Oh, foreign Holmes. Uh, do you speak English? What do you want? Nobody can come in. Count Romania see nobody. Uh, Count Romania is expecting us. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You got letter? Yes. Here. Come. Tell you, Holmes. 
Look at these walls. Simply oozing dampness. You, uh, wait here. There, Watson. That's better, isn't it? That fire will take the chill out of your bones. I need something to counteract the effect of all those family portraits. <laughs> Rum-looking lot, aren't they? Remarkably interesting collection. Curious how the family likeness remains unmistakable through so many generations. Well, judging from the looks of that fellow in the wig, cirrhosis of the liver must have been another of the family's inheritances. Hard-drinking crew, probably. Terrible, Mr. Holmes. I'm Count Romany. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Thank you, Count Romany. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Dr. Watson, it was good of you to come so far. Uh, something to drink, gentlemen? Oh, a little something to go very well, thank you. Good. I don't know just how much my solicitors in London may have told you, Mr. Holmes. A very little, Count Romany. Uh, so little, in fact, that I must confess my surprise at your perfect command of our language. Oh, well, my father had me educated in England. Very sound, sir. Couldn't do better. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. I... I hardly know where to begin my story. The whole thing so horrible. Perhaps that... it'll make it a bit easier for you if I tell you that Mr. Atterbury showed me your letters to him. Then you know that... that I believe I'm going mad. Or worse. Oh, Dr. Watson will bear me out, Count Romany, when I tell you that uh, people who really are on the verge of insanity never think it of themselves. Oh, no, it's quite so, quite so. I wish I could share that belief. But you see these portraits of my family. There have been strange legends coming down through the years of occasional weird and nameless horrors that have taken possession of each fourth generation. The fourth Romany died mad. The eighth lived out his life in a locked and guarded tower of the castle. And I am the twelfth Romany. All old families have legends. That's uh, hardly a basis for any fear. I, I quite agree with you. But some months ago, my father died, and I became the twelfth count. A few weeks later, I retired to bed one evening after reading quietly here in the library. Only to undergo a dream of such vividness that I shall never forget it. A dreamt of brightly colored corridors. Their length stretching endlessly into the distance. Their walls echoing with strange, unworldly music. In my dream, I hurried from empty room to empty room. Through floods of brilliant, very colored light. I saw no people, no living thing. Only the rooms of ruby and gold and jet and sapphire and emerald. At times the music seemed to be far away, thin and cold as though coming from the depths of interstellar space. And then again it would seem so near that, that I was certain I would find its source in the next room that I entered. In my endless search for I knew not what. At last... After I answered time, I awoke to find myself in my own bedroom. Oh, but my dear fellow, my dear fellow, a vivid dream's nothing unusual. It wasn't a dream, Doctor. It was what I saw upon awaking in my room. My door was still locked, but the rug bore the imprint of wet and naked feet. And across the foot of my bed there lay, still dripping, some strands of weed from the moat of the castle. Surely there's a natural explanation for that. Yes, my boy. Are you by any chance subject to walking in your sleep? No, Dr. Watson. And even if I were, I could not have walked through a locked and bolted door. And the windows? The windows of my room give on a wall of the castle that drops sheer for 60 feet. Nothing but a fly could go up or down. Well, Mr. Holmes, the next morning, a dog belonging to one of the local woodcutters was found dead in the castle moat. And with no blood left in his body. And the next time, time, Count Romany, I'm certain there must have been repetitions to bring you to your present fear. The next dream came a few weeks later. Again, I saw the brilliantly colored rooms. Again, I heard the unearthly music. And when you awoke? I was in my bed. And for a moment, I thought that nothing was wrong. Then, when I turned up the lamp, I saw streaks of gray across my bedspread. And grayish footprints upon the rug. Dust? Dust, Mr. Holmes. And a moment later, I received horrible confirmation of its source. For lying beside me on the pillow was the heavy, ancient wrought iron key which unlocks the burial vaults of the Roman oh, Extraordinary thing. Since your action in sending for me shows that you don't lack for moral courage, Count Romany, I'm certain that you paid an immediate visit to your family vaults. Quite right, Mr. Holmes, quite right. 
In the company of my cousin Peter and several of the servants, and with torches to light our way, we visited the subterranean vault which is cut into the mountainside under the castle. And you found? We... We found that the coffins of the fourth and eighth Count Romani had been opened. Their lids shoved aside, and the bones of my ancestors tumbled out upon the stone. Oh. Here, 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 my boy. Here. Drink this. You'll feel better. Thank you, Doctor. Well, now you understand, Mr. Holmes, why I sent for you. I do indeed. I consulted doctors. They gave me pills to make me sleep when sleep was the one thing I dreaded. The local priest spoke learnedly of exorcism and its possession by the devils. But it could not put an end to my dreams. The servants have run away in superstitious fear. Oh, except old Anton, who admitted you. The peasants flee at the sight of me. Only my cousin Peter Hallish, who has stayed bravely and loyally at my side, still remains with me. Mr. Holmes, am I mad? Tell me, am I mad? Or am I cursed by some fearful family taint? All that I can tell you at the moment, Count Romany, is that the priest was not mistaken when he said the devil has been at work here. I must apologize, gentlemen, for our limited cuisine. But with all of the staff gone except old Anton, our meals are rather scratchy affairs. Oh, my dear Count Romani, your wine cellar more than makes up for it. Well, you know, if you would take my prescription, Paul, and get out on a horse every day for a few hours of hunting, you would have a better appetite. <laughs> my cousin Peter is quite a materialist, gentlemen. He believes that all the evils of the flesh and the spirit can be cured by enough exercise. <laughs> and... I will wager that Dr. Watson agrees with me, eh? Eh, Doctor? Well, there's a good deal to be said for your theory, Mr. Hellish. Men sana in corpore sano, you know. <laughs> your cousin is, of course, familiar with the events you described to us earlier, Count Romanian. Oh, of course, Mr. Holmes. I've no secrets from good old Peter here. And what is your opinion of these strange events, Mr. Halash? Too much reading, too much thinking, too much brooding about the sins of our ancestors. I only hope that you and Dr. Watson can persuade Paul that all these dreams of his are just a lot of nonsense. Well, I hope so, too, I assure you. Uh, and now, gentlemen, I imagine you're ready to retire. We've had a long and wearying trip. I'll ring for Anton. Should there be a recurrence of your dreams, Count Romani? Please call me the instant you awaken. Oh, well, damp walls or no damp walls, I shall have no trouble sleeping tonight. I'm afraid you will, Watson. Huh? I intend that one of us shall keep the Count's door under observation all night. For heaven's sake, why? There's no doubt in your mind the poor chap is definitely unbalanced, is there? Is that your opinion? Certainly. Oh, this cake of delusions I overheard. Poor chap, absolutely certifiable. Nevertheless, Watson, we shall keep watch. I'll take the first, and I shall call you at midnight. What's the matter? Watson, wake up. Uh, what's up? I thought you were on watch. Oh, I must have dropped off. I can't understand Let how. wait. Uh, what is it? The Count. Come quick. Look, look Mr. Mr. Holmes. My cousin. There in his bed. Good heavens, Holmes. There's blood smeared all over his hands and on the bedclothes. But no sign of a wound. Just a minute. I can feel his pulse. He's only fainted. Now, what happened? I, I heard him cry out. Ran down to his room. The door was half open and Paul was lying across the bed. Just as you see him now. It is the curse of the Romanists. Anton, stop that nonsense. No nonsense. Priests say my master possessed by evil spirit. What's that? Sounds like someone riding hard. Coming this way. I will go to the door. Uh, you were right, Holmes. I can't find any sign of a wound on his body. I can't imagine where the blood came from. I very much fear that I can. What do you mean? Holmes. Holmes. Count Romanists. Oh, my dream, Holmes. My dream. I had it again tonight. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. That's the police inspector from Brasnia. A young girl was murdered tonight. Oh, no. And the prints of a man's naked feet led directly here to the castle. In 
just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of Count Romany. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, get your money's worth. Enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. But Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. You simply can't beat Cremel to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. No wonder Cremel is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Cremel daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened? After Count Romani's third and most terrible dream. Well, Romani was such a in such a state of profound shock over the horror that had taken place that I thought it best to administer a strong sedative, leaving Anton to watch over his master. Holmes and I, with Mr. Peter Hallish to act as interpreter, drove down with the police inspector to the home of the murdered girl. Ask the inspector to bring that lamp a little nearer, will you, Mr. Hallish? Jose de Olympite. Shocking, Holmes. Simply shocking. Her injuries look as though they'd been done by a wild animal. You're quite right, Watson. <laughs> My poor cousin. Oh, no court could hold him legally responsible. He'd have to be put away, of course. Hello, what's, what's all that shouting outside? It's the peasants. The news must have spread. They're shouting, To each our fellow Kosh, they burned the castle. Palalo Vampira. Death to the vampire. Hakasuk cell. Hang them. Well, Holmes, we'd better drive back to the castle immediately. That mob's in an angry temper. They mustn't be allowed to wreak their vengeance on that poor mad boy. Quite right, Watson. I've seen all I wish to hear. Come, Mr. Hallish. We'd better be getting back to the castle just as fast as we can. As a medical man, Dr. Watson, do you think that... If there's any chance that my cousin, under proper treatment and care, might eventually be brought back to normality. Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hallish. In fact, these cases generally grow progressively worse. Well, here's the poor fellow's room. He's probably still asleep from the effects of the sedative that I gave him. Ah, Anton. Is the Count still asleep? Well, speak up, man. The bed, it's empty. He's gone. Gone? Gone? He gone where you never find him. My master no wait for you to lock him up like animals. What shall we do? Where has he gone? Those peasants will be here in an hour. Holmes, what are you looking for? There's something that should be here on the desk. Something the Count showed us last night. The key to the Roman burial vault. But, but why should he... Why should he take that, Mr. Holmes? Gone right enough. Bring that lamp, Watson. We may yet be in time to avert the final disaster. <laughs> Careful, Doctor. Steps ahead here. The floor is very slippery. And this passageway must have been cut out of the very heart of the mountain. It was. they deep in the rock itself. If all these twistings and turnings haven't confused my sense of direction, we must be almost under the castle. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The burial vault. Oh, boy. Are you hurt, Watson? Yes, my feet simply went right out from under me. Just broke the lamp, I'm afraid. I know the passageway. Not much farther to the burial chamber. We will have to go slowly, though. Make what speed you can. I'll keep my hand on your shoulder. Watson, do the same with me. I only hope it hasn't occurred to him to lock the door of the vault after he entered it. If it did, we're beaten. Be careful now. The passage bends sharp to the right. Just a bit farther along. Well, wouldn't it be more merciful, Holmes, to let the poor fellow take his own way out? After all, the best we can save him for is a living death in a madhouse. Ah, that's a glimmer of light just ahead. The door to the vault. The jar. He must have a lamp inside. Let me go first. It's so faint, I can't see much. What are all those big, bulky shapes? The stone coffins of our ancestors. There's something moving over there in the shadow behind that stone pillar. It's a count. He's got a knife. Oh, Pete, look out, Robin. Be careful, Holmes. He's mad. Let me go. Let oh. me finish. Oh, oh. I don't want to stop. Drop that knife. No, no. Give me a hand here, Watson. No. I've got it. I've no. got it. No. <laughs> Oh, you're wounded. Oh, it's nothing. Just a scratch on my oh, head. Why did you have to interfere? I'd be better off dead. Come, Paul. You mustn't talk like that. Take the lamp, Mr. Hallash, and lead the way. I want to get your cousin back up to the castle at once. Oh, it's against the 
it's my rule to take a drink before breakfast, but this morning I'll break that rule. Thank you, Anton. Sit here, Count Romany. And you, Mr. Hallash, over there. Anton, lock that door and remain in case I should need you. Oh, what is the use of prolonging the agony, Mr. Holmes? If you'd let me finish things down there... We it... haven't much time left, Count Romany. The peasants from the village may be here at any moment. Well, then turn me over to them and let them do what they want. You know we would never do that, Paul. We will protect you no matter what happens. And no matter what you may have done. After all, you weren't responsible for your actions. I'm afraid I must correct you there, Mr. Hallash. Count Romania is and has been fully as responsible for everything he has done as any other sane person. What sort of riddle are you asking us, Holmes? Are you attempting to deny Count Romania's uh, dreams, the episode of the dog, the burial vault, and the horrible death of that girl? I'm not offering a riddle, Watson, but its solution. Your dreams, Count Romania, had one feature which immediately led me to suspect their unnatural origin. You spoke of brilliant colors, of unearthly music, of a distorted sense of space and time. All characteristics of the dreams, or more properly, visions induced by the drug Cannabis Indica, more commonly known as hashish. Good heavens. And since you showed none of the signs of the habitual drug taker, it was at once obvious to me that your dreams were being induced by someone else. Someone who administered the drug to you in your food or wine on those occasions when they desired you to have one of your hallucinations. But last night, that girl, the blood... The blood stains were the final confirmation, if I needed any, that you had not committed the crime. The real killer slipped badly there. It did not occur to him when smearing the blood upon you and the bedclothes that during a four-mile walk from where that poor girl was killed, the gull, the blood would have dried upon you and not come off upon the bedclothes. Peter Hallash, have you ever seen an execution in this country? Why do you address me? What have I to do with all this? Who but you would inherit the Romany title and estates? No, no! In the early hours of dawn, the prisoner is led out. His hands tied behind him. The priest walking in front and the jailers on each side. Mr. Holmes! He's led to this the stained wooden enough. block in the center of the prison courtyard, where there stands a giant figure in full evening dress, his hands covered by white gloves, his face masked. It is the execution. Stop it! Then, as the Stop wretched it, man is bent forward on the block, the executioner raises his gleaming axe high into the air for the final blow. I've had enough. I... Have you ever seen that, Peter Hallash? No, no. I am innocent. I swear it. Do you think a judge will believe you? no. He did not do it. He speaks true. It was I. You shall do nothing to harm him. Hands on you. I, this is impossible. I do it for my master and for revenge. But you never take me alive. Open oh, the window. No need to look out of the window. It's a drop of a hundred feet to the courtyard below. Oh. And perhaps it was best it ended that way. But, Holmes... I, I, I still don't understand. It's not difficult if you study the facts. Oh, poor Anton. But why did you accuse me, Holmes? Anton's fanatic plot to drive the Count to madness or suicide and to see, see you in his place almost succeeded, Mr. Hallash. When his sleeve slipped upward and I saw the cut he'd made on his arm to supply the blood, I knew that he was the girl's murderer. But there was only one way by which I could force the truth from him. And I suspected that his devotion to you was so strong that only an accusation against you would unseal his lips. A hatred that Anton must have nursed since childhood. I knew that my father had wronged his family, but... Well, I, I thought that was all dead and buried history. Not to a fanatical Carpathian peasant, Count Romany. Mr. Holmes, you've given me back my life, my sanity. There was never any question of your sanity, Count Romany. I saw that from the moment you first told me about the story of your dreams. Well, nevertheless, I don't know how I can ever thank you properly. If, uh... You and your cousin will introduce Watson and myself to some of your famous local fishing. I'll consider it thanks enough. And that uh, reminds me, Watson. Would you mind taking down a telegram for me? This little cut uh, momentarily precludes the use of my right a hand. A telegram? Of course, um... Oh, you'll find the pen and ink on the table there. All ready. Who's it to? Messrs. Uh, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. Grays in London, England. How do you spell Dodd? The two Ds, Watson. Re-vampires. Gentlemen, I take pleasure in informing you that I have brought the matter of your client, Count Paul Romany, to a satisfactory conclusion. Trusting to be favored by you with any further such commissions that uh, may arise, I remain your obedient servant, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> friends here is specially transcribed for you as a famous celebrity, that great authority on feminine beauty, the king of glamour, John Robert Powers himself. 
Mr. Powers. Thank you, Joe. Well, that was quite a send-off. I thought it might be of interest to our audience tonight if I brought along one of my Powers girls. As you know, these lovely Powers girls appear on magazine covers, they star in exclusive fashion shows, and very appropriately are called long-stemmed American beauties. So tonight I'd like you to meet Miss Maria Morton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mmm, that's a very attractive spring hat you're wearing, Maria. Like it? Yes, very much. But how about removing it so we can see those lovely shining locks? Why, of course. I'd love to. Mmm, Maria, your hair certainly looks like a million dollars. Thanks to you, Mr. Powers. To me? Yes. The first advice you gave me when I became a Powers model was to always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. And I must say, never in my life have I used any shampoo that left my hair more radiant. Yes, I'm completely sold on cremel shampoo. You see, cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its natural brilliant luster. And don't forget to mention the built-in oil base. And that's what helps keep the hair from becoming dry and brittle. The Powers girls tell me that after cremel shampoo, their hair holds a wave and curl much better. In fact, I certainly recommend Cramble Shampoo not only to the Powers girls, but to every woman who wants to bring out the radiant, shining beauty in her hair. Thank you very much, Mr. Powers, for this beauty tip. And many thanks to your beautiful model. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I should tell you about the strange death of a young Sussex schoolmaster. And how Holmes solved one of the most bizarre and most terrifying mysteries that we ever encountered. I call it The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. Tonight's adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the lion's mane. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, here we are again visiting the genial Dr. Watson in his cheerful study. We sit back in our comfortable chair and wait to hear another exciting story. What could be pleasant? <laughs> you go again, Mr. Bell, flattering me again. If only Sherlock Holmes were here to make the picture complete. No, Mr. Bell, you know that's impossible. He retired to Sussex years ago and took up bee farming. I suppose you visited him there. Naturally. As a matter of fact, I remember one Saturday towards the end of July... In 1907, that we... Is this the beginning of a story, Dr. Watson? I shouldn't be surprised. But hadn't you better have your word with our listeners first? Yes, Dr. Watson, I had. Men, I'm sure you'll be interested to learn that a recent survey showed that Kremel hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But after all, why shouldn't it be? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kremel always keeps the hair neatly in place longer with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kremel, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Just use a little Kremel on your hair in the morning... And at night, your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. Remember, no other hair tonic keeps your hair more handsomely groomed. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. 
Now, Dr. Watson, I'm all ears. Well, I was paying Holmes one of my frequent visits. His cottage is situated on the southern slope of the Sussex Downs, commanding an excellent view of the English Channel. At this point, the coast is made up of chalk cliffs, which can only be descended by a single tortuous path, which is steep and slippery. At the bottom of the path, there are curves and hollows, which make splendid swimming pools, and are filled afresh with each flow of the tide and warmed by the sun. What town is Mr. Holmes' place near? A village called Falworth. But even that is at a distance, and the house is quite lonely. Half a mile away is Holmes' only neighbor. And who is that? Harold Stackhurst, who's the headmaster of the well-known preparatory school, the Gables. A private school, I suppose you would call it. It was summer, and most of the boys were away on holiday, except a few who were catching up. The teaching staff was reduced to three. First of all, there was Harold Stackhurst himself, who was an old pal of mine. We went to stool together. He was a splendid fellow and a well-known blue for rowing in his day. Assisting him were two younger men, Fitzroy McPherson, red-headed and cheerful. In summer and winter, he went for his morning swim. Winter swimming, quite a spartan. <laughs> yes, indeed. The other schoolmaster was Ian Murdoch, a tall, dark man, taciturn and aloof, with occasional outbursts of temper. The villain of the piece, hmm? There you go, anticipating again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Stop this. Well, it was early one morning, just after sunrise. There'd been a severe gale the day before, but the wind and the waves had finally abated and everything looked newly washed and fresh. The air had a decided nip to it, and Holmes and I were on our way down to the beach for our morning flight. I say, Holmes, that water's blue this morning, isn't it? Rather cold looking, if you ask me. Do you good, Watson. Your circulation needs toning up. You can run all the way home. Run up the cliff path? Oh, it's bad for hard. Rubbish. The boys do it. Well, I'm not under the delusion that I'm still in my first youth. <laughs> Hello. Isn't that Stackhurst coming along the cliff? He's got a towel over his arm, obviously going down to the beach. He's not afraid of a little cold water. And he's almost as old as you are. He's older. Oh? Oh, great deal older. He was two forms above me at school. Dear, dear, quite an old man. I had no idea oh, that... Stop ragging me, Holmes. Hello there, Sackhurst. Hello. Hello. Going swimming? Yes, wait for us. Come on, Watson. Oh, bless my soul if it isn't Watson. Delighted to see you, old chap. I thought you weren't coming down for another well, month. Well, I just couldn't stay away any longer. I'm so fond of the swimming here. Yes, Watson has just been saying that there's nothing like a good dip before breakfast to tone up the system. <coughs> what did you say, Watson? Oh, I think, I think so. Stankhurst, where are your two young assistants, McPherson and Murdoch, the gloomy Scott? I've never known them to miss their matutinal plunge. Oh, well, Murdoch has had to keep some of the boys at their algebra. He'll be along later. Uh, McPherson has gone on ahead. I expect he's in the water now. Any more outbursts of temper on Murdoch's part lately? No, not since last week, when he found a boy putting toads in his bed. <laughs> his temper is ferocious, Holmes. I suppose I should give him dismissal, but he's such a confoundedly good teacher. A little bit of temper won't harm the boys now and then. Help to keep them in line. Yes, I'll wager the next fellow who wants to put extraneous objects in Murdoch's bed will think twice about it. Look, there's someone staggering up the edge of the cliffs. Yes, he's in bathing trunks and an overcoat flapping in the wind. What's the matter with him? He's drunk, probably. Look at him real. A fine example for my boys. Um, who the devil can it be? It's... Yes, it's McPherson. I could tell that red hair anywhere. He's trying to wave to us. I've never known him to behave like this. He's not drunk. He is in agony. He needs help. Hurry, Watson, run. I say, he, he, he's fainted. No, 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 he's, he's trying to get up again. Help! Well, he, he's writhing on the ground. Courage, old boy. We're coming. Bane. Bane. I can't breathe. He's killing me. What is it? What's happened to you? The maid. The lion's maid. But good heavens, he's having convulsions. His face is turning purple. Uh, yeah, now he's stopped. Thank heaven. How is he, Watson? I can't see him breathe. He, uh... Wait a minute. Yes, he's... He's dead. Some terrific shock. His heart gave out. Look. He's bitten through his lower lip. The paroxysm of his agony. What could it have been? He's not wounded. No signs of a struggle. Take that coat off. Let's take a look at him. 
Easy now, easy. Good heavens, Holmes, his back. Just look at his back. Great red welts. Round his shoulders and round his ribs. Oh, this is terrible. What was it he tried to tell us? He said something about a lion. A lion's mane, to be exact. Well, you don't think he's being clawed by a lion? Or some wild beast in this part of England? It, it, it's, it's unthinkable. Quite. Besides, the claws of an animal would have dug deeper. These welts are inflamed and there are little red spots at certain intervals. It looks as if someone has used a lash on him. A thin iron scourge with knots, poisoned knots. Who could it have been? There'd be no one along the edge of the cliff. And we can see for miles. No, no, on the beach. And there are some fishing boats, but they're too far out. I wonder... Uh, did anyone bear him a grudge? Had he quarreled with anyone? Why, no. Uh, that is, not recently. I... Hello. What's up? Why do you look so serious? Well, hello, Murdoch. Where did you come from? The classroom. I just left the boys. But what's the matter with McPherson? What's he lying like that for? He's dead. Murdered. He's been flogged to death. Dead? It's horrible. Who could have... We don't know. Is there anything I can do? Yes. Yes, go back to the house. Send for the police and keep the boys indoors. I don't want them mixed up in this. Certainly, of course. Dead, I... I can't believe it. Stankhurst, you stay here with the body. Watson and I will go down to the beach to see what we can find. Good. But don't be any longer than you can help. Come along, Watson. Here's the path leading down the face of the cliff. The only path for miles. If he was attacked down on the beach, the murderer is still there. I say, he may be armed. I'd better go back for my revolver. Suppose the murderer goes for us. Oh, rubbish. Come along. We've no time to waste. They escape. Careful. There's clay here. Slippery. Look, Holmes. Footprints. Yes, the same ones descending and then returning again. But first, and undoubtedly, that means no one else has been to the beach by this path since the storm. And here's the mark of his hand where he fell, and the print of both knees. That's all that the path holds for us, now for the beach itself. Look, look, there's quite a lagoon left by the tide. His towel is lying beside it. Folded and dry so he didn't enter the water. There's his sweater beside the pool. And look here, on the sand, footprints, naked and with a canvas shoe. Questions again, that proves he made ready to bathe, but the towel shows he returned without bathing, or at any rate, without drying himself. Well, look, Holmes, there are some distant figures up there on the beach. Mm, too far away. Besides, this lagoon lay between them and the person. Perhaps the fishing boat. Perhaps, but I can see no sign of a boat having been beached along this shore. Yes, but then, uh, who, uh, how... Uh... Quite. Couldn't it be Stackhurst? We saw him coming from the direction of the gables. Hmm. How about Murdoch? He has a glowering look. I don't trust him. Do you think that he really was up at the school with the boys? That is an alibi we shall have to look into. Uh, hello, Stackhurst. Why did you leave the body? Uh, Murdoch set down one of the gardeners to stand watch over it, so I, I came along. Besides, I, I just thought of something. Yes? Uh, you asked if anyone had a grudge against McPherson, and I, I thought I ought to tell you. Go on. Well... About a year ago, this chap Murdoch was rather fond of a girl down in the village. But McPherson cut him out. Well, Murdoch didn't seem to mind at the time, but about two months later, McPherson and Murdoch had a pretty bad row. Now, Murdoch was always a bit fiery, you know. Well, when McPherson's dog got excited, he went for Murdoch, and Murdoch went into one of his rages and threw the animal out of the window. Well, the dog wasn't hurt, and the, the quarrel was patched up. At least so we all thought. But you never know. Resentment sometimes smoulders for a long time. Yeah, particularly if there's a woman in the case. Quite. Well, let's have a look at the towel and sweater. We've seen everything else there's to see down here. Hello. There's something in the pocket of the sweater. Hmm. It's a note. Dear me. A note of assignation. Huh? Well, what's it say? We'll be there in the same place, darling. Oh, until there you are, then, woman. Oh, my love, oh. Mordy. Why, that's the girl. The one I told you about, Maud Bellamy. McPherson was in love with her. Obviously. This whole affair has upset me, so it may give the school a bad reputation. It was only by chance that several of the boys weren't with McPherson when it happened. I say, was it chance? After all, it was Murdoch who held them back. He was the one who insisted on algebra before breakfast. At present, I'm more interested in this girl than in Murdoch. Suppose we take a walk to Falworth and call on her. Oh, I do. I'm with you. Come along. Oh, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. 
We'd better dress first. We might cause quite a stir parading down the village streets in these costumes. Remember, you've still got your bathing suit on. Oh, do you? Sure I have. And I'd forgotten all about how, how chilly it was. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in his visit to Maud Bellamy. Men, I'm sure you'll agree that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. If you're smart, you'll use Kremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Kremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how tingling your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So for handsome, groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Kremel daily. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, you dressed and went over to Falworth to call on McPherson's girl. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Mr. Bell. Stackhouse pointed the house out to us. That's the Bellamy house over there, Mr. Holmes. The one with the corner tower and the slate roof. Maud is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy, who owns all the boats and bathing huts at Falworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but uh, now a man of some substance, I believe. Yes, judging from the house, he must have come up in the world. And Maud is the prettiest girl for miles around. Quite a beauty, in fact. She must have had scores of admirers. By Jove, look who's coming out of the front gate. I say, it's Murdoch. And what in thunder is he doing here? Hey there, Murdoch. What do you mean by coming over here? I thought I... I am your subordinate, sir, under your own roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account of my private actions. Your answer is pure impertinence. So is your question. This is not the first time that I've had to overlook your insubordinate ways. But it will certainly be the last. You will make arrangements to leave my school as soon as possible. I intended to go in any case. Lost the only person who made the Gables habitable. Insolence. How dare he, young whippersnapper? Mrs. Stackhouse, he seemed very eager to clear out of here. Perhaps you were a trifle hasty in giving him an excuse to go. I never thought of that. Uh, shall I tell the police to place him under arrest? No. We can prove nothing against him as yet. Better persuade him to stay until we are sure he didn't do it. Very well. It's against my principles, but I'll, I'll go after him and see what I can do. Splendid. Now, Watson, suppose we call on Miss Bellamy and present our condolences. I take it that Mr. Murdoch has already broken the news of the tragedy. Ring the bell, that's a good fellow. Well, don't you think it's a, a bit heartless, Holmes, calling at this time? If the girl has any character at all, she will want to help us discover the murder of her sweetheart. Any woman with any... What do you want? We would like to speak to Miss Bellamy. Well, you can't. You are her father, I take it. Yes, I'm her father, and I know you be, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And I'm not having you mixing my daughter up in any of your dirty business. I thought you might want to help us solve the murder. Ah, oh, you did, did you? Well, I'll have you know I consider Mr. McPherson's attentions to my maud was insulting. And my son, William, is of the same mind. Letters and meetings, but never a word of marriage. I'll not have you breaking her out. I'll not have her name dragged through the... That's all right, Father. I know that Fitzroy is dead. I want to help find his murderer. I'll not have you mix This is my business, Father. Let me manage it in my own way. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, to help bring them to justice. Why do you say them? Mr. McPherson was not a weakling. He was brave and strong. No single person could have inflicted such an outrage on him. Uh, One thing more. We found this note in the dead man's pocket... Can you throw any light on it? Did he go down to the beach expecting to meet you? No. I sent it. It's true. But we were to meet tonight. I see no reason for mystery. We were engaged to be married. We only kept it secret because 
Fitz didn't want to be ragged by the boys at the school. Here is my engagement ring. Well, you might have told me. I would, if you had shown a little more sympathy, Father. But the note, it didn't come by post. Who was your go-between? I'd rather not answer that question. It really has nothing to do with the matter. Do you realize that this go-between was the only person who knew of your meetings with young McPherson? Had he any reason to resent him? That's no business of yours. You had many suitors, I believe. <laughs> that she did. Was Ian Murdoch one of them? There was a time when I thought he was. But all that was changed when he found that Fitzroy and I cared for each other. Miss Bellamy, do you think it natural that a hot-tempered young fellow like Murdoch would get over his feeling as easily as that? What are you trying to make me say? If you think Ian Murdoch had anything to do with a murder, you're wrong. A finer man never drew the breath of life. He wanted us to be happy. He wasn't the kind to think of himself first. He'd gotten over his feeling for me. Then why did he want to be the first to tell you the news of your fiancé's death? Because he was Fitzroy's friend. He thought it was his duty. He thought he... What does it matter? Fitz is dead. Why don't you find his murderer? What's the good of all this? Hmm. Thank you for your information, Miss Bellamy. Leave me alone, can't you? Leave me alone! Go and find the murderer if you're so clever. Perhaps we shall. Well, good day. Looks like another blank wall to me, Holmes. Perhaps. But even that is enlightening. There are only so many possibilities, Watson. We may finally arrive at the correct solution by crossing off all the rest. <laughs> detective on a case you seem extraordinary lackadaisical. You spent the better part of the last three days up in your garret among your books. I've been looking for the solution, something I once read. It's in the back of my mind, but I can't seem to bring it into the light of my consciousness. Yes, and in the meantime, this Murdoch fellow may slip through our fingers. Once he leaves the school, we'll never be able to get our hands on him again. I wonder that he has, hasn't left before this. Oh, how can you sit there so calmly and say that, Holmes? You're losing your grip. Perhaps I am, perhaps I am, I... If I could only find the fact that I'm looking for. It began with a C. I'll swear it began with a C. Well, then, how about the old encyclopedia there? Look up all the C's in the book. But I'm not sure it is C. Oh, Holmes, you're being exasperating and exaggerating. You know that the murderer didn't escape along the beach or even climb to the top of the cliff. But did it ever occur to you that it it might see be, be somebody hiding in one of those caves? Some sadistic maniac? Yes, it did occur to me. But it's not possible. I searched every one of those caves and there's no trace of human habitation in any of them. Oh, and my theory of the sadistic maniacs all wrong? Yes. Huh? Oh, huh? And horrible as that theory sounds, I'm convinced that the truth is even more horrible. That death came from the sea. And the truth is more ghastly than anything you can imagine. Oh, you make the chills run down my spine. I must say, I shall never have the courage to go swimming down there again. And a wise thing, too. At least for some time. Well, I must say, I don't see how young Murdoch has the nerve. Murdoch? Murdoch went swimming down on that beach? When? About a quarter of an hour ago, I saw him go by with a towel over his arm. Why didn't you tell me? Come on, we must bring him back. Poor boy, he hasn't a chance. Oh, oh good heavens, Holmes. I, I had no idea. Look. Something's happened. Someone's coming up the path. Stackhurst. He's carrying someone on his back. By thunder, it's Murdoch. And he's in bathing trunks. Help! Holmes! Watson! Something's happened to Murdoch! What is it? It's the same thing that killed young McPherson. I met him, I met him staggering up the face of the cliff. He was too far gone for me to get him home, so I, I brought him here. Put him on the couch. Have uh, a look at him. His heart is giving out. He can hardly breathe. His face is turning quite black. Here, quick, Holmes. Pour me out a glass of that brandy over there. Right. Hold his head while I, I try to get it down. That's it. That's it. If he can only swallow. That's it. Now some more. That's better. Take the bottle. You can't give him too much. 
His color is coming back. He's, he's beginning to breathe again. His heart is getting stronger. Look, it, he's trying to talk. It lashed me in the water. It lashed me. Now I remember. In the water, of course. The pain. It's terrible. I can't stand it. Give me something. Morphine. Anything. I don't give him a sense of it. Might affect the heart. Holmes, here, get the cotton wool there and the, and the olive oil. Right. Uh, what is it? It's a poison of some kind. It affects the nerves, apparently. Must be terribly painful. Here's the stuff you wanted. Good. But now saturate the cotton wool. You put a dressing on his back. Now, that's right. You use, use plenty of oil. There we are. That's better. Oh, that's much better. By Jove, he's fainted. I don't think so. He's just fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion. Well, Watson... How's our patient coming along? Splendid, uh, The nurse says we can move him tomorrow. Splendid physique that boy must have had to stand up under the strain. I says, Techest, we all owe that chap an apology for suspecting him of uh, McPherson's death. Yes. But who in Sunday did kill him? I'll show him to you, if you like. You... You discovered the murderer? Yes. One of the most gruesome instruments of torture ever devised. He is waiting for us at the foot of this cliff. But is it safe to go down? You said that... Murder... Yes, if you don't go too near. Come along. All right, if you say so. Well, the, the tide's coming in. I don't see any murderer. I mean... No, uh... he's not as obvious as all that. Treacherous as well as deadly. I must say that this place gets on my nerves since the tragedy. I, I haven't allowed the boys to go in swimming lately. I, I suppose it's foolish of me. I... On the contrary. You would have had a few more tragedies if you'd allowed them to swim. This death strikes like lightning. There's no escaping it. But, great God, if, if it's as dangerous as all that, we'd better get back up the cliff before before the murderer finds us. We're quite safe unless we take a dip in the lagoon McPherson went swimming in. Well, but I thought you said that he, he didn't go into the water. So I did. The towel fooled me. The truth of the matter is that he was in such agony when he came out that he failed to use the towel. That's what threw me off the track in the first place. But the murderer... Down here. Where's he? Under the cliff where the lagoon is quite deep. Ah, there's your murderer on that rocky shelf about three feet below the surface. Look down there. See it? Why, it's a tangled mass. Great Scott, it's alive. It's vibrating and waving. A hairy creature with streaks of silver amongst its, its yellow stresses. Oh, what a, what a foul and sinister thing. Sinister enough. The death that comes from the sea... As fatal as a cobra and more far-reaching. That is Cyanea, the fearful stinger, sometimes called the lion's mane. Well, I've been born and bred in these parts, and I've never seen anything like it. Ugh, look at that foul thing. Well, it doesn't belong to Sussex, I swear. Just as well for Sussex. The southwest gale must have brought it up. What do you say? Shall we end this murder forever? Mm -hmm. Shall we end it by all means? Very well. I think this boulder should do the trick. Help me move it. It's too heavy for one man. Right. There she goes. Good. The boulder has settled right on the filthy creature, pinning it to the ledge. One edge of yellow membrane is still flapping. Not for long. Notice the oily scum oozing out from under the stone and rising slowly to the surface. That is the end of the killer. Lion's mane. I've never heard of that before, Dr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Bell, now that I, Holmes discovered the article that he'd been searching for and read it to us. The full name of the dreadful creature is Cynia capillata. It radiates almost invisible filaments to the distance of 50 feet. Within that radius, it is as deadly and far more painful 
than the bite of a poisonous snake. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell you about next week's story. But first, ladies, here's a sensational beauty tip direct from Hollywood. When you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date, do this the night before. Give your hair a glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the shampoo used by those famous beauties, the flowers mottled. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel Shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxuriant, active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to tantalizing loveliness? K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you our Holmes and I visited a mad scientist who lived on a rocky island in one of the Scottish locks. And of the strange things that happened there, I call it the adventure of the island of death. Tonight's adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lion's Mane. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time, regardless of whether you change to daylight saving time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the island of death. This is Tom Conway. Your help is vital in the drive on cancer, the disease that must be stopped. Help save future lives. Give to the cancer drive. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's Monday night and time to call on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bell. I was just having a glass of extremely mellow port. Perhaps you'd care to join me. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You're always the perfect host, just as you are the perfect storyteller. You flatter me, my boy, though I must confess that the ingredients which make up tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure are so strangely assorted that even an old gentleman like myself can hardly fail to make it an exciting yarn. And just what are the ingredients in tonight's story, Dr. Watson? Well, let me see. Take an almost deserted island set deep in a Scottish lock. Sprinkle it generously with the following assorted selections of humanity. One measure of evil scientist. A faint wisp of human skeleton. A considerable pinch of fat lady. A handful of professional contortionist. And a dash of midget. Agitate these ingredients well, then add to the mixture a detective by the name of Sherlock Holmes and a certain doctor by the name of Watson. (laughs) Season generously with fear, danger, and sudden death. And you have the recipe for the story I call The Island of Death. Dr. Watson, you're you're beginning to make the hackles rise in the back of my neck. Indeed, then, since hackle means hair, I think perhaps you'd better have your word with our listeners before I begin my story. Yes, I will. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. 
I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed, that it leaves a sticky and flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And it gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kreml always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L... Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, The Island of Death? Well, Mr. Bell, as I told you, most of that exciting adventure took place on a tiny island in the Scottish Lake District. However, it began innocuously enough, as so many of our adventures began, in our rooms at Baker Street. It was on a stormy September evening, and Holmes and I were seated on either side of our fireplace. I remember after dinner that he began to analyze the old cliché that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. I can almost hear him now as he said... My dear Watson, the true picture of the criminal world is stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. Oh, I'm not sure that I agree with you, Holmes. The police reports and the papers are usually quite undistinguished and dull. True, old chap. But that's the fault of the reporters. Depend upon it, Watson, there's nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. Oh, let's put it to a practical test. I pick up the evening paper. Uh, here is the first heading upon which I come. A husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's a half a column of print, and I bet you that without reading it, I can tell you the gist of the trouble. I accept your bet, Watson. Give me your deduction. Oh, it's not very hard. There is, of course, the other woman. The extra drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, and the sympathetic sister or landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. Your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, old fellow. I'm very fortunate, old The old article to which you refer is the Dundas separation case. Hmm? The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the unfortunate habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife. An action which I think you will agree is uh, not likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Hurling false teeth are absolutely fantastic. Quite. Who else could that be? You expecting a visitor? Yes, Watson, I am. And he might well prove a client who will point out the moral of our little discussion. Oh, what makes you say that? The gentleman calling on me is a distinctly colorful personality by the name of Stephen Singer. He's nearly seven feet tall, and yet he weighs under eight stone. Good a card God. from him this morning informed me of his intention of calling here at seven o'clock tonight. You said that he weighs under eight stone? That's only 130 pounds. He must be a human skeleton. That was the unfortunate title applied to him at the circus sideshow at which I first met him. Good Scott, circus freaks here in Baker Street. Huh. I'll have seen everything. Freak is an unkind and inappropriate word, Watson. Stephen Singer is a fellow human being, and a more than usually, unusually worthy one. In the case of the Bagshot Circus murders, he was good enough to take advantage of his uh, almost unique physical proportion and oblige me by hiding in the barrel of a circus cannon. His evidence was instrumental in sending a diabolical murderer to the gallows. Uh, let him in, will you, Watson? Yes, yeah, of course. Good evening, Mr. Singer. Come along in, won't you? It's, it's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. It's yeah. good to see you again, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Don't want to make a nuisance of myself, but I did have a little problem, and I thought perhaps you'd help me with it. Of course, Stephen. Sit down, won't you? By the way, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Mr. Singer? My friend was just telling me that you once held him, helped him in a, in a murder case. Oh, that. To hurt nothing. Just slipped myself into the cannon barrel and heard one or two things I wasn't meant to. <laughs> Nevertheless, your help was invaluable, Stephen. I shall be only too happy to do what I can to repay the favor. What's your problem? Well, uh, perhaps I'm imagining things and perhaps I'm not. But wouldn't you say it was a rum thing if a professor offered me and three of my pals from the circus 50 quid apiece to go to some island in Scotland for a week? Yes, indeed. I should say that uh, that's extremely odd. Can you give me a few more facts? Well, Mr. Holmes, this professor come to the circus three nights ago when we was playing at Stafford at a bow. Hmm. What was his name? Uh, professor McElwraith. Funny-looking cove with a bushy red beard he was. Indeed. I've heard of the gentleman... 
I understand that he is something of a rebel in the medical profession. He returned from Vienna recently where he's been studying under Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud? Never heard of him. You will, Watson, you will. Mm -hmm. He devotes himself to the psychological aspects of the human body. Pray continue with your story, Stephen. Well, Mr. Holmes, he approached me and three of me pals. And uh, who are those uh, pals? Well, there was Bill Carew, the major we call him. He's a midget. And there was Belle Brackett, the fat lady. And the third was a bloke who joined the circus two days ago. Jeff Walton is his name. I haven't seen his act, but he builds himself as the injured rubber man. Uh, the professor promised us 50 quid apiece our tickets on the Scotch Express tomorrow morning and told us he'd have a boat waiting to ferry us out to his island when we got there. Holmes, there's something devilish going on here. A professor who studies psychology wants four people to go to a lonely island. A midget, a contortionist, a fat lady, and the fourth... Oh, oh. oh that's all right. Mm. I'm used to it, Doctor. The force of human skeleton. Oh, I wouldn't say that. That's what you were going to say. Now, we all agreed to go up there. Uh, We didn't like the bloke, but none of us can turn down 50 quid. Mm, But we got to talking after he'd gone. Supposing he's up to doing us a bit of no good. And anyway, he made us sign that paper. Paper? What paper? I don't remember it too well, Mr. Holmes, but it did say that if anything was to happen to us, the professor wasn't responsible. That's what started us to talking and worrying after he'd gone. And that's why I've come to you. I'm glad that you did, Stephen. Did you inform your friends of your decision to come to see me? See me? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, I didn't. I might have done it if I'd have been sure you wouldn't have laughed at me. I'm convinced that this is no laughing matter, Stephen. Unless I'm much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. And then you'll come up there with us, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will meet you in Scotland. <laughs> The lake looks extremely choppy, Holmes. The boat's quite small. I hope it's not too far to the island. I'm a wretched sailor, you know. I'm sure it'll be a smooth trip, Watson. Well, I certainly hope so. Hello. Here comes Singer with the other three. Great Scott. What strange-looking traveling companion. Well, since they traveled on an earlier train, I think it's time to have Stephen introduce us. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I'd like you to meet some pals of mine. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes... This is Miss Belle Brackett. What? Be careful, Belle, watch your step on the gangplank. Well, dearie, got to be a strong plank to hold me up. How are you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? How do you do? How do you do? Oh, thank you. Uh, this is Bert Olney. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Don't know what you do on the bill, Governors, but I can kick the back of my head with both feet at once. Oh, really? Very useful, I should imagine. Providing you're not standing up. What's your act, gentlemen? Act? Well, we haven't exactly got an act. Just regard us as friends of Stephen's. We thought a little trip to the Highlands might do us good. Huh. It'll do me 50 pounds worth of good. That's all I know. Put 50 more pounds on me, dearie, and I'd explode. No. And this is Bill Carew, the major, we call him. And Dr. Watson, and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. gentlemen. I do hope this isn't going to be a long journey. I'm really rather a poor sailor. Well, I just said the same thing myself, Mr. Carew. Oh, call me Major. Everyone calls me Major. I suppose it's incongruous when you consider that I'm only four foot three, but I do like, like the nickname. Have a cigar. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you, Rose. Well, Major. we're all aboard, Mr. Holmes. Might as well get going, I suppose. Why not, Stephen? All right, Captain. We're all here. You may as well get started. Dr. Watson. Uh... Yes, Mr. Alden? Do me a favor, will you? Give us a scratch between the shoulder blades. Give you a what? A scratch between the shoulder blades. Oh, that's, just... oh, that's it. As soon as we cross the border, these Scots please started to bite on me. Thank you kindly. A starlit night, Watson, and a spanking breeze. I wonder what adventure lies in store for us. I have a feeling that Professor Mac- McElwraith may not be too glad to see us. Why did you come here, Holmes? I know who you are and what you do. Why are you so interested in my obscure experiments? For two reasons, Professor McElwraith. First, Stephen Singer is a friend of mine, and second, I have an insatiable curiosity, particularly for experiments that require obscurity. 
I want to know why a student of psychology wishes to isolate four malformed humans on a lonely island. All right, stay. Stay into the devil with you both. You can't leave this island until I give the word, my inquisitive friends. Quiet! Quiet! The four of you and my employees for the next few days. Two of you, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, are uninvited guests. Professional meddlers, as they assured me. And I've no reason to doubt that assurance. <laughs> Holmes, the man's as mad as a hatter. Quiet, Watson. Uh, since you're all to be on my island during my experiments, I should like you to study this map and acquaint yourself with the place. Here you'll see are the guest houses, all interconnected by telephones. And I've installed the very latest form of that admirable new device. Now, down this path lies the snake house. Snakes? I can't bear it may not be necessary for you to meet them, Miss Brackett. Of course, I do use them in my experiments. Oh! Now, this path over here leads to the haunted watchtower. An interesting edifice, as you will discover. Seven enemies of James VI met a most peculiar death there. <laughs> You'll find that they continue to meet that death quite regularly. Look here, Professor. I don't like the sound of this. Nor do I. You tell us what these experiments are that you keep talking about. With pleasure. Tell us. I've long known that the malformation of the body, of uh, freaks, if you'll forgive the expression, is caused by glandular deficiencies and imbalances. My studies have convinced me that these same glandular defects produce psychological alterations. For instance, you, Miss Parkett, weigh four times as much as you, Mr. Singer. It'll be interesting to see how differently each of you reacts to the same stimuli. What do you think we are? Guinea pigs? Excellent. You talk of applying different stimuli to these people, Professor McElwraith. What kind of stimuli do you intend to apply, may I ask? Every stimulus that the many resources of this island will enable me to apply. Fear, hunger, desire, envy, hatred. It should prove most illuminating. Most illuminating. I won't stand for it. We're human beings, not a bunch of animals. That's right. Let's go out. Larry, you're right, Belle. Of course he is. The bloke's barmy. Let's get on the boat and go back. I quite agree with you, sir. You're com absolutely inhuman, Professor. Mind your own business, you meddling fool. I paid these people to come here. And they're going to stay. You and your friend are more than welcome to leave, however. No, Professor. I shall make myself personally responsible for seeing that these good people return to the mainland tonight. Oh, that's right, that's right. That's right. And indeed. Then you must be an extremely strong swimmer, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean? The boat left this island an hour ago. It will not return for five days. You fools. You grotesque idiots. You're trapped. So go to your quarters, all of you. Go on. And don't be surprised if I begin my experiments before the night is over. Well, Holmes, if we are marooned on an island with a madman and four members of a circus, I suppose we might as well make the best of it. Oh, dear. I think I'll turn in. What the devil's that? The telephone. The wretched instrument. It's just a passing fad. I'll never catch on. You mark my words. Yes, what is it? Mr. Holmes. Are you in your cottage? Since I'm obviously at the other end of this wire, yes. Dr. Watson, is he with you? Yes. Why? I'm worried, Holmes. A few moments ago, I caught a glimpse of a figure standing near my library window. I'm speaking from there now. I thought it might be you or Dr. Watson. But if it isn't, I'm afraid... And well, you might be, if only of your own conscience. I'm afraid of them. The freaks. They're so angry. They might well... I'd hardly blame them. If you're frightened for your safety, the best thing to do is to let us all leave here at once. Are you sure it's impossible to summon the boat before five days are gone? Well, no, I did lie about that. I could give a signal in the morning by hoisting a flag on the watchtower. Just a moment. That was a stone dust against my window. I'll be back, Holmes. Don't hang up. What does that devil want, Holmes? Sounds distinctly subdued. He's frightened, Watson. He says there's someone lurking outside his window. Holmes! Are you still there? Yes, Professor. What's wrong? That, that frigate just standing in the shadows. I can see it from where I'm talking. I can't see the face, but it's... Holmes! It's raising its arm! It's going to... Oh. I'm afraid it's murder, Watson. Quick, we must get over to the big house as fast as we can.
In just a moment, we'll find out just what happened to Professor McElrath. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Be sure that you enjoy the extra advantages of Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. And it always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes. And it's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if you, like so many men, have hair so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, when you got over to the big house, did you find Professor McElwraith was dead? Yes, Mr. Bell. A quick examination of his crumpled body told me that he was beyond mortal aid. Holmes lost no time in examining that room of death. This crime isn't very hard to reconstruct, Watson. The dead man was standing here as he spoke his last words to me on this telephone. Yes, and the window is beside the instrument. The glass in one pane is shattered. Yes, at a height of approximately five feet. Uh, the professor was shot in the temple. He was about six feet tall. The line from his wound through the broken pane would indicate that the killer stood out there in the rose garden. Watch up, Mr. Holmes. Yes, we heard a shot. Anyone get a theory? Yes, I'm afraid they did. Professor McElrath has just been murdered. Murdered? Well, can't say I'm sorry. Perhaps not, Major. But the fact remains that his killer must be brought to justice. By the way, only three of you are here. Yes, where's Bert Alner, the contortionist? I don't know. Uh, he went straight to his cottage when we got back from the big house. Uh, that's the last I saw of him. You know, it's a funny thing. I was only half awake, Mr. Holmes, but I thought I heard two shots, uh, about five minutes apart. Two shots? And Bert Alner has not appeared? We must go over to his cottage at once. <laughs> Bad, Dr. Watson? No, a flesh wound in the back. He was lucky. Curious. Observe the revolver lying on the floor beside him. The same caliber as the one used to kill the professor. Ah, see what Bert's done, Mr. Holmes. He killed the professor to save us all. That's right, Stephen. And then he tried to kill himself because he knew you'd catch him, Mr. Holmes. That's the way it must have been. Oh, he was a brave man. An interesting theory. Yes, but only a theory. Look at the position of the wound. I'll stake my medical reputation that it couldn't possibly have been self-inflicted. Holmes, this has been an attempt at another murder. More coffee, Watson? No, thank you, Holmes. I've drunk a blasted gallon and I'm still sleepy. And I've smoked almost the entire <sighs> supply of tobacco I brought on this trip, and I'm still very wide awake. I ask questions until well after midnight. And what did I learn? That the servants all alibi each other. Precisely. And... and that of our party of four, no one is able to provide an alibi for the other. So that it must be one of them. As ill-assorted a group of suspects as we ever met. Yes. It's a strange business. Why the attack on Olney? The professor, yes, that's quite understandable. But why Olney? What singled him out from the others? Oh, I don't know. He's a contortionist, but he's perfectly normal-looking. He, he doesn't seem like a freak. Of course. That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the other end of the thread. Oh, have I? Round up the others and bring them to the haunted tower. The dawn is beginning to break, but before we hang that signal for rescue, I shall find the answer to this bizarre problem.
Before we fix this signal flag, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warn you that as soon as we reach land, I shall turn Professor McElwraith's murderer over to the authorities. Let it go, Mr. Holmes. Whoever it was did us all a good turn. Let's forget it. I'm afraid that murder is not a matter to be forgotten, Major. But surely you haven't forgotten the attempt on your own life, Mr. Olney. I feel nearly as good as new, Governor. I think the Major's right. Let's forget it. No, Mr. Olney. Not even on your request. Because the whole case centers around you. Who? Me? Last night, while the murderer was standing outside his window, the professor telephoned me. He wanted to know if both Dr. Watson and I were in our cottage. The implication is obvious. You mean that the mysterious figure he'd seen resembled us in Bill? Precisely, Watson. Now, Mr. Singer's nearly seven feet tall. You, Miss Brackett, if you'll forgive me, could hardly be mistaken for us. You said it, dear. Well, no, because the major, he told us that he's only four foot three. It must have been you, Mr. Holner. But I got shot, too. And you said when you examined me that it was impossible. I could have done it. Uh, medically impossible for a normal man, but I'd forgotten your profession. You're a contortionist. You could easily have shot yourself at, at, at such an angle. What do you have to say, Mr. Holner? That I, uh... Why not admit the truth? You're not a contortionist, are you? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm not. You see, my, my twin brother got the bid for this here job, but he had another engagement. And since the professor was so particular about the date, my brother told me to come here and we'd split the fee. But how did you know that he wasn't a contortionist, Holmes? You should remember, Watson. Huh? When we first saw him on the boat, he complained of the Scottish fleas and asked you to scratch between his shoulders. So he did, yes. A real contortionist would not have needed your assistance. So your medical verdict still holds good, Watson. Olney could not have shot himself. But you've ruled the rest of us out, Mr. Holmes. Not quite, Stephen. The simplest answer is that the mysterious figure that the professor described was disguised. Disguised? That theory would be confirmed by the fact that the killer, when he was in the garden, saw the professor standing at the telephone and deliberately attracted his attention by throwing a pebble at the window. Look here, Mr. Holmes, the sun's well up. I'm tired of all this theory stuff. I'm going to hang the flag on the tower. Very well, Major. But, Mr. Holmes, don't keep us on edge like this. Yes, dearie. You said someone disguised themselves. Now, who was it? Well, surely the answer is apparent. Not to me, it ain't. Could you, Miss Brackett, have reduced your excessive weight to appear the size of a normal man? No. Nor could you, Stephen, have decreased your excessive height. But the Major could have made himself appear taller with improvised stilts. Then the Major is the only possibly gil guilty party. The Major? Well, I mean, it's hard to believe he'd done it. Well, even if he did, I still don't think we ought to turn him in, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no. Remember, he did it for us, dear. Well, he didn't really hurt me when he took that shot at me. But that's just it, Olney. I might have been tempted if it were only the professor's murder. But he deliberately tried not to murder you, Mr. Olney, but to make it appear that you had killed the professor. But if he's arrested, there'll be a trial, dearie. And if there's a trial, you know how it'll be. They'll make out it was all because he's a freak. It'll be, it'll be harder than ever for people to accept us just as, uh, as people. Bell's right, Mr. Holmes. It'd be bad for all of us. I think the Major has thought of that possibility. Look at him up there on the tower. He's hoisted the flag. Huh? He... Now he's teetering on, on the edge of the parapet. He's going to... Major! Major! Slimy! He jumped! Must be a couple of hundred feet down there. He doesn't have a chance. Ah, oh, the poor Major! He done it for us! Come on, oh, Belle. I'll take you back to the cottage. Major. I suggest we all return to our quarters and pack. This unhappy tragedy has reached its final conclusion. What a shocking business. You're right, Dr. Watson. When I came to you in Baker Street, I never dreamed it would end up like this. One thing I'd like to say, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Stephen? I, I want to thank you, uh, not just for solving the case, but because you treated all of us not as freaks, but as ordinary human beings. Makes a big difference, you know. I know of only one way to treat people, Stephen, and that is as each person deserves to be treated. If Professor McElwraith had only realized that truth, he would not have paid with his life. <laughs> When you girls go out on an important date, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls... You'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural gleaming luster. 
It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a drying detergent. After a Cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. Cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair and a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never see it next week. Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you uh, about another of our encounters with the infamous Professor Moriarty. And how Holmes deduced that an apparently unimportant robbery in a Sussex vicarage was in reality part of a plot that threatened the safety of all England. I call it the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. America is strong only if her school system is strong. Today it's overcrowded and inadequate. So support your parent-teachers association... Do all you can to improve conditions in America's schools. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, here we are in Dr. Watson's comfortable study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Sit down, my boy, and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. (sighs) Warm tonight, isn't it? It is indeed. Quite summery, in fact. Let's see. Tonight you're going to tell us about the strange adventure of Mr. John Scott Eccles at Wisteria Lodge, aren't you? Yes, and I think I can promise you that you'll find it weird enough to make you shiver a bit in in spite of the weather. Good. I can hardly wait. Men, if you want that prosperous, successful look which stands out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use Kreml hair tonic. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Why it keeps hair neatly in place longer. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Kreml never leaves hair feeling cakey or stiff. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kreml, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or your hat band. Kreml always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance, as if your barber had just combed it. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the strange experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles and Wisteria Lodge? It was a bleak, wintry day. The year was 1892, I believe. We were in our rooms in Baker Street, and Holmes had received a telegram during lunch. He'd read it, 
and sent off a reply. The lunch things were subsequently cleared away and Holmes was standing in front of the fireplace, smoking his pipe, a thoughtful look on his face. Suddenly, he turned to me with a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. Watson, you are supposed to be a man of letters. How would you define the word grotesque? Grotesque? Why, something uh, strange, remarkable. No, there's more in it than that. Grotesque. There's an underlying suggestion of the tragic and the terrible. Yes, but why all this introspection? Who's been using the word now? Uh, this telegram. Read it. Oh, let's have a look. I've just had most incredible and grotesque experience. May I consult you? Signed, J.S. Eccles. And sent from the Chang Cross Post Office. Huh. Eccles. I wonder if it's a man or a woman. Man, of course. No woman would have sent a reply paid telegram. No? No. She would have come herself. Ah, and that, if I'm not mistaken, is Mr. Eccles himself. Let's take a peek at him before Mrs. Hudson lets him in. Watson, don't joggle the curtain like that. It's too obvious. Respectable looking, eh, Holmes? Notice the grey whiskers? <laughs> Pompous old bird. Yes. Everything from his spats to the gold-rimmed spectacles and top hat pronounce him a conservative. A churchman, a good citizen, orthodox and conventional to the last degree. Yes, but what is such a paragon coming here for? Accidents, my dear Watson, sometimes happen even in the best regulated circles. <coughs> here he is. Come in. Ah, good day. Mr. Eccles, I presume. Yes. Eccles. John Scott Eccles. I've just had a most upsetting and unpleasant experience, Mr. Holmes. Most improper, most outrageous. Pray sit down, Mr. Eccles. Oh, thank you. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? It's an outrage. That's what it is. Oh, sorry. Mm. <laughs> May I ask, Mr. Eccles, why you didn't come to me at once? Well, what do you mean? It's now quarter past two. Your telegram was dispatched at quarter past one. And yet one glance at the somewhat uh, disheveled state of your attire shows that the uh, disturbance dates from the moment of your waking. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I never gave a thought to my appearance. My one idea was to get out of that house. But I've been busy since then, running round to the house agents, you know. The fellow's rent was paid right enough. Come, come, Mr. Eccles. I'm afraid you've acquired my friend Dr. Watson's deplorable habit. Huh? He is prone to tell his stories wrong end foremost. Now, look here, Holmes. I really don't Don't interrupt, I Watson. Put a... Now, Mr. Eccles, will you please give us the facts of the case? Now what? Come in. Aha! Oh, so it's you, Lestrade, the watchdog of Scotland Yard. I might have known no one else would come thundering at the door in that fashion. I thought I'd find him here. Are you or are you not Mr. John Scott Eccles of Popper Mouse Lee? Naturally, he is. You traced him through his telegram to me. It's all perfectly obvious, so why be so melodramatic? Who is this gentleman? Allow me to introduce Inspector Lestrade, mastermind of Scotland Yard. Well, you've got a blazes, Mr. Holmes. It's Mr. Eccles I'm after. And what for, if I may be so impertinent? The murder of Mr. Aloysius Garcia of Wisteria Lodge near Isha. Dead? You say he's dead? No, none no, of that surprise stuff. This letter was found in his pocket. You wrote it, didn't you? Oh, of course. You accepted but... his invitation to spend last night in his house, didn't you? Oh, yes, You well... did stay the night there, eh? Yes, but I can explain. Explain, eh? One moment, Lestrade. Mr. Eccles was on the verge of telling me what happened during his visit. I suggest we allow him to proceed. Draw up a chair, Lestrade. You might learn something. Oh, very well, but I warn you, Mr. Eccles, anything you say may be used in evidence against you. But I'm sure my story puts also... Oh, dear me. Go on, please. Go on. Oh, yes, yes. Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, I'm a bachelor of a rather sociable turn of mind. I cultivate a large number of friends, among them Mr. Gerald Melville. Gerald Melville, the retired brewer? Oh, yes, that's the one. Oh, nothing like a glass of Melville's double brew to quench a thirst on... On a hot day, eh, Lestrade? Oh, Watson, don't interrupt. Oh, well, uh, it was there some weeks ago that I met a fellow named Garcia. He was, I understood, of Spanish descent and connected with the embassy. We struck up quite a friendship. One thing led to another, ended by his inviting me to spend a few days at his house, Wisteria Lodge, between Isha and Oxford. Hmm. How many were there in his household? He had uh, a sort of valid butler, a countryman of his, named Jose... And a half-breed cook called Grogo. A queer household to find in the heart of Surrey, eh, Holmes? Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. So I thought at the time. But it proved a good deal queerer than I expected. Yeah, now let's get to the point. You went to the house? Uh, yes. I arrived last night, a few hours after dinner. Drove over from Isha. Storm was brewing. The house was fair-sized. A crazy, tumble-down affair. I'll admit I had some doubts as to the wisdom of my visit as we went up the drive. Uh, 
Delighted to see you, my dear friend. Delighted. I was afraid you might not reach this place before the storm arrived. Jose, you will take the Senor Echo's things to his room. The one in front, across the hall from my own. Si, Senor. Ah, that is he, my priceless Jose. A bidding looking fellow, I must say, Garcia. Looks more like a brigand than a servant. Yes. That is what makes him so truly remarkable. Ah, but come in here into my study. There is a fire and some good red wine and a sandwich for you, which my good Groco has made especially. In here. Come. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Well, this is better. I'll admit I was chilled from that drive. And your hall is a trifle drafty, my dear Garza. But here we are, what you call cozy, eh? Yeah. Come, sit by the fire. Oh, I feel good. A glass of wine, no? Not a bad idea. Good. I will have one, too. So, and here is your sandwich. Mm, thank you. Mm, well, by Jove, I say this sandwich is hot. Yes, a Spanish specialty. It is full of onion. Mm, so I notice. Dears, what was that? Sounds like someone at the front door. There it is again. I say, Garcia, you look white as a sheet. Is anything the better? No, no nothing, nothing at all. Oh, only that it is so late for someone to be calling. Well, look here, I'll go to the door if you're afraid. No, 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 senor, it is not necessary. Jose will go. Ah, listen, he is going now. I wonder who it is on a night like this. Come in. What is it, Jose? What has happened? A uh, message for you, senor. A letter. Good, give it to me. Hmm. So, so, that is it. It is what, senor? Never mind, Jose. And close the door. Look here, Garcia. What's the matter? Did the letter have bad news? Bad news? The letter? Oh, but no, senor. Uh, just an invitation. I do not even bother to answer. See, it goes into the fire. Why are you trembling? Trembling? Me? It is the cold. I am not accustomed to this climate. But it is late, and I am a bad host, no? You want to go to bed? Not particularly. And uh, look here. If you're afraid of something, I'm perfectly willing to sit up all night. Afraid? Come, i show you to your room. You will take this candle, please. Hmm. Oh, oh, that's a bad draft you have in this hall, Darcy. I can hardly keep the candle from blowing out. This way, please. This is your room, senor. I am in there, across the hall. Oh, good. Then you can call to me if you get the jumps again. Or if I see a ghost, eh? <laughs> good night, senor. Oh, good night. And pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> More apt to have nightmares in a place like this. <laughs> Not even a fire in here. Looks like an iceberg. <laughs> the storm's getting near. Not a clock. Sounds like the knell of doom. Oh, right, oh, midnight. I had no idea it was so late. My watch must have stopped. Well, it says only 11.15. Suppose I forgot to wind it. Senor Eccles. Senor Eccles, are you still awake? Well, if I hadn't been, that clock would have wakened me. So sorry. But never mind. Next time it strikes only once for one o'clock. Yeah, that's a revelation. Uh, what I want to say, senor, is the bell by the bed. If you will ring it in the morning when you wake up, Jose will bring you your hot water. Oh, thanks. Good night again, senor. So far, I have seen no ghosts. <laughs> what does he mean by that? Ghosts. Oh, this would certainly be the place for them. Oh, that storm is going to break any minute now. If that candle wouldn't flicker so. Weird shadows. I don't like the way they move about. Get on my nerves. Better blow the candle out. That'll finish them. Now, if I can get a little sleep. Oh, what a bed. What's that? So you think you heard a scream, Mr. Eggles? Well, I wasn't sure. A storm broke at about that time. It may have been a wind. What a curious evening. The most curious thing about it was the clock. Do you often let your watch run down, Mr. Eccles? No, I can't say that I do. Well.
Well, uh, next morning the storm had cleared. I woke about dawn and tossed about half an hour. When I found that I couldn't go back to sleep, I rang for my hot water. That bed should be in a museum. Oh, it's even colder than last night. Confound that, Jose. Where's my hot water? Oh, I never did like the country. That fellow's probably still asleep. Maybe if I shout. Jose! I say, Jose! I don't like it. This place is too quiet. Jose! Grover, where are you? What the deuce? Why doesn't all this bellowing wake Garcia? Must be a sound sleeper. Garcia! Garcia, are you up? Confound the man. Uh, oh, you don't suppose? Oh, nonsense. I'm getting as jumpy as he was last night. Garcia, wake up! Oh, I say, I'd better go in and see if the man's all right. I say, Garcia, are you? Garcia! What? Well, look here. He's gone. The bed hasn't been slept in. Garcia! Jose! Garcia! I was thoroughly upset, Mr. Holmes. I ran from room to room, shouting. They were empty. The men were gone. My host, the footman, the cook, all vanished in the night. Quite a unique experience, eh, Watson? Yes, one of the most... I was furious. So I packed my bag, set off to visit the chief land agent in the village. And I found everything in order. Garcia had rented the place right enough. But even paid three months in advance. My next step was to come into town, call at the Spanish embassy. Yes? They had never heard of Garcia. That is the end of my story. Well, I admit it seems to fit in with what we discovered at Wisteria Lodge. We even found the note you spoke of. But Garcia threw it into the fire. I saw him do it. It was a dog grate. He overpitched it. I found this crumpled up at the back. Yes, that's it. I recognize the paper. Hmm. May I see it? Oh, what is that? Uh, our own colors. Green and white. Green open. White shut. Main stair. First corridor. Seventh right. Green bays. Godspeed. Sign D. Hmm. Woman's writing. An assignation of some sort, I'd say. Well, why should he turn pale if it was just an amorous intrigue? It was more than that. She writes Godspeed. It was a serious and dangerous undertaking. Well, who do you suppose she is? She signs a sub D. He was Paris, and she must have been two. D. R. That might stand for Dolores. Very good, Watson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but unfortunately, she wasn't Spanish. She wasn't Spanish? Why not? She writes to our Spanish friend in English. Oh, and there mean? were others in it, too. The envelope is addressed in a different hand, a man's writing. And the print of a man's cufflink has been pressed into the ceiling wax. A remarkable note. There's something about it I don't quite like. Hmm. Lestrade. Where did you say Garcia was found? Oxshot Common, about an eighth of a mile from his home. Head battered in. Footprints? Well, there weren't any we could see. The rain had washed them out. Robbed? No, no. His watch and money were left in tact. Well, Mr. Eccles, if you don't mind stepping around the yard, I'd like your story in writing. Certainly. I'll come at once. But I should like to retain your services, Mr. Holmes. I shall be delighted to... Uh... Collaborate with Scotland Yard, if Lestrade doesn't mind. And what good would it do if I did? Ah, then it's settled. I suggest we take a run down to Isha, eh, Watson? I find I have a longing for the country. Yeah, I'm coming too. Splendid. Suppose we meet tonight at Mr. Garcia's poetically named villa. What was it? Ah, yes. Wisteria Lodge. I fancy it'll be a case of Cherche la Femme. Cherche la... Oh, French. Uh, look for the woman. No. Oh, what woman? Uh, the woman who wrote that note. If I'm not mistaken, she's in a decidedly dangerous position. In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers on the visit to Wisteria Lodge. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why, when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients the like of which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Cremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. 
and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml leaves your scalp feeling so alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, you and Sherlock Holmes went down to Wisteria Lodge. Yes, Mr. Bell. That night found us walking in the neighborhood of Isha. It was pitch black, and there was a wind blowing. Look here, Holmes. Why go plodding about on a night like this? There's another storm brewing up. Why not wait until daylight? It's too dark to see anything now, anywhere. Even the road. Oh, stop grumbling, Watson. We promised Lestrade we'd pick him up at the villa. Yes, but Besides, I... Besides, we've got to rescue that woman. That note was written under pressure. The writing was shaky. Someone else addressed the envelope, sent it off and lured Garcia to his death. She's probably being kept prisoner at this moment, unless they've killed her, too. How are we going to find her? The note ran, Main stair, first corridor, seventh white, green bays. That indicates a large house. Yes, but there aren't many large houses in the neighborhood. Quite. Moreover, it had to be a house Garcia could get to, do what he intended to do, and be back by 12 o'clock. Less than an hour's time. What do you mean? I mean that Garcia invited our friend Mr. Eccles to visit him with one purpose in mind. Oh, what was that? He wanted an alibi. That is why the clock struck 12 when Mr. Eccles' watch indicated it was only quarter past 11, which was the correct time, by the way. Garcia intended to be somewhere else at 12 o'clock. Yes, but where? Somewhere within the radius of a mile. There are only two large houses within this radius. One belongs to Lord Weaverley, a conservative old fellow he's out of the question. The other, High Gables, was rented just last month by a man who calls himself Henderson, but who looks like a foreigner. The whole house is run by foreign servants with the exception of an English governess for his little girl. You think that she may be the woman in question? I only know she has not been seen for the last three days. Hmm, it looks bad. Well, if I'm not mistaken, that is a light from Wisteria Lodge shining through the trees. The stars here ahead of us. Lugubrious looking place. Hey, eh, Holmes? Yes. One across the driveway. That's the star sitting in the middle of the study with a light beside him. What's the matter with the man? He's as stiff as a ramrod. Tap on the window, Watson. Oh, it's you. Thank God for that. What's up, Lestrade? Open the window. Oh, I never expected to see the day when I'd be so glad to see your face, Mr. Holmes. It's been a bad evening. Here, Watson. Step over the sill. That's it. You can close the window behind you. Now then, Lestrade, what's been giving you the jumps? Well, it's a lonely, silent house and... What with that queer thing in the kitchen, when I heard you tapping at the window, I thought it had come again. It? What is it? The devil, for all I know. I got here a bit earlier. I was sitting here reading a book when all of a sudden something made me look up. And there was a face looking in at me through the lower pane. Good Scott. And what was it like? Well, it wasn't black, nor was it white. Sort of a clay color. Like it was dead and had earth on it and the size of it. Twice as big as yours. Good gracious me. But the look on the face was the worst of it. Great goggle eyes and a line of white teeth like a hungry beast. I, I tell you, I couldn't move a finger. I just shut my eyes and held my breath, and when I got the courage to look again, it was gone. Like that, into thin air. Hmm. Let's have a look round the house. Uh, wait till you see what's in the kitchen. Well, no time like the present. You know the place, Lestrade. You lead the way. Not in your life. I'll go with you, but not ahead of you. Hmm. All right. Here. Down this corridor to the right. Watson, you had better hold the lamp. Lestrade's hand doesn't seem to be as steady as usual. This is the kitchen. Untidy looking place. Look! What an extraordinary thing! Chicken feathers all over the room. Hmm, yes. A white cock torn savagely to pieces. And over in that corner is a goat with its throat slit and blood all over the place. How perfectly beastly. Yeah, but that's not the worst of it. Look here, Father Stink. Here's something to make your flesh creep. Ugh, what a sinister, shriveled-up thing. Looks like a barbaric doll or a mummified monkey. That is no doll, Watson. Nor yet a monkey. 
that was once a human being. A South American native, to be exact. What? Down there, some of the wilder tribes have a secret process by which they can dry and dwarf the bodies of their dead enemies until they look like this. It's a voodoo fetish. And all this mess of blood and slain animals indicates a South American voodoo sacrifice. South American? Green and white, of course. What is it, Holmes? Never mind, Watson. No time for discussion. Hurry. We must go to High Gables and find the governess. She must be made to talk while she's still able. That's the house. The governess's room is at the back. Hello. What's this? Closed carriage without lights drawn up at the front door and baggage piled on top. We're trying to make a getaway. We must stop them. <sighs> How can we? We've got no warrant. Thank heavens I'm not a member of the official police. My revolver's warrant enough for me. Look, look. The front door's opening. Two men are coming out. The one in the greatcoat is Henderson, as he calls himself. I think I can tell you his real name if I get a look at his face. They're carrying something between them. Why, it's a woman. The governor's. Why can't she walk? What have they done to her? They're putting her in the carriage. Come on. We must stop them. Now then, hands up, both of you. Carlo, Raymond, Pino, then. Raymond! No, you don't, Carlo. One move to pick up those reins and you'll get a bullet through you. Now then, what have you done to that woman? She's sick. We are taking her to London. You must not stop us. Lestrade, light the carriage lamp. Watson, take a look at that woman. What seems to be the matter with her? Hmm. Pulse? She pulls of eyes. Oh, yes, she, oh. she's been drugged. Opium. Oh. She's half conscious. You will kill her. She is sick. We must get her to a doctor. Every moment is vital. No. Don't let him. He's a devil. He killed Garcia. Don't listen to her. She's delirious. We must go to a doctor. I am a doctor, my good man. Don't worry. She's in good hands. Dr. Watson will take care of her. Now, Lestrade, if you will remove the gentleman's hat so we can have a good look at his face. Aha. As I expected. Lestrade, arrest this man. He is the murderer of Garcia and heaven knows how many other poor souls. Yeah, but who is he? Don Murillo, the tiger of San Pedro, the most bloodthirsty tyrant that ever ruled a helpless people. must say, Dr. Watson, I'm still a bit confused. Yes, and so was I, Mr. Bell, until the English governess explained the whole thing to me. Don Murillo had been a dictator of the country of San Pedro in South America. Its colors are green and white. Yes, I know. He was a terrible man who had no scruples about butchering anyone who stood in his way politically. One of his victims had been the Spanish husband of the English lady who later became Murillo's governess. Oh, I see. His reign of terror ended in a revolution, but he managed to escape the country with all the government funds. The inhabitants of San Pedro plotted to bring him to justice, but failed until the English woman managed to worm her way into his household. So that's why she was there. Yes, it is. She and a party headed by Garcia planned to kidnap Murillo and take him back to San Pedro, where he could be tried for his crimes. Murillo, however, suspected the governess, intercepted her note, and uh, killed Garcia. Well, that's perfectly clear now. Oh, just one more thing. The hideous face at the window, what was that? Oh, that, that was Grogo, Garcia's huge native cook, who was sneaking back to get his voodoo fetish, the shriveled mummy. <laughs> that was certainly a blood-curdling story. Dr. Watson will return in just a moment to give us a hint about next week's story. Here's something of real interest for our lady listeners. I'm sure we all know or have heard how beautiful Powers models are. But did you know that these famous beauties make up to $35,000 a year? Which shows they have brains as well as beauty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but seriously, Joe, what impresses me most is that Powers models can afford to spend a fortune on their hair. Yet when they wash it... They rely on inexpensive cremel shampoo. Which proves how wonderful cremel shampoo really is. 
Powers models were among the first to discover that no other shampoo leaves hair more shining bright with natural gloss and luster. And under no circumstances does Cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a harsh soap or drying detergent. Cremel shampoo is entirely different. I'll check with that, Joe. After a Cremel shampoo, the hair actually radiates natural, brilliant highlights. And Cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base which helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. It rinses out so easily and positively never, never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, always wash your hair with Cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining, sparkling beauty, yet in no way hurts its texture. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, no, let me think. Next week. I think... No, I won't. Next week, I think I'll tell you about... Another one of our meetings with the the infamous Professor Moriarty. Yes, that's what I'll tell you. It's a strange story. A very strange story of violence and sudden death. Death that struck from the London shadows. I call it The Adventure of the Harley Street Murders. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes mystery was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Nigel Bruce appeared to the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway by permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Harley Street Murders. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once more, we're about to visit Dr. Watson, the friend and chronicler of Sherlock Holmes and his amazing adventures. We find him sitting in his well-worn armchair, an eager look on his face and a humorous twinkle in his eye. Can it be that the good doctor looks forward to his weekly appearances before the microphone? Good evening, Mr. Bell. It <laughs> certainly can. Tonight I have my narrative all picked out. Have you ever noticed that red-headed people always seem to lead very eventful lives? Look at Queen Elizabeth. Yes. And I've heard that Cleopatra was a brick top, and she certainly had very few dull moments. No, I'm sure she didn't. Well, tonight I've decided to tell you the story... Of the Red-Headed League. The Red-Headed League. What a curious title. No more curious than the situation it gave rise to in Sherlock Holmes's life. And as soon as your word with our listeners is out, I'll begin. Good. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressings they try are too greasy, too highly perfumed. I've heard them complain about those sticky goos which plaster their hair down and leave flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And Kreml gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. 
so tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look, as if your barber had just combed it, and it keeps it that way all day long. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the red-headed Lee? Well, the adventure began one day during the autumn of the year 1890, I believe it was. It was just after my marriage, and I hadn't seen much of Sherlock Holmes lately. Anyway, I burst in upon my old friend to find him deep in conversation with a stout, florid-faced gentleman with the fiercest red hair it has ever been my privilege to observe. I was about to withdraw when Holmes pulled me abruptly into the room and closed the door behind me. Come in, my dear Watson, come in. You couldn't possibly have come at a better time. But, Holmes, I was afraid you might be busy. So I am, my dear fellow. Allow me. Mr. Wilson... This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sit down, Watson, sit down. Uh, thank you. I know that you share my love of the bizarre, although you've never agreed that for the strangest effects and most extraordinary combinations we must go to life itself. Well, you know I... Uh, Mr. Feel... Jabez Wilson here oh. has just started a narrative which promises to be one of the most singular to which I've listened for some time. Oh, really? And now, my dear Mr. Wilson, perhaps you would have the great kindness to recommence your story. Oh, certainly, Mr. Holmes. And as soon as I can find that newspaper clipping... Where did I put it? And I sworn it was here in my waistcoat pocket. Uh, Watson, while we're waiting for Mr. Wilson to find his missing newspaper advertisement, uh, suppose you tell me what you deduce from his appearance. Oh, well, now, let me see. Uh, well, I would say that he was uh, middle-aged, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Wilcox, I'm Wilson, and, uh, and he has red hair. Obvious, Watson. Too obvious. I'll come to your assistance. Oh, kind of He has at some time done manual labor. He is a Freemason, has been in China, and has done a considerable amount of writing lately. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you fair give me the creeps. Are you one of these mind readers? No, indeed. Then how in the name of good fortune did you know all this about me? About the manual labor, for example. It's as true as gospel. I begin as a ship's carpenter. Your hands, my dear sir. Your right hand is quite a size larger than your left. The muscles are more developed. As for the Freemasonry... You use an arc and compass breast then, uh, rather against the strict rules of your order. I uh, see that. But the writing, how about that? What else can be indicated by that right cuff, so very shiny? And the left sleeve with the smooth patch near the elbow where you rest it on the desk. Well, how about China? The fish that you have tattooed immediately above your right wrist could only have been done in China. That trick of staining the fish's scales a delicate pink is quite peculiar to China. And when, in addition, I see a Chinese coin hanging from your watch chain, the matter becomes even more simple. <laughs> well, I never. <laughs> At first I thought you'd done something clever. But now I see it was nothing to it after all. I begin to think, Watson, that I make a mistake in explaining. Omni ignotum pro magnifico, you know. Yes, <laughs> Uh, just what I was thinking. Yes, I'm afraid what reputation I may have will suffer shipwreck if I'm so candid. Uh, have you found the advertisement, Mr. Wilson? Oh, yes, I got it now. It was in my watch pocket. This is what begin it all, sir. Uh, just read it for yourself. Uh, Watson, uh, suppose you do that for us. With pleasure. Uh, first, uh, make a note of the paper and the date. It's the Morning Chronicle of July the 27th, 1890, just two months ago. Very well, Proceed with the advertisement. It begins, To the Red-Headed League. Owing to the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins, there is now another vacancy open which entitles a member of the League to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men above the age of 21 are eligible. Sounds very odd. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross, at the offices of the League, 7 Pope Court, Fleet Street. Dear me, Holmes, what on earth does this all mean? I think I promised you that this, was, this case was bizarre. Now, Mr. Wilson, if you will continue with your story. Well, it's just about as I was telling you, Mr. Holmes. I have a small pawnbroker shop in Coburg Square. Of late years, business has been bad. I used to be able to keep two assistants, but now I only have one. And I'd have a job to pay him, except he's willing to come for half wages so as to learn the business. Obliging youth. What's his name? Uh, Vincent Spaulding. And I couldn't want a smarter assistant, Mr. Holmes. 
I know he could easily earn twice what I'm able to give him. <laughs> well, as I say, if he's satisfied, who am I to be putting ideas into his head? Hmm. Your assistant seems to be as remarkable as your advertisement. Oh, he has only one fault, Mr. Holmes. Photography. Photography? Yes, snapping away with his camera and then diving down into the cellar like a rabbit into its hole to develop his pictures. An amateur photographer, huh? He is uh, still with you, I suppose? Oh, yes, sir. And an observant young fellow he is. He was the one who has brought this advertisement to my notice. Hmm. It was just this day, eight weeks, when he rapped on the office door with this very paper in his hand. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Wilson, sir. Oh, it's you, Vincent. What's the matter? Well, I wish to heaven, Mr. Wilson, that I was a red-headed man. Why? Well, well, look here, sir. What it says in this paper. There's another vacancy in the League of the Red-Headed Men. It's worth a pretty penny to him that gets it. A red-headed league? Never heard of it. Never heard of the League of the Red-Headed Men? No. Oh, Mr. Wilson, and you eligible for one of the vacancies. Huh? What are they worth? Oh, merely a couple of hundred a year, but the work's slight, and it needn't interfere much with one's regular occupation. Hmm. A couple of hundred pounds a year, huh? Let me see that paper, young man. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. As, as far as I can make out, the league was started by a millionaire named Ezekiah Hopkins, a red-headed man himself. He left his fortune in hands of trustees with instructions to provide easy berths to men who had red hair. Hmm. From what I hear, the work isn't difficult. Oh, well, there must be millions of red-headed men. Oh, not as many as you might think, sir. You see... It's confined to Londoners. Oh. And then again, it, it, it's, it's no use if your hair is light red or dark red or anything but real blazing fire red. They, they've got to pick the reddest hair they can find. <laughs> well, if there's a redder head of hair than mine in the length and breadth of London, I'd like to see it. Well, I, I have seen a few that I considered redder. Oh, nonsense. Well, where's Matt? Uh, what are you going to do, Mr. I'm Wilson? going around to apply for that vacancy. If it's rain and gold... No one can say that Jabez Wilson is the man to go out with a sieve. And did you get the job, Mr. Wilson? I did that, Mr. Holmes. There wasn't a head of hair could touch mine for redness. I do say so myself. And there was thousands competing. And what was the work? Oh, purely nominal, like the paper said. And it paid four pounds a week, regular as a clock. All I had to do was sit at a desk in an office at that address there from ten to two and copy out bits from the encyclopedia. Hmm. Educational as well as remunerative. And uh, how long did this work continue? About eight weeks. I was pretty well through the A's. Abbots, archery, architecture and the like. Then suddenly it come to an end. I went to my work, ten o'clock as usual. The door was shut and locked, and a card was nailed to the door. What did it say? Red-headed league dissolved October 9th, 1890. Hmm. Well, I say, Holmes, that's today. Well, it was this very morning it was, sir. Well, I lost no time trying to find the man that hired me. Four pounds a week is four pounds. You say you tried to find the man that rented the office? Yes, sir. I inquired from the house agent, and he gave me the man's name, and... Said he'd moved to a new address. You went there, of course. Yes, sir. Well? When I got to that address, it was a manufactory of artificial kneecaps. No one had ever heard of the Red-Headed League. So then you came straight to me. Yes, sir. I thought it best to lose no time. Quite right. Uh, by the by, Mr. Wilson, uh, this uh, assistant of yours, Mr. Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you when he called your attention to the Red-Headed League? About a month. How did he come? In answer to an advertisement. Uh, was he the only applicant? No, sir. I, I had a dozen. Why did you pick him? Oh, because he was handy and would come cheap. At half wages, in fact. Hmm. What is he like? Oh, small, stout built, very quick in his ways. No hair on his face, uh, though he's not short of 30. And he had a white splash of acid on his forehead. I thought as much. Have you ever noticed that his ears are pierced for earrings? Well, yes. He says a gypsy did it for him when he was a lad. Watson, 
What day of the week is it? Well, Saturday, of course. Saturday, dear me, so it is. Well, Mr. Wilson, I think I may promise you some startling developments by tonight. In the meantime, Watson, I suggest we drop round sometime this afternoon to view the attractions of saxe coburg Square and Mr. Wilson's exemplary assistant in particular. Oh, certainly, my dear fellow. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be expecting you. Goodbye, gentlemen. And now, Watson, if you will hand me my violin, I have some thinking to do. Can't you think without that? Oh, all right. Here you are. to be Saxe-Coburg Square. Mm. Shabby, genteel, little backwater of a place. And this, I fancy, is our friend's shop, the four-story building with the three gilt balls over the door. Yes. Well, the square itself seems fairly uninteresting, huh? Yeah, very depressing. Now, let's see what streets back, backs onto it on this side. Come along, Watson. Well, I can't see what difference the next street can make to our problem. <laughs> if it is a problem... The whole thing sounds more like a practical joke to me. A practical joke which cost its perpetrator four pounds a week? Nonsense, Watson. No man's sense of humor resides in his pocketbook. Well, this street seems to have more life. It's one of the chief arteries leading to the north and west. Let me see. What is the order of the houses here? Order? Yes, it's a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. First we have Mortimer's, then the tobacconist's. The little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarland's carriage building yard. Yes. Now, now we can go back to the shop of our friend, Mr. Wilson. What's the hurry, Holmes? Don't walk so fast. Well, I found out all I want to hear. Well, Holmes, you behave as if you were taking a memory course. Why should you want to know all the shops on that street? Just a waste of time. Nothing that exercises the brain is a waste of time, my dear Watson. The trouble with most of us is that our brains have become flabby from lack of proper use. Rubbish. Well, here we are back again. Quite. Why are you fapping on the pavement with your stick? Huh? If you want to enter the shop, why not knock on the door? Oh, quite so, Watson. I'm afraid my etiquette is a bit faulty lately. So, just to please you, I will knock on the door. Somebody's coming. I can see him through the glass. Looks like our bright little assistant. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Won't you step in? Uh, thank you, no. I only wish to ask you how to get from here to the Strand. Third right, fourth left. Smart fellow, that. Eh, Watson? I see no signs of a colossal intelligence. Nevertheless, he is, in my judgment, the fourth smartest mine in London. And for daring, I'm not sure that he's not the third. I see nothing so startling about him. The knees of his trousers, Watson. Didn't you notice? The knees of his trousers? What about him? Most enlightening, my dear Watson. Most enlightening. Oh, this is so much balderdash. I've had just about enough of it. I'm going to get myself some tea and a muffin. There's an appetizing little baker shop across the road there. Very good, Watson. Suppose you meet me back here at ten tonight. Sharp, mind you. And kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. What? This business is serious. More serious even than I expected. <laughs> Just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange case of the red-headed league. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy-looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes, and it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, 
Take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Cremel daily for better groomed hair for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson... You were going to meet Sherlock Holmes that night in saxe Coburg Square. Yes, Mr. Bell. Our rendezvous took place right on the dot. I remember the hour was striking. I say, Holmes, it's ten o'clock now. How long do we have to stand here in this confounded rain? I'm soaked to the skin. Until the other member of our party turns up, Watson. Ah, here comes a cab. I think you'll be in it. Whoa! Yes. Good evening, Mr. Merriweather. Good evening, Holmes. Yes. I say, Holmes, uh, why have you got to route me out on a night like this? Saturday night, too. I shall miss my rubber of whist. It's the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I've not had my whist. My dear Merriweather, I think you'll find that tonight you're playing for higher stakes than even you are accustomed to. And I can promise the play will be more exciting. Oh, indeed. Uh, by the way, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? But come, we must hurry. This way, gentlemen. Where are we going? Wilson's shop is here on the square. Oh, stop burbling, Watson. Oh, wasn't burbling, Watson. Follow me and don't waste time. In your message to me, Holmes, you said something about John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. Yeah. John Clay? Who's he? My dear Watson, John Clay is one of our most colorful and dangerous criminals. A young man, but at the head of his uh, profession. I'd rather have the braces on him than on any criminal in London. I've heard that his grandfather was a royal duke. And he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. He'll crack a crib in Scotland one week and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. We've been after him for years, Holmes, and haven't set eyes on him yet. Well, I trust I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. Here we are, down this narrow passageway. You'd better let me go first. Look here, Holmes. I don't like the look of all this. This passage goes underground. Gives me the creeps. Oh, ah. I say, let's run into something. Now, the wall, I fancy. I forgot to warn you. There's a turn here to the right. Yes, I found that out. Thanks very much. Ah, here's the door. Just a moment till I light my dark lantern. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll unlock the door for us. In just a moment till I find my key. Ah, here we are. Better let me go first, sir, in case we're too late. Ah, yes, the coast seems clear enough. Come along, both of you. Holmes, as I said, I don't like the look of this place. Your lantern throws such weird shadows. It smells like a vault. It is a vault, my dear Watson. The basement of the city and suburban bank, to be exact, of which our friend Mr. Merriweather here is managing director. Well, what are all those wooden crates doing here? They explain why the most daring criminal in London is taking such an interest in this particular place. Yes, Dr. Watson. These crates contain our French gold. French gold? Quite. Well, you see, we had occasion some months ago to borrow 30,000 Napoleons from France. From France? Good gracious me. Most of which has never been unpacked. Rather an inducement for any thief. Oh, really, Holmes, I think you are rather unduly excited. The building is guarded by ten burly watchmen. Yes, I dare say you're not particularly vulnerable from above. Nor from below, Holmes. Nothing but solid earth below these flagstones. Listen to this. Don't do that. You want to ruin all our plans? But look here, I say it did sound hollow, you know. Not so loud, please. Now then, I think we'd better take up our positions. You, Merriweather, behind those large boxes in the corner. Watson and I will hide behind this crate. I hope you appreciate the honor, my dear fellow. This crate contains no less than 2,000 Napoleons neatly packed in tinfoil. Good heavens. Ready? We must put the screen over my dark lantern. And sit here in the dark? Certainly. Oh, dear, and I brought along a pack of cards. I thought we might have time for a three-handed rubber. Not tonight, Mr. Merriweather. We are dealing with a dangerous man, and unless we can take him at a disadvantage, he may do us considerable harm. One thing more. When I flash my light, close in swiftly. And if he reaches for a weapon, shoot. And shoot to kill. Dear me, I... I wish I'd stayed at home. Quite. I'm going to cover the light. Yes, I'm here. 
I'm beginning to imagine all sorts of horrors. Sitting here in the dark like this. Really, Meriwether. Holmes, do you hear that? Look, 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 look. There in the middle of the floor. A slit of light. Somebody's raising one of the stone slabs. Look, look, there's a hand. Catch his hands before I can pull himself through the opening. Right, you are. Quick, Watson. Look out, he's got a knife. Take your hands off. No, you don't, you... Oh, oh well done, Holmes. Well done. You've knocked him out. Good. Drag him up here. Right, you are. There. Now, Mr. Merriweather, if you'll give us some light. That's better. But I say, Holmes, it's Vincent Spaulding, Wilson's assistant. Spaulding rubbish. This is John Clay, one of the most dangerous criminals in London. I've been after him for years. Help me search him, Watson. Look oh. out, Holmes. Look oh. out. He's coming, too. Take your filthy hands off me, you scarecrow. No, no, no. None of that now. You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. Oh, lunatic. And when you address me, have the goodness to say, sir, and please. Oh, very well. Uh, Would you please, sir, march yourself upstairs where we can hand you over to the policemen who are anxiously awaiting your highness's arrival? And be quick about it. Better have another spot of whiskey, Watson. Oh, thank you. Hi, Jervis. Feels good to get into dry clothes again after spending hours in that cold cellar. I say, said it, not so much soda, Holmes. Do you want to drown it? <laughs> oh, God bless you, my dear fellow. Oh, thanks. I say, Holmes, wh- when did you first begin to suspect that fellow Spaulding? I, I mean, Clay. When uh, Mr. Wilson told me he was anxious to work for half price. Always suspect anyone or anything that comes too cheap. There's sure to be a motive behind yes, but it. How did you guess what the motive was in this case? I mean, I suspected his. Uh, Fondness for photography, and his trick of vanishing into the cellar. The cellar. There was the end of this tangled clue. And why was someone so anxious to have our friend Mr. Wilson kept out of his shop for several hours every day? Activities in the cellar again. Uh, By the way, that red-headed league hoax is one of the cleverest dodges I've come across for some time. Too clever, in fact. When I heard of it, I knew there was only one man who could have originated it. John Clay. We've had our skirmishes... But this is the first time we've come face to face. Oh, so you went around to have a look at the shop? At his trousers, Watson. Trousers? At the mm. knees of his trousers, to be exact. You saw how worn and wrinkled they were? They spoke of hours of burrowing. Burrowing in the cellar. But what for? By tapping on the pavement, I found that the tunnel did not stretch out to the front. Where, then? We strolled round the corner, you remember. And there stood the city and suburban bank abutting on our friend's pawn shop. Yes, of course. The inference was clear. Yes, yes, I see that. But how did you guess that he'd make his attempt tonight? Perfectly simple, Watson. Perfectly simple. The offices of the Red-Headed League closed this morning. Mr. Wilson's absence was no longer necessary. The tunnel was completed, but it was essential that Mr. Clay should use it soon or it might be discovered. Tonight being Saturday would be ideal as it would give him two days for escape. Q.E.D. Holmes, your reasoning is perfect. A long chain, and yet every link rings true. Well, it saves me from ennui. These little problems help me to escape the common places of existence. Yes, uh, after all, uh, l'homme sait rien, l'oeuvre sait tout. As Flaubert once wrote to George Sand. Fascinating story, Dr. Watson. What a thrilling time you must have had during the days you lived with Sherlock Holmes. Well, I can't say that I was ever bored. (laughs) I should think not. Ladies, how often you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. And how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell. Because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour bays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a caustic soap. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam, even in the hardest water. 
You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that divinely beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Well, Mr. Bell, one of the favorite fictional problems of your modern mystery writer is the so-called locked room story. <laughs> yes, I know. Somebody gets murdered in a sealed room, locked from the inside, and the detective has an awful time finding out how it was done. Oh, quite correct, Mr. Bell, quite correct. And uh, next week... I'm going to tell you how, just ten years before the turn of the century, Holmes actually encountered such a problem and solved it. I call the story Murder in the Locked Room. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Red-Headed Lee. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about murder in the locked room. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time for the pleasantest of all doctor's appointments, our weekly visit with that splendid host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell, punctual to the minute, as usual. Draw up a chair and sit down. Oh, thank you. Ah, uh, that's it. All ready for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy, I was just going over my notes on the case before you arrived. It was an adventure that started off on a note of gaiety and ended in one of the most bizarre tragedies that we ever encountered. I call it Murder in the Locked Room. This I've got to hear. But first... Men, the good old summertime is here again. And after a day spent at the ballpark, on the golf links, or just loafing under the sun, does your hair look as stiff as a straw, dry, matted, and tangled? Then don't make the mistake of plastering your hair down with greasy, sticky goo. Instead, put Kreml hair tonic on the job. Kreml is that famous modern hair tonic. Such a wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing. Kremel has just enough light oils to keep dry, stringy hair neatly groomed throughout the hottest, most humid summer day. Yet Kremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy. It never leaves any unpleasant odor. Kremel always feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Kremel is able to give you all these advantages because it contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. So men, make Kremel a daily must this summer. For that handsome, clean-cut look from morn till night. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, Murder in the Locked Room? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place many, many years ago. It began on a gray and murky afternoon in Baker Street. we just finished tea, I remember, and Holmes was busying himself with some chemical experiments. For some time, he sat there in silence with his long, thin back curved over a a retort 
in which he was brewing a particularly malodorous product. As I glanced across at him, seated there under the gaslight, his head was sunk upon his breast, and he looked like a strange, lank bird with dull grey plumage and a black top knot. Suddenly, he turned to me and spoke. So, Watson, you've decided not to invest in South African securities. Huh? How nice to know that, Holmes. Huh? It isn't really difficult. I observe a groove between your left forefinger and thumb. Groove? It is enough to tell me that you do not intend to invest your small capital in the gold fields. I see no connection, groove. And yet the train of thought is elementary. Hmm? One, you had chalk between your thumb and finger when you returned from your club. Two, you put chalk there when you played billiards. Three, you never play billiards except with Marston. For you told me about a month ago that Marston had an option on some South African property which would expire in four weeks and which he desired you to share with him. Five, your checkbook is locked in my drawer and you have not asked for the key. Number six is the logical conclusion. You've decided not to invest your money in this oh. manner. <laughs> Absurdly simple. I oh. knew you'd say that. <laughs> I wonder who that is. Were you expecting a client? No, Watson, but I hope it is one. My practice has been decidedly slack lately. Go and see who it is, will you? Yes, of course. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. I'll show the gentleman in. Uh, this way, sir. Good, good evening. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do? My name is Chudley Stoner. Oh, come along in, Mr. Stoner. Thank you. And this must be the great Sherlock Holmes. My name is Holmes. The adjective is your own, Mr. Stoner. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. I don't imagine you know anything about me, Mr. Holmes. Nothing beyond the fact that you went to Eton and Oxford, that you have a beautiful and socially prominent wife, and that you contribute to the Strand magazine with some regularity. <laughs> I'm disappointed in not receiving one of your famous deductive analyses, Mr. Holmes, but I'm glad that my name is familiar to you. You contribute to the Strand magazine, sir, too? Uh, that's very interesting, sir. Uh, perhaps you read some of my, uh, my uh, humble efforts. Sir. Yes, indeed, <laughs> Doctor. Very colorful stories they are. Oh, Thanks. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Oh, Stoner, your own stories, which uh, also deal with the world of crime, seem to me to be even more sensational than Watson's. Probably because he has the facts to work with, whereas I have to depend on my gift of imagination. But the reason I've come to you tonight, Mr. Holmes, has nothing to do with imagination. I find myself mixed up in a real-life murder that is as puzzling as any problem I've dealt with in fiction. A murder, Mr. Stoner? I say, really, you don't... facts, please. Well, Mr. Holmes, I'll give them to you as briefly and concisely as possible. I just got back from Paris yesterday. My secretary went with me. He did not return. The French police say he committed suicide. I know that he didn't. Oh, how do you know that, Mr. Stoner? The boy had everything in the world to live for. No financial worries and a very promising future ahead of him. Hmm. Please describe the circumstances under which his body was found. Well, uh, I'd left him alone in his room. When I came to fetch him, there was no answer to my knock. I tried to look through the keyhole, but the key was in the lock from the inside, and I could see nothing. After some time it elapsed, I got worried. A friend of mine, an inspector of the police, was dining with me that night, and he suggested we should investigate. We broke down the door. My secretary was dead, a bullet in his heart. Inside a room, locked from the inside, huh? Obviously, the police were right in thinking that it was suicide, Mr. Sonner. Of course, you examined the room thoroughly for traces of some other method of ingress? Meticulously. The windows were locked tight. No uh, sliding panels? None. Where was the revolver? Beside his right hand, one bullet gone. And you say the key was in the inside of the door? Yes, and that's why the police wrote it off as suicide. Mr. Holmes, how would you explain such a situation? I'd like a few more facts before giving an opinion... You say you examined the room meticulously. Was there no uh, oddity? Nothing out of place? Nothing uh, peculiar in that room? Nothing that I noticed. Perhaps uh, a small pellet of wax, say? Yes, by Joe. I did find a wax pellet. It was lying on the carpet near the door, and I couldn't imagine what he was doing there. Well, there's your answer. Uh, one more question. This French inspector who entered the room with you, what was his personal relationship with your secretary? Odd that you should ask that. They'd quarreled the night before about some girl at the Folly Bajer. Then there you have it, Mr. Stoner. The murderer left the room, locked the door from the outside, removed the key and plugged the keyhole with wax. When the room was broken into, he simply slipped the key into the inside of the lock, thereby dislodging the wax pellet. Obviously, from what you've told me, only the inspector had that opportunity. Great Scott, a French police inspector, a murderer? Holmes, what are you going to do about this? Nothing, old chap. Huh? Beyond uh, wishing Mr. Stoner good luck with the editor of the Strand magazine. I don't think I follow you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, come now, Mr. Stoner. 
It's an intellectual game and, uh, in its way, quite stimulating. But don't think you can hoodwink me so easily. Holmes, what are you talking about? My dear Watson, I read the papers carefully. What do the papers have to do with this? I've noticed the presence of you and your lovely wife at so many social functions here in London in the past few days that I'm afraid I can't possibly accept your Paris story. The obvious answer remains. You've come to me with an imaginary problem in order to solve a difficulty in one of your stories. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're even smarter than I gave you credit for. But this is disgraceful, sir, wasting my friend's time like this. I suppose I should apologize, Mr. Holmes, but here's the way it happened. I came home late last night, a little uh, under the weather. I had the most wonderful idea on earth for a story. I was going to call it The Locked Room. I'm convinced I made some notes on the story last night, but when I wakened this morning, I couldn't find them. All I could remember was the problem, but I had no idea how to solve it, and so I came to you. I see It's an excellent idea for a story. Though I have known similar locked room problems, in fact, I don't recall that fiction has exploited their possibilities as yet. Holmes, why are you so calm? I think it's outrageous to come here and pick your brains for a story. My dear Watson, how else do you get the material for your own masterpieces? That's not very funny. Should you grudge it to him? Hmm? Well, it's not the same thing at all. I must say, you're being very sporting about it, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, Mr. Stoner. I'm being businesslike. May I ask how much you are in the habit of receiving for a story of yours in the Strand magazine? About 20 guineas. Why? I am a consulting detective, and I think I've given you a valuable opinion. My fee, if you sell your story, will be 10 guineas. Good night to you, Mr. Stoner. There you are, Monsieur Stoner. A remarkable deduction, André. Yes, here I am. I've spent all afternoon searching for those notes on the story. I could not find any trace of them. And yet I could swear I did some work when I came in last night. You are sure I didn't give you some dictation? Oh, quite sure, Monsieur Stoner. If you will pardon my saying so, you were a little... Yes, uh... yes, go on, André, say it. The secretary has some rights. I was drunk. That's what you mean, isn't it? Oh, I meant no offense. Sir. It'd be rather a relief if you did. You're always so infernally polite. Where's my wife? She's in the library with your brother-in-law, Monsieur Seal. Very well. I'll need you after dinner, André. I'm going to work on the story tonight. Yes, Monsieur Stoner. Hello, Chad. I was beginning to worry about you not being back for dinner. I stopped at the club. Good evening, Chad. Hello, Henry. And how is our master of the violin this evening? Chad, don't make fun of my brother like that. Yes, Chad, go easy. I can't learn the violin in two easy lessons, you know. Violet accompanied me on the piano just now. She says I'm improving. I don't doubt that you're improving. You couldn't become worse. Chad, you're intolerable. Henry's our guest. An unwanted guest as far as I'm concerned. He's been here two months. Why doesn't he try and get himself a job instead of mooning around here all day scraping away at his fiddle? That's the last time you've insulted me, Chad. I'm leaving here in the morning. I hope I can count on it. How dare you, Chad? How dare you? If Henry goes in the morning, I shall go with him. Now, Violet, take it easy. You've been drinking again, and you're disgusting when you drink. You made an absolute fool of yourself in front of André last night. You're very protective about him. Are you sure those calf eyes he keeps making at you are entirely unreciprocated? I hate you, Chad. I'm not waiting until the morning. I'm leaving tonight. Now, wait a minute, Violet. I'm sorry. I don't know what makes me do it. I get a few drinks and I just feel that I've got to hurt you. Well, you certainly succeed. I used to think it was the so-called artistic temperament that made you this way. Now I realize it's drink. I'm sorry, Violet, but it's not been too easy for me. Having Henry around all day gets pretty trying, particularly when I'm attempting to work. But he's planning to move soon anyway. Surely you can tolerate it a little longer for our sake, Chad, can't you? Of course I can, Violet. I'm sorry, dear. I'll try and be a little less boorish and uh, I'll watch the drinking. That sounds more like the man I married. And I'll help, too. I'll try and keep Henry out of your way as much as possible, dear. We can make a go of it, Violet. I know we can. Well, I'm going into the study. I want to jot down some notes on the new story while they're still fresh in my mind. All right, dear. Dinner will be in about half an hour. I'll call you. Fine. Hmm, the locked room. Yes, that'll be a good title. Hmm. It'll be worth giving Sherlock Holmes ten guineas for the help he gave me. Who is it? Is that you? I'm flattered that you dropped by to see me, Inspector Lestrade. 
Not a business visit, I gather. Bless you now, Mr. Dams. You'll have a whiskey and soda, won't you, Lestrade? Thank you kindly, Dr. Watson. Uh, not too much soda, if you don't mind. The uh, London criminal is becoming a dull dog these days, Lestrade. My own practice has been remarkably slow in the past few weeks. Uh, same thing with us at Scotland Yard, Mr. Dams. But, of course, we don't grumble at that. Now, take me. I've had an easy day today. Just come from investigating a suicide in Church Street, Kensington. Indeed, another poor devil who couldn't stand the pace of our modern living, I suppose. I suppose so, Doctor. Though you'd have thought this bloke had everything he wanted. He was quite a successful writer, they tell me. A writer? What was his name? He wrote for the Strand magazine. Name was Chudley Stoner. <laughs> Dr. Watson, you dropped that glass. You say Chudley Stoner committed suicide tonight? That's right, Mr. Holmes. You know him? Under what circumstances was he found? It was a routine case, sir. Locked the door on his study from the inside and then blew his brains out. The windows were locked and there were no secret panels and that kind of stuff. It was suicide, all right. Hmm, the arm of coincidence is long indeed, but not as long as that. Has the body been moved? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I told him to touch nothing until the police photographers got there. Just to be on the safe side, you understand, sir. Splendid. Grab your coat and hat, Watson. Right, your home. But what's all the excitement, Mr. Elms? It's just a suicide. Nonsense, Inspector. I'll stake my whole reputation that Chudley Stoner has been the victim of a murder plot as cunning and diabolical as any that I've ever encountered. In just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes is correct in deducing that this is murder. Are you one of the many men who find it difficult to keep your hair neatly groomed in summer? Does the burning sun bake and scorch your hair, making it look messy and not the least attractive? Then try Cremel Hair Tonic. Just notice the amazing change in the appearance of your hair. You see, Cremel does lots more than just keep your hair looking handsome. This highly specialized hair tonic gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if the sun dries your hair so that it breaks off and falls, Cremel helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, more pliable when you comb it. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. Be smart, men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this is really one for the book. A mystery writer comes to Sherlock Holmes with a fictitious murder plot. Holmes solves it for him, then the man goes away and gets murdered in exactly the way he described. Precisely, Mr. Bell, as provocative a problem as ever we encountered. I bet you hurried off to the dead man's house at once, didn't you? As fast as a handsome cab could take us, sir. As soon as we arrived, we cross-examined the three members of the household. The dead man's wife, Violet, her brother, Henry Seal, and Andre LaRue, the secretary. All of them told the same story. They, that they'd heard the shot and hastened to the room from different parts of the house. They said that they looked through the keyhole, found it was blocked, and then the two men broke down the door. Just the same story as in the dead man's fictional problem, wasn't it? What happened next, Dr. Watt? Well, before we talk to the three suspects any further, Holmes, Inspector Lestrade, and I walked into the dead man's study to examine the body. I can almost hear Holmes now, as he said. Hmm. It's not hard to find a motive. A beautiful wife, a worthless brother who'd been told to get out, an attractive and attentive young French secretary who hated the dead man's cruelty. Blimey. And I called it just a routine suicide. You'll notice that no wax pellet is in evidence this time. I'd say that the answer is obvious. The dead man did write some notes on his story last night. The killer found them and realized that he'd been presented with a perfect murder method, never expecting that the dead man would divulge his method to me. Mr. Holmes... Why are you examining the key hole of the door? I was looking for a pellet of wax, Inspector. It's missing. Obviously, the murderer had read about that in the dead man's notes and was clever enough to remove it. But uh, let's examine the corpse. Hmm. Interesting. Most interesting. Why, Holmes? Well, surely you can see for yourself, Watson. The bloodstains clearly indicate that the man fell here, some five or six feet from the desk. 
And yet, with a dying burst of energy, he crawled towards the desk and clutched it. Undoubtedly, he was trying to give us a dying message. But how can holding on to a desk give a message, Mr. Holmes? And why should a dying man try to do that anyway? Remember that the dead man was a writer and a student of, student of criminology. In his last few moments of consciousness, he probably realized I'd be on the track of his murderer. He gave us more than one clue, Holmes. Look at his body. As he fell for the last time, he upset that bowl of violets. And his wife's name is Violet. Coincidence, I think, Watson. The flowers were knocked over inadvertently as he fell. But the move to the desk was a deliberate and desperate effort. Well, uh, if you talk about that, look here, gentlemen. Lying by his right arm. Look, that was knocked off the desk, too. It's a seal with a monogram on it. Right, Doctor. And Seal is the name of the dead man's brother-in-law. Henry Seal. Interesting, but I refuse to believe that a dying man could deliberately knock over such a comprehensive number of incriminating objects as he died. Then who do you suppose did do it, Holmes? At this stage of the case, I shall suppose nothing, Watson. We have uh, three obvious suspects waiting for us. Let's question them. They want us here. I know nothing Quiet, about Quiet, please. Mr. Elms wants to ask you some questions. I... No, Inspector. I only wish to ask them one question. You, Mrs. Stoner, how did you occupy your time while you were waiting for the police to arrive? I was so nervous that to try to calm myself, I did some knitting. I do quite a lot of knitting for the Coast Guard men, you know. I see. And you, Mr. Seal, what were your movements before the police arrived? I sat in the library, Mr. Holmes, playing solitaire. And you, André? I, I went to my room and worked on my account books. I realized that my job here was finished and I thought I would get my books in order. I see. That's all for now, thank you. Come along, Henry. Uh, Lestrade. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'd like you to get me those three objects spoken of. The knitting, the cards, and the account books. Right you are, Mr. Holmes. I don't see that you found out much there, Holmes. Don't you, Watson? I'd have thought my line of reasoning was obvious. What are you doing? Kneeling at that keyhole. You said that this time the pellet of wax had been removed. True, Watson. But even though the pellet's been removed, I'm quite sure there'll be traces of wax inside the keyhole. And there are. Splendid. I shall remove this lock and take it back to Baker Street. The murderer undoubtedly still had some traces of wax on his fingers. A closer examination of the fragments of wax inside this keyhole and uh, an equally close examination of the knitting, of the cards, and the account books should be able to give us the solution to this case. Well, Holmes, you've been poring over the microscope for nearly an hour. Have you got the answer? Nearly, but not quite. But you've examined all three of the objects. Surely it's just a question of finding which one of them shows traces of wax. Oh, no, old chap. Huh? It's not as easy as that. Oddly enough, the knitting, the pack of cards, and the account books all show traces of wax. Great Scott. But that means that all those people were involved in the murder. It was a concerted plan between the three of them. I think not, Watson. What? And in five more minutes, I'm sure I can prove to you who the murderer is. Violet. Violet, why are you sitting alone here in the library? Oh, hello, Andre. I'm so upset. They think that Chad was murdered. The inspector's still questioning Henry. I believe they think he did it. Oh, it's awful. Oh. oh. Now, don't worry, darling. Everything is going to be all right. Please, Andre. With Chad's body hardly cold. But surely now that he is dead... Uh, you always made me believe that if he were dead, we could be together, darling. I was insane. I thought he was neglecting me. That perhaps there was some other woman. But just before he died, we had a talk. I knew it was going to be all right again. But me? You mean you were making a fool of me? I was making a fool of myself, Andre. Please forget it. Forget it? No, my cold-blooded Englishwoman. I am not some stupid boy you can play with. 
You cannot throw me aside. I have risked my life for your happiness. Risk your... Andre! You murdered Chad. Of course I did. I hated him. Yet I hated the way he made you unhappy. And the fool gave me the perfect way to do it by telling me about his filthy story. And then forgetting that he had done so. You devil, get away from me. I'm turning you over to the police. No, you are not. You are going to join Chad since you love him so much. Andre, put away that oh. revolver. <coughs> nice shooting, Watson. You got him in the wrist. Oh, sorry. Mrs. Turner, are you all right? Yes, but thank heaven you were both behind those curtains. I'm sorry that we had to wait until the last minute to disclose our presence. But it's just as well to have witnesses to a murder confession. What do you have to say for yourself, Monsieur Leroux? Nothing. Send for your policeman and have me taken to prison. With pleasure. Watson, ask Inspector Lestrade to step in here, will you? Tell him we have a customer for him. A customer for the gallows. <laughs> Midnight. It would be good to get back to Baker Street. It's, it's been an exhausting evening's work. Yes, Watson. A sordid case. A shabby patchwork of discontent and hatred. Oh, well, we've been instrumental in sending yet another felon to his rightful destiny. You know, Holmes, there's still one or two points I don't quite understand. I can't believe it, Watson. What are they? Well, you said that all three objects you examined contained traces of wax. They did, and at what? first that confused me. But there are various qualities of wax. For instance, Mrs. Stoner was knitting with a certain waxed wool that is used specifically in knitting for seafaring men. It uh, gives the garments a weatherproof finish. Never heard of it. Possibly not, but it's a fact. And, uh, as you know, I specialize in such odd pieces of information. Well, what about the traces of wax on the cards that Henry Seal used when he was playing solitaire? Again, I was misled. Until I remembered that Mrs. Stoner told us that her brother had been playing the violin a short while before her husband's death. Oh, he'd been using rosin. Precisely. Oh, yes. Logically, it uh, had to be the secretary. But the proof came when I made the final analysis of the three specimens of wax. Uh, that, uh, on the account books, was the only one that exactly matched the traces of wax I found in the keyhole. Oh, suppose I'm very stupid, Holmes. Hmm. Uh, anything else bothering you? Yes, just one point. You said that the dying man tried to indicate his murderer by clasping the desk as he died. Yes, I'm sure he was trying to give us a dying message. Well, I was fooled by the violets and the seal. Well, that was a freakish coincidence. But the effort in crawling to the desk was not. That was the true message. Well, I still don't see it. Oh, come now, Watson. The secretary was a Frenchman. The French word for desk and for sec secretary is the same. Secretaire. Oh, I see it now. Oh, really, Watson? You know, Holmes, you'll never get your fee for this case. Indeed. And why? Stone is dead. you never sell that story to the Strand magazine now. True, Watson. But uh, I've no doubt that you will. Though perhaps it'll be a slightly different version of it. And you'll probably call it something very melodramatic. Um, perhaps uh, <laughs> murder in the locked room. <laughs> Ladies, when you want to look your radiant best, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with Cremel shampoo. And I want to state right here and now that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls, you'll be amazed how Cremel shampoo reveals all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a harsh soap, not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. After a Cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. And Cremel shampoo never dries or breaks the hair. In fact, it even has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with a lovely satin smoothness. The hair holds away better, too. So, ladies, 
Buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I never think next week. Next week, I... I think I shall tell you how Holmes and I returned to Baker Street one afternoon to find our rooms occupied by a beautiful young woman on the verge of hysteria. Well, that sounds promising. And who was the beautiful young woman? No, 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 Mr. <laughs> Bell, Mr. Bell, I've told you before about this. You'll have to wait till next week to find that out. <laughs> I will say, however, that her story was horrifying enough to make our hair stand on end. I call this adventure Death in the North Sea. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Dancing Men. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about Death in the North Sea. Save for the future the easy, automatic way. Buy U.S. saving bonds through your payroll savings plan or at your bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now for our weekly visit to the famous chronicler of Sherlock Holmes, our good friend, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you this evening? Oh, in the best of spirits, Mr. Bell. Thank you, and you? Never better, thank you. And am I correct in deducing that that faded old newspaper lying upon your desk has something to do with the story you're going to tell us tonight? indeed, Mr. Bell. Here you are. The London Times of September the 4th, 1903. Take a look at this. Hmm. Judges summing up to jury interrupted. Sensational solution by Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, I think that you will find it equally sensational, Mr. Bell. It was one of Holmes's most dramatic cases. But uh, first, you want a word with our listeners. Go ahead, well... Well, I light up the pipe. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Men, in summer when you go without your hat, does your hair get dry, wild, and unruly looking? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy? Then remember, Kreml hair tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. As if your barber had just combed it. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Kreml always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, so refreshed and alive. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now that I see you've got your pipe drawing to your satisfaction, Dr. Watson... How about the story you promised? Well, well, Holmes and I had just returned from a long-anticipated holiday in Scotland. Mrs. Hudson greeted us with the news that a lady was at that moment awaiting us in our rooms. And as we opened the door... Oh, Mr. Holmes, at last, thank heaven. I beg your you pardon. You must save him. He didn't do it. I know he didn't. And they'll hang him. They'll hang him. No one in the world but you can help him now. Now, my dear madam, you must control yourself. I can't possibly help you until I know your problem. Oh, you... You must excuse me. Uh, here, 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 my dear. You, you drink this. It'll, it'll make you feel better. Oh, thank you. 
I've been waiting for you, Mr. Holmes, praying for your return for days. You left no forwarding address. I know. Dr. Watson and I had promised ourselves a real holiday. I'm Edith Fairmont. <sighs> Evidently, that name means nothing to you. You haven't seen the newspapers? No, not for four weeks, thank him. Compose yourself, madam, and tell us what has brought you here. And remember that we know nothing beyond the obvious facts that you are in great distress and uh, from your peril recently widowed. Well, I... I shall try to give you a clear account, Mr. Holmes. You're my one remaining hope. Some ten years ago, I married Augustus Fairmont. A marriage which, I frankly admit, was forwarded more by my parents than by any wishes of mine. I was then only 18. Augustus was more than 20 years older than I. He was a diamond importer, and a very successful one. Our marriage was perhaps not an ideally happy one. But for ten years, I... I did my best to be a good wife to Augustus. No, 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 my dear. Just, just uh, take please it continue, easy, Mrs. Take it easy. About a year ago, my husband took into partnership with him a young man of 32, Charles Rossiter. During the ensuing months, Charles and I fell in love, Mr. Holmes. But I assure you that both my self-respect and Charles's high sense of honor kept us from anything more than a declaration of that love. Oh, I beg you to believe that I'm telling you the entire truth. I'm sure you realize, Mrs. Fairmont, that that is the only thing to do. Yes, of course, of course. Charles wanted to discuss our problem with my husband, but I persuaded him to let me approach Augustus. But the result was as I had anticipated. Afterward, I met Charles for tea as we'd agreed to tell him what had happened. Edith, my dear... I thought you'd never get here. Oh, it was difficult, Charles. Even more difficult than we expected. I... I hate to tell you this, my dearest. You don't have to tell me. I knew as soon as I saw you. Augustus refused even to discuss the possibility of giving me a divorce. You know how violent his temper is. He... he really frightened me. I wish you'd let me speak to him. Oh, I'm glad I didn't. His hatred for you is great enough as it is. But how can he want to hold you tight to him in marriage knowing that you love me... I should think that any decent man... Evidently, you don't know Augustus very well. He has an almost abnormal sense of possession. Whatever belongs to him, he'll keep, no matter what the cost. Very well, then. We've tried to do the right thing. Since he won't give you a divorce, there's only one thing left. Leave him. You and I will go to America or the continent and, and make a new life there for ourselves. I can't, Charles. You know that I love you, but we could never find happiness in that sort of life. I want to be your wife, Charles, to have children. And since that's denied us, we must stop seeing each other. I shall always love you, dear. Edith, you can't go out of my life like that. There's no other way. Goodbye, my darling. That was the last meeting I had with Charles, Mr. Holmes. I see. Go on, Mrs. Fairmont. Well, my husband and Charles were, under the circumstances, equally anxious to dissolve their partnership. They agreed to make a final trip to Amsterdam to complete a transaction which they'd previously arranged, after which the business was to be dissolved. Uh, how long ago was this? A little more than a month ago. The day before they left, my husband, telling me that he was unable to find the revolver which he always carried when transporting valuable shipments of diamonds, asked me to buy him a new one. I did so, and he took it with him when he sailed. Two days later, having completed their business in Amsterdam, Charles and my husband started back to England aboard the night boat from Flushing. My husband had with him over 10,000 pounds worth of unset diamonds which they'd purchased. I assume, Mrs. Fairmont, that this part of your narrative is all uh, hearsay. What I'm telling you now, I've learned from the police. Charles and my husband had adjoining cabins on the boat. It was a foggy night in the North Sea, and about midnight... A German gentleman in the cabin adjoining my husband's on the other side from Charles's heard the sounds of a violent quarrel between Charles and Augustus. Stuart! Stuart! Yes, Mr. Smith? What can I do for you? Listen to that bellowing in there. Is this a cattle boat? How can I sleep with such a death? Look the noise going on. Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. The, the gentleman do seem a bit agitated, like. I'll knock on the door. I'm sorry, sir, but there's been a complaint from some of the passengers regarding the noise. Oh, all right. There you are, Mr. Smith. 
there's any more disturbance, just ring for me. If there's any more disturbance, I go to the captain. For an hour now, I've been trying to get to sleep. Oh, what was that? That was a shot, you dumb cop. Come. It's locked. Well, I get down. Oh, good aliens. That man is dead. Dead as a doornail. It's Augustus. What's happened? You ask what has happened? With that man dead on the floor and you in the doorway between your cabins? Here, Stuart, get the captain. I'll watch this murder until you come back. Mrs. Fairmont, I can understand what a strain it must be for you to tell all this. Uh, let me get you some aromatic... Oh, I, I'm all right, Dr. Watson. Thank you. Uh, your husband had died instantly, Mrs. Fairmont? So the police said, Mr. Holmes. Apparently the revolver had been fired at very close range, directly into his head. They said he must have fallen dead on the instant. And the revolver? Well, it was gone, Mr. Holmes. The porthole which gave onto the sea was wide open. The police, of course, say that Charles threw the revolver out of the porthole after shooting Augustus. The bullet was a thirty-two caliber, the same as the one I had purchased at my husband's request. And uh, what has Mr. Charles Rossiter to say? Well, what is there for him to say? Oh, quiet, Watson. Oh, I don't blame you for thinking that Charles is guilty, Dr. Watson. Everyone in the world thinks so. But I know that he isn't. He has sworn to me that it's a complete mystery to him, and I believe him. If I didn't believe him, there'd be nothing left to live for. The police arrested him, of course. Oh, naturally. He he goes to trial at the Old Bailey tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must save him. You must. You're my only hope. No one else can do it. Say that you will. I cannot promise that, Mrs. Fairmont. I'll uh, undertake the case, but you must understand that anything I discover, even though it may be evidence damning to Mr. Rossiter, will be turned over to the police. That's all I ask. I know he's innocent, and I have faith that you'll prove it. I beg you not to indulge in any false hopes, Mrs. Fairmont. I shall do my best to uncover the truth, but we have little time at our disposal. You omitted to mention what had happened to the diamonds. Were they found on your husband's person? Oh, I... I almost forgot. They seemed so unimportant. The diamonds were missing, Mr. Holmes. Huh? Missing? Oh. How do you count for that? The police think that Charles was going to steal them, and that suddenly realizing the impossibility of the idea, he threw both them and the revolver out of the porthole. Odd. Well, with the trial starting tomorrow, Mrs. Fairmont, Watson and I have much to do. Our first task must be a complete examination of the police records of the case. I know you'll excuse us if we hurry off, Mrs. Fairmont. Our first call must be on Mr. Charles Rossiter in prison. And as heaven's my witness, Mr. Holmes, I've told you and Dr. Watson everything I know. You say that you and your late partner had taken out business insurance on each other's lives? Yes, Mr. Holmes, to the extent of uh, 25,000 pounds apiece. 25,000 pounds apiece? I say that makes it look even worse, Holmes, huh? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, one more question, Mr. Rossiter. After the quarrel on the boat, when the steward had knocked and requested silence, you went back into your own cabin. Is that correct? It is, Mr. Holmes. And according to you, you heard the sound of a shot from Fairmont's cabin a moment later. How much time would you say had elapsed? Oh, a very short interval, not, not more than 15 seconds at the outside. Thank you. Well, Mr. Rossiter, I'll do what I can, but... Uh... Oh, I know it's hopeless. I wouldn't believe the story myself if I heard it from someone else. Tell me, Dr. Watson, you're a medical man. Could I conceivably have had a lapse of memory? Could I have shot Fairmont without knowing anything about it? Well, it seems to me almost inconceivable. I never heard of a case of amnesia or loss of memory that began and ended all in the space of a couple of minutes. Well, come on, Watson. We must be going. Mr. Holmes, do, do you think there's any chance? Keep up your courage, Mr. Rossiter. There's always a chance. Uh, water. Holmes, I grant you that Mrs. Fairman's a lovely woman and that young Rossiter had a lot of provocation. But why did you tell him that there was a chance? It hardly seems cricket to me. I told him that there was a chance, Watson, for the excellent reason that there is. 
Chance of what? Of acquitting Rossiter of a crime which he very obviously did not commit. What do you mean to say that... Come along, Watson. We've no time to stand about arguing. Rossiter's trial opens tomorrow morning. And if we're to secure the evidence we need, you and I have our work cut out for us. Evidence? Evidence of what? Evidence to convince a jury. The sequence of events is obvious, but it'll require a continuous chain of proof to convince a jury of Rossiter's innocence. Innocence? (laughs) On my soul, Holmes, I think you must be mad. Prosecution has an absolutely clear-cut case. And you go on practicing about Rosta's innocence. If Rosta didn't shoot Augustus Fairmont, somebody must have. Somebody did, Watson. And a devilishly clever plot he invented, too. But if we're to save Rosita from hanging, it's up to us to prove it. Just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes is able to prove it. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than keep your hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and keep and buy Kreml hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kreml gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. It never looks or feels greasy or sticky. In addition, Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the hair, the scalp, feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most prosperous men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily for better groomed hair and more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what steps did you and Sherlock Holmes take next to prove Rossiter's innocence? Well, Holmes and I hurried to the offices of Fairmont and Rossiter in Hatton Gardens. Assisted by Fairmont's chief clerk, a little dried-up wisp of a man, we spent the next hour in an intensive study of Fairmont's old checkbook stuff. There's no question of it, Watson. These regular payments, month after month, to Mademoiselle Elaine Dufour can only mean one thing. Oh, I don't see why. She might have been an old nurse of his or something. Really, Watson. Huh? One does not pay one's old nurse 50 pounds a month over a period of years. Oh, oh that's all right. Thank oh. heaven we found Mademoiselle Dufour's address. Why? Because you're leaving for Paris tonight. Huh? And I want you to bring back Mademoiselle Dufour no matter what means you use to persuade her. Oh, really, Holmes? What are you going to do? I'll be doing while well, I'm off on this, on this wild goose chase. Huh? I have a few things to look uh, into, Watson. Quite a few things. And you performed the post-mortem yourself, Dr. McPherson? I did, Mr. Holmes. And I'm prepared to state my professional reputation that Augustus Fairmont would have been dead within a year, no matter what had been done. That is easy to progress too far for surgeries to have been any use whatsoever. You uh, told the police this, of course. Oh, naturally. They weren't interested. All they cared about was the bullet which finished the fellow off. Of course, you understand, Mr. Holmes, that after the police had finished, this cabin was all straightened up. New carpet on the floor, everything ship-shaped. Quite. And uh, Mr. Fairmont's body was lying right here. Is that right, Stuart? It was indeed, sir. And a fair turn he'd give me, with half his head blown off. And uh, this cabin and the adjoining one, occupied by Mr. Rossiter, are identical in every way? Yes, sir. Ah. I'd hoped to find something like this. What was it, sir? Take a good look at this, Stuart. I may need your evidence in court. This uh, rather deep nick here in the lower part of the brass rim of the porthole. Oh, I see the nick all right, sir, but I'm blasted if I can mention... Just tell me one thing. After the tragedy, was any heavy object missing from Mr. Fairmont's cabin? Uh, Something heavy, but uh, fairly small? That's a queer thing, sir, now that you've come to mention it. I reported to the chief steward that the heavy glass water bottle was gone when the police let me straighten up the cabin. But well, I didn't think nothing of it at the time, so, so that maybe it got smashed in all the confusion. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much indeed. And you asked me to come back to 
England with you, Dr. Watson? Yeah, I do indeed, Mademoiselle Dufour. To go into court and tell everything? I know nothing about your English law. Perhaps I render myself liable to prosecution. All this for the sake of a man who I have never seen. Not only for his sake, Mademoiselle, but also for the sake of the woman who loves him. And, most important of all, for the sake of right and justice. To save a man from hanging for a crime that he did not commit. There's no way in which I can force you to come with me. I can only most earnestly beg you to do what we both know is the right thing. And in the final analysis, members of the jury, I must remind you that the decision as to Charles Rossiter's guilt or innocence rests solely with you. Under the law, my province as judge is merely to assist you in reaching a just verdict. And this I have endeavored to do by summing up for you the evidence to which we have been listening during these last three days. The prosecution has endeavored to prove to you that this man, who has not denied his love for Mrs. Fairmont, knew that they could never be together so long as her husband should live. You have heard the evidence of their quarrel on the boat, of the shooting and of the scene found by Mr. Schmidt, the steward, and the other witnesses when the door to the cabin was broken down. You have heard the suggestion of premeditation in the purchase of the weapon by Mrs. Fairmont, a weapon which, though missing, was of identical caliber with the bullet which killed her husband. You have heard the prisoner's protestations of innocence and his own inability to offer any logical explanation of the tragedy. Under these circumstances, is it... Millard, I beg leave to interrupt. Well, Sir Aubrey, what is it you want to say? During the entire trial, Millard, my client and I have put our hopes in an investigation being conducted by the eminent criminologist, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Mr. Holmes has just arrived in court, together with his colleague, Dr. Watson, who has brought with him from Paris a witness whose evidence is vital to the defense. I respectfully beg your lordship's permission and that of the prosecution to allow Mr. Holmes to tell us what he has discovered. Uh, <coughs> it is most irregular, Sir Aubrey, but the primary concern of this court is that justice be done. In view of Mr. Sherlock Holmes' distinguished record and many services to the law, I see no objection to granting your request. Thank you, my lord. I assure you that we would not have waited till so late in this trial to present our evidence had it not been for the fact that Dr. Watson has only at this moment arrived from Paris, escorting a lady who is the final link in that chain of evidence. Proceed, Mr. Holmes. The late Augustus Fairmont, married to a woman more than 20 years his junior, was a man with a very great sense of possession. Whether or not he loved his wife, he was determined that no one else should have her. And when his wife freely and honestly confronted him with her admission that she loved another man, Fairmont could think of nothing but revenge. Hmm. I'm willing to allow you a fair amount of latitude, Mr. Holmes, but this seems to have no bearing on the case. With your lordship's permission, I hope to establish its bearing in just a moment. I have here in court Dr. McPherson, who conducted the post-mortem upon the late Mr. Fairmont. Dr. McPherson will testify that Augustus Fairmont was suffering from an incurable disease which would unquestionably have killed him within another year. <laughs> Violence! Violence in the court! Also in court and ready to testify is Sir Edward Penrose of Harley Street, to whom Augustus Fairmont went for an opinion just a little more than six weeks ago. Sir Edward informed Fairmont, who had never before suspected the presence of this disease, that he would be lucky if he lived for six months, and that there was nothing to be done. Now, Fairmont faced with the knowledge that he would die, probably painfully and lingeringly, within a few months at most. And the bitterness of this knowledge must have been increased a hundredfold by the realization that his death would remove the last barrier to the wedding of these two people who loved each other. Bravo, Holmes. Quiet in the court. Oh, sir. Then Augustus Fairmont evolved in his twisted mind a perfect plot. He would die, not lingeringly and painfully, but instantly. And in dying, he would make sure that Charles Rossiter, the man he hated, would be hanged for his murder. <laughs> With his partner, Rossiter, with his partner, Rossiter, Fairmont sailed to Amsterdam. 
But when he had purchased some 10,000 pounds worth of diamonds, the thought crossed his mind of making a final provision for the woman whom, for many years, he'd been seeing in France. She's here now, due to Dr. Watson. And I will ask her to rise. <laughs> Mademoiselle Dufour, is it not true that Mr. Fairmont provided for you during the last six or seven years, and that he visited you frequently during his trips to the continent? That is correct, Mr. Holmes. Now... Will you please tell the court what you received in the mail from Mr. Fairmont the day after you read of his death? I received a package containing a small fortune in unset diamonds, together with a letter from August, saying that I would not hear from him again, that I should make no inquiries concerning him, and that these diamonds would provide me with sufficient funds for the rest of my life. Thank you very much, Mademoiselle Dufour. Wyatt! Wyatt in the courtroom! I think that will be all. Oh, magnificent, my dear. I'm so very, very proud of you. Well Justice done. Fairmont very well done. provided for the woman with whom he had so long a friendship. <laughs> he did this with a knowledge that he was to die that very night. On board the boat, he purposely entered into a noisy argument with young Rossiter, an argument which ended with a steward knocking on the door. A moment later, Rossiter returned to his own cabin and shut the communicating door. <coughs> the instant he had done so, Fairmont took from its place of concealment the revolver which, with studied malice, he had caused his wife to buy. This revolver Fairmont had previously prepared for what he was about to do by tying a stout string from its trigger guard to the heavy glass water bottle he had taken from his cabin wall. It was the work of but a moment, after Rossiter had closed the door, to suspend the heavy bottle outside the porthole which gave directly upon the sea. Then Fairmont raised the revolver to his head and pulled the trigger... As he fell dead, the revolver released from his hand was pulled sharply up and out of the porthole by the heavy weight of the bottle. It hit the edge of the porthole, nicking the brass rim, and then disappeared forever into the depths of the North Sea. Unless this demonstration is stopped instantly, I shall have the courtroom cleared. My lad, in view of the evidence offered by Mr. Sherlock Holmes... The Crown withdraws its charge against Charles Rossiter. Oh, 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 great work, Holmes. Great work. You brought it off, old man. I never could have, Watson, if you hadn't been persuasive enough to get Mademoiselle Dufour here oh, in time. you to say so, boy. Ah, look, look. Here comes Mrs. Fairmont. Oh, God bless you, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I, I've got to kiss you both. Oh, very nice. Upon my word. That's the nicest fee we've ever had. <laughs> now, friends, our guest star, one of the greatest authorities on feminine beauty, that king of glamour, John Robert Powers. And you know, Mr. Powers is famous for his million-dollar Powers models. Gorgeous girls you often see on magazine covers, in the movies, in exclusive fashion shows. Ladies and gentlemen, by special transcription, Mr. John Robert Powers. Good evening, friends. I have a little surprise for you this evening, as I brought along one of my most attractive Powers girls of all times, Ellen Allardyce. And perhaps we can get Ellen to tell us how she keeps her hair so bright and shining. Will you, Ellen? I owe all that to you, Mr. Powers. Do you remember how you told me to always wash my hair with cremel shampoo? I certainly do, Ellen. I tell all my Powers girls to use cremel shampoo. I'm fairly convinced that no other shampoo leaves the hair more radiant with such natural, brilliant luster. And cremel shampoo keeps it that way for days. What I like about cremel shampoo is that it never dries the hair. That's right, Ellen, because cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base. This oil base actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry and brittle. I know it. Cremel shampoo always leaves the hair so much silkier with a lovely natural satin sheen. And I love the way cremel shampoo whips up just lots and lots of luxuriant active foam, even in the hardest water. Ellen, I think every girl owes it to herself to try cremel shampoo. I feel certain she'll be in for one of the greatest beauty thrills of her life. Because without a doubt, in all my years spent in helping women become more attractive, I've never come across a more beautifying shampoo than cremel shampoo. Many, many thanks to you, Mr. Powers, and to your very lovely Powers model, Miss Ellen Allardyce. 
Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week... Yes, next week, in answer to many requests, I think I shall tell you about the most gruesome and most horrifying experience that Holmes and I ever had. It concerns the frightening happenings at Stoke Moran, the home of Dr. Grimesby Roylet, and tells how Holmes solved the mystery of the death of one of Dr. Roylet's two daughters and prevented the murder of the other. I call it The Adventure of the Speckled Band. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Problem of Thor Bridge. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. Inviting you to be with us next week at the same time. And Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Speckled Band. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and dean of storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I see you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, Dr. Watson. You've been refreshing your memory on tonight's new Sherlock yes, Holmes adventure? Yes, boy, and while I was going over my notes on the case, I, I came across this. It played a prominent part in the story that I'm going to tell you. Hmm, the platinum cross. Is that some kind of medal, Dr. Watson? It is, Mr. Bell, it is. It's the cross of St. Hilarius, one of the highest decorations of the small European kingdom of Grosnia. Presented to Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bell, though... Before he was awarded it, the two of us went through one of the strangest and in some ways the most embarrassing experiences of our entire career. I call the story The Adventure of the Innocent Murderess. Sounds exciting. We'll be ready for it in just a moment, Dr. Watson. Men, in summer when you go without your hat, does your hair get dry, wild, and unruly looking? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy? Then remember, Kremel Hair Tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day, as if your barber had just combed it. You see, Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oils to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. It never leaves any unpleasant odor. Kremel always looks and feels clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. A recent survey showed Kremel hair tonic was preferred among America's most prosperous and successful men, among top-flight executives who know the importance of handsomely groomed hair. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story that you call The Adventure of the Innocent Murderer? Well, Mr. Bell, that strange affair began on a spring afternoon at the turn of the century. It was a beautiful day, and for some hours, Holmes and I had rambled about in the park, in silence for the most part, as befits two men who know each other intimately. But shortly after five, when we returned to Baker Street, and I remember that as we opened the front door, Mrs. Hudson spoke to us. Excuse me, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? 
There's been a gentleman here asking for you, sir. So much for our afternoon walks, Watson. Well, is he gone, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. Didn't you ask him in? I uh, did that, sir. He waited half an hour. A very restless kind of man he was, walking and stamping all the time he was here. Uh, and finally, he ups and out. And all I could say wouldn't hold him back, Mr. Holmes. Well, you did your best, Mrs. Hudson. But did he leave his name? Oh, no, doctor. But he was a foreigner. I swear I've never seen him here before. He'll be back, I'm sure. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Aye, sir. Were you expecting a clown, Holmes? Had I done so, chap, I would not have spent the past few hours wandering about with you in Regent's Park. Oh, I wonder who he is. He left us one clue to his identity. I don't see any clue. This pipe on the table is not one of yours. Hmm. A nice old briar with a good long stem. Well, can you deduce anything from that? Very little, except for the obvious fact that its owner is left-handed, is a muscular man with an excellent set of teeth, uh, careless in his habits, and... Uh, with no need to practice economy. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. That's a little far-fetched. On the contrary. But I think that's our client now. Meet him on the stairs, will you, Watson? Yes, yes, indeed. Now we'll have something more interesting than his pipe to study. Uh, this way, sir. So I thank you, Mrs. Hudson. That's all right, sir. You are Sherlock Holmes. No, my name is Watson. Dr. Watson. Oh, then you must be Mr. Holmes. Since there are only three of us in the room, that would seem an eminently logical conclusion. Please, do not make fun of me. I am bewildered foreigner in your country. Oh, my friend is only joking, sir. Do sit down, won't you, Mr... Mr... My name is Priscop. Igor Priscop. And I do not Prisco. wish to sit down. It pleases me to walk as I talk. It soothes me. And I am in great need of soothment. Mr. Priscop, I shall be delighted to give you any assistance I can. I'm only sorry that I was out when you were uh, called earlier. I myself was desolated. But I will waste no further time in desolation. Mr. Holmes, you have in the past performed great service to my country. And what is your country, sir, may I ask? The kingdom of Grotznia, my friend. Small in area, but great in tradition. Mr. Holmes, as Igor Priscop says, you have helped us in the past. In uh, a modest way, Mr. Priscop. Though your government was generous enough to award me the uh, Medal of St. Stephen. First class, a high honor. You were also presented with the Medal of St. Arcadu, second class, as well as that of St. Michael and the seven subsidiary angels. Oh, yes, yes, I got one of those. Ah, that one, I regret to say, is of slight importance. Mm -hmm. But now, Mr. Holmes, I come to you as an emissary of Grotznia and ask you for your greatest service. Hmm. As I recall, Mr. Perskop, my greatest services to Grosnia were under the regime of the People's Party. The party to which I belong. And if our newspapers are accurate, that is the party which is now out of favor. I do seem to remember reading something about that in the Times the other day. I am happy to see that you are both so well informed. Let me now explain this situation to you further, my friend. There is now an international committee of powers meeting at the Hague. They are trying to decide if the royalists rightfully control Grotznia, or... Or if your party does. That is right, Mr. Holmes. In the meanwhile, the Grotznian embassy here in London is dominated by the royalists. Unfortunate for you, I'm sure, but uh, what do you expect my friend to do? He's hardly a politician, you know. I have come to London to make contact with our exiles here. The embassy must not know. No one must know that Igor Priscop is in London. Mr. Holmes. My very life is in danger. For the sake of my beloved Grotznia, I want you to let me stay here in Baker Street, in secret. That uh, is an unusual request, Mr. Yes, and a completely impractical one, sir. There's very little room here. Little I, room. I, I must insist. You, you, Mr. Holmes, hold the order of St. Stephen first class. You're a friend of my people. Now, now, you, you must help me. You must. Good Lord, he's fainted. Very emotional, these foreigners. No, Watson, no. Look at that stain on his shirt. He's been wounded. Obviously, at least one of his enemies knows that he's in London. That's why he came to us. Well, it's only a fresh wound in the shoulder. I'll bandage it up. I see. I have some smelling salts here. That'll bring him round. There we are. Uh, ha hand me that, that glass, will you? He's well, coming to of his own accord. Uh... Oh. Here you are, Mr. Priscop. Drink this. Oh, no. No medicine. I do not believe in them. Never mind about that. You try this. Oh, thanks. No. 
Forgive my display of weakness. Why didn't you tell me that you'd already been attacked, Mr. Priscop? Oh, it is but a scratch. A clumsy attempt from the darkness as I returned here. I did not wish to alarm you over nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Somebody attempts to murder you, you call it nothing. I repeat my request, Mr. Holmes. Will you let me stay here a while? Very well, Mr. Priscop. Since your life is in obvious danger, you may stay here in Baker Street. Da propaspo, Mr. Holmes. I thank you. And let the Tsinaku Orchestra play for the Embassy Ball in Belgrave Square. Here in Baker Street is the true Embassy of Grozny. Gracious me. There are two nice brown eggs facing you, Watson. Why glower at them? Why not get on with your breakfast? Oh, I've got no appetite, Holmes. The whole routine of my life has been turned topsy-turvy since you let that fellow Priscop stay here. It's a pity that this modest flutter of excitement should upset your lives to such an extent. However, it may interest you to know that my brother Mycroft regards our action in sheltering Priscop as a very important one for England. Oh, has Mycroft been here this morning? Yes, before you were up. As you know, Mycroft is the unofficial oracle of our foreign office. He feels that the Groznian royalists are so closely allied to the court of Prussia as to constitute a menace to our country. Good gracious me. However, he also feels that the Committee of Powers at The Hague will rule in favor of the People's Party. If that does happen, the fact that we have helped Priscop will place the Foreign Office in a very favorable position with the new government. I see. Well, that makes it rather different. I, I think I will tackle those eggs after all. Uh, where is Mr. Priscop now? In the next room, conferring with a politi political friend of his by the name of Carlo Tarfush. Well, I must say they do have extraordinary names. Carlo Tarfush. <laughs> Sounds like a double barrel sneeze. Ah, Mr. Tarfush. Allow me to introduce my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Uh, Watson, how do you do? How do, you do? Uh, and uh, how did you find your compatriot? Oh, in splendid spirits and in splendid hands, Mr. Holmes. On behalf of Grosnia, I thank you both for giving him sanctuary. Oh, nothing at all, sir. Nothing at all. Very happy to have been of any assistance. Right. Come in. And I must be leaving, gentlemen. Good day to you. And again, my most sincere thanks. Oh, pardon. It's got a parcel, gents. It's for a Mr. Prispop or something like that. Oh, here you are, young fellow. I'll take it. No, I want to give it to Mr. Holmes. Lummy. Just wait until I tell me old mum I've talked to the great Sherlock Holmes. She won't half be proud. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. And here's a shilling for your trouble, my boy. Coo Bob. Thank you, Governor. Be careful, Holmes. That package is addressed to Priscop. It might be a time bomb, you know. It's sent from the Weintraub Importing Company. We'll see if Mr. Priscop ordered any delivery from there. Ah, there you are, Mr. Priscop. This uh, package just came for you. Were you expecting it? Oh, yes. The propaspo, Mr. Holmes. It is from the Weintraub Company. It must be my vinku. You what? Vinku. Vinku, the wine of my country. Where would Grotznia be without Vinku? He distilled the essence and life of whortleberries. No English drink can compare with it. Uh, perhaps you will join me in glass? I think not, thank you. It's a little early in the day. Well, I quite agree with you, Holmes. Then I shall retire to my room alone and sample this Grotznia nectar. I shall see you later, gentlemen. How can he keep a clear head if he starts drinking at this time of the day? I doubt if the essence of whortleberries is too potent. At least uh, to a Grosnian. Well, it's got it someone else at the door. We have all the privacy of Paddington Station. Uh, come in. Ah, so. Good morning, young lady. W what can where I... Where is he? Tell me where he is. First, tell me who you are, please. I am lovely. Lovely Michelso. Where is Priscop? Lead me to him. Mr. Priscop is under my protection. Before you see him, I insist on knowing your business, madam. You are hiding him. But I will find him if I have to search the closet in his house. This door leads to another room. Perhaps he's in there. Come back. Grab a Watson. Your mistress. Priscop, you traitor. You will be traitor. She's insane. She's insane. There. Justice is done. Do with me what you will. Quick, Watson. How's Priscop? He's dead, Holmes. Shot through the chest, another through the arm. The third shot broke the bottle of wine. Justice has been done. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Tarfush? You must save Lavery. She's my fiancée. 
She had good reason to think Prisca Petrit. But she shot him down in cold blood, sir. She did it for Grazmia. She committed murder practically under our very eyes. She must pay for it. And Dr. Watson and I will have the greatest pleasure in testifying against her. Until her trial takes place, I have nothing further to say. particularly engrossed at the times this morning, Holmes? I'm reading the report of the trial of Lavery McKelso. Well, I can't see why it's dragging on for so long. We gave our evidence two days ago. The case is perfectly clear. She shot Igoro Priscov or whatever it was before our eyes. She's a murderess. They should hang her. Yes, Sir Francis Jackson, her counsel for the defense, apparently does not share your, your opinion. He's an extremely clever man. After cross-examining the police surgeon yesterday, he... Ask for an adjournment until noon today. On what grounds? He wishes a fresh post-mortem made. The police surgeon had not examined the contents of the stomach of the dead man. Why, well, no, should he, Holmes? Priscoff was shot to death. We saw it happen. What's Sir Francis up to? I think I'm beginning to suspect, Watson. And I pray for the sake of my own reputation that I'm wrong. However, it's no use sitting here in Baker Street surmising. Let's go over to the Old Bailey and hear what the post-mortem report discloses. Gentlemen of the jury, I will read to you the final paragraph of the Home Analyst Report. <coughs> Sufficient cyanide was found in the stomach of the deceased to have killed three men. <laughs> As you know, cyanide is an almost instantaneous poison. Between this report and the medical evidence you have already heard, there can be no doubt that the deceased Igor Priskov was already dead when the defendant fired the bullet into his body. I therefore instruct you to acquit the defendant. <laughs> Good heavens, Holmes. You realize this whole case made us look ridiculous? I am well aware of the fact. It's a stigma on our professional reputations. And a stigma that must be removed. Oh, look out here. Here comes Carlo Tafush, fiancé of the girl who's just been acqu acquitted. Well, Mr. Tafush, I imagine you're very happy. Oh, of course I am, Mr. Holmes. And I'm marrying Lavry today, as soon as the police release her. Indeed? Yes. And uh, in the meanwhile, I have a commission for you. Find the real murderer of Igoro Priskov. Find him, Mr. Holmes, or you will become the laughing stock of all Europe. In just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes does find the real murderer of Igoro Priskov. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kreml hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kreml gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, most humid summer day. It never looks or feels greasy or sticky. In addition, Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, cool, alive, and tingling. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. So buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic, a nationwide favorite among America's most successful men. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes are in a bad spot. A man poisoned and then shot under your very eyes. Yes, Mr. Bell, but I can assure you that Holmes, as soon as you return to Baker Street from the trial, plunged into a fine frenzy of activity. He was examining the top of the table under his microscope 
traces of poison where the bottle of wine had been shattered. You've been hunched over that microscope for hours, Holmes. No results yet? Not as yet. Well, I was just reading the Evening Gazette. There's an interesting article on the Grosvenor situation. No, well, what does it say? The committee in The Hague has ruled for the People's Party. And our friend Carlo Tarfush, the one who married the girl Lovely, is to be the new ambassador here in London. Indeed, how very interesting. It goes on to say here that they've established that the dead man, Igoro Priskov, never was a traitor. The poor girl was deceived by false evidence. The villain who deceived her has fled to Germany. I was right. This stain, beyond question, is that of wine mixed with cyanide. Now to track the history of that bottle. We know that nobody tampered with it after it went from the messenger boy's hands to Priscop's. Therefore... But how are we going to find that boy again? This is a job for my band of street urchins. The Baker Street of regulars. Round them up, Watson. Tell them I'll give a golden sovereign to the boy that brings him to me first. <laughs> Of course, I remember delivering that parcel to you, Mr. Holmes. Did anyone accost you on your way over here to deliver it, Charlie? Yes, Mr. Holmes, they did. Oh, a young lady, was it? Yes, it was. How did you know, sir? Describe what happened, Charlie. Well, Mr. Holmes, she spoke to me on the street. Nice and friendly she was. And then she took me in a tea shop and gave me a raspberry tart and a nice big cup of tea. Where did you put the parcel? On the chair beside me. Oh, it's easy to see what happened, Holmes. She switched the, the parcels. Quite. Charlie, was the young lady a foreigner? Yes, Mr. Holmes. She didn't half talk funny like. Look at this photograph. Was that the young lady who you're talking about? That's her, all right, Mr. Holmes. Blimey, you know everything, don't you, sir? Not quite, Charlie. Here. Here's five shillings for your trouble. And I'll be off with you. Coo, five bob. Thank you, Governor. So the girl was guilty all the time. But I... I don't see her motive. I do. And we're going at once to the Grosnian Embassy. Remember, she's now the ambassador's lady. I intend to let her know that I do understand. Mr. Holmes. Your conversation is very interesting. But surely I do not have to point to an intelligent man like yourself that I've been tried and acquitted of murder. Under your delightful Anglo-Saxon law, double jeopardy, I cannot possibly be tried again. Oh, just the same. You're a murderess. Am I? You were no passionate patriot. You never believed in that forged evidence. You simply killed Igor Priscop because with him out of the way... You knew that your future husband would become the ambassador. In my country, we have a proverb. Inshko na vili greshko lumagen. What does that mean? Ammunition is more persuasive than strategy. Mr. Holmes, you have no ammunition. There is nothing you can do to me. And so, I wish you both good night. <laughs> must be some way of catching her, Watson. There must. Well, you've been outwitted before, Holmes. People forget it. They don't like to remember your triumphs. To blazes with the people. I must account for this to myself. Hand me that evening paper, will you, Watson? Uh, there you are. Where was that article on Grosnier that you read to me earlier? The second page, I think. Ah, here it is. But I have ammunition, Watson. The lady was wrong. What on earth are you burbling about, Holmes? We must draft a telegram to Mr. Tarfush, the new Grosnian ambassador. We'll ask him to hold a party of all the most important Grosnian attaches. There, my dear Watson, amid the bright lights and gay music, I shall have the utmost pleasure in proving to the ambassador's wife that she's far from invulnerable. <laughs> Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Ambassador? The attaches are waiting in the library. 
You said that you would expose poor Prescott's murderer. Now, why should we wait any longer? I shall be most happy to explain it now. Come on, Watson. Right, you are home. Your wife is in the library, too, Mr. Tartle? Yes, Mr. Holmes, and she is as curious as I am. And here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, at my request, Mr. Sherlock Holmes has been trying to find the murderer of poor Igoro Priscott. He tells me that he is now ready to make his report. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, I realize that my revelation will be something of a shock to you all. I have proof beyond doubt that the person who murdered Igor Priscott by poison is the same person who fired those shots into his already dead body. Your own wife, Mr. Ambassador. But that is ridiculous, Holmes. We know that she misguidedly shot at Priscott after he was dead. But she did not poison him. I can prove that she did. I have the boy outside, Mrs. Tarfush, that you took into the tea shop when you changed the bottles of wine. I have the evidence of the stains on the table that show traces of the poisoned wine. Do you wish me to prove my case? Lavery? Why do not answer him? I do not wish to, Carlo. And I do not have to. Under English law, I cannot be tried again. But, Lavery, you stand accused before your fellow countrymen. Perhaps I can clear up a slight misapprehension. It is true, is it not, Mr. Tarfush, that Grosnian law does not recognize the doctrine of double jeopardy, and therefore a Grosnian could be tried twice for the same crime? Of course. It is also true, isn't it, that the Committee of Powers and The Hague has recognized that the People's Party has been all along the true government of Grosnia? That also is true, Mr. Holmes. And an embassy is extraterritorial. Acts committed there are punished by the laws of the nation whose embassy it is. You are correct, Mr. Holmes. This embassy here is Grosnian ground. So was 221B Baker Street when Mr. Priscop was murdered. Therefore, your wife committed her crime in Grosnia. She may still be arrested, tried, convicted, and executed by Grosnian law. Mr. Ambassador, I demand that your embassy guards arrest this murderess. <laughs> Anything interesting in this morning's post, Holmes? Yes, Watson. And um, when you come to write your story of the uh, Rosnian murderers, these three missives will provide colorful footnotes. Oh, what are they? The uh, first is a note from Carlo Tapush. He is resigning the embassy and entering a monastery. He says, um, I served his country but destroyed his life. Well, I'm afraid he loved that dreadful woman. What else did you get? The second is a package from the Grosnian government. Good Lord, uh, look. What is it? Oh, good Lord, it's a platinum cross. The Order of St. Hilarius. What's the funny-looking thing hanging from it? It looks like some strange animal. Half horse and half something else. Uh, that, my dear chap, is known as a hippogriff. A fabled beast with the head and claws of a griffin and the hoofs and tail of a horse. The Order of St. Hilarius is a high order, but... St. Hilarius, with Hippogriff, is higher still. I'm uh, very flattered. What was your third communication? A letter from my brother, Mycroft. He says, uh, thanks to your work, Grosnia has signed a British oil concession. The Empire is grateful. That's very nice, Holmes. Yes, Watson, yes, very nice. But uh, just grateful? I mean to say, not even grateful with Hippogriff? Those famous million-dollar powers models you see on magazine covers always have to keep their hair shining bright with gleaming highlights. Now, here's how they do it. We glamour bathe our hair with Cremel shampoo. And I want to state right here and now that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls, you'll be amazed how Cremel shampoo reveals all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a harsh soap, not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. After a Cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. 
And Cremel shampoo is one shampoo you can buy which never dries or breaks the hair. In fact, it even has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with a lovely satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me think. Next week. Next week for our final broadcast of the season, I think I'll tell you about one of the most gruesome adventures that we ever encountered. It took place in the famous torture chamber, now a museum, in the castle of Nuremberg in Germany. I call it The Adventure of the Iron Maiden. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Iron Maiden. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now let's drop in on Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Here you are. Come and sit down. Thank you. I trust that you'll join me in a glass of port? I think I'd better. If only to fortify myself against the horrors of the story you promised us for this evening. The adventure of the Iron Maiden, you called it. Well, yes, Mr. Bell. For your last visit of the season, I promised you one of our most macabre adventures. And as soon as you've had a word with our listeners... I'll tell you about the Iron Maiden, or she was known in Nuremberg, the Eisner Jungfrau. Men, on hot summer days, does your hair get out of hand and look dry, wild, and unruly? After a swim, does it feel sticky and stringy, so matted and tangled? Then remember, Kreml hair tonic keeps dry, wild, sun-baked hair looking perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. As if your barber had just combed it. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair neatly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kreml never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Kreml always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. It leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. So make Kreml a daily must this summer for that handsome, clean-cut look from morning till night. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm sure we're all as anxious as I am to hear the strange story of the Iron Maiden. Well, it was just before the turn of the century, and Holmes and I had brought to a successful completion a most delicate mission for the reigning family of Saxon. We were spending a day of relaxation in the picturesque old German town of Nuremberg, preparatory to a leisurely trip on the Rhine, and then back to England. As we were getting up from breakfast in our rooms in the hotel, Holmes said, 
Wonderful weather, Watson. And I see you're admiring the excellent view of this quaint old town from our window. View? I suppose the view's all right. You don't sound very enthusiastic. I'm not. You know what the trouble with Germany is, Holmes? No. What? It's full of Germans. Hmm. Huh? Must be the waiter. Come in, come in, come in. Yes, I the honor of addressing Mr. Sherlock Holmes of London, England. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir. My name is Watson. Dr. Watson. Ah, yeah, Mr. Holmes, so celebrated colleague. Oh, very good of you. <laughs> uh, permit me that I introduce myself, gentlemen. My name is Ferdinand Langer. Yes, Mr. Langer? Uh, my friend, the chief porter of this hotel, told me of your arrival. And I have come to, to beg of you if... Perhaps you can help me with my so difficult problem. If it is a matter for the police, Mr. Langer, I fear that I shall be unable to assist you. I have no uh, official standing here. And besides, Dr. Watson and I will be leaving tomorrow. Ah, oh, the police. To the police I have been, Mr. Holmes. At me they laugh. I, I am, uh, how do you say, uh, chief keeper of the fifth Egger term. Uh, what? The five-cornered tower of the oh. castle of Nuremberg. Oh, oh, you have heard oh. of it? Of course. And of its famous torture museum. The uh, torture museum? That sounds distinctly unpleasant. For 35 years now I've worked in the tower. In the last 18 years I am chief keeper. All this time there is never a complaint about me. But now, these last few weeks, the letters have started to come. Each one with more awful threatenings. Threats, Mr. Langer? Threats of what? They're too old I am getting. That I should resign my position. That if I do not... Something terrible will happen. Here, here is the latest for yourself. You shall see, Mr. Holmes. Ah, oh, yes. Hmm. If my knowledge of German serves me, vague threats, nothing specific, quite a typical letter. Uh, from the irregularity of the handwriting, Mr. Langer, the slanting lines and certain other definite characteristics, I'd say that the writer of this letter is definitely unbalanced. Ah, sure. You, you mean mad, Holmes? Uh, perhaps not outwardly so but most definitely abnormal. And from the fact that these threats are evidently designed to make you resign your position, Mr. Langer, I deduce that the author of them must be connected in some way with the affairs of the tower. Have you any suspicions? Uh, this I do not like to say, Mr. Holmes. But there is a young man, my assistant, Heinrich Schiller, who but waits to step into my shoes. He even presumes to pay court to my daughter, Elsa. Oh, well, 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 we're, we're only young once, Mr. Langer. Oh, my daughter, I have better things in mind than this insolent young man. Oh, really? So, you too, Mr. Holmes, think Heinrich wrote these letters? You think I should have him arrested or dismissed? I think you'll require more evidence than a mere guess, Dr. Langer. But how shall I get it? Well, perhaps we might combine business with pleasure. What do you say, Watson? Suppose we have Mr. Langer show us through Nuremberg's most famous site, the Five-Cornered Tower. Here we are, gentlemen. If you will just follow me through this gate here. This way, gentlemen. Uh, just a moment, my man. Are you in charge here? Yes, madam. Then why are these people being admitted to the tower while my friend Miss Simpson and I are kept standing about and demarred barred from entrance? Oh, do please be careful, Amelia. It isn't as though we were home. Nonsense. I insist upon knowing. I am sorry, madam, but the tower is not open for visitors until 11 each morning. As you will find if your Baedeker you will consult. And it is now but ten o'clock. Then why are these two men being admitted? Uh, because... No they... excuses. I'm English, my man. And in England, we believe in fair play. No favoritism. I'm sure, Mr. Lungo, that you have no objections to showing these two charming ladies through the tower with us. Oh, of course, Mr. Holmes, if you say... So. I do indeed. Thank you very much, sir. Just what I should expect from a fellow Britisher. A pleasure, after you, ladies. Lead the way, Mr. Langer. Uh, 
At this point, in the very center of the castle, we are. Cut from out of the solid rock built by the prisoners from 1253 till 60 years later. 1253? Victoria, be a note of that. What in heaven's name is that black pit yawning in the center over the... The Tiefer Brunnen, the deep well. Lean over and listen while I drop a stone. must be almost possible. About um, 340 feet, I'd say. You have been here before, Mr. Holmes? No, I merely counted the interval from the time you dropped the stone until the splash. Oh, Amelia, down that corridor, look. That gigantic shadow. It's getting nearer. No, 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 no. Control yourself, madam. It's merely somebody approaching with a torch. Ah, good morning, Herr Langer. I did not know you were showing a party so, so early. That is Heinrich, Mr. Holmes. Follow with us, Heinrich. Yes, sir. Here are the dungeon cells, where we kept the prisoners. It's most insanitary, I call it. Nothing but damp stone. Barbaric. Just what I should expect of foreigners. And here... The torture chamber. What are all those strange objects? Oh, at least there's a couch for the poor prisoners. Uh, hardly that, I fear. That uh, wheel-like object at the head of it proclaims its true purpose. Yeah, Mr. Holmes. This was the rack. On it they would tie the victim, and with the wheel they would stretch and stretch and stretch his limbs until his bones cracked. Oh, how awful. Come, come, Victoria. No weakness. Oh, pleasant idea, I must say. What's that iron collar thing up, up there? Oh, that, Doctor, fits into that larger iron frame which over there you may see. Around the neck of a prisoner, it was snapped and locked, so that the unfortunate man neither sit nor lie down nor sleep could. Regular chamber of horrors. Well, there is the boot, the iron frame in which a prisoner's leg was slowly crushed, and the brazier for melting lead and heating tongs and pincers. They are all here. And uh, that large iron affair beneath the embrasure, that, Mr. Langer... I assume to be the famous Iron Maiden. The Iron Maiden? It looks just like a statue. Well, I can't say that I consider it a very beautiful one. It is a statue, madam, but a hollow one. <laughs> and for good reason. I, I think I'd rather not hear about it. Victoria, keep a stiff upper lip. The two halves of the statue swing open, and within are many iron spikes, as in the moment you will see. Into it was placed the victim, and slowly, slowly the door upon him was closed. The maiden's kiss, the executioners called it. Imaginative bunch of fellows they must have been. A most graphic description, Mr. Langer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, perhaps one of the ladies would like to open the statue and see with it. Oh, no, not I. Nonsense, Victoria. The ghosts of prisoners who have been dead for 500 years can't hurt you. Uh, here, uh, Mr. Guide, I'll open it. Good. You lift this bar here, so, and then pull open with this handle. Uh, it, it works rather stiffly. There, now it's opening. Ah! Good heavens! Oh, oh! The body of a woman. No, no don't I touch her. Mr. Don't, Holmes, the letters. Something it's horrible it's they spoke of. Quiet. Now it has happened. Yes. It's unbelievable. Control yourself, Victoria. Schiller, take these two ladies out into the air. Yes, sir. Now, yes. chin up, my dear. Chin up. Lean on me if you like, but chin up. Oh, I must say, Holmes, that's about a, as nasty a sight as I've ever seen. Quite so, Watson. Mr. Langer. Do you recognize this woman? <laughs> Never saw her before. What time yesterday did the last visitors go through? The museum is closed from six o'clock on, Mr. Holmes. Then the body of this unfortunate young woman must have been placed here between that time last night and the present moment. Yeah, but how I cannot understand. Now, at last, to me, the police will have to listen. Undoubtedly. And you'd best send for them at once. Dr. Watson and I will be leaving Nuremberg tomorrow morning. And the authorities will no doubt wish to take our statements. Immediately, I shall send for them. We shall wait here for their arrival. Oh, this scandal. It will wreck the museum. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you have seen Heinrich. Tell me, could he so terrible a thing have done? That, Mr. Langer, is a question we'd best leave to the police. I fetched them at once. 
a curious problem, Watson. The solution is, of course, obvious. Solution? Uh, this murder, you mean? Murder? There's been no murder, Watson. What the devil do you mean, Holmes? With the corpse literally staring us in the face from inside that revolting iron statue. If you will examine the corpse for a moment, my dear Watson, you'll notice that it exhibits no signs whatsoever of rigor. By Jove, you're, you're right. But what on earth does it mean? Simply that this poor woman was dead long before her body was put into the Iron Maiden. I've no doubt that the police will quickly be able to establish that a corpse is missing from the morgue or one of the local hospitals. But Holmes, what can be the purpose of so fiendish and so horrible a plot? I hardly expect you to tell me it's merely a practical joke. Far from it. Madness lay at the bottom of those letters that Lunger showed us. And madness placed this body within the statue. But the difficulty, Watson, will be to reveal the madman behind these acts. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the mystery of the Iron Maiden. Men, on hot, sticky summer days, your hair needs extra special care. And when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kremel hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. Kremel gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. It keeps the hair perfectly groomed throughout the hottest, stickiest day. It never looks a field greasy or sticky. In addition, Kremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kremel is preferred among America's most prosperous men. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily. For better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what did Sherlock Holmes do to uncover the madman behind the strange deed in the five-cornered tower of Nuremberg? Well, by the time that the police had finished with us, it was late in the afternoon. Considerably shaken by the events of the day, we returned to our hotel where the two ladies who had spent so grim a morning with us were also stopping. After a tub and a whiskey and soda, I don't know which was more welcome, I came back into our room to find Holmes in conversation with young Heinrich Schiller. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes, I will. I know that the police suspect me of these letters, and how can I prove that I did not write them? Elsa's father shows clearly that he thinks it is I behind all this horror. If you will carry out my instructions, Mr. Schiller... I think we may succeed in clearing up this matter this evening. Heaven bless you, Mr. Holmes. If only you can remove the shadow that hangs over Elsa and myself. Mm, yes. And uh, now goodbye. Until later. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. Hmm. That young fellow looks as though he was at his wit's end. If the police, the father of the girl you loved, and even the girl herself suspected you of being an anonymous letter writer with a latent streak of insanity... I'd uh, greatly doubt that even you could maintain your usual poise. Possibly. But I wouldn't write anonymous letters or put corpses in iron maidens. I trust not. Well, I'm ready to do, to do good justice to a great dinner and then a good night's sleep before we start our trip down the Rhine tomorrow. I hope that the dinner will be good. But I'm sorry to tell you that your chances of a good night's sleep look extremely poor. Oh? Why? Because by ten o'clock this evening, you and I must be securely hidden in the torture room of the castle. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, Quite. And before we dine, I'd be obliged if you would unpack your service revolver and make certain that it's loaded. We may well be depending upon you before the night is out. Well, just a moment. Where are you off to? I'm going downstairs to see Miss Atterbury. I'll meet you in the dining room. That grim-faced old trout? Well, don't tell me you're going to ask her and that mousy little companion of hers to, to dine with us. Not at all, my dear fellow. I want Miss Atterbury's assistance in baiting a trap. So there, Miss Atterbury, you have a frank statement of my problem. I understand, Mr. Holmes. The difficulty, you see, is that although the man in question is uh, undoubtedly as mad as a hatter, there's no way in the world by which I can prove it. And uh, 
What I fear is that, uh, having begun with threatening letters and uh, graduated to stolen bodies, his mania may at any time break out in an even more violent form. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you don't mean murder. Don't be idiotic, Victoria. Of course, Mr. Holmes means murder. Oh! If you are willing to take the risk, Miss Atterbury, it is my belief that uh, a sudden and violent shock may serve to bring his madness into the open. But um, I'll not disguise from you the fact that although Dr. Watson and I will take every precaution, you may still be running a considerable personal risk. Don't do it, Amelia. This is no concern of yours. Think what the dear vicar would say. The vicar would probably faint. I, however, am made of sterner stuff. Mr. Holmes, I shall be glad to assist you to the best of my ability. Capital. Then I shall see you at about 11 o'clock tonight, Miss Atterbury. Although, uh... You will not see us. Hmm. It's only eleven o'clock, Holmes. I feel as though we've been here most of the night. Cold dampness of this infernal torture chamber is like a breath from a tomb. I only hope, Watson, that my estimate of our man's psychology has been accurate. I'd hate to think that I'd put Miss Atterbury into jeopardy unnecessarily. Well, she looked to me the sort of female who could take care of herself if she were charged by a mad elephant. Nothing wrong with her courage, though. There are not many women who would... so that you can shoot straight if the need arises. I have my revolver ready, Holmes. Be in readiness for anything, Watson. Once they're in this room, we shan't be able to make the slightest sound. Right you are, right you are. You are sure, Miss Atterbury, that no one knows about this visit? No. I made a point of telling nobody. Good. Only because you have shown such great interest and been so understanding... Would I through the tower show you at night when the museum is closed? It's too good of you, my dear Mr. Langner. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, but I did so want to see it by moonlight. Uh, when I get back to England, I know I shall be the envy of all my friends. It is because the proper spirit you show to the memories of the old days that I bring you here now. It is best at night. Those who once screamed aloud in this room, almost you imagine that in the moonlight you can see them <laughs> and hear them. Oh, really, Mr. Langer, you have the most remarkable ability for summoning up the ghosts of the past. When I think of what this room must have known, it makes the cold shivers run down my spine. Ah, it is because you have the imagination. That you so feel. That is but right and proper. I was so disappointed today when you were unable to complete your description of all these fascinating devices. There is no reason why now you should not them all be seen. Uh, that pair of objects hanging on the wall there, uh, they look almost like gloves hanging at the end of those iron chains. <laughs> they are gloves, but of a variety more strange. Come to the wall here. To you, I show them. See? It is most ingenious. So, the iron gloves open. And into them were the hands of the prisoner put. Uh, may, may I try them? It would all make it seem so real. But why not? Here, your hands you place inside. Uh, like this? Yeah. And then... Oh, you've closed them? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, most, most interesting, but uh, it's rather uncomfortable standing here against the wall with my hands chained over my head. So, if you don't mind... But that is only half of it. <laughs> All you have not yet seen. I pull back this lever so... Ah, and slowly, 
Slowly the stones of the floor under your feet move away. <laughs> Until you are hanging above a pit that goes down, down into the deepest depths of the castle. <laughs> and there you shall hide. Oh, shall hear you. Until ready I am to pull the lever that the chains will release. And down you will go. He's reaching for it. Quick, Watson. Ah! Good work, Watson. Just in time. Is, is everything all right, Mr. Holmes? I, I, I watched the corridor, as you told me. Quite all right, Schiller. Just reverse that infernal device and let's release Miss Atterbury. Oh, thank you so much. Are you all right, Miss Atterbury? Quite. <laughs> Although it was not an experience, I should care to repeat. I can well believe that. But there's nothing wrong with your courage, madam. <laughs> I believe I'd like a cup of tea. Well, we'd better get this fellow to the hospital, Holmes. I got him through the shoulder. Nothing fatal, but he's losing a lot of blood. Well, I will carry him, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I will take him to the hospital. Go ahead, Miss Atterbury. Oh, I'll you. hold the torch. I realize, Holmes, that the man was mad. It was a trap you set finally brought his madness out into the open, but... It uh, was the only way, Watson... A long shot, but a successful one. I can't understand what Langer was uh, attempting to gain. I imagine, Watson, that his mind had become twisted by his many years among his gruesome exhibits of the past. And his hatred of young Scheller, Schiller, both as a prospective son-in-law and as a successor to his own position, must have hatched this mad plot. Well, it all ended well due to your foresight, Holmes, and to your pluck, Miss Atterbury. Oh, very good show, I must say. <laughs> it is a pleasure. Uh, tell me, Dr. Watson, I believe that Mr. Holmes said that you and he are leaving tomorrow morning uh, for a trip down the Rhine before your return to England. Uh, you're not by any chance going aboard the steamer Earl Kearney, are you? Well, uh, yes, yes, we are. Oh, how very fortunate. <laughs> Miss Simpson and I are going on the same boat, uh, so we shall all be shipmates for a delightful week. Oh, yes, 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 D delightful. Um, are you a bachelor, Dr. Watson? A bachelor? Uh, yes, yes, I, I am. The Rhine scenery, they say, is most romantic. Yes, so I've heard. Uh, so I've heard. Uh, just a moment, Holmes. My, yes, Watson? Uh, my, my shoelace has come undone. Uh, you go on ahead, Miss Atterbury. We'll, we'll catch up with you in a minute. All right. Don't be long. I say, Holmes, you take her back to the hotel. Uh, i got something else to do. Um, I'm going to change our tickets, Watson? Huh? Uh, how do you know? I thought you might be thinking of giving up the Rhine trip and getting out of Germany by the fastest train. A brilliant deduction, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Ladies, when you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date... Just do this the night before. Give your hair a ten-minute glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the same shampoo used by those famous beauties, the Powers Models. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more... Your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. Not a harsh soap. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel Shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. It removes dandruff flakes the first time you use it. Cremel Shampoo whips up a luxuriant, active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to a vision of shining beauty, like the lovely million-dollar Powers models? K-R-E-M-L. Cremel Shampoo. Well, Dr. Watson, I'm afraid that this will be our last visit for a while. Yes, I'm afraid so, Mr. Bell, but it's been a pleasure to be with you and our listeners for so many weeks. 
And I hope you've enjoyed hearing my stories of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes as much as I have telling them. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we certainly have. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. You know, Dr. Watson, beginning one week from today, Cremel will present a new series of programs featuring Eddie Duchin to be heard Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons over the most of these ABC stations. Consult your local newspaper for the time. I'm sure that they will be very fine programs. And before saying goodbye for the summer on behalf of Tom Conway and myself, I'd like to thank all of those whose assistance has made our weekly visits possible. Claire Wiedener of the American Broadcasting Company, Carl Hefferman, our engineer, Bill Verdier and Vic Livotti, who so capably furnished our sound effects, Shirley Wilson, our charming script girl, Alex Steinert, who composed and conducted the music, Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, Edith Miser and Leonard Lee, who wrote the dramatizations, and last but not least... Our producer and our director, Tom McKnight. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo and wishing you a happy and prosperous summer. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another of his fascinating stories about his old friend... That master detective, Sherlock Holmes, will be back with you once again. And we're looking forward to getting together at this time every week from here on out. And I hope you won't mind if every once in a while I sort of get a word in edgewise about Petri wines. You know, and I really mean this, Petri wines are wonderful wines. For instance, right now, I wish I could give you a glass of Petri California port. You could hold that Petri port up to the light and look at its clear, deep red color. You could smell that luscious grape aroma. And best of all, you could taste that Petri port. What a flavor. That Petri port just sort of bound on your tongue, and oh boy, is that ever good. Try Petri port after dinner some evening, or try it when some friends drop in. You can serve it proudly, because after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. <laughs> And now let's look in on our good friend, Dr. Watson, and see if he's expecting us. Oh, come in. Come in, Mr. Bartow. You're just the man I've been expecting. How are you, Dr. Watson? It's good to see you again. Oh, thank you, my boy. It's very nice to see you again, too. I've missed our Monday night visits during the last three months. Sit yourself down. Uh, would you care to join me in a, in a glass of port? Well, thanks, Doctor. That'd be nice. You know, it seems to me, after our summer vacation, a toast to the great Sherlock Holmes would be in order. That's an excellent idea. Here you are, young fellow. Thanks. You propose the toast, Doctor. To Sherlock Holmes, master detective and loyal friend, whose adventures have brought considerable, shall we say, fame to a certain retired doctor now living in Northern California. I'll drink to that. Well, now, suppose I might as well get on with tonight's story. Which particular adventure have you selected, Doctor? One that I call the limping ghost. Sounds exciting. And, as usual, you find me saying, how did it begin? In Baker Street on a windy December evening at the turn of the century. A young, white-faced boy sat in front of our blazing fire. And as he told us his strange story, the flickering firelight danced weird patterns on the walls. The young man was Alexander McMorris, the seventh Earl of Loch Nair. The Earl of Loch Nair. Say, uh, didn't I read in the papers the other day that the 8th Earl of Loch Nair had been killed in an airplane accident? Quite right, my boy. 
Even in this day and age, the tragic history of violent death seems to dog the footsteps of the Loch Nair family. But to return to my story. On that December night in 1900, we heard the whole history of the limping coast of Loch Nair. The first Earl had lost a foot at the Battle of Flodden Field in 1513. In spite of this terrible handicap, he fought on valiantly until he died on the battlefield from loss of blood. From then on, right until the time this story begins, the limping ghost, clad in a suit of armour, always appeared at Loch Nair Castle before and after the death of the current Earl. Yes, Mr. Bartell, it was a strange story that Sherlock Holmes and I listened to that night. A story of death and horror over the centuries, punctuated by the limping clank of ghostly armor. Milady, I have terrible news for you. Your husband, the Earl, was killed in the explosion that destroyed Lord Darnley. <laughs> Lady, the Guy Fawkes plan to blow up the Houses of Parliament has failed. Your husband is in the Tower of London. They say he's to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Madam, I regret to inform you that your husband, on my instructions, has been arrested for murder. I have no doubt that he will be hanged. And that's the story of the Loch Nairs, Mr. Holmes. You were instrumental in sending my great uncle to the gallows, a fate which he richly deserved. I'm deemed only natural to come here to Baker Street and consult you now that I'm in trouble. I shall be most happy to do anything I can to help you, sir. I don't remember anything about your sending the Earl of Loch to the scaffold home. Well, he did, Dr. Watson. Oh, really? And the servants have always sworn the ghost really did walk at midnight on the day that he was hanged. Indeed. Now, sir, I suggest that you tell us what problem brought you here. The ghost is walking again, Mr. Holmes. You know what that means. According to the legend, that the present Earl will die. Exactly. Are they worried? Might I understand that you've actually seen this ghost yourself? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The night before last, Betty, well, that is, Miss Nolan and I, were sitting in the dining hall in front of the fire when we heard a strange sound up in the musician's gallery. We looked up and in the moonlight saw a ghostly figure in armor limping towards the staircase. Oh, gracious me. Uh, my dear sir, you're, you're certain that you really saw it? Moonlight can play strange tricks, you know. There wasn't any doubt about it, Doctor. We both saw and heard it. What did you do? I started to go towards the stairs, but as I did so, Betty screamed and then tumbled to the floor in a heap. Mm. Fainted, I suppose. Yes. While I was reviving her, the, the ghost disappeared. Who's staying with you at Loch Castle at the moment? Well, there's Betty Nolan. She's the sister of James Nolan. He looks after my estate. Uh, Betty and I... Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Anyone else staying with you? Yes. A distant cousin of mine, Jeremy K. McMorris, an American... He turned up in England a couple of months ago with his son, Walter. They're both with me at the present. A distant cousin. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Actually, the descendants of a more than usually black sheep branch of the family. I, uh, I don't know how long the old man's going to be with us, though. If you ask me, he's a dying man. How do you say that, sir? As far as I can gather, he's been wasting away for years. It's only a question of time before his strength fails him entirely. I, uh... <clears throat> Was hoping perhaps you could take a look at him, Dr. Watson. That is, uh, if I could persuade you and Mr. Holmes to come and stay at the castle for a few days. Well, what about it, Holmes? It's an intriguing problem, Watson. The current Earl of Lochnair would seem to be in danger. A cousin of his is dying of an obscure disease, and the ghost of Lochnair Castle is walking again. Yes, it's an irresistible invitation. I see no reason why we can't leave on the Scotch Express tonight. <laughs> Quite a heavy fall of snow here in your absence, young man. Quite so. And judging from the color of the sky, there's more to come. Uh, very angry looking. Hmm. Oh, now, as we round this bend, you'll be able to see the castle. Ah, yes. There you are, gentlemen. Huh. Magnificent. Yes, it's a fine place, all right, Doctor, though it cost me a great deal in upkeep. As a matter of fact, I only have one wing open. It's always been something of a problem to get servants to come and live here. See, the local villagers have a great respect for the Loch Nair ghost, you know. What servants do you have at the castle at present? A cook housekeeper, Mrs. McClintock, fine old lady who's been with me for six years now. And then there's old Tamas. He served my family for as long as I can remember. Well, as a matter of fact, there he is now. Hello, Tamas. I'm glad to see you back, my lord, and that's a fact. Oh, thank you, Tamas. Oh, 
These gentlemen are Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good, good day to you, gentlemen. How do you good do? Good day, Thomas. Good day. Uh, I'll trap round to the stables. I may as well break the news to you. Yes, what's happened, Thomas? It's your cousin, my lord. Poor old Mr. McMorris. He's dead. What? Died early this morning. God rest his soul. Dead? Well, I'm very sorry that I arrived too late to be of any help. Well, thank you for telling me, Thomas. Oh, you may take the trap round now. Aye, sir. I'll bring the baggage on me. So he's dead. Well, I can't say it's unexpected, but it is a shock, nevertheless. I'm sure that it must be, particularly as you yourself told us you saw the ghost of Loch Nair the night before last. In which case... In which case, Watson, I think we may reasonably expect another visitation. Perhaps before the night is over. Shall we go in? This is Miss Nolan, my fiancée, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and Dr. Watson. I'm very glad to meet you. Hi, Miss Nolan. And uh, this is her brother, James Nolan, the manager of my estate. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Nolan? Much better for seeing you both up here. I'm sure it won't take you long to lay this ghost business by the heels. Well, I trust you don't overestimate our abilities, Mr. Nolan. Alec, you've you've heard about your cousin, of course. Oh, yes, my dear. Thomas told us as we drove up. Where is Walter? He went into the village with the doctor and... The body of his father. Oh. He should be back soon. How's he taking it? Very quietly. Too quietly, if you ask me. Those Americans are pretty demonstrative people, you know. And Walter has been no exception. But he behaved very strangely this morning. When the doctor told him his father was dead, he just said, now things will start to happen and then shut up like an oyster. I can't make head or tail of the fellow. Uh, yes, quite so, quite so. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I expect you and Dr. Watson would like to go to your room. Yes, I must go. I think first I'd like to take a look at the um, musician's gallery, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, of course. Would you excuse us, darling? All right, Alec. It's uh, in the dining hall here. <laughs> they must have been very hospitable people in those days. Fifty or sixty people could eat at that table. <laughs> yes, Doctor. Needless to remark, we hardly have a usual room nowadays. There's the musician's gallery, Mr. Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I see. How do we get up there? I'll show you. See, there's a stone staircase behind this tapestry here. Follow me. Watch your step. It's quite narrow, rather dark. Watch your head, Watson, old chap. Oh, don't worry about me, Holmes. I'm perfect. Oh, I say. Must have built these stairs for pygmies. Oh, yes. Here we are, gentlemen. This is the musician's gap. Hi, Joe. It must have made a pretty picture in the days gone by. A little string orchestra fiddling away up here and down below the Scottish nobility bobbing and floating round in the intricacies of a Highland chatiche or a stately gavotte or something. Where does that door lead to? To the bedroom wing. And that's where the ghost appeared from the other night, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh-huh. The door's jar. You generally keep this door unlocked, sir? Why, no. But the key mysteriously disappeared about a week ago. James is having a new one made. So I must remind him about that. Alec! Alec, all right! Oh, we're up here, Walter. We're coming down. That's Walter McMorris. My dead cousin's son. Well, fellow, this must be a dreadful day for him. Yes, I'm afraid this is going to be a rather painful interview. Oh, hello, Walter. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Sherlock Holmes, sir. I've heard about you and your friend, Dr. Watson. Walter, old man, I'm dreadfully sorry about your father. Are you now? Isn't that nice of you? Well, you'll be sorry enough when you hear that I'm going to take you to court and prove that I'm the real Earl of Loch Nair. Why, Walter, you're out of your mind. Am I? No. Father was out of his because he kept quiet all these years. But I'm going to have my rights. I've looked up the records. I've had genealogists working for months. And I've got all the facts that prove you're an imposter. Oh, man, what are you talking about? You know well enough... When Sherlock Holmes here sent your great uncle to the gallows 20 years ago, the title and estate should have come to my father. When I leave here tomorrow, I'm going straight to the finest lawyer in London. And man, if you believe this, why have you said nothing about it till now? Because I'm smart. I found out a thing or two since I've been staying here. And one of the things I found out is that your precious fiancé and her brother wouldn't look twice at you if it weren't for your money and the title. Shut up. You'll find out. She's a smart little filly, and she knows what kind of a track she's running. Are you duck! My compliments, sir. A very professional uppercut. Yes, and a very well-deserved one. I... Offensive scoundrel. Sorry about this. Uh, please don't say anything in front of Betty. You're going to upset her. I quite understand. Come along, Watson. Let's go and find our rooms. Home. It's 
nearly dinner time. Why are we wandering about here in the dark instead of having a glass of sherry with the others in the library? I'm a conscientious practitioner, Watson. I'd like to earn my fees. It uh, occurred to me that a further examination of his dining hall might prove profitable. Well, personally, Holmes, I think you're wasting your time on this case. <laughs> What makes you think that, old chap? It's perfectly obvious that young American fellow was impersonating the ghost a few nights ago. He knew his father was going to die and he wanted to build up the legend so as to make his own claim seem more believable. Well, that's very sound reasoning, Watson. Though to be logical in his deception, he should repeat the performance now that his father is dead. Well, the ghosts only walk at midnight. So why don't we go and have a glass of sherry? Shh. Hmm? What is it, Holmes? Someone's coming in from the library. The lighted candle. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mrs. McClintock, the housekeeper. Oh, gracious me. You gave me quite a start. I heard voices and I knew the candles were not alight in here, so I came in to see who it was. You're watching for the ghost, I suppose. Well, you'll no be disappointed, gentlemen, though you may see more than you bargained for. Those that meddle with ghostly things that in a hand are playing with something much more dangerous than fire. Fire burns. But the shades on dead people... Holmes, Holmes! Look up there, the gallery! The door's opening. It's the ghost! Aye, here he comes, the poor buddy. See the armor on him? And the way he's dragging one leg behind him? Yes, it's really quite an effective impersonation. And the twilight provides most appropriate lighting for his play-acting, too. You mean it's a young American? Of course, obviously. Ah! Look, look behind him. There's another figure. Yes, Dressed in the same kind of armor and carrying a sword. Pins a foot, Watson. The ghost has seen him. He's turning. The second figure's raising his sword. Look out! Great heavens! He's knocked him through the railings. That must be a 20 foot fall. Come on, old fellow. Help me open his visor. Just a minute. Uh... Yes. It's Walter McMorris, the American. Though from the angle of his head, I would suggest that it might be the late Walter McMorris. Say, eh, Watson? He's dead all right, home. Neck broken. Meanwhile, the second figure has been able to slip back through that corner escape us. Come on, he was dressed in armor. He can't go very fast. Perhaps we can overtake him. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, which is all the time I need to tell you about Petri California Muscatel. Ever try Petri Muscatel? It's a wine that looks like sheer... Boy, pop one of those Muscat grapes into your mouth and you know you've got something delicious. You know that. And you get the same flavor in Petri Muscatel. It's a perfect wine to serve a lady. Women love it. And that best time to serve it is after dinner or on a Sunday afternoon. You know, times like that. But just make sure it's Petri Muscatel, because that's the way to make sure it's going to be good. Remember, Petri. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure and the story of the limping ghost of Loch Nair. Couldn't find it, Holmes. There's no trace of the ghost in the musician's gallery. You gave him too much of a start, I'm afraid. <laughs> of course you didn't find him. You'll never find him because he's not mortal. Mrs. McClintock, is the original suit of armor the one worn by the first Earl of Loch Ness still in the castle? Aye, sir. It's in the library through that door there. I'll take you to it. Don't bother, thank you. We'll find it. Come on, Watson. Bring that candle with you. All right, Joe. You can know what your dinner really can. Holmes, what do you make of the second girl? Well, imposter, obviously. But who could it have been? That's what we have to find out, old chap. Undoubtedly, someone knew that the American Walter McMorris was impersonating the ghost and used this macabre method to kill him. But why kill him? Possibly his claims to the title and estate were valid. Or perhaps some fanatic was so devoted to the Loch Nair legend that he assumed the role of ghost and killed him for his sacrilege. Hold the candle a little higher, will you, old chap? Here you are. Hello. Here's a suit of armor, Holmes. Lying in a heap on the floor. Oh, on the floor, eh? Well, as it obviously belongs on that stand over there. It's perfectly clear what's happened. The second figure used this armor and slipped it back in here while we were examining the dead man. Possibly, Watson, possibly. At least this armor gives us a definite clue. But it limits the field of possible suspects. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, it's an interesting fact that the human race has grown definitely larger in the past 400 years. Very few ancient armor like this. For example, take the first item on the top of the heap lying on the floor here. 
These gauntlets of chain mail. Start them on. Well, much too small for exactly. me. Either you nor I could have worn this suit. No, 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 nor could young Neville and the estate agent. Whereas his sister could have done. Yes, so could Thomas the butler. He's a small fellow. And if it comes to that, Watson, our distinguished client, the young Earl of Loch Nair, is himself a small man. Right, so he is. And he might easily have had a motive. Young McMorris had disputed his right to the title earlier in the day. But we mustn't jump to conclusions. Nevertheless, you see what valuable evidence this arm has become. Hello, hello. It sounds as if the rest of the party are on the scene. Yes, I suggest that we join them without making any reference to this suit of armor. Remember, old chap, one of them in there is a murderer. And we may have to set a trap to catch him. Uh, are you sure he's dead, Dr. Watson? There's no doubt about it. His neck was broken instantly by the fall. <clears throat> it's dreadful. Father and son both dying on the same day. And you said the real ghost came up behind him, Mr. Holmes, and struck him so they crashed through the railing up there. I said another figure dressed in armor and killed him, Mr. Nolan. It was a real ghost. I saw him with my own two eyes. He killed that man for trying to bring shame on the name of Loch Nair. Couldn't we get in touch with the police? How can I... No, dear. Oh, well, I can't frighten. Now, hush, darling. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. No, at least we have the assurance that the ghost will not limp again. Why? Well, the murderer has no further motive for impersonating the ghost. To walk now would be to support the dead American's claims. No, we shall spend a quiet night, and tomorrow I shall communicate with the proper authorities as to my quite definite notions regarding the murderer's identity. Uh, but if the ghost should walk again, Mr. Holmes... Well, then, sir, I shall know that at last I've encountered a truly supernatural crime and shall retire from the practice of, um, of detection. <laughs> It's nearly two o'clock. You still over there by the window, puffing away that pipe of yours? Oh, you know, I can't help being that young McMorris knows a great deal more than he told us. To look about him, I don't like. Never did trust a fellow. Couldn't look you squarely in the eye. Don't you feel the same way, Holmes? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Holmes! Shh, Black Watson. Where have you been? I thought you were over there by the window. I've uh, been talking to myself. Never mind that, old chap. Get your son in a dressing gown. We're on the last lap of this strange eventful tragedy. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Perhaps I can get some sleep. Holmes, um, where have... We invaded the trap. Now it's ready to spring. Don't dawdle, Watson. Come I'm on, come on. I'm not dawdling. I'm not dawdling. What do you mean you, you baited a trap? You'll see for yourself in a few moments. As a matter of fact, I really baited it when I said downstairs that if the real ghost should walk again, I would retire from the practice of detection. I didn't understand your saying that myself. Well, I was tempting the murderer to show his hand once more. Come on, come on, please. Where are we going? To wait behind the curtain at the foot of the stairs leading to the musician's gallery. And I hope we don't have to wait very long. through this wretched curtain. How much longer do we have to wait? Until our murderer arrives. Are you, are you certain you'll come? Not certain, but hopeful. Extremely hopeful. You know who it is, don't you? Yes. But my proof is too thin for a court of law. I must catch him in the act. Here he comes. Splendid. Let's go up and grab him. No, 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 no. They walk into my trap. He's coming towards the head of the stairs. Oh! Great start! Exactly. A simple piece of wire stretched across the gallery is remarkably effective, even with ghosts. Come on, Watson. Help me off with this visor. There we are. Good oh. Lord, it's... Oh. It's James Nolan. Exactly. Well, what's happened? You walked into a simple trap, my friend. I'm afraid the next trap will be more lethal, for it will undoubtedly prove to be the one beneath the gallows. Now that we're headed back for London, Holmes, perhaps you'll settle one or two points in the case that are bothering me quite a bit. Oh, oh, with pleasure, my dear chap. What are they? I still don't see what Nolan's motive was in murdering the American. Oh, that should be obvious. He wanted to ensure that his sister's fiancée would enjoy undisputed title to the name of the States. Well, how did you know it was Nolan? 
when I examined the authentic suit of armor. You see, it was um, obvious it had never been worn. But I still don't quite oh, understand... Oh, come now, old chap. Yes? The suit of armor was in a heap on the floor. Yeah? And if it had been hastily discarded, and yet, um, well, the gauntlets were on top of the pile, you remember. Well, that's right, they were. If the suit had really been worn, the gauntlets would have been the first things to have been taken off, and so would have been um, underneath the pile. Hmm? Obviously, therefore, the armor had been disarranged in order to make people believe the real ghost had walked. Oh, yeah. After the American's death, the suspects were four. Miss Nolan, her brother, Thomas, the butler, and the Earl himself. Well, I ruled out Mrs. McClintock because, you remember, she was standing behind us at the time of the murder. Well, I'm beginning to understand. All the suspects except Nolan were small enough to have worn the armor. That's right. Therefore, only he could have pretended to use it. Pretended? But he, he did use it. Oh, no, my dear fellow. Undoubtedly, he procured a similar one of modern manufacture. An amazing case, Holmes. An interesting one at any rate. And once again, old fellow, I'm possibly reminded of an old Scottish litany. Scottish litany? Which one's that? Oh, you remember it. Round ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. <laughs> Good Lord, deliver us. <laughs> really a swell story. You know, for a while there, I was beginning to believe in ghosts. Well, I'm ashamed to admit it, but at the time, so was I. <laughs> you know, this sounds silly, but I bet it would be fun to be one of those legendary ink go around sticking your nose into everybody's business and playing practical jokes like mad and nobody able to figure out who did it. That would really be fun in a way. Well, you can go around scaring people all you want to, but not for me. I think a ghost leads a terrible life. So, for instance, a ghost can't have the pleasure of eating a nice juicy steak. Yeah, or drinking a glass of really good wine. Ah, oh, now you're talking, young fellow, my lad. Petri wine. Yeah, still talking, young fellow. You see, when I say good wine, I always mean Petri wine because you can depend on Petri. I know, I know. Why, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Handing on down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. When you realize they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, well, common sense tells you the Petri family knows practically all there is to know about the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant wine. Yep, whether you're looking for a swell wine to serve before dinner or with dinner or after dinner, for any occasion, you just can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you... Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that Holmes and I had in the English countryside. It concerns the apparent madness of a certain Colonel Warburton and the puzzling mystery of two dead dogs. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. <laughs> To bring you such good wine So when you eat and when you cook Remember Petri wine To make good food taste better Remember Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Once again, it's time to walk down Baker Street with its swirling fog, its passing hansom cabs, and bustling London life. Hello, this is Ben Wright, welcoming you to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. At the end of each broadcast, the announcer says, Tonight's episode was written by Dennis Green, 
and Anthony Boucher. Both men, although they are no longer with us, were married. Dennis Green's widow, Mary Green, lives in New York and is still active in theater and dance. And Phyllis White, Anthony Boucher's widow, lives in San Francisco and makes numerous guest appearances at Mystery Club gatherings and at the meetings of the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, tonight it is my pleasure to present Phyllis White, who will tell you a little about what her husband and Dennis Green did for the Sherlock Holmes radio series. Phyllis? I've been asked to give an account how it happened that my husband got involved with the Sherlock Holmes show. The way his career developed was not according to any underlying plan. Whenever he turned a corner and moved into a new field, it was brought about by chance. And this was a good example of that. He was at the time a mystery reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, this time he went over to the book department office, got his books and his mail, and found among the mail an invitation to a cocktail party. It was in honor of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, who had come to San Francisco to do a war bond promotion. The party was going on right then, so he could quite easily have learned about it too late. But he trotted right over, and aside from meeting Rathbone and Bruce, there were other people who had come along from the radio program. There was Glenn Hall Taylor, who was the producer, and there was Dennis Green, who was one of the writers. He was writing in collaboration with Leslie Charteris. Well, as it turned out, the Greens were staying on a little longer in the Bay Area. My husband invited them to come over to Berkeley and have dinner with us and see his Sherlock Holmes collection. Well, they they went back to Hollywood, and not long after, it turned out that the program was in need of a new writer. Dennis suggested Boucher. Well, it turned out that it... uh, Mesh just beautifully as a collaboration. Here was a, a noble project working with gifted colleagues, something that they could all feel affection for and respect and a lot of fun along the way, too. Thank you, Phyllis. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in Colonel Warburton's Madness. Petri Wine brings you... <laughs> Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know what I wish I could share with you sometime? A bottle of Petri California Sherry. Have you ever tasted Petri Sherry? It's just perfect before dinner. Why, that Petri Sherry can change the usual before-dinner lull into a special event, and that's a fact. Just look at the clear color of Petri Sherry. It's a deep, rich amber, clear and cheerful-looking. And wait till you taste it. That's when you find out for sure just how good a wine can be. That's when you find out just what I mean when I say that The flavor of Petri Sherry comes right from the heart of the grape. Try Petri Sherry by itself. Or with hors d'oeuvres or canopies or whatever you call those little cocktail sandwiches. And say, if you like your sherry dry, well then Petri California Pale Dry Sherry is the sherry for you. Just be sure the label says Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. Now, let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. Doctor? I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Bartow. Come out and join me. <laughs> Quiet, Winnie. Quiet, down, down, Monty. <laughs> I see the welcoming committee's here. <laughs> this little scoundrel. They begin to think they own this patio. Scoop them off the chair, Mr. Bartow, and, and settle yourself down. All right, off you go, boy. Off you go, go on, off you go. That's it, my boy. As a matter of fact, it's rather appropriate that the puppies should be here tonight. As in the story that I'm going to tell you, a dog played a most prominent part. A dog? What kind of a dog, Doctor? Now, 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 my boy, don't get me anticipating my story. For once, I'm going to start at the beginning. 
which was, On a summer morning in 1890, not long after my marriage, I'd gone back to my private practice, you know, and Sherlock Holmes was living alone in our old Baker Street rooms. Well, you still saw him, I suppose. Indeed I did, Mr. Bartell. In fact, occasionally I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to visit my wife and me. But to get back to my story, I'd been exceptionally busy that summer, and consequence was feeling rather, shall we say, nervy and, and run down. So much so that Mary, oh, <laughs> Mrs. Watson, persuaded me to take a fortnight's holiday. We went down to the charming little village of Taplow on the lower reaches of the River Thames. But, as so often happens, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang up to glare. I guess the holiday backfired on you, Doctor, and you found yourself involved in a mystery. Maybe a mystery calling for the aid of your old friend Sherlock Holmes? Quite correct, Mr. Bartell. We'd only been down there a couple of days when the trouble began. In fact, the whole thing became so involved that I thought the best thing to do was to put the whole strange story in a letter to Sherlock Holmes. This I did. And I can imagine how he chuckled when he read my news. Dear old Watson, seems to be a little out of his depth. My dear Holmes, I need your help, or at least your advice. Two days down here and I've become involved in a most unusual problem. It began this morning when Mary and I were out for an after-breakfast stroll. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and there seemed every indication of it being a happy... You know, Mary, I've always thought up to now that balmy was rather a silly word. <laughs> I still do, John, dear. Nevertheless, it's the only possible word that describes a day like this adequately. Very well, dear, it's balmy. Personally, I'm so happy to see you relaxing that I don't care what the weather's like. You've been working much too hard. Yes, it's been a busy year. Yes, and last year Sherlock Holmes monopolized most of your time. At least I've got you to myself for once. <laughs> you dear little thing, you... Always been rather jealous of my association with Holmes, haven't you? Not jealous, dear, but I must confess his influence on you wasn't entirely for the good. He had a habit of keeping you out all night. Well, you should be used to that, dear. After all, it happens often enough in my practice. True, John, but on those occasions I know where you are and don't worry about you. And again, you've copied so many of Mr. Holmes' eccentricities. Hmm? Keeping your tobacco in a Persian slipper, for instance. <laughs> and Oh, John, look down. Do you see that woman walking across the field towards us? Yes, well, what's the matter? Do you know her? I'm not sure, but I think it's Ellen Warburton. I believe she does live somewhere near here. And who is Ellen Warburton? An old friend of mine. She's frightfully clever and advanced. She's interested in women's suffrage and all sorts of things. Oh, sounds dreadful. Imagine giving women the right to vote. Their place is in the home. It is Ellen. 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 Ellen Warburton. Oh, how are you? Mary. Mary Watson. Very nice to see you again. I'm Mary Watson now. This is my husband. How do you do, Miss Robertson? How do you? Uh, how do you do? Mary, I'd heard that you'd married. Aren't you a medical detective or something, Mr. Watson? <laughs> Not quite, dear. Uh, I see... hold the degree of Doctor of Medicine from the University of London, madam. But he's helped the great Sherlock Holmes on many of his cases. That's how I've heard of him then. Do you mind if I walk with you a little way? Of course not, Ellen. Come along. Uh, do you live near here, Miss Warburton? About four miles away, Doctor, at Chevy mm. Grange. I'm a glorified housekeeper for my uncle, Colonel Warburton. Oh, dear, that sounds rather dull for you. As a matter of fact, the state of my uncle's health at the present moment makes it anything but dull for me. That's why I ask if I might walk with you for a way. Well, what's the matter with him, Ellen? He's going mad. Before my eyes. And I can do nothing to help him. Mad? Oh, come now, Miss Warburton, sure are you... Doctor, I'm not an hysterical girl. In fact, I regard myself as something of a scientist. I studied physics for a number of years at Bristol University. And I tell you that my uncle is going insane. What are the symptoms? Most of the time, he's perfectly normal. But when these attacks are on him, he gets in the most frightful rages and says the strangest things. He's even complained of hearing a shrill, piping whistle that comes out of nowhere. I can't hear it, nor can anyone else. But uncle gets into the most dreadful state. I wonder... Would you have a look at him for me, Dr. Watson? Well, I don't... Of course, feel... John will do everything he can. Thank you so much. Then supposing you both come over for... So, my dear Holmes, at seven o'clock this evening, we found ourselves approaching Chevy Grange. It was rather a forbidding-looking place, covering a little more than an acre, I should say. As we stood waiting for admittance, I must confess that I was not entirely... Oh, 
Gloomy looking place, isn't it, Mary? It is a little forbidding, John, dear. Oh, dear. What's that? Sounds like a tom-tom. Someone singing a weird chant. Seems to be coming from the direction of that barn over there. It doesn't seem quite appropriate, dear, does it? I mean, not in the heart of Buckinghamshire. Why not knock on the door again, John? It's all right, I will. Perhaps they didn't hear us. Oh, oh, they did. Who is it? Oh, it's guests. It's Dr. and Mrs. Watson, my good man. Ack is the name, sir. Come in, please. The colonel's expecting you, sir. He's in the study. This way, sir. By the way, Hacker, as we were waiting outside the front door, we heard a strange chant, and it sounded as if someone was beating a a tom-tom. Oh, that's her. That was Miss Narda. You'll be hearing more of her. Promising beginning. Let's see what happened next. This uh, very unpleasant fellow, Hacker, showed us into the study where we met Colonel Warburton. First, it was hard to believe that he was a sick man. He looked well enough, and his conversation was sprightly. Spent most of his army life in Africa as military governor in a Zulu district. And the African spears and other trophies that lined his study walls bore mute evidence to his past life. He encouraged me to tell him some of my own army experiences. Oh, dear. Poor fellow. It was very rather fabric. There I was, Colonel Warburton, on the howdah of this wretched elephant. The river was a raging torrent and I couldn't get the confounded animal to budge. Well, <laughs> I'm a pretty strong swimmer, you know. Won several cups of swimming, as a matter of fact. Of course, I was a much younger man then. Uh, and John, I... dear. Yes, ma'am? You interrupted Colonel Warburton's story, oh, dear. Oh, sorry. I was a little instant would be interesting. Uh, uh, do go on, Colonel. Yes, uh, Your story was so interesting. Right. You were telling us that you were intercepted by an African drum code message. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I don't want to sound conceited, but I... I doubt if there was another Englishman in the world who could have told you what those particular drum beats meant. Oh, I don't doubt that, Colonel Warburton. Well, I'd spent a good number of years studying the native customs. I spotted the code right away. It meant that an uprising was planned to start throughout the whole province at noon the next day. Of course, I... Uh... There it is again. A devilish whistle. And you hear it, Dr. Watson? Mrs. Watson? I can hear nothing, sir. Nor can I. Of course not. No one could hear it but me. No, 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 Colonel Warburton. Don't get so excited, it's sir. It's black magic. That's what it is. Oh, really? It's a black oh, you magic. You must realize that the powers of jungle witchcraft are completely unknown in this country, Dr. Watson. But I know of them. And I can think of many people who might wish to employ them against me. Come in. Come in. Oh. Oh, it's you, Nada. Great Scott. She's... She's, she's very beautiful. Nada, I want you to meet some friends of Ellen's. Dr. and Mrs. Watson. I am very pleased to meet both of you. How do you do? How do you do, Miss uh, Nada? Nada's father was a Chaga jeweler, one of the greatest Zulu chieftains I ever had the privilege of knowing. He did me the rare honor to swear blood brotherhood. So when the missionary sent Nada to England to complete her education, I insisted that she spend her first few months here under my wing. I... Listen. What is it, Colonel? That whistle again. For heaven's sake, say that you heard it this time. Please say that you did. I didn't hear a thing, sir. Well, I did. And I know where that sound came from. Now, now put down that spear at once, will you, Colonel Warburton? The devils are trying to kill me. I'll kill them first. No, no, no. Don't throw it, sir. Don't throw it. Someone's opening the door. Uncle. It's Ellen. Great Scott. The spear missed her by an inch. Uncle, what is it? Whistle. I heard it again, Ellen. And I'm going to find where it came from. I'm... Poor Uncle. Of course, you heard no sound. Nothing, Ellen. What can we do to help him, Dr. Watson? Well, it's hard to say, Miss Warden. I'm not sure that medical help's what she needs. Uh, he seems perfectly sane and lucid, except for these strange outbursts. But we must do something. I propose to, madam. As soon as I get back to the inn, I think I'll write to my old friend Sherlock Holmes and ask his advice. There's a problem. I can't feel that the man should be committed to an asylum, and yet, obviously, when these attacks are on him, he's as mad as a hatter. Well, fascinating problem and one that calls for speedy action. I think a telegram to my friend Watson might help to clarify some aspects of the case. Yes. You see, uh, Dr. John H. Watson, Red Lion Inn, Taplow Bucks. I suggest that you ascertain one important... Ascertain one important fact. Does the Warburton household have a dog? <laughs> 
There's a glass of ply, Holmes. Oh, my soul, Mary. That's a cryptic answer to my letter. Yes, dear, it is. I'm afraid Ellen will be disappointed. He's coming over to join us for lunch to see if you have any news. What on earth can dogs have to do with the case? I can't possibly... Here's Helen now. Good morning, Ellen. Hello, Mary. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, good morning. I suppose it's too early to have received any reply from Mr. Holmes. Well, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I just got this telegram from him. You can read it if you like. I can't see it. It makes much sense, Mr. Holmes. But that's extraordinary. I did have a little dog. He was killed a week ago. But it didn't occur to me to tell you about it yesterday. Oh, that's amazing. How could Mr. Holmes have known about it? Uh, it's very little that Holmes doesn't know, my dear. How was your dog killed, Miss Warburton? I found him in the grounds with his head smashed in by a stone. Oh, how dreadful. Who do you think did it? It might have been a poacher. And then again, it might have been... Your uncle? It's possible. When he's in those rages, I don't think he knows what he's doing. That's very important. I think I shall go and send Holmes a telegram at once. Don't wait lunch for me. Why did we have to walk over to the station, John dear? To see if there was an answer at the station telegraph office to the wire that I sent home. Oh, it's only 4.30, dear. It's hardly possible for him to have answered as quickly as that. In any case, they delivered the telegram to the hotel, you know. Well, it was a nice walk, my dear. Hello, there's a, a train in the station now. I wonder where it's from. Why don't you ask that porter, dear? It's not a bad idea. Uh, porter, eh? what train is this? Oh, it's the London train, sir. Right on time. Next stop, ready? Not many people getting off here, are there? Great Scott, <laughs> look who's here. Oh, dear, it's Mr. Holmes, and he's got a dog on a leash. Oh, Holmes. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? This is Watson. How nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, I'm Holmes. I'm delighted you're here, old fellow. We walked over to the station to see if you'd answered my telegram, and <laughs> here you are in person. <laughs> it occurred to me that I could be down here in the same time that it would take a telegram to reach you. And I decided that a day or two in the country would make a person change. Apart from the fact that Colonel Warburton's problem interests me enormously. Why on earth did you bring a dog? I thought that this was a case in which a dog would be of invaluable assistance. Oh, be careful, John. Yes, look out, old chap. I, uh, I think it would be safer not to pat him. I picked him up in the Mile End Road for a couple of florins, and I fear he's a dog that should have remained in London. A singularly unattractive nature seems to have been entirely ruined by an hour's train ride. Unpleasant brute, isn't he? By the way, Holmes, what do you make of the case from my letters? Well, I should prefer to reserve my judgment until I've met the colonel. However, I will vouchsafe one opinion. Oh, what's that? To paraphrase a proverb, don't disbelieve all you don't hear. I can't think why someone doesn't answer. They can't all be out. Now, while we're waiting, I think I'll tie the dog up to this tree here. I don't want my arrival to too much commotion. Quiet! Quiet! Well, don't you think perhaps we could try the door, John? Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a good idea. Hello, hello. It's unlocked. Then let's go in, old fellow. Let's go in. Colonel Warburton? Colonel Warburton? Ellen? Uh, Ellen? What was the name of that, that butler fellow? Hacker. Yes, of course, that's it, Hacker. Uh, Hacker! Hacker! We appear to be in an empty house. The dog! Oh, fool that I am, I shouldn't have left him here. Come on! Ah. Oh. We're too late. Oh, the poor dog. He's been killed. Yes, poor brute. Stabbed to death by one of the colonel's spears. That proves it, Holmes. The man is mad. I think not, Watson. I think it proves that Colonel Warburton is a great deal more sane than some of the members of his household. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to remind you that there's one secret every smart woman knows. Simply, good wine makes good food taste better. And by good wine, naturally, I mean Petri wine. Try a Petri wine with your dinner. If you want a wonderful red wine, try Petri California Burgundy. If you want a perfect white wine, try Petri California Sauterne. In fact, try them both. 
you'll agree, I'm sure, that next to your good cooking, nothing can do more for a meal than a glass of good wine. A glass of Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, the story of Colonel Warburton's madness. Holmes, why are we heading for this barn? Seems to me we should be back in the house. Why, old chap? Found the house empty. Besides, I thought I heard. Shh, shh, shh. What is it? Listen. It's the same sound that Mary and I heard yesterday. Oh, once more, it's coming from the barn. Come on, Watson. But quietly. window here. It's that Zulu girl, Nada. She's beating a drum and chanting. Who's the man with her? It's Colonel Warburton. No, it isn't. It's that servant fellow, Hacker. What in thunder is he doing here? Apparently assisting Miss Nada in some of her uh, African mysticism. It's black magic they're dabbling with, just as the Colonel said. Let's go in and catch him red-handed. No, no. no. Stay quiet. We'll talk to them soon enough. The moment I feel it's a uh, much more urgent that we find Colonel Warburton. Come on. Well, there's the Colonel pacing up and down in front of the house with Mary and his and his niece, Miss Warburton. We shouldn't have left the women alone with him, you know. The man's dangerous. I don't think the women have been in any danger, Watson. Where have you been? Oh, well, Holmes and I decided we'd do uh, take a little walk. It proved very interesting. Uh, Miss Warburton, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? I'm so glad you're here. How do you do, Miss Warburton? And this is Colonel Warburton, Mr. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, eh? I suppose you think I killed your wretched dog. Well, I might have done it. When I hear that whistle, something seems to snap in my brain. I might have killed it. Why doesn't your doctor friend certify me as insane? Send me where I belong before I do any worse, damn it. Poor man. Isn't there anything you can do for him, Mr. Holmes? I most certainly will try to, Miss Warburton. What's no fellow? I wonder if you'll follow the colonel and give him a sedative. I'm afraid he has quite an ordeal before mm. him. What's over, well, Holmes? Miss Warburton, where were you when my dog was killed? Down in the greenhouse. As soon as I heard the poor animal yelping, I ran up to the house. I see. Mr. Holmes, you are going to be able to help the colonel, aren't you? I'm convinced of it, Mrs. Watson. That is why I brought a dog with me from London. But now that he's dead, I... I must obtain another one before I can proceed further with the case. Now, I wonder where on earth I can find John. Well, look, look. Huh? Down by the gate, there's a little girl walking with the dark. That's Sarah Entwistle, the daughter of our neighbors. Sarah, eh? Oh, excuse me, will you? Just a moment. Sarah! Sarah! Yes? Yeah. Uh, oh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, my dear, what a, uh, what a pretty dog you have there. What's his name? It's a her. Her name's Boojum. What's your name? <laughs> Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? <laughs> That's a funny name. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, look here, Sarah. Uh, here's a nice, shiny half-crown for you. Why are you giving me money? Well, because I love dogs, and I, I want to borrow, uh, what did you call him? Boojum. Boojum, oh, yes, yes. I want to borrow Boojum for half an hour. Why? Well, I, I want to, uh, I want to play with her, Sarah. You can play with her here. She's awfully friendly. <laughs> well, you see, I, I, I really want to take her for a nice walk. Why? She's just had one. Now, look here, Sarah. It's a beautifully shiny half-crown. Mommy's told me I mustn't take money from strangers. But I'm not a stranger. I'm a friend of Colonel Warburton. Having trouble, Mr. Holmes? Yes, I am, Mrs. Watson. You see, I, I want to give Sarah half a crown for borrowing Boojum for a short while, but she, well, she doesn't want to do it. Sarah, does Boojum like bones? Oh, yes. Loves them. We've got a lot of bones up at the house we'd like to give her. Have they got plenty of meat on them? Mm, plenty. She can have a wonderful feast, and then we'll bring her back in half an hour. All right. Go on, Boojum. Now, promise you'll bring her back in half an oh, hour. Oh, we promise. Yes, Sarah. And, and, and Sarah, what about the, uh, uh, what about the half crown? Well, I'll take it home and ask Mummy if I may keep it. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye. And take care of Boojum. <laughs> oh, she's a sweet little girl. Mr. Holmes, you're not going to expose Boojum to any danger, are you? None, Mrs. Watson. Otherwise, I shouldn't have borrowed her. I'm convinced that Boojum will give us the clue to what appears to be Colonel Warburton's madness. No, 
Now, let me see. We're all here. Miss Warburton, the colonel, Miss Nara, Hacker, and the dog, Boojum. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I propose to conduct an experiment. Before I conduct it, I should like to point out the chronology of the events in this case. First, Miss Nara arrived here. Mr. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Uh, uh, please, that... let me finish, Miss Nara. First, Miss Nara arrived here. Second, the colonel first heard the mysterious whistle. Third, your dog was killed, Miss Warburton. Fourth, the whistling set in in dead earnest. Uh, the colonel Warburton and Miss Warburton... Doesn't that pattern suggest anything to you? No, I can't say that it does, Mr. Holmes. I don't see what you're driving at. Nor do I, Holmes. We should be more explicit. Very well, then I will. I shall uh, now conduct my experiment. I want you all to watch Colonel Warburton and the dog Boojum. Excuse me while I turn my back. Now. There it is again. That whistle. (laughs) The dog heard it, too. (laughs) Great son, Holmes. What does it mean? It means that this wooden whistle in my hand is the answer to the mystery. The sound made by this cunningly designed instrument is above the normal range of pitch. You see, the colonel has hypersensitive ears. But the dog heard it. Perhaps I should have said the normal human range of pitch. Then do you suppose someone has deliberately been trying to drive the colonel mad? Of course, Mary. That's why the dogs were murdered. Whoever it was knew that a dog would give the game away. And it's not hard to guess who that someone is. Nada, this started when you came here. Is this your gratitude for the colonel's kindness to you? Endangering his sanity with your evil black magic? That is not true. Uh, one moment, please, Miss Warburton. Miss Nutter. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson and I watched you in the barn some three quarters of an hour ago with Hacker. Were you engaged in practicing any form of black magic? No, no. I was praying to my old gods to save the colonel's sanity. What were you doing there, Hacker? Don't tell me you were praying to old gods, too. Well, I used to be a chapel going man, sir, but I don't know. No harm in trying something new, I always say. In any case, why should Miss Nada wish to persecute the colonel? It might be for some tribal revenge. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Alan. Her father and I were sworn blood brothers. Exactly, sir. No, it should be obvious. Who had a motive for making the colonel appear mad? His niece and heiress. What do you mean? She has studied physics, you will remember, and so could know about supersonic research. Possibly she was afraid the colonel might leave his estate to Miss Nada. And so wished him to appear insane and thereby invalidate a new will. In any case, I found this whistle in a drawer in your room, Miss Warburton. Ellen! Ellen, how could you? I did it for your sake, to save you from Nada. She's just an adventuress, only you won't see it. Colonel Warburton, what action do you wish me to take regarding your niece, Miss Warburton? My niece? I have no niece, Mr. Holmes. Come, Nada, my dear. Oh, what an amazing case, Holmes. Mary, wasn't it clever the way Holmes solved it? It was very interesting, dear. I was quite enthralled. Oh, now I think I shall return to London and let you two finish your holiday in peace. Before you do that, Mr. Holmes, there's one thing we should do. What, Mary? Boo jump. <laughs> we promised, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I think the three of us might walk her home. But before we do that, I suggest we rummage through the kitchen. The kitchen? What on earth for? Bones, dear. Exactly. And bones with plenty of meat on them. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. And look, uh, you mean there really is a whistle that only dogs can hear? I thought you'd ask me that question, so I've got one of those whistles to show you. There. Well, there's nothing unusual about it. Blow it, Doctor. Well, listen, Mr. Bartell, if, if I want you to come quickly, I don't just have to whistle. All I have to say is, would anybody like a glass of Pepsi wine? And, hey, hey, presto, there you are. <laughs> well, can you blame me? I know a good wine when I hear it. And Petri wine sure is good wine. It ought to be. The Petri family's been making wine for generations. As you know, ever since they started the Petri business, way back in the 1800s, that business has always been family-owned and operated. So just think of all the experience the Petri family's gained. They've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. So whenever you're choosing a wine, a wine to serve before dinner, with dinner, or at any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine.
Tonight, Sherlock Holmes' adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Engineer's Thumb. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I remember one instance when um, the uh, culprit was not Willie. It was really Dennis's fault. He'd be naughty about putting an in-joke in the script. Holmes and Watson had to meet someone at a hotel... And he gave the hotel a name which was recognized by all the former denizens of London as that of a house of ill repute. There were various comments about that, and Edna said, oh, but it's a very high-class one. Order was restored, and the rehearsal continued. Um, They read on. Holmes and Watson were making their way through the fog to this rendezvous until Watson exclaimed, There it is now. I see the red light. Edna used to permit a certain amount of this, but she would uh, clamp down firmly because it was a tight schedule. This is Ben Wright. Phyllis White and I will return shortly with another new adventure of Sherlock Holmes. We return again to Phyllis White, who had some more delightful information about the Sherlock Holmes radio broadcasts. Phyllis? Rathbone and Bruce were making films, and they had just one day off per week for the radio work. They received the scripts a couple of days early to look over if they had time, and they would turn up at the studio early the afternoon of broadcast day. And the first reading would be... um, rather slow and broken up as there was discussion and maybe a few changes. Then there would be a reading for timing to fit to the exact number of minutes available. It was more likely to be too long than too short. Edna would flip over a few pages and knock out a couple of words here and a couple on another page, and it would miraculously come out exact to the minute. And so they went through the rest of the afternoon as they... Tempo and pressure increased and the show sharpened up. At the end of the afternoon, they went on the air for the eastern United States. Then there was a couple of hours break, and everybody would go out to dinner. Then they would come back and do it all over again for the West Coast. I feel very thankful now that these live and ephemeral shows were captured on disc and that they could now reach a new audience. Now, please join Phyllis and I as we listen to The Iron Box. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Well, this is it, New Year's Eve. And I wish you could be here with us this evening so we could toast each other with a glass of Petri California port. 
As you know, port wine has long been a favorite wine for celebrating a happy occasion. That's because port is a wine rich in tradition. And you couldn't ask for a more delicious port than Petri Port. Petri Port is a deep, glowing red color. Beautiful to look at and wonderful to taste. With a hearty, full flavor that's right from the heart of the grape. And when you serve Petri Port to your friends tonight or, or any time, remember you can serve it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's drop in and see him. 